Hello everyone and welcome to the complete Android app development masterclass. My name is Maysam, I'm a professional Android app developer and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. Before starting the course, let's talk about it for a few minutes. This course is about 15 hours and by watching it you are going to learn a lot about Android app development. But it is impossible to cover everything in just 15 hours. For that I've recorded an extended version of this course which is about 60 hours and in that you are going to learn everything that you need for a successful career in Android app development. You can find the extended course by clicking on the link down below this video. Let's see what we are going to cover in this video in this 15 hours. You will start from the very beginning. That means that even if you don't have any prior experience in programming, you are going to do just fine. We will cover everything in the course. In the first section of the course, you will set up the environment that you need for Android app development. That includes installing Java development kit, Android Studio, software development kit for Android app development, and the emulator for testing your applications. Besides setting up the environment, in the first section, you will create a small application to get familiar with Android app development and each piece in an Android application. In the second section of this course, you will learn Java language. Java is the most popular language for making Android applications and in this section, we will take a deep look at that. You will learn about different variables and operators, loops and conditional statements, different collections in Java, concurrency and threading, handling exceptions, singleton pattern and a lot more. You will also learn about object-oriented programming in Java. That includes things like classes and interfaces, inner classes and abstract classes, inheritance and polymorphism, and a lot more. We will end this section with a challenge so to make sure that you have learned everything we have talked about. In the next section, you will learn about user interfaces. You will learn about how to design modern layouts for your applications. In this section, we will talk about things like buttons and text views, different layouts, working with images and fonts, showing a list of items with list view and recycler view. We will talk about snack bars and card views, adding animations to your applications, and last but not least, we will talk about material design in Android. Once again, we will end this section with a challenge so to make sure that you have learned everything. After learning Java and designing user interfaces, you have the ability to create a lot of applications. In the final section of this course, we will create one real-world application from scratch. We will combine all of our knowledge about Android app development and we will create this application together. In this section, besides practicing everything you have learned so far, you will learn about a lot more topics. For instance, you will learn about persisting your data with shared preferences and also you will learn how to show different websites in your application, and of course a lot more. You can also include this application in your portfolio if you want. We are going to set up the environment that we need in order to create Android applications. We are going to install few things. First of all, we are going to install Java Development Kit, or as some might call it, JDK. After that, we are going to install Android Studio and after everything, we are going to create a virtual device in order to test our Android applications. As you can see, I have already downloaded JDK and Android Studio. Let's also see where we can get them from. For JDK, you can simply search for Java JDK and a link from Oracle website should pop up. The first link from the Oracle webpage is probably our needed link. As you can see, we are going to download and install JDK version 8. It's going to be enough for our purposes in this course. Down in here, first of all, we need to agree to the license agreement. And after that, depending on your operating system, you can download one of these versions. I'm on Windows, so I'm going to download and install this Windows X64 version. If you are not sure about this x86 or x64, you can right click on your my computer on your desktop in properties. In here you can see the architecture of your CPU. Mine is 64 bit, for you it might be x86. Depending on that, select one of these two files. Just click on this download and the download should be started. Sometimes like here it might ask you to log into your Oracle account. Let's do that. Creating an Oracle account is free and you won't be charged. Okay, let's select sign in. And as you can see, the download has begun. I'm going to select cancel in here because I have uh, downloaded the JDK previously. Let's select that. It's going to be a really simple uh, installation process. 
let's select next once again next once again let's click on next and as you can see we have successfully installed jdk let's click on this clause if you want to make sure that you have installed java jdk successfully you can always go to your command prompt by going to start menu and typing cmd in here you can type java dash version as you can see we are seeing some information about the version of java installed on our system as long as it's 1.8 and higher we are good to go let's close our command prompt next we are going to download android studio for that we can go to developer.android.com let's see developer.android.com during the course we will come back to this website a lot because this is the official website for android developers okay for downloading android studio just go to this android studio tab and from here you can download one of the versions if you don't see uh, your version of operating system, you can click on this download options, but in here, I'm just going to uh, click on the download. Let's say download Android Studio. We need to agree to the terms and conditions. And as you can see, the download has started. Once again, I'm going to select cancel in here because I have uh, already downloaded Android Studio. After the download is finished, just click on that. Once again, this is going to be a simple installation process. Let's select next. In here, make sure to check this Android virtual device. Let's select next. In here, you need to select a path to install Android Studio. Notice that installing Android Studio and all of its SDKs and also emulators sometimes might take something like 20 or even 40 gigabytes. So make sure to have at least 20 gigabytes on the drive that you are going to install your Android Studio. After that, let's select next and install. After the installation is finished, just click on this next and let's start our Android Studio. Don't worry about these three projects that I have in here. Basically, these are the recent projects that I was working on. I have Android Studio installed on my system previously and I uninstalled it for this uh, video, but for you, this list should be empty. Also, along the way of installing Android Studio, you might see some windowses about selecting a theme or other preferences. I didn't see them because I have installed Android Studio previously on my system. Those are not important depending on your preferences. Select one. Just if you see something like installing SDK, uncheck that because we are going to install it in here together. In order to install SDK, you can come to this configure in here and uh, you can select this SDK manager. SDK stands for software development kit and for developing Android applications, you need to install at least one SDK. Once again, as you can see, I have installed two SDKs in here, Android 10 and Android 9 APIs, but for you, this list should be empty and none of these should be checked. First of all, let's uh, check this show package details in order to see the package details for every SDK. By the time I'm recording this video, the latest version of Android is Android 10 or API level 29 to be precise. I suggest that you always install the latest version, but sometimes there might be some preview versions in here. I don't suggest installing those because those can be buggy and uh, those are not yet released on a stable channel. So make sure to install the latest stable version. If you want, you can install the complete SDK, but I don't suggest that because these can be memory and uh, hard drive consuming and these can occupy a lot of storage on your device. But the necessary things in here is first of all uh, Android SDK versions, whatever the version of your API is. So the first one, also the sources for that version of SDK, the second option. Also, I suggest that depending on the architecture of your system, select one of these two versions of Atom. Mine was a 64 architecture, so I'm going to select this one. If you are going to work with different Google APIs, for example, if you are going to work with a Google Map or YouTube APIs, uh, check one of these, for example, uh, this Google APIs for Atom 64. And also check one of these two Google API versions. This is going to install at least one SDK on my system, uh, the Android 10 or API level 29, but if you want, you can select and install multiple SDK versions. Basically, this SDK versions and APIs means that in what version of Android are you going to run and test your applications. 
later on we will see that when we are going to run our application on a virtual device we are going to need at least one sdk installing multiple sdks can be memory consuming and also hard drive consuming but if you have the resources i suggest that you at least install the latest version after that install this api level 29 because there were a lot of changes specifically in the data storage structure also install api level 28 down in here install api level 26 and after that level 21 and also 19 because uh, in this version of sdks there were a lot of changes and i'm just uh, saying this because of my experience in android app development but if you don't have the proper resources selecting one of these is going to be just fine after selecting what you need in here just click on this apply make sure to have a stable internet connection because it's going to download some stuff let's click on this apply in here you can see a dialog that will show you some information about the stuff that are going to be downloaded and also the size of the download file let's select ok in here and our download should be started i'm going to skip the video in here until the download is finished after the downloading and installing all of the components that you have selected before is finished just click on this finish and let's see what else do we have in here okay we have successfully installed at least one sdk let's switch to this sdk tools and let's see what we need from here first of all once again check this show package details install one of these android sdk build tools i suggest that install the latest version as you can see mine is installed in here 29.0.2 at the time this is the latest version also down in here uh, you need to install android emulator mine is not updated so i'm going to update that the next two things that are mandatory are these sdk platform tools and sdk tools make sure to select those two also down in here we have this documentation for android sdk this option is not necessary but uh, it's going to help us a lot during our journey in android app development later on we will see that these documentations will help us a lot when we want to debug something or when we face some errors so i strongly suggest to install these documentations as well the other thing that is not necessary but i suggest to install is this hexam installer it is going to be an accelerator for the speed of your emulator the native emulator in android studio can be very slow especially if you have a, a low memory ram for that reason i suggest you to install this hexam installer but there is one thing that i need to mention in here i've seen a lot of students having problem with this hexam installer i've seen them that they cannot install this hexam successfully this hexam cannot be installed on all of the cpus and depending on the structure of your cpu uh, this hexam might not be installed but there are some cpus especially intel cpus that they have a special option in the devices bios specifically for this emulator accelerator if that's not enabled you may want to uh, enable that in the bios settings as well and also if for any reason you couldn't install this hexam installer this emulator accelerator and also for that matter the android emulator itself there is no need to worry there is another way as well beside the native android emulator you can install external emulators as well for example the one that i know that is working very well is called jenny motion in here i'm not going to install that but i will put a link uh, to download jenny motion in the description of this video and also beside all of these you can always install and test your applications on the real device that you have later on in the course we will see that how we can install and uh, test our applications on our mobile phones okay after selecting everything from here just click on apply once again once again we are seeing the download information let's select ok and let the download begin once again i'm going to skip the video in here until the download is finished once again when the download and installing is finished just click on this finish and we have successfully installed sdk platforms and sdk tools just before i close this window let's uh, switch to this appearance in here from here you can change all of the preferences uh, that you want for example you can change the theme dracula is the dark theme also we have this high contrast theme the intellij theme is the light theme i'm going to stay with that because it's good for recording purposes if you want you can use custom fonts for the fonts of your windowses 
from here you can also change the size of your font i'm not going to do that also down in here you can change the font size also for the presentation mode uh, if you want to change the size of your codes you can search for font in here uh, i believe it's in this editor tab in here in this font you can see that mine is 18 you can increase or decrease that if you want okay uh, let's delete this one and also let's minimize this editor i have another suggestion for you in here as well in this appearance inside the system settings inside the updates make sure that your updates are being checked from a stable channel we have other channels like developer channels and beta channels as well make sure that you have uh, the stable channel others can be buggy okay that's it for installing sdk we will be coming back to this setting menu later on let's select ok okay now it's time to install at least one emulator for that we can once again select this configure this time we can click on this avd manager avd stands for android virtual device as you can see once again i have uh, two devices installed in here pixel 2 and pixel 3 this list should be empty for you but because i had android studio installed on my system i can see them let's uh, select this create virtual device in order to create a new virtual device first of all you can create your own and customized uh, hardware by selecting this uh, new hardware profile from here you can name your device you can select that if it's a phone or tablet you can set the screen size and resolution also down in here you can specify some ram to it and all sorts of sensors and hardwares I'm not going to create my customized device, instead I'm going to install one of the predefined devices. As you can see I have Pixel 2 and Pixel 3 in here. Let's select another device from here. Also from this left panel you can see all sorts of devices like TV, Wear OS and tablets. Let's select one device from here. I don't even know all of these devices, let's just uh, select this Pixel XL. Select next okay from here you need to specify the android version that is going to be installed on this device i'm going to install android q or api level 29 on this device so we need to download that first let's select download once again i think it's going to be a large file so i'm going to skip the download in here until the download is finished yes it's 1.1 gigabyte okay the download and installing is finished just click on finish now we can select the downloaded api sometimes you might not see the version of api that you are looking for for that first of all you can always refresh this list after that you can check the second tab and also the third tab but we are going to install uh, android q on our device let's select next in here we can customize our device for example we can change the name of our device we can also change the default orientation for example the landscape and portrait i'm going to stay with portrait in this uh, show advanced settings we can do some more customization for example you can change the camera the network also down in here you can change the size of ram an SD card and all sort of customization. I'm not going to change any of this. I'm just going to click on this finish. And as simple as that, we have installed a new emulator on our device. Okay, let's close this window. Okay, I think it's a good point to finish off this video. In this video, we have installed JDK. We have installed Android Studio. After that, we have installed SDK and we have done some customization on the appearance and after everything we have installed a new virtual device we are going to create our first application we can do so by opening android studio and selecting this start a new android studio project first of all in this window we can see some templates these templates are just some small applications that have uh, some codes written to some level for example, in this basic activity, you can see that we have a small button and also a menu above in here. We can see other templates in here, for example, a template for Google Maps. We have a template for navigation drawer. Don't worry about all of these because we will learn how to create all of these elements ourselves. Later on, even we select this add no activity template. But the Android team are nice guys and they have provided us these uh, templates. In a lot of these templates, you can see the word activity. Don't worry about this activity yet. If you remember from the content videos, I said that we are going to have an entire session 
which we will talk about activities and fragments. But for now, you can think of activities as different parts of your application. For example, if your application has different pages, an activity is one of those pages. This definition is not accurate. It might not even be correct, but for now, we can think of an activity as a page of our application. In our first application, I'm going to stay with this empty activity, which has no element. It's just going to create some files for us. But if you want to stay with add no activity, you can do so as well. Once again, later on, we will see that how we can create all of these templates ourselves. Okay, let's select empty activity and let's hit next. In here, we need to provide some information about our application. For example, the name of our application. I'm going to change the name of my application to, let's say, Hello World, as it's a custom among uh, developers to name their first project Hello World, just for no reason. The second part, you will define the package name for your application. This package name should be unique to every application that is being released into the world. Later on, when you want to publish your application to Play Store, uh, your application will be identified with this package name. The convention in here is to provide the name of your website in backward. For example, my website is called makeo.org, so my package name is org.makeo.the name of my project. Don't worry if you don't have any website. If you don't, you can use something like com.example. Let's say com example dot the name of my project but since i have a website i'm going to use that in here i'm going to say org dot once again this package name should be unique to every application after that you need to define the path that you want to save your project if you want you can change this path by you know, selecting this folder in here and uh, select the path but in here i'm not going to change that after that, you can select the language that you are going to work with. Android applications can be written with Java language and also Kotlin language. In this course, we are going to stay with Java, but if you want, I am currently recording a new course about uh, developing Android applications with Kotlin. Uh, feel free to check that if you want, but uh, let's select Java in here. After that, you need to define a minimum API level. This minimum API level in here means that how many older Android devices can install your application. For example, if you click on this drop down in here, you can see the list of different API levels. Right now, the minimum API level that I can select is 14, but I can go up to API level uh, 29 or Android 10 to be precise. There is a balance in here. If you select your minimum API level very high, you can work with a lot of uh, newer functionalities in Android, but fewer devices will be able to install your Android applications. For example, if I select API level 29, which is the latest version, only less than 1% of the devices can install my application. If I select uh, something like 19, you can see that 95% of devices by this time can install my application. You as the developer should decide this balance. For this course, probably uh, we are going to stay with API level 19 for most of our projects because I think it's a good balance uh, and 95% uh, is a good number. Leave this check empty for now. Uh, also using Android X artifacts is mandatory uh, since few months ago. We will talk about it later on in the course. Let's hit finish and let's create our first project. If it's the first time that you are creating your Android applications, uh, this process can be very slow because Android Studio is going to download some stuff, for example, the Gradle file uh, from internet. So for that reason, this process can be slow if it's the first time that you are creating your application. The first thing in here that is noticeable is that Android Studio have created two files for us, this uh, activity main.xml file and this main activity.java file. These have been created because we have selected that empty activity template when we have created our project. Inside each of these files, there are some codes. Once again, we can create all of these codes if we don't select that empty activity, but uh, if you select that, you can have some codes uh, written to some level. The other thing in here is this uh, build pane down in here. This build pane in here will show the progress uh, of building your Android applications. 
whenever you want to run your Android application, whether that is in the debug mode, which we will be working uh, in our entire course, or whether it's in the production level, this building here will show the progress of building your Android applications. I'm going to minimize it for now and let's talk about all the other stuff that we are seeing in here. First of all, let's talk about this project pane in here. I can minimize and maximize that. Also, uh, top in here, we have multiple options. For example, we have this project option. This project option will sh exactly show uh, the structure of files in on your system. For example, you can maximize uh, every folder. If you want to have access to this mainactivity.java file, you can go to app folder inside the sources, inside the main folder, inside the Java folder. You can see that we have a folder in here in which uh, contains the main activity Java file. This is the exact hierarchy of files on our system. If you want to make sure of that, you can right click on the name of your project and uh, select show in Explorer, this option in here. It will open the Explorer on your Windows. You can see that we have a Hello World project. Don't worry about the others. Uh, inside this project, as you can see uh, in the hierarchy, we have this app folder. Inside this app folder, we have a source folder, main folder, Java folder, org, make code, hello world. And this is the Java file that we are seeing in here. So this project view will show the exact hierarchy of different files on your system. There is another view in here and that's called Android view. We are going to stay with Android view for the most of this course because it's much more easy for eyes to follow. As you can see, we have this app folder. Inside that, we have this Java folder. We have this package name. And inside that, we have this main activity.java file. It's much more easy for eyes to follow different files. Also, beside this app folder, we have these Gradle scripts down in here as well. Before I talk about these Gradle scripts, I need to talk about the structure of every Android application. So in most Android applications, there are at least two different kinds of files. The layout files, which will uh, define the looks of your application. The layout files in Android are called XML. You can see this activity main.xml file. If you click on that, you can see uh, the layout of your application. Right now, it has only one simple text. The other part of every Android application uh, is the Java file. If you are developing in Kotlin language, there are Kotlin files. The Java or Kotlin file in most cases will define the logic of your application. For example, what happens if you click on a button or what to do with the user's inputs. All of those will be handled in the Java or Kotlin files. Beside the layout files and Java files in every Android applications, there might be some other files, for example, you may have some images and also some audio files as well. Those will be inside this resources folder, for example, inside the meet map folders. Right now we have uh, an icon for our application, which is this simple Android icon. Other images or other files can be put inside this resources folder as well. Basically, this resources folder is for the static uh, variables or static files on your application. So these are the three main components of every Android application. We have layouts, we have the Java file, and also we have the static files. Beside this, we have uh, this manifest file inside the manifest folder. This manifest file will uh, specify some general properties for your application. For example, you can see the icon of your application in here. Also, you can see the name of your application, which is hello world in this case and some other properties or features about your application. We will talk about this manifest file later on in the course, but for now let's close it. We have all of these different files in every Android application, but uh, for example, when you are going to download some application from the Play Store, you will see that we have only one file, one APK file. That's the final application that will be released. How are we going to generate that APK file? Well, in that case, this Gradle tool in here is going to be useful. Gradle is a build tool that will uh, combine all of these files and other files and will create uh, an APK file. 
no matter if you want to release your application or if you want to test your application on an emulator, you are going to need Gradle. For that reason, we are going to work extensively with Gradle. The other use of Gradle is that if you want to use other people's code in your project as well. For example, if you want to use YouTube player in your project, you will add its dependency inside this build.gradle file down in here. Just by writing one line of code, Gradle will download the code for YouTube video player. As simple as that, Gradle will add the YouTube player code to your project and after that you can use it. So, Gradle is a build tool that will handle the combination of every file and also other codes and will generate an APK file. We will talk about different Gradle scripts later on in the course. Okay, let's close all of these extra files. Okay, this was the project pane. We can minimize or maximize this pane from here. Let's minimize that and let's talk about other panes available in Android Studio. Down in here, you have some useful uh, panes as well. For example, this to-do is very helpful when you are creating or when you are developing Android applications. To-dos are some works that you don't want to do at the time, but you don't want to forget those works. For example, inside this main activity, I can add a to-do as simple as that. I can say to-do, let's say complete this. It's just for the developers to remind themselves or other colleagues to do something later on. As you can see, this to-do has been added inside this to-do pane as well. If you want, you can check that. It says that it's inside the main activity. Uh, later on, we will talk about how we can define to-dos and also other kinds of uh, comments. So this is one of the other panes. The other one is this terminal down in here. This terminal is like the command prompt in Windows or let's say terminal in uh, Linux or Mac. And it's very helpful if you are working with something like ADB or Android Debug Bridge. Later on, we will see the use of ADB in our projects. Also, it's very useful uh, for working with SQLite databases. We will work extensively with this terminal in the database session. After that, we have this build tool in here. We have seen it when we have created our project. You can see the progress of every application when it's going to be built. In a lot of cases, there might be some problem when we build our project and from here you can uh, exactly locate the problem. After that, we have this log cat in here. It's going to be very helpful when we are going to debug our Android applications. In fact, we are going to work a lot with this log cat. Okay, let's minimize all of this for now. Above in here, we have some menus. Uh, we have file, edit view, and all of these. Uh, we will work with uh, most of them, I believe, in the course, but uh, it's impossible to work with all of them. Also, there is one thing that uh, I need to say in here. When you create your first application, you may get some warnings, for example, a rendering warning or some other kind of warning. If you get those, probably there isn't something wrong with your application. You just need to rebuild your project. For that, you can come to this build option in here and make your project once again, in case if you get some errors at the first time that you create your application. Sometimes newer versions of Android Studio can be buggy and uh, Creating your project once again simply can solve your problem. Also, there is another option from here, from file. You can close your project and reopen it. That can be useful or in some cases, you may want to invalidate your cache and uh, restart Android Studio. So if you get those uh, warnings or errors, you can uh, try these three different ways in order to overcome uh, the problem. There is one very useful tool that has been added to Android Studio recently in the past few months and that's called uh, Android Profiler. Let's add that to this pane uh, down in here as well. We can add that by going to this view, tool windows and profiler. It's going to be helpful for monitoring the resources that your application is using. For example, the amount of RAM, the CPU that your application is using or even uh, the amount of network that your application is using. If we run our application, we can track the live amount of uh, different resources that our application is going to use. Let's run our application and see it for ourselves. You can run your application by clicking on this green triangle from here, but before that, make sure to select the current app that you are working, 
and also beside that make sure to select a device in the previous video we have created a virtual device and we can see the list of different uh, virtual devices available I'm going to run my application on Pixel 3 API level 29 uh, for no reason let's just run it if we click on this build in here you can see the build progress I said that even if you are going to uh, debug your application or even if you are going to run your application at the production process you can check the progress of build as well as you can see uh, this uh, emulator has been opened and we will see our application in a few minutes also from down in here you can uh, see the current status of running your application right now it has created or built my application successfully and it's waiting for the device to turn on also if you check this log cat in here you can see that there are a lot of things going on in here we will be using this log cat extensively later on in the course uh, for different debugging purposes let's minimize that also if you open this profiler you will see the live tracks of different resources that uh, your application is using let's open our emulator right now we have this simple application in which has a predefined text called hello world and uh, if you want you can check the amount of cpu or other uh, kind of uh, resources that your application is using it's going to be helpful when uh, you are not sure how much resources your application is using let's minimize that for now if you want you can close your application with this uh, red button in here you can stop it and also if you want uh, you can turn off your device by long pressing this uh, turn off button you can say power off and your device will be shut down as you can see we are getting some warnings in here right now these are not important uh, but if you want to check them uh, you can click on this event lock and everything that happens since uh, we click on this green triangle will be logged in here okay let's minimize that and let's switch back to our activity main.xml file and we have a lot of options in here as well right now you can see two different views of your application uh, this white one is called the design view and this one in here is the blueprint view there are some slight differences between these two for example if you have some invisible item inside your activity that might not be visible inside this design view but you can keep track of that inside the blueprint view for now i'm going to disable this blueprint view because we are not going to work with that uh, just for now in order to disable that you can click on this stack icon and you can say just design you can also minimize and maximize that by uh, pressing uh, this plus button in here at the left panel in here you can drag different uh, elements different user interface or ui elements for example if you want to add a button to your application you can simply drag it like this and this button will be added to your application as you can see right now because this uh, element is clicked we can see different attributes uh, at the right panel we have a lot of attributes for every user interface element the most important one is this id above in here this ID is the unique ID of your element in which we will use it in order to have access to this button for example from inside our Java file later on we will talk about that if we click on our text view you can see that we have different uh, attributes as well these are just a few attributes if you want to check the list of all of the available attributes you can click on this all attributes and you can see that there are a lot of them we are going to get familiar with uh, different UI elements in the UI session. We have that, uh, I think, in uh, two sessions from now. After the Java session, we will be talking about user interface uh, in specific details. Also, when you are inside your XML file, you have two views, design view and text view. Design view is this view that we are working right now. And if we switch back to text view, you can see the exact value of every UI element in XML code. XML is a markup language. If you are a web developer, you know the concept of a markup language. HTML is also a markup language. Markup languages are just for defining some elements that user is going to see. 
for example, a button or text view. You can see that there are a lot of attributes in here that we don't know anything about them yet. We will be talking about them later on in the course. So there are two ways of defining UI elements. One is that you drag simple items, for example, a button uh, to your design view or from the text view, you can type it. We can see that we have a button in here. We can select the whole button and we can simply press delete and that button will be deleted. You can see that we no longer can see that. Also, if you don't have this preview enabled, uh, you can enable it from here. Let's just press Ctrl Z in order to get back our button and let's switch back to our design view. I'm going to define an ID for this hello text because later on inside my Java file I'm going to identify that and I'm going to work with that. So by clicking on hello world you can see the list of attributes. At the top we have this ID. Uh, we can set an ID for our text view. Also if you don't know the difference between a text view, edit text and all of these don't be worry. Text view is just a fancy way of saying a simple text. You can define the ID whatever you want, for example in here I'm going to say txt message, but notice that there are some conventions in here. You can't use spaces when you are going to define an ID. Also beside that you can't use some weird characters like a dollar sign or a hashtag sign. The other convention in here is that uh, you type the first letter in lower cases, for example this T in here is lower cases. And also after the first word, uh, you type the first letter of the second word uh, in capital letters. For example, we have this M in here. There are some just uh, basic conventions among programmers. By pressing enter, we now have an ID for this hello world. If we switch back to our text view from down in here, we can see that uh, for this text view, an attribute has been added, the ID attribute. So no matter what you do inside your text view or design view, they are basically the same. But as you can see right now, we have some warning for this button. The warning says that uh, this button is not constrained to anywhere. That's because we are using this constraint layout for this whole XML file. Don't worry about this constraint layout yet. We have other layouts like relative layout and uh, linear layouts as well. But for now, just know that when you are using constraint layout, which is the default case when you are creating an Android application, you need to constrain or chain your different elements to somewhere. For example, if I don't constrain this button to anywhere, it's going to be floating at the runtime. Because of the different screen sizes, we cannot know the exact position or exact place of this button. And right now, if we run our application, probably this button will be moved to the place 0 and 0, which is exactly this corner in our layout. In order to overcome this warning, we can simply uh, add some constraints by clicking and dragging. As simple as that. I'm constraining this button to the both edges of my um, screen. Also for the top and the bottom, I can constrain that as well. For the top, I'm going to constrain that to this text view. And for the bottom, I'm going to constrain that to the bottom of my screen. As you can see, whenever I add a constraint, an attribute will be added to this text view in here as well. Now we don't have that red warning. Also, it's worth mentioning that uh, by default, when we have created this button, when we have dragged that into our design view, an ID uh, has been added to it as well. The ID of this button is just button. We can change that if you want. For example, I can say btn, let's say hello, or whatever you want, but in an XML file, the ID should be specific to every element. Right now this button doesn't do anything. In this video we are going to make our application a little bit more interactive. For example, we are going to change the text of this text view by clicking on this button. For that we need to define this text view in our Java file so that we could have access to its attributes. But before I go further to my Java file, I'm going to switch to follow screen so that you won't be distracted with all of my icons down in here. If you go to this view option in here, down here at the bottom, you can see that we have few options. I'm going to go to full screen. For the rest of the course, I'm going to stay with full screen. Okay, let's switch to our main activity.java file. As I said in the previous video, you can see that we have some code written in here. 
And that's because when we created our project, we have selected uh, the empty activity project. For that, now we have an empty activity which has an activity main.xml file and also main activity.java file. In future, we will see that we can create all of these files if we select no activity at the time of creating our project. But in here, we have these codes written to this level. Also, we have this plus sign in here beside this import. If you click on that, you can see that uh, we have imported some packages to this uh, class. If you want, you can always minimize and maximize that uh, import. And for that matter, you can minimize and maximize all of your methods. For now, I'm going to leave these imports like this so that we can see what we are importing into our Java file. Don't be worried about all of the new keywords that you are seeing in here. For example, this public class extends protected void. We will talk about all of them later on in the course, but for now just know that this onCreate method is going to be the start point of our application. It means that when we run our application, the codes inside these two curly braces is going to be the code that will run first. Once again, don't worry about the term method that I used. We will talk about that later on in the course. So inside this onCreate method, two things are happening. We have this super.onCreate. We are not going to talk about that right now. And after that, we are setting some content views. By setting content views, we are accessing to the activity main file. You can see that we have this activity main in here. Basically, it means that this Java class is somehow related to this activity main layout file. We will talk in more depth about this later on in the course, but for now just know that up until this point in our code, we have said that this Java file is related to this layout file. After that, we can write the codes that we need. For example, in here, I'm going to access to that text view that we have created in the previous video. For that, I can say text view. As you can see, when I type something, IntelliJ, the ID behind the Android Studio, is suggesting me some options. There are a lot of options in here, but the one that I need is going to come from uh, Android.Widget package. So in Java, we have classes equivalent to the UI elements or user interface elements in our layout file. If we are going to define a button, we have that class in Java file as well. In here, we are going to use text view so we can import that in our project as well. As you can see, a new line of code has been added to our imports. This line of code is importing the text view from the widget package into our Java file. Next, I need to name my text view. The name is optional and you can name it whatever you want. For example, in here, I'm going to say txt hello. This is just a basic convention. You can name your class whatever you want, but we will talk about conventions later on in the course. After naming your text view, you need to locate the text view from inside the layout file. And the way to do that is like this. You can say is equal to. There is a helpful method in every activity that is useful for finding different views by their IDs. And that method is named find view by ID. Once again, this method is useful to find different views, different user interface elements from your layout files by their ID. Inside the parentheses of this method, we need to pass the ID of our text view from inside our layout file. And the way to do that is like this. We can type R. R is a special class in Java, which will give us the access to all of our resources, our static files in our project. Once again, it stands for resources. Let's select that. We can say r dot id dot. After that, we need to add the id of our text view, which was txt message, I believe. This id in here should be the exact id that you have put inside your layout file. For this text view, you can see that the id is txt message, and we are using that to have access to our text view. So this way, by using this find view by ID method and after that passing the ID in this shape, now we have access to our text view. But you can see that there is one more error in here and that's because in Java, every time you write a sentence, you need to finish your sentences with a semicolon. That's just syntactical and it really doesn't matter. Some languages does not require this semicolon, but in Java, you need to put a semicolon at the end of every sentence. Okay, now up to this point, we have our text view in our Java file. Now we can use it. For example, if we want to change the text of our text view, we can say something like this. We can type the name of our text view, which is txt hello. After that, we can say dot. 
Don't worry about this dot operator, we will talk about it in the next section, in the Java section. But for now, just know that when you are typing dot on an object, you have access to all of its methods and attributes. For example, in here I can say set text. Once again, you can see that we have multiple options. Let's import the first one. Inside the parentheses of this method, we need to pass a text. And whenever you are going to pass a text statically, whenever you are going to hard code the text, we need to pass it inside double quotations. Let's pass a double quotation. Inside this double quotation, I'm going to say hello. This way, now we have changed the text of our text view. Let's run the application and see if it's going to work. Remember that inside our activity main uh, layout file, the text is hello world. Inside our Java file, we are changing it to hello. Let's run the application. As you can see in here, the text of our text view has been changed to hello. Still, our application is not interactive. We want to change the text when we click on this button, not when we run the application. For that, we need to define an event listener, to be precise, an on-click listener for this button, so that when we click on this button, the text of our text view changes. There are multiple ways of defining an on-click listener for our button. The simplest one is to do that inside your main activity layout file. If you come down in here, inside your button element, inside the anchor brackets of your button, if you type on click, you can see that we have an option in here. Let's pass a name in here. For example, I'm going to say on btn click. This name in here is going to be the name of a method in our Java file. As you can see right now, we are getting a red warning. It says that there is no such method in your Java file. Let's copy the name from here and uh, let's go to our main activity and create that method. So in order to create a method, we need to do that outside of the scope of this on create method and inside the curly braces of this class. I'm talking about these two. We need to define our method inside this class. And the way to do that is like this. We can say public void after that the name of our method, which is on btn click, a pair of parentheses. Because it's going to be the on click listener for our button, we need to accept a view in here. Don't worry about this view in here. We will talk about all of these in Java session. Let's name this view. After that, we need a pair of curly braces for our method. And in here, we need to put the code that we need to execute when the user clicks on our button. If you switch back to your activity main.xml file, now you can see that the red error uh, has been disappeared. Okay, let's go to mainactivity.java file. I'm going to change the text of our text view to hello when the user clicks on our button. So for that matter, I'm going to move these two lines of code uh, to inside this method. You can probably guess the behavior of our application right now. Let's run it once again and see how is it going to work. You can see that the text still says hello world. If we click on our button, the text will change to hello. This is okay, but this is not entirely what we want. It's just saying hello right now. We want to say hello to the exact user. For example, we are going to get the name of our user and by clicking a button, we are going to say, for example, hello Mason, hello Tom, and something like that. We are going to get the user's input. The way to get the user's input is by using some element in our UI called edit text. Let's switch to design view. You can add an edit text into your project by going to this text option in here. You can see that we have multiple options. The first one is for text view. We have seen the text view. It's uh, this hello world text. After that, we have other options, plain text, password, email, and all of these. These are all helpful uh, for when you want to get different kind of users input. But for our purpose in here, we are going to use plain text. Plain text is just a simple text that we are going to get from the user. Let's drag that into our view. If you take a look at the attributes in here, you can see that its ID is edit text. Let's quickly change that. Let's say edit txt name. Because we are inside the constraint layout, we also need to constraint this uh, edit text as well. But before that, I'm going to change uh, the top constraint of this button. I'm going to change its constraint uh, from the bottom of this text view 
to the bottom of this edit text. For that, I am going to drag the top constraint of this button to the bottom of this edit text. Now let's add some other constraints for this edit text as well. For example, for the top, I'm going to constraint it to the bottom of my uh, text view. And also for the edges, I'm going to go to the edges of a screen. Right now, it's too close to our text view. If you want, we can add some margins. For example, in here, I'm going to say 70. That seems to be better. The other attribute that every edit text has is uh, this text in here. I'm talking about this attribute in here. You can see that right now it says name. If you want, you can change that. But in here, I'm going to completely delete that. Instead, I'm going to define some hints. You can see this hint attribute in here. The difference between hint and text is that when you click on your edit text, the hint will be deleted. It's just a hint for the user to know that what he or she is going to enter inside this edit text. For example, in here I'm going to say name. You can see that it's somehow grayed out. Okay, now we have an edit text inside our layout file. Inside our Java file, we need to have access to this edit text so that we could get the user's input. Once again, the start point of our activity and our application is this onCreate method. So we can do that inside uh, this onCreate method. We can have access to our edit text like we did for this text view. We can say edit text. Once again, you can see that we have an equivalent class for this edit text as well. Also, if you take a look at in here, uh, you can see that this line of code has been added to our class as well. Let's say edit text, edit text name. Like before, we can say is equal to find view by ID. And once again, we need to pass the ID of our edit text, which I can say r.id.editttxt name. To this point, we have defined our edit text. Now uh, we need to get the text of our edit text. For that, we can say edit text name dot get text. You can see that we have this option, but this is not enough. We also need to do another level of conversion and we do that by saying dot to string. Don't worry about this to string method yet. We will talk about that later on in the course. It's just for converting whatever the text is inside our edit text to a text that we can use in our Java file. Don't worry about that. We will talk about it later on. But there is a problem with our code in here. We are going to get the user's name and we are going to say hello to the user when we click on the button. For that, we need to have access to this edit text inside our on button click method. But if you try to do that, for example, if you say edit text name, you can see that everything is in red. It means that you don't have access to that edit text inside this method. And that's because something called a scope in Java. The scope of this edit text is this onCreate method within the curly braces of this onCreate method. We can't have access to this element from inside our onButton click method. In order to solve that problem, we need to move these two line of code to inside our onButton click method. Let's quickly do that. Inside our onButton click method, let's paste them. But right now, we are not doing anything with the user's input. We are getting the user's input, but we are not doing anything with that. We need to pass this line of code to the set text method. Let's quickly delete this line of code and inside the parentheses of this set text method, I'm going to pass that. I'm going to say edit text name dot get text dot to string. This way we are setting the text of our text view to whatever the text is inside our edit text. Let's quickly run the application and see if it's going to work. This is how our application and this edit text looks right now. If we click on that, you can see that uh, we can type something. For example, let's type my name. And if we click on our button, the text of our text view changes to Mesa. This is not entirely what we wanted. We wanted to say hello to Mesa. In order to do that, we need to uh, make some changes to our code. Also notice that I didn't put any double quotation in here. And that's because we are passing this text dynamically to our set text method. If we wanted to pass our text statically, we need to put that inside double quotation, but in here we don't need the double quotation. If we want to say hello to the user, we can say something like this. We can say double quotation. Let's add a plus in here. And inside these double quotations, let's say hello. Also, let's add a space so that uh, we could see everything better. This in here is called concatenation in programming, adding the two texts together. Let's run the application once again, and let's type something in here. Let's say Mesa. By pressing button, 
This time you can see that the text has been changed to Hello Mesa. Our application is now much more interactive. Okay, this is our challenge. We are going to create a registration form like this. We are going to get the user's first name, last name, and email. And by pressing this register button, we are going to show them inside these text views. Let me quickly show what I'm talking about. So if we have a first name, a last name, and also an email, if we click on this register button, we are going to show them inside these text views to the user. It's just a simple application so that we can practice everything that we have learned so far. Okay, I want you to pause the video in here and create this simple application. After you have created it, come back to the video and we are going to create this exact application together. I hope you solved the challenge, but if not, that's totally okay. We are going to create that in here together. Also notice that whenever you run Android Studio, you can see a list of recent projects in the left panel in here. Okay, let's move on and let's create our project. We can say start a new Android Studio project. Once again, we are going to select this empty activity. Let's name our project in here. I'm going to name it first challenge or let's name it registration form. You need to specify a package name, mine is fine, uh, change the save location if you want. And also I'm going to stay with API level 19. Okay, let's create our project. Let's start by creating our layout file. I'm going to close this Java file for now and let's also minimize this project pane. First of all, let's delete this hello world text. You can click on it and by pressing delete, you can delete that. In our registration form, we need the three edit texts. Let's add them quickly. In text, we need to add three plain texts in here. Let's quickly add them. We will constrain them later on. Don't worry about that right now. Three edit texts and also we need a button. Let's add that as well. We also need the three text views. For the edit texts, let's also change their IDs. For the first one, I'm going to say edit text first name. Uh, let's also delete this text and also add some hint. Let's say first name. Let's do the same thing for the other two edit texts. Sometimes when you are defining a hint or maybe a text attribute for your elements, you can see some annoying dialogue like this in here. You can avoid that by pressing the escape key on your keyboard. Okay, for the button, first of all, let's change its ID to, let's say, btn register. You can uh, name it whatever you want. Uh, let's also delete this text and let's say register. Also, you can see that we have this onclick attribute in here. We can define an onclick attribute for our button from here or like we did in the previous video in our text view. I'm going to define that right now in here. Let's say on register btn click. Later on, we will create this method. For the text views, first of all, let's change their IDs. For example, for the first one, let's say txt first name. Also, let's change the text to first name. Similarly, for the other two. Okay, let's quickly constrain all of these elements. We can click on them. For the first one, I'm going to constrain it to the top edge of my screen and also both sides of my screen. Let's also add a margin top of maybe uh, 100. That seems to be better. For the next one, I'm going to constrain it to the both edges of the first name edit text and also to the bottom of my first name edit text. Add a margin top of 24. I'm going to do the same thing for this email. For the button, I'm going to do the same thing, but I will probably change the top constraint. Also, if you did a mistake when you are constraining uh, your elements, you can click on the constraint. By pressing delete key, you can delete the constraint. Let's change the top constraint to maybe something like 90 dp. For the first name, I'm going to constrain it to the both edges of my button. Sometimes it may not work, just try once again. And also the top constraint to the bottom of my button. Uh, for the top constraint, once again, let's say 90. I think 90 is fine. Uh, let's delete this top constraint because right now we are not seeing our uh, last name text view. And let's add it once again. For the last name, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Let's change the top constraint margin to, let's say, 24. Same thing for the email. Okay, this is going to be the look of our application. And now that we have defined our layout file, let's switch to our Java file and define the behavior of our application. I'm going to close this activity main.xml just before everything. Let's just copy 
this on click attribute so that we don't make any mistake when we define this method in our Java file. In our project pane, inside Java folder, inside our package folder, inside our main activity.java file, I need to create my on click method. Once again, I can say public void the name of my method, which I've copied from my layout file. Inside the parentheses, I need to say view with capital V, after that view with the lower V. And now I have created my on button click listener. Once again, don't be worried about the syntax of this method. We will talk about it later on when we have talked about Java. In here, first of all, I'm going to define my text views. If you remember, we can do something like this. We can say text view for the first one. Let's say txt first name is equal to find view by id r dot id dot txt first name. I'm going to do the same thing for email and last name. After you have defined your text views, it's time to define your edit texts. We can do that like this. We can say edit text for the first one. Let's name it edit text first name is equal to find view by id r dot id dot edit text first name. Once again, I'm going to do the same thing for edit text email and also edit text last name. Okay, now we have access to all of the UI elements that we wanted. Now let's change the text of our text views. For example, for the txt first name, I can say something like this. Let's say txt first name dot set text. We have seen this in the previous video, nothing new in here. Let's say first name plus the text of our edit text first name. We can say edit text first name dot get text dot to string. As simple as that, now we are setting the text of our text view to the text of our edit text. Let's do the same thing for last name and email. Edit text last name dot set text. Let's say last name first of all. Plus edit text last name dot get text dot to string. Edit text email dot set text. Uh, sorry, I have put uh, the wrong element in here. This should be and txt last name, not edit text last name. Same thing for the email. txt email dot set text. Let's say email plus edit text email dot get text dot to string. That's all we need from our application. Let's just run it. Okay, it seems like uh, we have done a good job with the layout of our application. I think it's just better to decrease the margin top of this register button and also this first name edit text so that we could see all of them better. Let's also test its behavior. For the first name, let's say Emma. For the last name, let's say Watson. For the email, Emma Watson at gmail.com. Let's click on this register button. And as you can see, we are seeing the text that we wanted. It seems like our application is working perfectly. In this section of the course, we are going to talk about Java. For writing Java applications, we are going to need an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Android Studio has been built upon an IDE called IntelliJ. Until few months ago, you could have write and drawn Java applications on Android Studio, but I think it was around July 2019 that you can no longer do that. And that was because of a new release in Grado. I have recorded a video on that exact problem at the time, and it's on my YouTube channel. If you want to take a look at that, just uh, search for MakeCode on YouTube and you will probably find the video. Let me quickly show that. This is the video that I'm talking about. Android Studio does not support plain Java code anymore. What to do now? And you can also see my uh, channel name. So make sure to check that if you need. But basically what I was talking about in that video was that instead of Android Studio, you need to use another IDE. The most famous IDEs that are available for writing Java applications are Eclipse and IntelliJ. In this course, we are going to use IntelliJ because it's a lot like Android Studio and also it's free. In that video, I have talked about how to install IntelliJ IDE. Make sure to check that if you need, but it's a lot like uh, installing Android Studio. Beside IntelliJ, you are going to need JDK Java Development Kit, which we have already installed on our system. You can get IntelliJ IDE from JetBrains website. Let's say IntelliJ IDE. 
The first link from the JetBrains website probably is our needed link. Just one thing that worth mentioning in here is that there are two versions, a community version and also an ultimate version. The community version is free and also it's enough for our need in this course. So make sure to download that. And after you have downloaded it and also installed it, come back to this video to write Java applications. I have IntelliJ installed on my system and I'm going to uh, open it right now. You can create a new project in here by saying create new project. As you can see, the process is a lot like Android Studio. I have the ultimate version of IntelliJ ID and for that I can see all of these options. These might not be available for you if you are using community version. But no matter what version you are using, you should see this uh, Java option in here. Select that. In here you need to specify the path to your uh, JDK. If you have installed JDK with me at the beginning of this course, you should be good in here. You can just select the version of your JDK. My version in here is 13, but we are not going to use all of the features of Java 13 because Oracle does not support this version of Java for long term. We are going to stay with all of the features of Java 8. Okay, after you have selected the Java and your JDK, let's click next. We are not going to create our project from template, so make sure to uncheck this option. After that, click next. In here, we need to name our project and also specify a location. For the name of this project, I'm going to say hello world. Also, if you don't see these uh, settings in here, you have this more settings option in, down in here. Make sure that your module name is exactly your project name. Also, feel free to change the project location if you need. I'm not going to change that in here. Let's just click finish and let's create our project. As you can see, IntelliJ ID is a lot like Android Studio. And the reason for that, once again, is that Android Studio has been built upon this IDE. Let's just close this tip dialog and let's switch to full screen mode. And let's go to full screen mode. Once again, in IntelliJ IDE, you can see this project pane. You can minimize and maximize that. You can also move through the folders. Right now, because we didn't use any template, our folders are empty. We can create our project like this by clicking on the source folder, by right clicking on that, selecting new package. We can specify a package for our application. In this case, I'm going to say org.makecode. Let's say hello world. And inside this package, we can create our Java classes. Don't worry about the term class that I used. We are going to talk about that in object oriented session. But for now, just know that we are going to need at least one Java class in order to run our Java applications. By right clicking on our package and selecting new Java class, we can create our class. Let's name this class hello. As you can see, a new Java class has been created in our package and also we have few lines of code. Let's minimize our project pane and let's focus on this hello.java class. Basically what we have in here is the package that we are currently in, which is world, And also we have the declaration of a class. Once again, we are going to talk about classes later on in future videos. In order to have a start point for our application, we are going to need at least one method. And that method is called the main method. In order to create that method, we can type PSVM by pressing tab or enter we can have that method. As you can see, this green triangle has been added in here. It means that now we can run our application from this point. We will talk about the meaning of all of these new keywords later on in the course. But for now, just know that in order to run your Java applications, you need at least one Java class in which has one method called main. This main method is like the uncreate method of our activities. Now we can write our codes inside this main method. For example, in order to print something to the console, we can say something like this. We can say SOUT or SOUT. And by pressing tab or enter, you can see this line of code, system.out.println. Or alternatively, you can type this manually instead of using the shortcut. You can say system. Notice that the S should be in upper cases. Make sure to use the upper case for S. Let's say system.out. Basically, this out means output in here. It means that we are going to output in something. In this case, we are going to print something. Later on, we will see that we have an in as well, in which we will get the user's input. Let's say system.out.print line. You can see that we have print and print line. For now, we are going to use the print one. We will talk about the difference later on. In order to print something to the console, you need to pass it inside the double quotation. You can say something like this. 
For example, let's say hello world. Now we have the simplest Java application that can be written. Let's quickly run our application. In order to run our Java application for the first time, we need to right click inside the curly braces of our main method and select run hello.main. Let's do that. As you can see, we are printing hello world into our console. Sometimes if it's the first time that you are running Java applications, you may get some errors in here. In the most cases, those errors will be gone by rebuilding your project. You can come to this build tab above in here and rebuild your project. After the rebuild is finished, you can run your application once again by right clicking and selecting run hello.main. In most cases, the error should be gone, but if you had any other problem, please uh, ask them in the Q&A section of the course. Also notice that for the rest of this section, we are not going to have any user interface. It is possible to have a graphical user interface, GUI for your Java applications, but because this is an Android course, and later on we will talk about user interface in Android applications, we are not going to uh, use any user interface for our Java applications. We are just going to understand the language. Okay, now let's minimize our run pane from here and let's talk about the difference between print and print line. The difference between print and print line is that when you are using print line, after printing your text, the cursor will move to the next line. That is not the case with print. In order to see the difference, let's say system.out.print. Once again, let's pass our hello world text. And let's run our application to see the difference. Also, if it's the first time that you are going to run your application, you can right click inside the main method and click on this run hello.main. Or if it's not the first time, you can click on this green triangle at the left or the green triangle uh, on the top of your screen. You can also see the shortcut for Windows is Shift plus F10. If you are using Mac or Linux, you can hover over this green triangle and see the shortcut. Let's run the application and see the difference between print and print line. You can see that the text has been printed, but the cursor never moved to the next line. If we switch these two line of code, we can see the difference better. Let's switch them. Now print line is the first line and print is the second line. Let's run the application once again. This time you can see that the two text has been printed in two separate lines. Okay, now that we know the difference between print and print line, let's talk about variables in Java. But before I do that, I'm going to comment these two line of code. You can comment them by pressing Ctrl plus a slash. When you comment some code in Java, it means that you are telling the compiler to ignore these two line of code. The use of comment is for developers to remind themselves or other colleagues of something important. For example, in here I can say slash slash, let's say do something. This line of code will be completely ignored. The other kind of comment in here is like this. We can say slash slash to do. After that, we can say do something. If we use this kind of comment with to do at the beginning of your comment, you can see that first of all the color will be changed to blue and also if you click on the to do tab in here, you can see that you have one to do in your file. It's very helpful when you are working with multiple programmers. By clicking on this to do, everyone can see the list of different to do's. There are more to comments, we will talk about them later on in the course, but for now just know that when you are commenting something, that line will be completely ignored. Okay, now let's talk about variables. Variables are useful for when you want to store simple data in your Java application. For example, if you want to store a number or a text. Variables are useful for when you want to store some small data in your Java application. For example, if you want to store a number or a text. If you want to store a number, you would do that like this. You can say int int stands for integer basically inside an integer you can store whole numbers for example negative and positive numbers plus zero and the way to define them is like this first of all you type int after that you need to name your variable for example in here i can say number this name in here is optional and you can use whatever you want after that you can assign a value to your variable for example i can say five in here this int is the data type of my variable this number is the name of my variable and this 5 is the value of my variable. Beside positive numbers, you can also have negative numbers. After you have stored your variables, you can do some operation on them. For example, you can print them. And the way to do that is like this. You can say system.out.println and after that you can pass your number or whatever is the name of your variable. Notice that in here I haven't used double quotation. 
basically whenever you are passing some text explicitly you need to pass the double quotation but whenever you are passing your variable you shouldn't pass any double quotation let's run the application and see if we can see our number you can see that the value of our number is negative 5 in this case but inside integers you cannot have decimal values for example in here i can't say 5.3 we will see other kind of variables in which you can use in order to store decimal numbers but uh, more on that in a few minutes. The other kind of variable that you can use in order to store whole numbers is long. Let's see that as well. We can say long, we can name it my long is equal to once again let's say 5. Let's also print that. Let's say system.out.print line and let's pass our long. If we run the application we can see 5 down in here. The difference between long and integer is that you can store larger numbers inside a long. And also a long variable will store more spaces in your device's memory RAM. To be exact, inside an integer you can store numbers as large as the number of 2 to the power of 31. But inside a long you can store numbers as long as the number of 2 to the power of 63. That's the difference between long and integer. But what if you want to uh, store decimal numbers, floating point numbers? For that you have other kind of variables. The first one is a double. Let's see that. We can say double. Let's name it my double. Let's assign it the value of 4.5. Like before we can print it. Let's pass our double. If we run the application, we should see the number of 4.5 printed. You can see that down in here. So double is one kind of variable in which you can use in order to store floating point numbers. The other option is to use float. Let's see that as well. We can say float. Let's name it my float. Once again, the names are optional. You can name your variables whatever you want. We can say 4.5 in here once again. But right now you can see that we are getting a red error in here. And that's because Floating point numbers by default are double in Java. It means that if you want to define a float number, you need to cast your number to float. The way to cast your number is like this. After the equal, you can open and close a parenthesis and inside the parenthesis you can say float. By casting, you will explicitly tell the IDE that this is going to be a float number and not a double number. Okay, let's quickly print this as well. Let's pass our float and let's run the application. You can see that once again 4.5 has been printed. Once again the difference between float and double is that inside a float you can store smaller numbers. And also the other difference is in the space that each one of these are going to occupy in the device's memory RAM. Basically double will occupy more space. We won't be using float that much in this course. I just wanted to show you that float does exist in Java. Okay, now we have seen numbers, but what if we want to store different characters in Java? For that, we have a special kind of variable, which is char. For example, we can say char my char is equal to, let's say, m. Notice that when I've assigned this character to my char variable, I have used this single quotation. That wasn't the case when we have worked with different numbers. When you are assigning a character, you need to use the single quotation. Like before, we can print our character. Let's pass our character and let's run the application. You can see M printed in here. When you are using char variable, you can't have multiple characters. For example, in here, I can't have MA. You can see that we are getting an error. In order to store multiple characters, we have another kind of variable in which we will talk about that in a minute. But before I do that, I'm going to show you just one more thing. You can also store something like this in your character. You can say backslash U. 0, 0, A, e. This is the special Unicode value for registered symbol. Let's run the application and see what would be the result. You can see that the registered trademark has been printed into our console. When you are using a char variable, you can also assign Unicode values as well. You can search for different Unicode values. For example, if you want to show the copyright symbol, we can say something like this. We can say backslash U00A9. If you uh, run the application, we should see the copyright symbol. Feel free to search for other Unicode values on the internet. Okay, now uh, let's talk about a string. If we want to store multiple characters, we can use a string. We can say a string with capital S. After that, like before, we can name our string. Let's say my string or let's name it name is equal to Mesa, my name. Like before, if we want, we can print our string. 
let's pass the name and let's run the application. You can see that MaySAM has been printed into our console. But you may have noticed that there is a difference in here. The color of this string is not blue like the other kind of variables. That's because of a very important difference between a string and other kind of variables. The other kind of variables that we have talked about so far are primitive data types, but a string is a class in Java. We will talk about classes and objects in Java, but for now, just know that when you are using a class, you can have some operations on that. For example, if you type name, you can say dot, and you can see a list of different available methods. We will talk about a few of them later on in the course, but you can see that there are a lot of them. So the difference in here is that a string is a class, but others are primitive data types. There is one more kind of variables that I'm going to talk about in here, and that's called boolean. Let's see that as well. We can say boolean my boolean, let's say is equal to true. When you are using a boolean, that boolean can have only true or false values. These are the only two values that a boolean can have. Once again, like before, we can print our boolean. Let's pass my boolean in here and let's run our application. You can see that true has been printed. As I said, our boolean can have false values as well. Let's run the application. False has been printed. Boolean is very helpful when you are working with conditional statements. We will talk about conditional statements in the next video. Okay, this was our talk about different variables in Java. There are a few more of these in which you can check at the Oracle documentation. But probably you are not going to need the others. These are all that we are going to use in this course. Okay, now that we have talked about variables, let's quickly talk about arithmetic operators as well. But before that, I'm going to comment all of these lines of code because these can be distracting. The reason that I'm commenting these lines of code and not deleting them is that I'm going to upload the source code so that if you need, you can check the source code. Okay, let's move on. Down in here, let's quickly define two new integers. I can say int a is equal to six. After that, let's say int b is equal to, let's say two. You can use operators in Java in order to perform some kind of operation on your variable. We have different kind of operators. The first one that we are going to talk about in here is called arithmetic operators. Let's quickly see them. For example, in here I can say int answer is equal to a plus b. This plus is the first arithmetic operator that we are going to talk about in here. This is going to add the value of b to a. Let's quickly print our answer and let's run our application. You can see that the answer is 8. It has added b to a. The other kind of arithmetic operator that I'm going to talk about in here is minus, which you can guess its value. It's going to deduct b from a. The answer in here should be 4. You can see that 4 has been printed. The other one is a star which is used for multiplying the two values together. In here, the answer should be 6 times 2, which is going to be 12. Let's run the application. And you can see 12 in here. The other one is slash, which is used for division. We are going to divide 6 by 2. Let's run the application. You can see that the answer is 3. The thing that you need to be extra careful with this slash operator in here is that the second number, b in this case, should never be 0. Let's quickly change the value of b to 0 and let's see what would be the result. Let's run the application. You can see that we are getting a red error in here. We are getting an arithmetic exception. We will talk about exceptions later on in the course, but for now, just know that whenever an exception occurs, our application crashes. Certainly, we don't want that behavior in our application, so be careful about the second number. Or alternatively, you need to catch the exception that you think that might occur. We will talk about exceptions later on in the course. We have one more kind of uh, arithmetic operator in Java, and that's called remainder. Let's see that as well. It's the percent sign. The remainder operator is going to give us the remainder of a divided by b. In this case, if we divide 6 by 2, the answer is 3 and its remainder is 0. So right now, if I run the application, I should see 0. You can see that 0 has been printed down in here. But if I change the value of a to, let's say, 5, now the remainder of 5 divided by 2 is 1. Let's see that if we can see 1. Yes, it has been printed. From time to time, this remainder operator can be useful as well. 
There is one more thing that I need to talk about, the slash operator, the division operator. Right now we can expect that if we divide 5 by 2, we should see 2.5. Let's run the application and see if we can see that. We can see that we are getting 2 as the answer. And that's because we have saved the answer inside an integer. If you remember at the beginning of this video, I said that integers can only contain whole numbers. If you want to have floating point numbers, you can use something like double. But this in here is not going to work as well because the answer itself is an integer. If you hover over the highlight, you can see that a divided by b is an integer. If you want to cast your number to a double, after the equal sign, you can open and close a parenthesis, and inside the parenthesis you can say double. This way you have casted an integer to a double. Now if we run our application, you can see that we are seeing 2.5. So if you want to see the exact value of a division, use doubles. Let's just talk a bit more about the plus operator, and after that finish off this video. So right now if I use a plus in here, you can guess the answer, 5 plus 2 is 7. Let's run the application. We can see 7 down in here. We can also use this plus with different texts. For example, if I have two texts in here, let's say string first name is equal to, let's say, Emma. Let's also define another text. Let's say last name is equal to Watson. We can use the plus operator to add these two texts together. For example, let's say a string full name is equal to first name plus our last name. If we print our full name, you can guess what would be the result. In here we can see Emma Watson. Let's also add a space in here in order to see everything better. Emma Watson has been printed. This in here is called concatenating in Java, adding two texts together. So you can see that this plus operator have two usages. It can be used to concatenate two texts together or Whenever we use it with different numbers, it will act as the addition operator. We are going to talk about more operators in Java. Specifically, we will talk about relational and logical operators. Before doing that, let's quickly create our project. By selecting create new project, by selecting Java and clicking on next, and next once again, we can name our project. Let's name this project operators. Let's create our project and inside the source folder, let's create our package. Let's say new package, let's name it org.makeout.operators. Inside our package, let's create our main class. Let's name this class main. Inside our main class, we are going to need our main method. Let's type psvm. By pressing tab, we have our main method. Before I talk about relational and logical operators, let's quickly talk a bit more about arithmetic operators. If you remember from the previous video, when we have defined a new integer, for example a, and we assign a value to that, we could have said something like this. We could have said int answer is equal to a plus 2. Or instead of defining a new integer, we can say a is equal to a plus 2. It means that increase the value of i by 2. Let's print a and see what would be its result. Let's run our application because it's the first time I'm going to say run main.hello. You can see that the value of a is 7. We can simplify this line of code. We can say something like this. I'm going to comment that and in here I can say a plus equal 2. Let's also add some spaces. These two lines of code are exactly the same. We can use plus equal in order to simplify the line 6. Let's run our application once again. You can see that the result is the same. Also, if we want to uh, increase a by 1, for example, if we want to say a is equal to a plus 1, we can uh, do something like this. We can say a plus equal 1, or alternatively, we can say a plus plus. That is possible as well. This a plus plus is going to increase the value of a by 1. If we run our application, we should see 6 as the value of a. You can see 6 down in here. Alternatively, we can use minus as well. We can say a minus minus. It will deduct 1 from the value of a. If we run our application, we can see 4 in the console. Similar to that, we can say a 
minus equal to let's say two for example in this case if we run our application we should see three as the value of a like minus equal you can also have multiply equal and also divided by equal it means that divide a by two and store the value or store the answer inside a this sentence in here is the simplified version of this line of code that i'm going to write we can say a is equal to a divided by two both of these lines are the same if you want to make sure of that you can delete this line and you can run your application 5 divided by 2 is 2.5 because we are saving that inside an integer the answer should be 2 so we should see 2 as the value of our a and you can see 2 down in here before talking about logical and relational operator i just wanted to talk about these simplifications okay now let's talk about relational and to be specific comparison operators in java comparison operators are useful for when you want to compare two things for example two numbers before that let's quickly define two numbers i'm going to say int a is equal to 5 after that let's say int b is equal to let's say 3 after that we can say boolean answer is equal to the first comparison operator that i'm going to talk about in here is greater than operator and the way to define that is like this we can say a greater than b i have saved the result of this comparison inside a boolean this left anchor bracket in here means greater than operator it means that if a is greater than b assign the value of true to this answer right now if we print our answer we should see true let's quickly do that let's say answer and let's run our application you can see that answer is true because a is 5 and 5 is greater than 3 the other kind of comparison operator is less than and that's this uh, right anchor bracket right now a is not less than b so the answer should be false if we run our application we should see false in the console and we can see that the other kind of comparison operator that i'm going to talk about in here is useful for when you want to compare the equality between two integers and that operator is these two equal signs right now a is not equal to b so if we run our application we should see false into our console let's run our application and here we can see false remember that when we are using two equal signs it means that we are checking for the equality of two number but when we are using a single equal sign like in here and above in here we are assigning a value to our variable let's change the value of b to 5 to see that if this is going to be true let's run the application now you can see that the answer is true we have other kind of comparison operators as well one of them is greater than equal when we use this left anchor bracket and also this equal sign it means that check if a is greater than b or if a is equal to b right now a is equal to b so this answer should be true if we run our application we should see true you can see that down in here we see true also if a is 5 and b would be something like 3 if we run the application we should see true once again we can see true but if we change the value of a from 5 to something like 2 because none of this condition is true right now we should see false let's run our application and we can see false the other comparison operator is less than equal and we use that like this we can use this right anchor bracket and equal sign this in here means that check if a is less than b or if a is equal to b right now a is less than b so the answer should be true if we run our application we should see true but if we change the value of a to something like 5 we should see false and we can see false beside this we also have another kind of comparison operator and that's this explanation mark plus the equal sign this in here means that check if a is not equal to b this explanation mark in here adds a negative meaning to our equal operator right now a is not equal to b so the answer should be true if we run our application we should see true and true has been printed okay these were the comparison operators that i was going to talk about feel free to practice them because we are going to use them a lot in our course next i'm going to talk about logical operators in java but before that let's quickly comment these two line of code down in here let's define a new boolean let's say boolean answer is equal to let me write the syntax and i will talk about it we can say a is equal to 5 or 
let's say b is equal to something like 2. This is our first logical operator. This in here means or. You can add these two pipelines by using shift plus uh, backslash. Backslash is somewhere above the enter in English keyboard. So in here this or operator means that if a is equal to 5 or if b is equal to 2, assign true to this answer. If none of those condition is true, so assign false to this answer. Right now a is equal to 5, at least one of our conditions are true, so the answer should be true. So if we print our answer, we should see true. Let's run the application. And you can see true down in here. If we change the value of a, for example, to 6, because none of these conditions are true, we should see false. Let's run the application. And down in here, we can see false. The other kind of logical operator that I'm going to talk about is two AND signs. Let's quickly see that as well. This in here is AND operator. It means that uh, assign true to answer if both of these conditions are true. If A is equal to 5 and also if B is equal to 2. If one of these conditions is not true, so assign false to answer. Right now, none of these conditions is true, so we should see false as our answer. Let's run the application. And as you can guess, we see false. If we change the value of a to 5 and run our application, once again, we should see false because the second condition is not true. But if we change the value of b to 2 and run our application, this time we should see true. And we can see true down in here. And these were the two kind of logical operators that I was going to talk about, OR and AND. Now that we have talked about the operators that we wanted, let's talk about conditional statements. I'm going to comment these two line of code. The first kind of conditional statements that I'm going to talk about is called IF statements. We can type something like that. We can say IF a pair of parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we need to provide our condition. For example, we can say IF A is greater than 3. After the parentheses, we need a pair of curly braces. Inside the curly braces, we can put our code. For example, let's say a is greater than 3. So in here, we are saying that if our condition is true, execute the code inside the curly braces. If it's not true, jump to after the curly braces. For example, in here, let's say continue. Right now a is 5 and it's greater than 3, so we should see this text printed. Let's run our application. You can see that a is greater than 3. But if we change the value of a to something like 2 and run our application, we can see that we are no longer seeing this text. In if statements, we can also have multiple conditions. For example, in here I can say else and I can provide another pair of curly braces. Inside these curly braces, I can say something like this. I can say a is less than 3. Right now a is 2, a is less than 3, so we should see only this uh, text printed. Let's run our application. You can see that a is less than 3. As for the condition, you can provide your condition like this directly inside your uh, if statement parentheses, or you can define your boolean before your if statement. For example, in here, if I say boolean answer is equal to a greater than 3, now I can pass my answer inside this parenthesis. I can say if answer is equal to true. Let's minimize this run pane for now. This is going to work the same, but if you hover over the highlight in here, the IntelliJ ID is warning me about something. The first warning is that answer equals equals to true can be simplified to answer. It means that I can delete this part. This is going to work exactly the same. If we run our application, we should see the same result. A is less than 3. Let's run our application. And you can see A is less than 3. If we want to negate this answer, we can add an explanation mark before our variable. For example, in here, we can say if answer is not equal to true. If we run our application, we should see the first line. You can see that a is greater than 3. This is not true because a is 2, but in here we have uh, changed the meaning of this boolean. We have added a negative meaning. Let's delete this for now and let's run our application once again. Beside else, you can also have an else if as well. Let's quickly comment this if statement and let's write another one. Down in here, I'm going to say if. Inside this if statement, let's check that if a is positive or negative. I can say if a is greater than 0. Inside the curly braces, let's print a is positive. 
in here instead of else i can use something like this i can say else if now we need to put another condition in here we can say if a is less than zero once again we need a pair of curly braces inside the curly braces we can say a is negative you can have as many else if cases as you want for example i can add another one in here but of course in here i don't think this if statement would mean anything but you can have as many as you want but in every if statement you can have at most one else case let's delete all of these for example i can have only one else case this else is going to be the default case in this case if we use this else it means that a is not greater than zero and also it's not you know, less than zero so it is zero and here we can safely say a is zero this is going to be the default case for our if statement right now a is two so we should see a is positive let's run our application and as you can see a is positive let's change a to minus two if we run our application you can guess it we should see a is negative and we can see that down in here if we change the value of i to zero we should see a is zero and as you can see we can see that down in here so if statements are one kind of conditional statements we have another one as well let's comment all of these the other one is called switch statement let's see that as well we can say switch inside the parentheses of this switch statement we need to provide the variable that we want to switch on for example i can pass a in here after the parentheses i can provide a pair of curly braces inside the curly braces i can define different cases for example i can say in case a is equal to one after that we need a column and in case a is one we can uh, print something for example we can say a is one also it's very important to provide a break after every case let's do that i will talk about this break in a minute but for now just know that after every case you are going to need a break we can define as many cases as we want. For example, in here I can say in case A is 2. Let's print something. Let's say A is 2. After that, we need a break. We can define another case. For example, for 3. Let's say A is 3. In every switch statement, we are going to need a default case as well. And we can pass that like this. We can say default and we can print something like a is not one two or three in the default case we need the break as well let's quickly add that right now the value of a is zero let's change that to two and you can guess it we should see a is two let's run the application and you can see a is two if we change the value of a to once again zero and run our application you can see a is not one two or three let's also talk about this break in here but before that let's quickly change the value of a to one this break in here will cause our switch statement to break for example if we don't have this break in here at the first case which is a is equal to one and if we run our application you can see that even though a is one we can see both sentences we can see a is one plus a is two in here because we don't have any break we didn't break out of the switch statement and we have jumped to the second statement so don't forget to have a break after each case in your switch statement we are going to talk about loops in java but before that let me just say that i have created my project I have added this package inside my source folder. Inside this package, we have only one main class in which has this one main method. I hope that you can come to this point by yourself. If not, please watch the previous videos on how to create a project and uh, create your main class and your main method. In programming, loops are useful for when you want to do a repetitive job. For example, if you want to print something 10 times like this in here, if you want to print this hello 10 times, you can just copy and paste it 10 times. But in general, it's a bad idea that you copy and paste yourself. Whenever in programming you are copy and pasting, know that you are doing something wrong. Instead of copy and pasting, we are going to use loops in this video. The first kind of loops that I'm going to talk about are for loops. Let me write it and we will talk about its syntax. 
This is the general syntax of a for loop. First of all, we write for. After that, we have a pair of parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we have three statements. In the first statement, we are defining a new integer called i. You can name your integer whatever you want. And also, we are initializing our i to have a value of 0. The second statement is the condition of our for loop. We are going to continue this loop until this condition is not met. And the third statement is just a statement for changing the value of i every time that we loop. We will see in action what all of these mean. After the parentheses, we have a pair of curly braces in which we can contain our code inside them. For example, if we want to print something like hello in here, we can include that inside this pair of curly braces. So what this for loop is going to do is that first of all, we are defining a new integer called i and we are assigning the value of 0 to that integer. After that, we are checking our condition. We are checking that if i is less than 10. In the first time that we are going to loop, i is 0, so this condition is met. If this condition is true, we are going to execute the code inside the curly braces. In this case, we are going to print hello. After printing hello, we are going to execute the third statement. In this case, we are going to increase the value of i by 1. For the next time that we are going to loop, first of all, we are going to check our condition. We are checking that if i is still less than 10 or not. For the second time, i is 1, i still is less than 10, so we are going to execute our code. This circle in here is going to continue and continue until our condition is false. When it's false, we are going to break out of the for loop. So in this case, we are going to print hello 10 times. Let's run our application and let's see if we can see hello 10 times. You can see that we have printed hello 10 times. It seems to be perfect. Instead of 10, you can put any number that you want in here. For example, you can say 5. If you execute your program, you would see that hello would be printed 5 times. Instead of this 5 in here, you can pass a variable. For example, if you had a variable before this for loop, if we had int a is equal to 5 in here, Later on, we can pass a instead of 5 to this for loop. For example, in here, instead of 5, we can say a. If we run the application, we should see the same result. Inside our for loop, we can also have access to the i itself. For example, instead of printing hello, we can uh, print i. Let's quickly print that as well. And let's run the application. You can see that we are printing the numbers 0 to 4. Okay, for loop is one kind of loops in Java, the other kind is while loop. Let's quickly see that as well. Once again, I'm going to write the syntax of while loop and we will talk about it after that. This is the general syntax of a while loop. First of all, we type while. After that, we have a pair of parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we have our condition. In this case, a less than 10. After that, we have a pair of curly braces, and inside the curly braces, we have our code. In this case, we are going to print hello. Notice that we are not changing the value of a, so this condition is always true. And if I run my application right now, we are going to stuck in an infinite loop. Let me quickly run the application and see what an infinite loop looks like. But before that, let me uh, comment this for loop. You can see that no matter what happens, we are inside an infinite loop. We are printing hello indefinitely. In some cases, this might be our desired behavior, but in most cases, we probably do not want that. We can exit our application by pressing on this red button. We can also check our exit code, which is negative 1. In a normal application, we would get 0. Okay, but how can we exit a while loop? There are multiple ways for that. The simplest way is to change the value of a inside the void loop. For example, after printing hello, I can say a++ in order to increase the value of a so that it won't be the same every time that we are going to loop through this while loop. So for example, for the first time a is 5, so our condition is true, so we are going to execute these two line of code. We are going to loop through this cycle until a is 10. When that's the case, this condition is no longer met and we are going to break out of the while loop. Let's run the application one more time. This time you can see that we have only printed hello five times. 
and also this exit code is zero which means that we have exited our application successfully without any error the other way that break out of a while loop is to add a break let me quickly add that this time after the first loop we are going to break out of the while loop it means that we are going to print hello only once let's run the application and in here you can see that we have printed hello only once inside while loops we have another keyword called continue let's quickly see that as well i'm going to delete this break and before this print statement i'm going to put an if statement let's say if a is equal to 8 then let's continue this continue in here means that uh, go to the next record of your while loop go to the next round of looping it means that no matter what is the rest of the code inside the while loop break out of the while loop and go to the next record so for example in this case if a is 5 6 or 7 we are going to print hello but if a is 8 we are not going to print hello after that we are going to print hello in case if a is 9 if we don't want to stuck in an infinite loop we also need to change the value of a somewhere inside the while loop for example before this if statement I can say a plus plus right now if i run my application i should see hello only four times because if a is eight we are going to continue the loop it means that we are going to jump to the next record and we are not going to print hello let's run the application and see if we can see hello four times and as you can see we are seeing hello four times so continue is a useful keyword for when you want to jump to the next record okay now that we have talked about while loop let's also talk about another kind of loops in java the value of a in here is 5 if we change our condition to let's say a less than 5 we know that this condition is no longer true so we are not going to go inside the while loop it means that we are not going to run the code inside the while loop let's run the application we shouldn't see any hello printed into our console and as you can see we can't see any hello but in some cases you may want to go inside the while loop at least once no matter what the condition is for those situations you can use do while loops let me uh, comment this while loop and let's create a do while loop it's a lot like while loops you need to type do inside the curly braces you need to put your code for example you can say system.out.println and you can print hello after the curly brace you need to say while and inside the parentheses you need to specify your condition for example you need to say a less than 5 after the parentheses you need a semicolon of course in this case because a is equal to 5 this condition in here is not true but even with that condition we should see this hello at least once because we are using do while loops let's run the application and let's see if we can see hello as you can see we can see hello only once so do while loops are useful for when you want to execute your code at least one no matter what the condition is we also have another kind of loops in java called for each loops but i'm not going to talk about that in here because i think that if we know about different arrays and collections and in regard to that if we know about object oriented programming we will understand it much better so i'm going to talk about for each loops after we have learned about all those stuff okay i think that's enough for loops now we are going to have a quick challenge but before we have our challenge we need to know about two more things we need to know how to get the user's input and also we need to know how to generate a random number later on we will see that how these two are going to be useful in order to get the user's input you can use something called a scanner the syntax in here might not be familiar to you because we haven't talked about object oriented programming but we are going to need that in our challenge because we want to have an interactive challenge if you don't understand the syntax just copy and paste the code that i'm writing in here in order to define a scanner you can type something like this you can say a scanner with capital s notice that it's coming from java.util package after that you need to name your scanner which i'm going to say scanner after that you can say is equal to new scanner once again with capital s inside the parentheses you need to say system.in we have seen system.out which was useful for outputting something system.in is useful for when you want to get the user's input 
now you have a scanner you can get a number from user like this you can say int answer is equal to a scanner dot next int this one down in here by saying scanner dot next int our scanner is going to wait for the user's input until the user enters some number we will see that in action in a minute but before that let's quickly output something for example let's say answer was plus the value of answer also let's type something before our scanner let's say please enter a number let's run our application and let's see what these few lines of code are going to do you can see that we are saying please enter a number text and in here console is waiting for the user to enter a number for example i can say 5 by pressing enter you can see that answer was 5 and we have exited our application successfully so by using scanner you can get the user's input beside integers beside number you can also get a text from user if you want let's quickly see that as well first of all let's print something let's say enter your name after that i can say something like this i can say a string name is equal to scanner dot next you can see that this next method is going to return a string don't worry about all of these new stuff method scanner classes object oriented programming we will talk about all of these later on but for now because we are going to need the user's input we are going to figure out a way to receive that so by using scanner.next we are going to get the user's name and after that let's print something let's say hello plus the name of the user let's run our application once again in here first of all we need to enter a number let's add four after that scanner is waiting for my name let's say Maysam, and we can say hello Maysam message so this way we can get the user's input let's also see how we can generate a random number i'm going to comment these lines of code for now in order to generate a random number you can say something like this you can say random with capital r let's name it random is equal to new random and we don't need to provide anything inside the parentheses after that in order to generate a random number we can say something like int number is equal to random dot next int this method in here is going to generate a random number let's print that number let's say number plus the number let's run our application once again you can see that we have this random number it's also useful to specify a domain for your random number right now our random number is this weird negative number it might not be useful it's good to define a domain in order to define that domain you can pass a number to this next int method for example if i put 20 in here and if i run my application once again the number should be somewhere between 0 and 19 if you want your random number to be somewhere between uh, 1 to 20 you can simply add uh, 1 in here you can say plus 1 let's run the application once again you can see 9 this time this number in here is completely random it means that every time that we run our application we should see a different number you can see that we are generating different numbers okay now that we know how to get a random number and also how to get the user's input it's time for our challenge here is our challenge we are going to create a game the concept behind this game is to generate a random number and ask the user to guess that number continue asking the user until you receive the correct number also to make everything more fun after five times of guessing wrong show a game over message to the user here is how our game is going to work first of all we are going to show a welcome message after that we are going to ask for the user's name and we are going to say hello to the user after that we are going to ask for the user's permission to start the game if we received a positive answer we are going to generate a random number and we are going to ask for the user's guess if the guess is correct we are going to show a congratulation message and quit the game if the guess is wrong we are going to ask again until we receive the correct number also as a hint to the user beside the first time every time that you are asking for a number tell the user to guess higher or lower for example if the random number is 10 
If the user has guessed 7 for the first time, tell him to guess higher. If the user failed after 5 times, show a game over message and quit the game. This challenge in here is the combination of everything that we have learned so far, so make sure to practice before watching the next video. It's going to help you a lot. Okay, go solve the challenge and after that come back to the next video so that uh, you see my solution for this challenge. See you in the next video. I hope you solved the challenge, but if not, that's totally okay. After all, it's your first encounter with Java and it's the first application that you are writing. In this video, we are going to solve the challenge together. Let's start by creating a new project. Like before, I'm going to select Java, next, once again next. Let's name this project Guess Me Game. Let's create our project. And inside our source folder, let's create our package and Java file. Let's name this package org.makecode.guessmegame. New Java class, let's name it main. Inside our main class, let's type psvm. And now we have our main method. Okay, first of all, we are going to show some welcome message to the user. So let's say system.out.println. Let's say welcome to Wonderland. After that, we are going to ask for the user's name. So let's say, please enter your name. Or may I have your name? After that, we need to receive the user's name, in which we need a scanner for that. Let's create our scanner. Let's say scanner is equal to new scanner system.in. After that, let's say string name is equal to scanner.next. And let's say hello to the user. Let's say hello plus the name. After that, let's ask for the user's permission to start the game. Let's say, uh, shall we start? In here, I'm going to give the user two options. And here are my two options. Let's say one, yes. And the other, let's say no. But in order to format my text a little bit better, I'm going to add a special syntax in here in which you haven't seen so far. By adding backslash t, I'm adding a tab before this yes. So this will be formatted with a tab. Let's add one in here as well. Nothing special, just for formatting my text a little bit better. After that, I'm going to save the user's answer. Let's say int begin answer is equal to scanner.next int. And after that, I'm going to create a while loop. Let's say while begin answer is not equal to one, we are going to continue asking our question. So let's uh, copy this three line of code and paste them inside our while loop. After that, inside the while loop, we also need to store the new user's answer. For that, we can say begin answer is equal to scanner.nextInt. This way, we are not going to break out of this while loop until the user's answer is 1. When it's 1, we have the permission to start the game. After the while loop, it's time to generate a random number. Let's say random random is equal to new random. After that, let's say int x is equal to random.nextInt. For the domain, I'm going to say 20 because I want my number to be from 1 to 20. So I need to add a plus 1 in here. After that, it's time to ask the user to guess a number. So let's say, please guess a number. And in here, we need to save the user's answer. Let's say int user input is equal to a scanner dot next int. In here, I'm going to define three new variables and their usages will be clear in a minute. Let's quickly define them. First of all, I'm going to save the times that user has tried the game. So let's say int times tried is equal to zero initially. After that, let's define a Boolean. Let's say Boolean has won. Initially, it's false. And after that, a Boolean indicating if we should finish the game. So let's say should finish. Once again, it's going to be false initially. After defining these three new variables, I'm going to create another while loop. Let's say while 
should finish is not equal to true then inside the while loop first of all i'm going to increase the times that user has tried so let's say times tried plus plus after that i'm going to create an if statement let's say if times tried is less than five then we have the permission to continue if it's more than five in the else case we need to break out of this while loop for that i'm just going to say should finish is equal to true this is going to be the last line of our while loop so if we loop once again because this condition is no longer met we are going to break out of the while loop but in case the time stride is less than 5 we are going to check that if the user's input is equal to the randomly generated number for that i can say if user input is equal to x then we need to change the value of has won to true because user has won the game and also we need to break out of this while loop let's say should finish is equal to true let's add an else if case to this if statement let's say else if let's say if user's input is greater than uh, our x which is our randomly generated number we are going to tell the user to guess lower for that we can say uh, guess lower and of course we need to wait for the new user's input for that we can say user input is equal to scanner.nextInt we also need another case in here in case the number is uh, less than x if that's the case we are going to tell the user to guess higher and also we are going to wait for the new user input let's say user input is equal to scanner.nextInt we are done with this while loop we will review what we are doing in here but after the while loop we need another if statement we can say if the user has won the game if that's true then we are going to show a message let's say congratulations and also let's say to the user in which try he or she has won the game let's say you have guessed in your plus times tried plus guess but in the else case first of all we are going to show a game over message let's say game over and after that we are going to say what was the number let's say the number was plus x this is our entire application let's review what we are doing in here first of all we are showing a, a welcome message to the user after that we are asking for the user's name we are creating a scanner and after that we are waiting for the user to enter his or her name after we receive the name we are waiting for the user's permission to start the game we are saving the user's input in here inside the while loop we are making sure that we have the permission if we don't have the permission we are going to ask again and again until we have the permission after that we made sure that we have the permission we are creating our random number the random number is between 1 to 20 and after that we are asking the user to guess a number we are saving the user's input in here we have defined three new variables in here times tried has won and should finish next we are creating this while loop it starts from here and ends in here the condition of this while loop is while we shouldn't finish the game continue the loop first thing inside this while loop we are increasing the time stride so if it's the first time because the time stride is initially zero we are changing that to one after that we are checking that if time stride is less than five we are comparing the user's input with the randomly generated number if that's equal to our random number we are changing the value of this has won to true and also we need to break out of this loop so we are changing the value of this should finish to true but in case the user input is greater than our random number we are telling the user to guess lower and also we are waiting for the user's input but in case the user's input is less than our random number we are telling the user to guess higher once again we are waiting for the user's input in case the time stride is greater than five we are just breaking out of the loop if that's the case the has won is still false so we are checking that in here if has won is equal to true it means that user has won the game so we are uh, showing this congratulation message 
Also, we are showing that in which try the user has guessed the number correctly. But in case if the user didn't want the game, we are showing this game over message and also we are showing the random number. Let's run the game and see if everything is working fine. We are seeing the welcome message. After that, it's asking for our name. Let's put Mesam. We are seeing hello Mesam. After that, we are seeing the message for our permission. Shall we start? Or it was better to say shall we begin? Let's say to no. Once again, we are seeing the message. This is our first while loop. Also, this formatting here is because of that backslash T that I have used when I have uh, created this text. I'm talking about this one. This backslash T in here. Also, beside 1 and 2, if you uh, enter any other number, we should see this message once again. So, let's say 3, for example. You can see that we are seeing the message. Okay, let's say yes to continue. The console is waiting for us to guess a number. Let's say 10. It says guess lower. Let's say 5. It seems like uh, I have won the game in my second try. Okay, let's run the game once again. May I have your name? Let's say Maysam. Yes, let's begin. Let's guess another number. It says that guess lower. I'm going to guess higher in order to debug all the features of the game. Let's say 11, 12, 13, 15. You can see that after five try, uh, I can see the game over message and I can see that the number was nine. Okay, it seems like our application is working perfect. Just before I uh, finish off this video, let's um, change this message in here to shall we begin. I think that's better. Okay, this was our challenge. I hope you solved it. If you did, do celebrate, but if not, that's okay. Later on in the course, we are going to practice all of these many more times so that we make sure that we have learned everything that we see in the course. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the video in here. Just before I do that, I'm going to say that in the next video, we are going to talk about arrays in Java. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about arrays in Java. Up until now, if we wanted to store some simple data, for example, a number or maybe a text, we could have used variables. For example, we could have said int a is equal to 5. But what if we want to store a list of different variables, for example, a list of names or a list of students? For storing a list of variables, we have multiple options in Java. The first one that we are going to talk about in this video is called array. Let's see how we can have an array of, for example, strings. For that, we can say a string. After that, we need a pair of square brackets. After that, we need the name of our array. For example, I can say student. Next, I can say new a string once again with a pair of square brackets. This new keyword in here is simple English. It means that we are defining a new array of strings. Inside this square bracket, we can define the size of our array. For example, if we want to store five different student names, I can say five in here. As simple as that, now we have an array of size five. After defining your array, you can put some values into it. For example, I can say students with an index of, let's say, one is equal to, let's put my name in here, Mesa. This way, we are assigning this value to the element in which has the index of 1 in our array. There is a very important point in here, and that indexes in Java starts from 0. So, in here, when I said students with an index of 1, it means that we are referring to the second element in our array. If you want to assign some value to your first element in your array, you can say students with an index of 0. Let's see that as well. Let's say is equal to... For example, so we can keep doing this for all of our elements inside our array. Beside assigning uh, values to your array elements, you can also get the value of those elements as well. For example, in here we can say print the value of a student with an index of 2. You can guess it. In this case, it should be Tom. Let's run the application and see if we can see Tom. As you can see, Tom has been printed. This is one way of assigning different values to your array elements. The other way is like this. You can uh, assign different values at the time of creating your array. For example, in here I can say a string array. Let's name it employees is equal to. 
instead of saying new string array, I can pass a pair of curly brace. And inside that curly brace, I can pass my values. For example, I can say mason or every other value that I want. So these are the two ways of assigning values to your array elements. Like a string array, you can also have other kind of arrays as well. For example, if I want to put some numbers inside an array, I can say int with a pair of square brackets. Let's say numbers is equal to, let's say a pair of curly braces. And inside those curly braces, I can pass my values. Let's say one, two through six. When you are working with different arrays, for loops can be very helpful to access all of the elements inside your array. For example, if I want to print all of the values inside this numbers array, I can say something like this. I can create a for loop. Let's say for int i is equal to zero. i less than, in this case, the size of my numbers array is six. So let's say six. After that, let's say i plus plus. Inside the for loop, I can say print the value of numbers with an index of i. This way, I am going to print all of the numbers inside my numbers array. Before running the application, I am going to comment this line of code so that we have a clean console. As you can see, numbers from 1 to 6 have been printed into our console. So for loops are very helpful when you are working with different kind of arrays. In here, we have hard-coded this 6, but what if we don't know the size of our array? For example, if we get some values from our database or from our server. In that case, it might be possible that we don't know the size of our array. How can we use for loops with arrays if we don't know the size of our array? For that, we can use a helpful property of different arrays. For example, in this case, I can say numbers dot length. This way, we don't need to be worried about the size of our array. We can just use it like this. Let's run the application once again. And as before, we have printed numbers from 1 to 6. Later on, we will see that beside primitive data types and strings, we can also have different kind of arrays for different objects, for example, for different classes in Java. But more on that later on. So using arrays is one way of having a list of different items, but uh, there are some limitations to arrays. For example, the size of our array after the definition is immutable. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In here, when we define our students array, we have set the size to be 5. But what if we want to change the size of our array? For example, what if we want to define a sixth element? For example, if we say students with an index of 5, let's say Brian. If you hover over this 5, you can see that array index is out of bounds. It means that this element in here cannot fit in our array. For example, if we try to reach to that element, we should see a problem. Let's say print a students with an index of 5. Before that, let's comment this line of code and let's run our application. As you can see, we are getting an exception in here. Once again, when we get exceptions, it means that our application crashes. And the exception type in here is array index out of bound exception. It means that the sixth element does not exist in our array. So arrays are immutable after you define them. You cannot change their size. This is one of the limitations of simple arrays in Java. There are others as well. For example, you cannot do that much with your arrays. Later on, when we use other kind of collections in Java, we will see that we have all kind of operations uh, on our array elements. But I'm not going to talk about other kind of collections in here because I think that it's better to talk about them after we know about object-oriented programming. Later on in the course, we will talk about other kind of collections like uh, array lists and maps. Just before I finish off this video, I'm going to write a simple application in which will help us to practice what we have learned about arrays. Before that, let me comment all of these lines of codes. And let's start creating our application down in here. In this application, I'm going to simulate the contact application on the phone. I'm going to show a list of different uh, contacts names uh, on a phone for, to the user. And after that, by typing the contacts name, we are going to give the user that contacts number. In order to simulate that, first of all, we are going to need a string array. Let's say a string array names is equal to, let's pass our names directly. Let's say Mesa. After that, we need a list of different numbers. For that, I'm going to create an integer array. Let's say numbers is equal to 
and let's initialize our array. After that, I'm going to show the name of all of the available contacts on the form. So let's create a for loop for int i is equal to zero, i less than names.length and i plus plus. Let's print the names inside our names array. Let's say print names with an index of i. After the for loop, I'm going to ask the user to enter a name. So let's say print. Let's say please enter a name. After that, we need our scanner. So let's create that is equal to new scanner system.in. After that, let's get the contacts name. Let's say the string name is equal to scanner.next. Then I'm going to create a for loop and inside that loop, I'm going to find the index of the contact. So let's say for int i is equal to zero, i less than names dot length i plus plus. Let's write an if statement in here. Let's say if name is equal to names with an index of i. Then inside this if statement, we are going to print the contacts number. For that, I can say print numbers with an index of i. But right now there is a problem with my code. I'm not sure that if it's going to work fine or not. And that's because of these two uh, equal signs in here. Let's run the application and see if it's going to work. Let's enter a name in here. Let's say Sarah. And as you can see, nothing has been printed. Let's talk about these two equal signs in here. If you hover over the warning in here, it says that string values are compared using two equal signs, not uh, equal with a pair of parentheses. The problem in here is that when you are using two equal signs, you are checking uh, for the equality of two strings by their reference. I'm talking about their reference inside the device's memory RAM. Whenever you are storing a variable, that uh, variable allocates some space inside the device's memory RAM and that allocated space has some address. And that allocated space has some reference in which we are comparing those two reference in here together. So even if the value of two strings in here can be the same, but the reference might not be. For that reason, it's not a good way to compare two strings via using these two equal signs. Instead of using these two equal signs, there is a better option for comparing two strings and that's the equals method. Let's see that as well. In here, I can say name dot equals and inside the parentheses, I can pass the other string. For example, I can say names with an index of i. If you remember from the previous videos, I said that strings are not primitive data type and they are objects in Java. And because they are objects, we have some properties on our strings. For example, uh, this equals method. Once again, we are going to talk about a method later on in the course when we talk about object oriented programming. But for now, just know that uh, there is a method called equals in our string class in which we can use to check the equality of two strings by their values. So now if we run our application, we should uh, get the Sarah's number. Let's run the application. In here, once again, let's say Sarah. And as you can see, we are getting the number. Let's also check that if we are getting the correct number. Sarah is the second contact in our array and the second element in our numbers array is this number in which we have printed into our console. It seems like our application is working fine. Okay, I think that's enough talking about uh, arrays in Java. In the next video, finally, we are going to start talking about object-oriented programming. That's a very important topic and it's going to help you a lot to understand Java. So make sure to don't miss the next two or three videos. See you in the next video. As I said at the end of the previous video, in this video, finally, we are going to start talking about object-oriented programming. Up until this point, with the help of variables, we could have defined simple data types. For example, if we wanted to have numbers, we could have say int number is equal to 5. Or similarly, we could have defined characters, texts, and all sorts of variables that we have talked about in previous videos. But what if we want to have a more complex data? For example, how can we define a car in Java or a phone or every other object that you can think of? Well, that is possible with the concept of object-oriented programming. In object-oriented programming, you define your own objects. 
The core component of object-oriented programming are classes. Right now you can see that we are inside a class. This class is named main, but if we want we can create our own class as well. Let me quickly delete this line of code and let's create a new class. For example, inside my source folder, inside my package, on the package I can right click and by selecting new java class I can create my class. In here I need to name my class. For example, I can say phone. Notice that there is a convention. You need to use uppercases for the first letter of the name of your class. Also, you cannot have uh, spaces or some strange characters as the name of your classes. So in here, I'm just going to simply name my class phone. Notice that there are other options in here as well. For example, interface and enum. Later on, we will talk about them. But for now, let's just create a class. The one that uh, has the C icon. By pressing enter, we can create our class. This is how a class looks like. It lives inside a package. Right now, its package is section one Also, if you take a look at uh, the left pane in here, you can see that a new class has been added into our package. Every class has the keyword class in its declaration. Also, every class has a name. And beside these two has an access modifier. We will talk about access modifier in few minutes, but for now, let's continue on. Every class has a pair of curly braces in which we can put our code inside them. A class is going to represent an object. In this case, we are going to represent a phone. If you think of different objects, objects can have different properties. For example, in the case of a phone, a phone can have some amount of memory RAM. It can have a screen size. Beside that, it have a name and all sorts of other properties that you can think of. When you define a class, you can have properties for your classes as well. For example, in this case, if we want to give some properties to our phone class, we can say something like this. We can say a string name. Now we define a property called name for our phone. Notice that I'm not initializing the property of my class in here. I'm not giving a name to my phone. And that's because when we declare a class, we can reuse that class. We can create multiple instances of that class with different properties. For example, if we define a new iPhone, the name would be iPhone. If we define another phone, the name of that phone might be different. So for that reason, I'm not initializing the properties of my class. Let's add a few more properties to our phone object. Let's say int screen size. Beside that, let's say int memory RAM. After that, let's say int camera. So now that we have created this simple class, we can instantiate it. We know for sure that the starting point of our application is this main method inside our main class. So if I need to instantiate my class, I need to do it in here. And here is how you can create an instance of your class. You type the name of your class. You can see that when I type the name of my class, I'm getting some suggestions from IntelliJ. Sometimes you may get multiple options, and that's because different classes with different names can live in different packages. For that reason, always take a look at the package that your object lives in. In this case, I'm going to just import this class. After that, you need to name your instance. For example, I can say iPhone. Next, I can say is equal to new phone. This way, with the help of this new keyword, we can create a new instance of our object. Now that we have created an instance of our class, we can have access to the properties of our objects, our class. For example, if we want to define some property for our class, we can say something like this. We can say iPhone dot, let's say name is equal to, let's name it iPhone 11. With the help of this dot operator, you can have access to all of the properties or to be precise, all of the fields of your class. Similar to assigning a value to your class's properties or fields, you can also get those properties or fields. And here is how you can get them. For example, if you want to print the name of our iPhone, we can say something like this. We can say print iPhone.name. If we run our application, we should see iPhone 11 printed into our console. And here is iPhone 11. Similar to that, you can have access to all of the fields of your class. For example, I can say iPhone dot, let's say memory RAM is equal to 8. 
Beside properties, your classes can also have some behaviors. For example, in the case of a phone, you can play some music with your phone or you can call somebody. If you want to define some behavior for your class, you can use methods. Let's see them as well. Let's switch back to our phone class. Here is how you can define a method. I'm going to write the syntax and after that we will talk about it. First of all, our method has a name. In this case, its name is play music. After that, a method can have an access modifier like we did for the declaration of our class. We will talk about this public in a minute. After that, every method can have some inputs. For example, in this case, we are getting a string called track name. Later on, when we use this method, we need to pass some input to this method. If you don't want to have any inputs for your method, you can just uh, pass a pair of empty parentheses. But if you want, you can have one or more inputs. If you want to have multiple inputs for your method, you can separate those inputs with a comma. For example, in here, I can say a string uh, album name. But I'm not going to do that in here, but you can have as many inputs as you want. Beside a name, an input, and also an access modifier, every method can return something. In this case, it's void, but if you want, you can change it. For example, you can say a string as the return type of your method. You can also have integers or other kind of primitive data types. Even you can return another class with your method. But more on that later on. If you don't want to return anything from your method, you can use the keyword void like we did before. We will talk more about the return type of every method later on, but for now, we are not going to return anything from this method, so we are going to pass void. Inside the curly braces of my method, I can put my code. For example, in this case, I'm going to play some music, or at least I'm going to print something. In this case, I'm just going to say playing plus the track name. Now that I have created this method, I can use it in my main class where I have uh, instantiated my object. For example, in here I can say iPhone dot play music. Once again, you can see that by typing dot, I can have access to my methods as well. Right now, I'm getting a red error in here, and that's because when I have created my method, I have set an input for it. So when I'm going to use my method, I need to pass a track name. For example, let's say our wings are burning, the name of a track. Let's run the application and see what could happen. You can see that we are playing some music. So by defining methods, you can have behaviors for your classes. There are few reasons for using methods. The first one is that you can reuse your method. For example, in here, after this line of code, I can say iPhone.PlayMusic and I can pass a different track name. Let's pass lamenting kiss this time. If we run our application, you can see that our methods are being executed one at a time. So the first benefit of using methods is that you can reuse them. The next one is uh, for organizing our code. For example, imagine that you want to have some sort of calculation. You can pass uh, all the codes for that calculation into a method and by calling that method, you can pass all of those calculations to a method and later on, uh, you can just call that method in order to do the calculation. It's going to help us a lot for organizing our code. Also, by using methods, you can encapsulate things. We will talk about encapsulation in later videos, but in here, inside your class, you can define your methods as private and that method will be accessible only from your class and not from outside of your class. If you go back to main class, you can see that we are getting red warning. If you hover over the error, it says that uh, this method has private access. So by using private methods, you can encapsulate different behaviors for your own class. Okay, now let's talk about this access modifier. You can have access modifiers for your methods, for your classes, and also for the fields of your classes. I can make this name private if I want as well. Basically, we have three kind of uh, access modifiers. We have private, we have public, and also we have protected. If you don't use anything as the access modifier, uh, it's equal to when you use public. So there is no difference between public string name or just a string name. When you use public as the access modifier, for example, if I use public in here, it means that this field is going to be accessible from other classes as well. But if I use private in here, let's say private, if I go back to my main class, you can see that we are getting a red warning. 
It means that we can no longer use this property. So by setting the access modifier of our field or method, that field or method is only accessible from inside our class. Beside public and private, we also have protected. We will talk about protected later on in the course, but private and public are the most access modifiers that we are going to use in the course. For the access modifier of your class, you can also have private. Let me quickly type that. But usually you wouldn't do that. Right now you can see that we are getting a red warning in here. And the warning says that modifier private not allowed in here. You use private mostly when you use inner classes. We will talk about inner classes later on in future videos. But basically they are some nested classes inside other classes. When you define them as private classes, you can have access to those nested classes from the parent class. We will talk about that later on when we talk about inner classes. For now, let's just change this one to public. There are few reasons for using private as the access modifier of your fields or methods. The first one is that you may want to limit the access of uh, your fields or methods to the class itself and not other classes. For example, imagine that you are writing some code that you are going to publish for other developers. In that case, you may want to protect your classes against changes. For that reason, you may want to change the access modifiers of your fields and also methods to private. But now that we have defined the access modifier of this field as private, how can we have access to this name from outside of this class? There is a way to that. Let's quickly talk about it. We can create public methods. For example, down in here, I can say public. As the return type of this method, I'm going to say void. For the name of this method, I'm going to say set name. As you can see, when I use the keyword set, I am getting some suggestions from IntelliJ. Basically, there is a convention among programmers to set the name of their setter methods like this. And IntelliJ is smart enough to know the convention. But of course, you can name them whatever you want. In this case, I'm going to follow the convention. So I'm going to say set name. Inside the parentheses as the input of this method, I'm going to say a string, let's say name. Inside this method, I'm going to change the value of this name to whatever the name that I'm going to receive via this method. For that, I can say this dot name is equal to name. The keyword this is referring to the current object that we are in. For example, right now we are inside our phone object, our phone class. So by using this dot name, we are accessing the property of this class called name. The second name in here is the input of our method. So we are setting the value of this name to whatever we receive uh, via the input of this method. Now, because the access modifier of this method is public, we can use it inside other classes. For example, from inside the main class. If we want to set the name of our iPhone, we can say something like this. Before that, let's delete this line of code. We can say iPhone dot, let's say set name. Inside the parentheses of this method, I need to pass the name of my phone. Let's say iPhone 11. So this way, I don't have access to the field directly, but uh, by using the method, I can change the value of that field. But what if we want to get the value of this field? Well, we can write another uh, method. And here is how we can create that method. We can say public. As the return type of this method, I'm not going to say void because I'm going to return this name. So I'm going to say a string. Once again, there is a convention in here. We can say get name. We don't need anything as the input. Inside this method, we are going to return something. And here is how you can return something from a method. You type return. After that, whatever you are going to return. In this case, I'm going to return this name. So I'm going to say this dot name. Once again, this refers to the current object. This dot names means the name inside our phone object. Now that we have created this method inside our main class, instead of saying iPhone dot name, I can say something like this. I can say iPhone dot get name. If we run our application, once again, we should see the name of our phone. Let's run the application. You can see that iPhone 11 has been printed. Besides creating these kind of methods ourselves, we have another option. If we come down in here, we can use the help of our IDE. We can right click in here. We can go to this generate method. Similarly, we can press Alt plus insert. 
you can see that in here we have a list of options we have getter we have setter and also we have getter and setter if we want to create getters and setters we can select that after that we can create the field that we want to create getters and setters for for example if we select a camera and press ok you can see that ide has created some codes for us you can see that these methods are almost identical to the methods that we created above in here because creating getters and setter methods are very usual ide can help us with the creating of them but why are we using getters and setters well there are few reasons for that the first reason is encapsulation. Let's quickly talk about that a bit. For example, if we don't want to give others uh, the permission to change the value of our fields, we can delete the setters. In that case, we only give them the permission to get the value of objects, but not set the value of objects. Or vice versa, we can create setter methods for our class. In that case, we can set the value of our properties from other classes, but we cannot get the value of those properties. The first reason is encapsulation. The other reason is that sometimes in your setter and getter methods, you may want to do some other operations as well. For example, if you are setting a name for your phone, you may want to validate that name before setting it. In that case, you can have some validation before assigning the value to your property. Okay, that's enough talking about getters and setters. Let's quickly change the access modifiers of all of these to private. And let's create getters and setters for the ones that we didn't create any. Down in here, after everything, I'm going to press Alt plus insert. Let's say getters and setters. And let's select both of them. You can see that IntelliJ has created these codes for us. But because we have changed the access modifier of this memory RAM to private, now we have an error inside our main class. In here, instead of saying iPhone.memory RAM is equal to 8, I can say something like this. I can say iPhone.set memory RAM and I can pass 8. What we did in here is one way of instantiating our object. We have defined our object. After that, we have set different values for our object. There is another way of instantiating your objects. Let's quickly see that as well. So if I switch back to my phone class above the play music method, I can create something called constructor. Let's use the help of IDE for creating that constructor. Once again, I'm going to go to generate menu. The first item in here is constructor. In here, I'm going to select all of the fields and I'm going to press OK. And as you can see, this code has been generated for us. This is called a constructor in object-oriented programming. Our constructor needs to have public as its access modifier. It cannot be private. After that, the return type of this uh, constructor is a phone. The exact item that we are in. Our constructor does not have any name. And as the input of this constructor, we are receiving all of the fields of our class. We are receiving name, a screen size, memory RAM, and camera. Inside our constructor, we are assigning different values that we have get via the input to the fields of our class. Now that we have created a constructor, if we switch back to our main class, we can see that we are getting a red warning in here. The warning says that expected four arguments, but found zero. It means that now that we have created the constructor, we need to pass the values directly to the parentheses of this new phone. And here is how you can pass them. The first one was the name of our phone, let's say iPhone 11. I don't remember the order of things, but the next one was a screen size, let's say 5. I believe the next one was memory RAM, let's say 8. And the other one was camera, let's say 8 as well. Now that we have instantiated our object like this, we don't need to directly set the fields of our class. We can safely delete this. Also, let's delete this as well. In this line, we are printing the name of our iPhone. Let's run the application and see if we can print the name correctly. As you can see, iPhone 11 has been printed. So when you are using constructors, you need to pass the values of different properties at the time of instantiating your objects. Your class can have multiple constructors as well. For example, if I come down in here and once again right click and go to the generate menu, if I select constructor, this time I can select different items. For example, in this case, I'm going to select only name and memory RAM. If I press OK, you can see that we have another constructor which will only receive name and memory RAM. But if you hover over this phone, you can see that this constructor is never used. 
if we switch back to our main class we can create another form and we can use the second constructor let's quickly do that i'm going to do that after these two line of code let's say form and this is the beauty of object oriented programming when you create a class you can reuse that class as many times as you want for example in here i'm going to define an entirely new form let's name this form pixel let's say is equal to new form this time i'm going to use the second constructor for the name i'm going to say pixel 3 and for the memory ram i'm going to say 16. you can see that the id is happy with this way of defining a new form now we have two different instances of our phone class. Having two different kind of uh, constructors for a class is called polymorphism in Java. Polymorphism has other types as well. We will talk about it later on. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the video in here. In the next video, we are going to continue our talk about object-oriented programming. There are many more things left that we need to talk about. See you in the next video. In the previous video, we have talked briefly about classes, what those are, how can we create them, and also what are the most usages of a class. In this video, we are going to talk about some important concepts regarding to object-oriented programming. The first of those concepts is inheritance. I'm going to talk about inheritance with an example because I think that would make everything easier to understand. First of all, I'm going to create a class called dog. For this dog class, I'm going to define some properties. For example, I'm going to define a name. Let's say private string name. After that, I'm going to define a color. Let's say private string color. Let's also define the number of legs. Let's say private int legs. And also I'm going to define a boolean indicating that if a dog has a tail or not. So let's say private boolean. Let's name it has tail. Let's also create a constructor for our dog class. By pressing Alt plus insert you can see the dialog in here. Let's select all of the fields. Let's also create some getters and setters for our dog class as well. Once again, by pressing Alt plus insert, by selecting this getter and setter, you can create getters and setters. Let's also define a method for our dog class as well. I'm going to say public void. Let's name this method eat. I'm going to indicate the eating behavior of a dog. As the input of this method, I'm going to receive a food. So let's say a string food. And inside this method, I'm just going to print something. Let's say eating plus our food. Okay, nothing special is in this class. First of all, we have created these four fields. After that, we have created the constructor. We have created our getters and setters. And we have created this eat method. I will talk about why I'm doing all of this. Let's also create another class called bird. Let's say bird. For this bird class, let's also have a name. Also, let's have a color. Let's define two more fields. One for the number of legs, private int legs. And also another one indicating that if our bird has a tail or not. So let's say private boolean. Let's say has tail. For this bird class, let's also create a constructor. And some getters and setters. I'm going to create my eat method for this bird class as well. Let's say public void eat. Let's get the name of our food. And inside this method, let's print something. Let's say eating that food. You probably can see the pattern in here. There are a lot of similarities between our bird and dog class. Both of those classes have four fields. They have a constructor. They have all of these getters and setters. And both of them have this eat method. In programming, this is not efficient. You basically are copy and pasting yourself. Instead of defining our bird and dog class like this, we are going to use another concept in object-oriented programming called inheritance. For that, first of all, I'm going to create an animal class, and after that, I will extend the animal class to this bird and dog. Let's see how we can do that. Inside my package, I'm going to create my animal class. Let's say animal. First of all, let's add some fields. I'm going to use the four previous fields. Let's also copy them from here. 
and after that let's create a constructor and getters and setters and our eat method don't worry we will reduce the amount of copy and pasting in a minute let's say public void eat a string food as the input and let's print the name of our food now that we have created this animal class creating bird and dog class is going to be much simpler for that i'm going to delete all of the codes inside this bird class let's delete all of them this time instead of defining all of the fields and constructors and methods i'm going to say extend animal this way we are saying that our bird is an animal we are extending the animal class and later on if we want we can customize our bird class as well but right now you can see that we are getting a red warning and the warning in here says that there is no default constructor available in this package basically it says that you need a constructor let's press alt plus insert in here and let's select constructor and as you can see the IDE has generated this constructor you can also see that even though we don't have any fields in our bird class we are receiving some arguments in the constructor but this constructor has rather a strange syntax we haven't seen this super keyword so far basically this super keyword means that do whatever you are doing with these parameters in the parent class in this case our parent class is animal so this super is passing all of these arguments to the constructor of our animal class it means that uh, it's setting all of the values to the fields of our animal now that i have created my bird class like this if i want to instantiate it for example inside the main class i can do as before let's say bird let's name it phoenix let's say is equal to new bird and as you can see the constructor is waiting for our arguments first of all we need a name let's pass nino we need a color let's say golden after that we need the number of legs which i'm going to pass two and a boolean indicating if our bird has a tail or not let's pass through once again remember that in our bird class we didn't have any extra methods but in my main class if i want i can use some of the getter methods of our parent class in this case animal for example if i want to get the name of my bird i can say something like this i can say phoenix dot get name you can see that we have all of the getter methods let's run the application and let's see if we can uh, print the name of our bird you can see that the name has been printed successfully beside getter and setter methods you can also have access to all of the other methods that you have created for example if you remember inside the animal class we have created uh, this eat method let's see if we can use it in our bird instance for example in here if i say phoenix dot eat i don't know what phoenix is eat but let's just pass meat and let's run our application and let's see if we can successfully execute the eat method and as you can see in here nina is eating meat now that you have created your bird class you can also change the dog class as well for example in here i'm going to delete all of these codes once again instead i'm going to extend the animal class once again let's say extends animal you can see the red warning and that's because we need a constructor you can see that the amount of similar codes that you were copy and pasting is a lot less right now the bird and dog class are basically the same but we know for sure that a dog and a bird are not the same they may have other fields and also other behaviors as well if you want you can customize your child classes as well for example inside my bird class i want to add another field i'm going to say private let's say int wings we know that dogs do not have wings in here i'm going to delete this constructor and i'm going to create it once again because i'm going to use the help of my ide let's press alt plus insert in here i'm going to select wings and this time as you can see the constructor has been changed a little bit the super statement is as the same it means that do whatever you are doing with all of these uh, four fields but because inside our parent class inside the animal class we do not have a wings field this wings hasn't been passed to this super statement so we are setting the value of wings directly inside the constructor of this bird class this way we can customize our child classes right now the dog does not have any uh, wings field but our bird does but right now if i switch back to my main class i should get a warning 
and the warning in here says that you need to pass a wing let's also pass that in here as well for example i'm going to say two we can also create getter and setter methods for these wings as well for example inside our bird class down in here let's press alt plus insert and let's select getter and setters now that we have created the getters and setters let's see if we can print uh, the number of wings for example down in here i'm going to say phoenix dot get wings let's run the application and you can see that two has been printed as the number of wings beside getter and setter methods you can also have other methods inside your child class as well for example inside this bird class if i want i can define a fly method as well let's quickly see that let's say public void fly i'm not going to receive anything as the input let's just print something let's say this dot get name also if you remember from the previous video i said that this keyword refers to the current object that you are in in this case inside the bird class we don't have any get name method but because we are extending the animal class we can use this dot get name let's say is flying so beside using fields you can also customize your child classes with different methods let's see if we can call this method from inside our main class let's say phoenix.fly as you can see nina is flying also beside defining new methods inside your child class you can also change the behavior of methods of your parent class for example if you remember inside the animal class we had this eat method i'm talking about this one which inside this method we are saying eating food inside our bird class if we want we can change that for example right in here i'm going to press ctrl plus o you can see that we are seeing a list of different methods i'm going to override this eat method so by overriding you are going to say that i'm going to change the behavior of this eat method from what is happening inside the parent class once again we are seeing this super keyword it means that do whatever you are doing with this parameter inside the parent class if you want you can delete this super statement completely but let it be for now we will uh, delete that later on after this super keyword i'm going to print another statement in here let's just say eating finished so this way we have changed the eat method inside our child class from what it was inside the animal class right now inside our main class we have executed this line of code phoenix.eat let's comment the lines after that so that we can see uh, what's going to be the behavior of this eat method let's run the application you can see that we are saying eating meat and after that eating finished if you want to completely change the behavior of your method inside the child class you can simply delete this super.eat method for example in here i'm going to say chewing food instead of eating food so in both child and parent class we have this eat method but their behavior is different let's run the application and see if we can see the difference you can see that we are chewing meat so what we did so far is called inheritance in object oriented programming we have inherited the bird class from the animal class you can also continue this inheritance multiple times for example if you want you can inherit the dog object let's quickly create another class in here for example let's say shepherd now in here i can say extend the dog class you can see that once again we are getting this red warning let's create our constructor in order to overcome that uh, problem you can see that even though inside the dog field we do not have any field but inside our shepherd class in the constructor we need all of those arguments because the parent of this shepherd class which is dog is the child of another class which is animal so you can do this inheritance as many times as you want you can also create another class and extend the shepherd class but i don't think that mean anything in here i just wanted to say that you have that option okay i think that's enough talking about inheritance the other concept that i'm going to talk about is called polymorphism we have talked a bit about polymorphism in the previous video but uh, let's talk more about it in here so in previous video i said that one kind of polymorphism is that for a class to have multiple constructors for example inside our animal class if we had another constructor in here which will accept different number of fields for example the first three now that we have two constructor this is one kind of polymorphism 
Now we can create this animal class in two different ways. Basically polymorphism means uh, having multiple forms. But there are two more kind of polymorphism. But before we talk about that, let's uh, delete this constructor. I'm not sure that if we are going to need that. The other kind of polymorphism that we have used so far is about this eat method. So inside this animal class, we had this eat method, but also we had it inside the child class, which is bird. But these two eat methods have different forms. It means that we are doing different things inside each one of these methods. This is another kind of polymorphism methods inside a parent and a child class that are doing the same job differently. We also have another kind of polymorphism and that's uh, with the methods themselves. We don't have this fly method inside our animal class but in here we can also have another method called fly as well. Let's quickly see how we can create another method called fly. I'm going to say public void fly. But this time inside the parentheses, I'm going to receive some arguments. For example, I'm going to receive the speed. As you can see, the compiler is happy with this way of defining two different methods with the same name. Now, if I switch back to my main class, we can see that we are not getting an error. But before that, I think I should uncomment this line of code. Even though we are not getting error warning, this in here, it means that we are using the first fly method. Let me close all of the unnecessary classes. Inside the bird class, we are using the first method. But if we want to use the second method, we just need to pass some arguments in here. For example, let's pass 100. We can have methods with the same name when we have different number of arguments or alternatively when we have different kind of arguments. For example, in this case, we are uh, passing integer. But if we had another method, for example, uh, in which we pass a string, that method can have the fly name as well. Let's see that quickly. Let's say public void fly. And inside the parentheses, I don't know, let's pass a string. Let's just say name. You can see that uh, the compiler is happy with this way of defining a method with the same name. So beside the difference in the number of parameters, the kind of parameter is also important. This in here is also called polymorphism, using methods with the same name in different ways. Okay, let's delete these two. I don't think we are going to need them. And I think it's a good point to stop the video in here. In the next video, first thing we are going to start talking about composition in object-oriented programming. See you in the next video. In the previous video, we have talked about inheritance and polymorphism. In this video, we are going to talk about composition in object-oriented programming. In previous videos, I said that classes are useful for when you want to define your customized data type. For example, imagine that you are going to create a car. In that car, you have multiple systems. For example, you have a system for a stereotype. Your car also may have some engine. It can also have a fuel system. If you want to simulate a car in programming, you can create different classes, for example, for engine, for a stereo system, and also for fuel system. And after that, inside your car class, you can compose all of those classes to have a car. Let's see how we can use composition in Java. In my package, I'm going to create a class called engine. For this engine, I'm going to have two fields. First of all, I'm going to define a model. So let's say private string model. And after that, let's have an integer, private int. I'm going to name this integer RPM. RPM stands for round per minute. It's just a property of different engines. I'm going to keep it really simple. So I think these two would be enough. After that, let's quickly create our constructor and getters and setters. Let's create a car class and let's see how we can use this engine inside that. Let's say new Java class. Let's name it car. For this car class, I'm going to define four fields. First of all, let's pass a name, private string name. After that, let's have an integer for the number of doors. After that, let's define the color of our car, private string color. And after that, I'm going to include or compose an engine in here. For that, I can simply say private engine with capital E. And in here, you can see that in my package, I have an engine class. I can import that into this class. Let's name it engine. 
For the sake of simplicity, I have composed only one class inside this class, but if you want, you can create another class for a stereo system and fuel system and everything else that you want, but I think you would get my point if I use only one class. After that, like other classes, I can create my constructor. You can see that this engine has been passed to our constructor the same way that we have passed other data types like integers and strings. We can also have getters and setters the same way that we had for uh, previous classes. Now that we have created this car, we can instantiate it, for example, inside our main class. For example, if I want to have a car object in here, I can say car, let's name it Mercedes, is equal to new car. As you can see, the constructor in here requires four fields, a name, doors, color, and also an engine. For the name, I'm going to pass Mercedes AMG. For the number of doors, let's pass two. For the color, let's say silver. But what should we pass as the engine in here? Well, we can pass our engine in two ways. First of all, we can create our engine before this car class. For example, in here, I can say engine. Let's name it engine is equal to new engine and I can pass a model and RPM for this engine to instantiate it. For example, I'm going to say Renault for the RPM, let's say um, 8000. After creating our engine object, we can pass it to the constructor of our car. For example, in here, I can say engine. And like that, we can create our car, but the other way is to um, pass your engine directly to the constructor of your car. For example, I can say new engine in here, and I can instantiate my engine object directly inside the constructor. Let's say Renault and let's pass 8000. Now that we have passed it directly, we don't need the first line. Of course, we know that Mercedes wouldn't use Renault engine, but uh, I think it doesn't matter in here. Now that we have instantiated our car object, we can have access to all of the fields like we did before. For example, if we want to print the name of our car, we can say something like this. We can say mercedes.name or .get name to be precise. But what if we want to get the model of the engine of this car? Well, for that, we can say something like this. Let's print engine model plus we can say mercedes.get engine, this method in here. After that, we can once again say dot get model. So this get engine method will return an engine object in which we can perform another dot operator on that. Let's run the application and see what would be the result. First of all, you can see the name of our car and after that you can see the engine model, which is Renault. Also, instead of using the methods of your engine, you can uh, get the engine object directly. For example, in here before the print statement, I'm going to say engine, let's name it engine, is equal to, let's say Mercedes.getEngine. You can see the return type in here, but whenever you are not sure about the return type, you can press down the control key and by hover overing your method, you can see the return type. You can see the declaration of your method, which says public engine get engine. It means that this method is going to return an engine object. Now that you have your instance of engine, you can perform all kinds of operations on that. Instead of pressing down the control key and hover over your method, there is another option to get the return type and for that matter the declaration of your method. And here is how you can do that. You can click on the name of your method and you can press down the control Q. This way you can see some information about the declaration of your method. These kind of documentations are especially useful for when you are using a third party library or some built in methods. For example, if we click on this print line method and press Ctrl Q, you can see that the documentation is giving us much more information. For example, in this case, it says that uh, this method is printing a string and then terminate the line. You can see some information about the method itself. Also, if you want, you can have this kind of information on the methods that you yourself create. For example, on this getEngine method, if we switch to our car class, we can create some sort of documentation. Let's find that method. And here is how you can do that. You need to add a comment in here. In previous videos, we have seen how to create a new comment. By using two slashes, we could have uh, create our comment. But these kind of comments are not useful in here. Instead, we can use a single slash. And after that, we can have two stars. By pressing an enter, 
you can see that uh, we have these sort of comments as well. These kind of comments are useful for when you have multiple lines. And in here you can have some sort of information in which later on will be shown when you press Ctrl Q on the name of your method. For example, in here let's say uh, returns the engine of our car. Now that we have provided this information in here, if we switch back to our main class on the declaration of our method on the name, if we press Ctrl plus Q, you can see that in here we can see that information. Sometimes this kind of commenting can be useful as well. But there are more to this kind of commenting. For example, we can provide some links, but more on that later on uh, in future videos. So this way of using different classes inside other classes is called composition in object oriented programming. Once again, if you have created some other classes, for example, a stereo system class and also a fuel system class, you could have added them one by one in here as well. But for the sake of simplicity, I've just included this engine. This way we can compose different objects inside one class. Okay, I think that's enough talking about composition. Let's talk about a keyboard in Java called null. Before that, let's close this car class and let's comment all of these lines of codes. There are some times that you don't want to instantiate your objects immediately. For example, down in here I can say car Mercedes is equal to, I don't want to instantiate my car object in here like we did before. Instead, I want to postpone that to a few lines after this. For that, you can pass null values for your objects. Let's see null in here as well. This null keyword in Java means nothing. It means that this car Mercedes is nothing. When the value of an object is null, you cannot perform any kind of operation on that. For example, in here I cannot say Mercedes dot get name for example we are not getting a compile time error it means that our application is going to be created but if you take a look at the highlight in here it says that this method is going to produce null pointer exception if you remember from previous videos i said that whenever null pointer exception happens your application is going to crash so the error in here is going to be a runtime error and not a compile time error Let's run our application and let's see what would happen. You can see that in here we are getting a red warning in our console says java.lang.nullpointer exception. In general, we should always avoid exceptions in our application. Later on, we will talk about how can we do that, but for now, let's just assume that we know whenever an object is null, we cannot perform any operation on that. For example, we cannot use the methods inside that object. So whenever you are not sure about null values, for example, whenever you are retrieving some data from a web server or from your local database, first of all, you need to check that if your object is null or not. And here is how you can do that. For example, you can create an if statement. Before this Mercedes.get name, I can say if, let's say Mercedes, is not equal to null. I'm going to put an if statement in here. In case uh, our object is not null, we are going to call this method. But in the else case, I'm going to print something. Let's say the car was null. Let's run the application once again. This time you can see that we are not seeing the exception, which is good. But right now we are not doing anything helpful uh, with our value being null. We are just printing something. Sometimes this is the desired behavior, but sometimes you may want to check that what was the cause of your object to be null. So null means nothing in Java. Okay, let's comment all of these. And let's talk about another keyword in Java called final. So up to this point, when we wanted to instantiate our object or variable, we could have said something like this. We could have said int a is equal to 5, for example. Later on, we could have changed this a, for example, we could have said a is equal to uh, 5 plus 1 or a plus 1. This way, we could have changed the value of our variable. But there are some times that you need to be sure that uh, the value of your variable wouldn't change. In those cases, you can use the final keyword. And here is how you can do that. Before the type of your variable, you can say final. Final int a is equal to 5. Now, if I try to change the value of my variable, for example, like before, if I say a is equal to a plus 1, 
you can see that we are getting a warning in here. The warning says that cannot assign a value to a final variable. So whenever you are declaring your variables and classes as final, you cannot change the value of that variable or class. Let's also check the case when we define our uh, classes as final. I'm going to comment these two line of code. And down in here, I'm going to say final. Let's say engine. Let's name it engine is equal to new engine. Let's pass a model and a RPM. Now, if I try to change the value of this engine, for example, if I say engine is equal to new engine with other parameters, for example, let's change the RPM, let's say 7000. Once again, you can see the error. The error says that cannot assign a value to final variable. But there is a point in here. When you declare your objects as final, you cannot change the whole instance of that object, but you can change the properties of your object. For example, in here, if you remember inside our engine class, we had two setter methods, which with the help of them, we could have changed the value of two properties. For example, if we wanted to change the RPM, we could have set something like engine.setRPM to let's say 10,000. You can see that even though we declared our engine as final, we can change its properties. We just cannot change the whole instance. We can change its properties. Using final keywords can be useful from time to time. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to have a quick challenge to make sure that we have understand the concepts of object-oriented programming. See you in the next video. This is our challenge. Imagine that you are a doctor and you want to check on your patient. In this application, first of all, you are showing the name and age of the user to the doctor. And after that, you can see a list of different organs in which the doctor can select. The first organ is left eye. Let's select that. In here, you can see that we are seeing some details about the organ. For example, the name, the medical condition, and also the color of the eye. After that, we gave the doctor the option to close the eye. And also, if the eye is closed, we are going to open that. Let's select one in here to close the eye. We can see that left eye closed. Once again, we are seeing the list of our organs. Let's select two in this case. This time, if I don't want to close or open the eye, I can put any number beside one. For example, if I put two in here, you can see that once again, we are seeing the list of different organs. Let's select three to see the heart. Once again, you can see that we are seeing some details about the heart. After that, we have the ability to change the heart rate. In a normal doctor patient situation, this wouldn't be the available option, but in here we just want to demonstrate some behavior for our heart organ. So if we select one in here, the scanner is asking for our new heart rate, which I can put 75. And you can see that heart rate changed to 75. Let's select a stomach. Once again, you can see the details of the stomach. We have one behavior in here, which is digest. If we select that, you can see that digesting has begun. Once again, this is a hypothetical situation. And in a normal situation, you cannot order the patient to digest the food. Let's also select five in here to see the skin. This time for the skin, you can see that we are not seeing any behavior. Instead, we are just seeing some uh, details. After that, once again, we have our list in which if we put six or for that matter any other number we will uh, close the application let's put six in here and as you can see application has been uh, exited successfully by solving this challenge i want you to practice the object oriented programming concepts that we have talked about in the past three videos so make sure to use them okay pause the video in here and go solve the challenge after that come back to the video and let's see my solution for the challenge as well here is my solution for the challenge first of all i'm going to create a package inside my source folder let's name it org.makeup.op challenge inside this package i'm going to create my organ class Inside this organ class, I'm going to have two fields. Let's say private string 
name and also private string medical condition i'm going to keep it simple so i think these two would be fine after that let's create a constructor and after that let's create all of the getters and setters i'm not sure that we are going to use all of these getters and setters later on if we didn't use them we just simply delete them beside these i'm going to have another method inside this class named get details let's see that as well let's say public void get details and let's print some details about this organ first of all let's say name plus this dot get name after that let's print a medical condition of this organ as well medical condition plus this dot get medical condition that's all we need inside this organ class let's quickly create our organs one by one first of all i'm going to create an organ called i let's say i inside this i class i'm going to have a string called color and after that let's have a boolean indicating if the i is open or not so let's say private boolean is opened after that it's time to extend the organ class let's say extend organ in here we are using inheritance now it's the time to create our constructor let's select both of these two fields and after that let's create all of the getters and setters once again i'm not sure that we are going to use all of these getters and setters later on if we didn't use them we just simply delete them okay let's override the get details method i can do that by pressing ctrl plus o by selecting get details method now we can change this method for example in this case let's also print the color of the eye let's say color plus this dot get color inside this i class i'm going to have two other methods as well let's see them let's say public void open inside this open method i'm going to change the value of this boolean to true so let's say this dot set opened and let's pass true after that let's print something indicating the eye has been opened let's say this dot get name you can see that we don't have any get name method inside this class we are using the get name from the parent class which is organ let's say plus opened let's have another method called close i'm going to say public void close once again first of all i'm going to change the value of the boolean to false let's say this dot set opened and let's pass false after that let's print something let's say this dot get name plus closed that's all we need inside this i class let's quickly create another class for the heart let's say heart for this heart class i'm going to add another field called rate let's say private int rate it's time to extend the organ class extends organ and after that we need to create our constructor after that we need to create our getters and setters i'm pressing alt plus insert to get that dialog in case that's confusing for you after that it's time to uh, override the get details method by pressing ctrl plus o and by selecting get details method we have that in here i'm just going to print the heart rate let's say heart rate plus this dot get heart rate or get rate that's all we need to do inside this heart class let's quickly create a stomach class let's say stomach inside this stomach class i'm going to have a boolean let's say private boolean is empty indicating if the stomach is empty or not after that it's time to extend the organ class extend organ and after that we need to create our constructor let's create our getters and setters 
And after that, let's override the getDetails method. Inside this getDetails method, first of all, I'm going to check that if the stomach is empty or not. So let's say if this dot is empty, I'm going to use the method in here. If the stomach is empty, I'm going to print something. I'm going to say need to be fed. But in the else case, let's just print the stomach is full. Let's also create another method for this class called digest. Let's say public void digest. Let's just print something. Let's say digesting begin. Okay, we are done with our stomach class. Let's quickly create the skin class as well. For this skin class, I'm going to define two more fields. First of all, I'm going to define a string for the color of the skin. After that, I'm going to define an integer for the softness of the skin. Let's say private int softness. This integer is going to be some number from uh, 0 to 100 indicating the softness of the skin. After that, it's time to extend the organ class. And after that, we need to create our constructor. Next, we need to create our getters and setters. And after that, let's override the getDetails method. Inside this method, let's also print a skin color. Let's say skin color plus this dot get color. That's all of our organs. Now we can create our patient class. Inside my package, let's create a patient class. For this patient, first of all, I'm going to have a string for its name. After that, we are going to have an integer for the age of the patient. After that, we can create our organs. For example, I'm going to say private eye. Let's say left eye. Let's do the same for the right eye. Let's also have a heart. After that, maybe a stomach and a skin. Okay, that's all of our fields for the patient. Let's create the constructor. And let's create all of the getters and setters. We don't need any special method inside this patient class. Inside our main class, which we need to create, we can instantiate it. Let's create our main class. First of all, in here, we are going to create our main method. After that, we can create our patient object. But before that, let's minimize this project pane. Let's say patient, let's name it patient is equal to new patient. First of all, we need a name in here. Let's say Brad. After that, we need the age, let's say 28. After that, we need the left eye, which I can say new eye. For this eye, first of all, we need a name, let's say left eye. After that, we need the medical condition, which I'm going to say uh, short-sighted. For the color, let's say blue. For the is open boolean, let's say true. We need the same thing for the right eye. New eye. Let's just change the name to right eye. Also, let's change the medical condition to normal. After that, we need a heart. Let's say new heart. For the medical condition, let's say normal. And for the rate of the heart, let's just say 65. Uh, I think the next organ was a stomach. So let's say new stomach. The name would be stomach. The medical condition, I'm just going to enter a name of some medical condition. I'm going to say PUD. Public ulcer disease in case if you are wondering. And for the is empty, let's say false. After that, we need a skin. Let's say new skin for the color of the skin. Or first of all, we need the name. Let's say skin. For the medical condition, let's say burnt. Uh, after that, what do we need? We need the color and also softness. For the color, let's say white. For the softness, let's say 40 out of 100. 
Okay, that's our patient object. Now we need to create the logic for our application. First of all, I'm going to print the name and age of the patient. So let's say print name plus patient dot get name. After that, do the same thing for the age. We are going to receive the user's input, so we need the scanner. Let's say a scanner, a scanner is equal to new scanner. Let's pass system.in. Also know that we know about object oriented programming. We know how this scanner is working. This is just a class with this new keyword. We are instantiating it inside the constructor of this scanner. We need this system.in, whatever that is. So this way we have created an instance of this scanner. After that, I'm going to define a Boolean. Let's say Boolean. Let's name it short finish. And initially I'm going to set it to false. Later on, we will see that how this one is going to be useful. After that, I'm going to create a while loop. Let's say while should finish is not equal to true. Continue looping. Inside the while loop, I'm going to show a list of different organs. For that, I can say choose an organ. In here, I have two options. I can use this system.out.print lines line after line. Or the better option is to use backslash n. Let's see that as well. First of all, let's go to the next line in order to have a cleaner code. In here, I can say backslash n. This backslash n moves the cursor to the next line. The other one that I'm going to use in here is called backslash t. This backslash t will add a tab to our text. Later on, we will see exactly what these two are doing. Okay, the first organ is left eye. The next one is right eye. After showing this list to the user, I'm going to receive the user's input. So I'm going to say int choice is equal to scanner.nextInt. We have seen this in previous videos, so I'm not going to explain in here. We are just going to receive the user's input. After that, depending on this choice, I'm going to create a switch statement. Let's say switch on choice. And let's create our different cases. In case the user's choice is one, first of all, we are going to print the details about the left eye. So let's say patient.getLeftEye.getDetails. Next, I'm going to give the user the option to open or close the eye. For that, I need to check that if the eye is opened or closed. So let's say if patient.getLeftEye.is is opened, we need to close it. Or at least we need to give the option to close the eye. Let's print something in here. Let's say backslash t backslash t in order to have two tabs. After that, let's say uh, close or close the eye. Next, we need to get the user's input in case if it's one, we are going to close the eye. So let's say if scanner.nextInt is equal to one, then we need to say patient.getLeftEye.close the eye or close. But in the else case, we are just going to continue to the next record. In the else case of the first if statement, this one in here, in case the eye is not opened, we are going to show the option to open the eye. So let's say else. We need the same logic. We can print something backslash t backslash t one open the eye. Next, we need to get the user's input. Let's say if scanner dot next int is equal to one. We are going to say patient dot get left eye dot uh, open. In the else case, we are just going to continue. By continue, I mean once again, we are going to show the list of different organs. Okay, that's our first case. We also need a break in here. Let's write the second case. The second case is the right eye. We basically can copy and paste all of this logic but we just need to change the left eye to right eye. So for example, in here, let's say get right eye.
Okay, we are done with our second case. Let's also write the case for the heart. Let's say case three. First of all, let's show the details of the heart. Let's say patient dot get heart dot get details. After that, we are going to give the user to change the heart rate. For that, let's say backslash t backslash t one change the heart rate. Once again, we need to listen for the user's input. So let's say if the scanner dot next int is equal to one. We need to ask for the new heart rate. So let's say uh, enter a new heart rate. After that, we need to save that heart rate. So let's say int is equal to a scanner dot next int. After that, we can say patient dot get heart dot let's say set rate and let's pass our new heart rate. But in the else case, like before, we are going to continue. We also need a break in here. Let's quickly add that. And also after changing the heart rate, it's better to show some message. Let's say heart rate change to plus patient dot get heart dot get rate. Okay, that's our third case. The fourth one was for the stomach. So let's say case four. First of all, we need to print the details of the stomach patient dot get stomach dot get details. For the stomach, we had the digest option. So in here, let's show that option backslash t backslash t. Let's say digest. Let's say if the scanner dot next int is equal to one. If that's the case, let's say patient dot get stomach dot digest. But in the else case, let's just continue. We also need a break in here. Let's quickly add that. The fifth case is for the skin. Let's say case five. For the skin, we didn't have any option. We just need to print the details. Let's say patient dot get skin dot get details. Of course, after that, we need to add a break. In here, I'm going to add a default case. And if the user enters any other number than this five, we are going to quit the application. For that, we are going to change the value of this should finish boolean to true. After that, we need a break. Okay, I think our application is ready to test. Let's see how did we do. In here, we can see the name and age of the patient, which is good. We can also see the list of our organs. Once again, it's good. Let's select left eye. We can see the details of the left eye. And also we have this close the eye option. Let's put another number beside this one. Let's say two. Once again, we can see the list of our organs. Let's see if we can close the left eye. Let's put one in here. And as you can see, left eye has been closed. Okay, let's check the right eye. It's working the same. Let's enter two in here in order to show the list of organs. And let's select our heart. We can see the heart details, which is good. Let's see if we can change the heart rate. Let's select one in here. The console is waiting for the new heart rate, let's say 75. And as you can see, heart rate has been changed to 75. Let's check it once again in order to make sure of that. Let's say three. And as you can see, the heart rate is 75. Let's put two in order to show the list of organs. And let's select four in order to see the stomach. We can see all of the details of the stomach. Let's digest some food. And as you can see, digesting has begun. Let's check the skin, which is five. You can see that we are getting the details of the skin, but we don't have any option. That seems to be good. And if we enter any other number than this five, we should quit the application. Let's enter seven in here, for example. And as you can see, application has been finished successfully. Okay, it seems like our application is working fine. Let's just delete the uh, getter and setter methods that we said that we will delete if we didn't use them. Let's check the classes one by one. First of all, inside the I class, Everything that is grayed out, it means that we never use that. For example, we never use this set color method. Okay, it seems to be good. Inside the heart class, I think we have used all of them. Okay, that's fine. Inside the organ class, 
Uh, we didn't need this uh, set medical condition method and also we didn't need this set name method. Inside the patient class, let's see what do we have in there. And uh, I think we didn't use any of the setters of this patient class. Let's just delete them. Okay, that seems to be good. Let's see what we have inside the skin class. And in here, we never use these setters and this get softness method. Let's delete them. Inside the stomach class, let's delete this set empty method. And in order to make sure of everything, let's just run our application one more time. Okay, it seems like we don't have any compile time error, which seems to be fine. Okay, that was our challenge about object-oriented programming concepts. I will upload the source code at the links that you can see on the screen. Feel free to check them. And also, I'm more than happy to see your feedback about the code. In the next video, we will talk about collections in Java. See you in the next video. In previous videos, we have seen simple arrays in Java. For example, if we wanted to store a list of different names, we could have said something like this. We could have said a string with a pair of a square bracket. After that, we could have named our array. And after that, we could have uh, initialized our string array like this. Inside the square bracket in here, we needed to pass the size of our array, for example, 5. The other way was to pass our elements at the time of instantiating our array. For example, we could have set a pair of curly braces and inside those curly braces, we could have passed our elements. Let's pass few names in here. After that, if we wanted to have access to these elements, we could have say something like this. We could have said print, let's say names with an index of let's say two for the third element, which is Brad in this case. If we run our application right now, we should see Brad. Let's run it. You can see that Brad has been printed. But if you remember, I said that using this kind of simple arrays in Java has a lot of limitations. For example, the first limitation is that their size is immutable. It means that their size cannot be changed. Right now, we have five elements inside our names array. If we want to add another item inside this array, we cannot do that. For example, we cannot say something like names with an index of five, which indicates the sixth element. We cannot assign a value to that. You can see that in here we have a red warning. And if we try to run our application, we get an exception. Let's see the exception. The exception in here is array index out of bound exception. Also, when working with simple arrays in Java, you don't have that much options. Later on, we will see that when we use different kind of collections, we can operate all sorts of operations on our collections in which we do not have them in simple arrays. If we want to add a six element to our array, we can create a new array. And after that, we can copy all of the elements from inside this array right now for the situation that we have in here if we want to add another item to our array we can create another array with the size of six after that we can copy all of these elements to that array and after everything we can add this new item for example in here i can say a string array let's name it new names is equal to new string array with the size of six after that i can create a for loop let's say for int i is equal to zero, i less than names dot length, and i plus plus. Inside that for loop, first of all, I need to add all of the names to this new names array. I can say new names with an index of i is equal to names with an index of i. This way, we can copy all of the elements from inside this names array to this new names array. After copying all of the elements, after the for loop, I can say new names with an index of five, is equal to jerry this way we can get around this problem for example if i comment this line and run my application maybe after that uh, print the six element inside our new names uh, we have a solution but as you can see this solution is not that much effective let's quickly print this you can see jerry has been printed in here but as you can see there are a lot of codes involved and beside that if your array has a lot of elements for example a million elements this process can be really time consuming beside that it can be resource consuming if you are downloading this array from the internet 
so this solution in here is not effective instead of copy and pasting the whole array we are going to use collections let's delete all of these codes in java we have multiple kinds of collections the first of which i'm going to talk about in here is called array list let's quickly see that so we type array list with capital a after that inside a pair of anchor bracket or as some might call them diamonds we need to define the type of our array list object for example i can say a string after that we need to name our array list for example i can say names is equal to new array list as simple as that we have an array list this is one way of defining your array list there is also another way let's quickly see that so instead of saying array list string we can say list you can see that the icon in here is different it's an interface we will talk about interfaces later on in the course but for now just know that there are two ways of defining your array list let's see how can we use this list to create an array list we can say list of strings for example once again let's name our list for example let's say students is equal to new array list there is a slight difference in here but i just wanted to show you both ways of defining your array list okay let's delete this line for now right now our array list is empty and if we want to add some elements to this array list we can simply say names dot add we can use this add method in order to add elements into our array list for example let's add one you can use this add method as many times as you want if i want to add another element i can simply do that so the first benefit of using array list is clear now the size of array list is mutable it means that we can change the size of array list after adding some elements to your array list you can get those elements by using the get method let's quickly see that for example let's print the first element i can say names dot get you can see that this get method requires an index once again indexes in java start from zero so if i pass zero in here it means that i'm going to get the first element right now if i run my application i should see mason printed into the console you can see that mason has been printed also when using array lists you can also get the size of your array list for example if i want to print the size of my array list i can say something like this i can say names dot size let's run the application and see what would be the result you can see that the size of our array list is two you have all sort of options when using array lists you can also uh, clear all of the elements inside your array list for example i can say names dot clear this clear method removes all of the elements inside your array list after clearing if i once again get the size of my array list this time the size should be zero and as you can see down in here it's zero if you want you can also remove one element from your array list let's quickly see that i can say names dot remove this remove method requires an object it means that we need to pass the whole element so let's say mason for example but before that let me quickly comment this line because we don't want to clear our array list and after removing mason let's print the first element uh, inside our array list let's say uh, names.get and let's pass zero as the index as you can see the first element right now is zero it means that mason has been removed successfully let's see what other option do we have on our array list let's type names by typing dot we can see the list of options we can also check that if an option exists in our uh, array list for example if i use this contains method once again it requires an object let's say mason uh, let's print this whole line of code this contains method uh, returns a boolean so right now if i run my application because we have removed mason we should see false we can see that that's good but if we change this to zero we should see true and true it is you can also check that if your array list is empty or not for that you can uh, print something for example you can say names dot is empty we have this method once again it's returning a boolean right now we have zero in our array list so it shouldn't be empty and as you can see we are receiving false but if we remove zero before this line of code we should see true let's quickly do that names dot remove and let's pass zero this time you can see that true has been printed you can also get the index of some element from inside your array list as well 
Let's quickly see that. Before everything, I'm going to comment all of these lines of code because I want to have a, a clear console. Down in here, let's say print names dot index of, and in here I can pass my object. For example, I can pass Mesa. Right now, Mesa is the first element, so we should see zero printed. You can see that it's zero. But if we don't have that uh, element inside our array list, for example, if we pass Brad in here, we should see negative one. And as you can see, negative one has been printed. When you are using array lists, you can only have objects as the type of elements inside your array list. For example, in here, I cannot say integer. You cannot use primitive data types when you are creating a new array list. As you can see in the error in here, the error says that type argument cannot be primitive type. If you want to have an array list of different numbers, you can use the equivalent Java class. For example, in here, I can say integer with a capital I. And now I have an array list of integer. Right now I am getting an error because I'm trying to add some strings to this integer array list, but you get the idea we can use this integer class in order to uh, have an array list. So in Java, equivalent to every primitive data type, you have a class as well. We have seen this integer. Let's also check others. We can say Boolean. Similar to that, we can say long. We can also say double and you can check the others yourself but let's change this one to a string right now the other option that you have when you are using array list is sorting different items for example if you want to sort different elements inside your array list alphabetically you have that option and the way to do that is like this let's see that down in here we can say names dot sort you can see that this sort method requires some comparator Later on in the course, we will see this comparator. In fact, we will use this sort method in order to sort different elements in our array list. But for now, I'm not going to talk about this. I just wanted to say that you have this option. Okay, let's delete this and let's move on from this part. Similar to simple arrays in Java, if you want to iterate through all of the elements in your array list, you can use for loops. Let's quickly see that as well. We can say for int i is equal to zero i less than names dot size this time i plus plus inside this for loop we can say uh, print names dot get with the index of i this way we can print all of the elements in our array list but before that let's comment this line and let's run our application you can see that we can see both of our elements printed okay that's enough talking about array list let's also talk about another kind of collection in java called maps maps are useful for when you have some key value per data let's define a map and we will talk about what i mean by key value pairs you can define a map like this you can say map you can see that map is an interface we will talk about interfaces later on in the course i believe in the next video but for now let's move on you can also see that inside these anchor brackets inside these diamonds we have this k and v these two stands for key and values so in here if we say anchor bracket for the first element we need to pass the kind of key the data type of our keys for example i can say string and after that we need to provide the data type of our values for example i can say a string once again for the data type of my values right now i'm getting a red warning and that's because uh, it seems like the ide hasn't imported maps into my class I can press Alt plus Enter, and if we take a look at above in here, it seems like uh, we have imported maps into our class successfully. After defining the data type of your keys and values inside your map, you need to name your map. For example, I can say contacts. In here, I can say new maps, but if I do that, you will see that there are a lot of methods that I need to be worried about. There is a better way of defining your maps. Uh, let's press Ctrl Z in order to undo the change. I can say new hash map. This time you can see that this hash map is a class. And if we want, we can instantiate our map this way. This time we do not have all of those extra methods. I don't intend to talk about hash maps in here. The topic is a bit technical. It's about the way that we are going to iterate through our maps elements. It's way above the talk that we have in here. I just wanted to say that you can instantiate your maps as different hash maps. Okay, now you have an empty map, which the data type of different keys is a string. 
and the data type of different values is a string as well. If you want to put some elements to this map, you can say something like this. You can say contacts.put. This is the method that we are going to use in order to add some elements to our map. You can see that right now this put method is waiting for a key and also a value. For the key, for example, I can pass uh, a name, let's say Maysam, and for the value, let's pass his email. Let's say Maysam at mayco.org. This way we can add elements to our map. I think if I change the name of my contacts map to, let's say, email list, that would be much more better. In order to change the name of some variable or class in Java, you have an option. You can select the whole name. You can right click on the name of your variable. You can go to this refactor in here and you can use this rename. Or alternatively, you can use the shortcut, which is shift plus F6. Let's select that. And in here, I'm going to delete this whole name. You can see that once I'm deleting this, it's deleting the name in both places. So let's say email list and let's press enter. I think this name is much more suitable. Let's add another element to our map. Let's say email list dot put, let's say Brad and let's say Brad at gmail.com. Now that I have some elements in my map, if I want to have access to those elements, I can say something like this. For example, let's print this statement. Let's say email list dot. And once again, you can see that we have this get method, which requires an object. For the object in here, we need to pass the key. For example, if I pass Mesam, as the result, I should see the value of Mesam. In this case, I should see the email. Let's run the application and let's see if we can print the email of Mesam. You can see that the email has been printed successfully. Like array lists, when you are using maps, you have all sorts of options. For example, if you want to get the size of your map, you can say something like this. You can say email list dot size. Let's run the application and let's see if we can get to two has been printed. If you want to remove an item from your map, you can say email list dot remove. Once again, this remove requires an object. In this case, we need to pass the key. Let's pass Brad and let's print the size of our map once again. This time after removing Brad, you can see that the size is 1. You can also check that if some key exists in your map or not. The way to do that is like this. Let's print that first of all. You can say email list dot contain keys. Similarly, we have contains value, which you can guess it will check that if some value exists in your map. Let's try the first one contains key and let's pass Brad in here. Because we have removed Brad, we should see false. And as you can see, false has been printed. But if I change this to Mesam, we should see true. OK, that seems to work fine. We can do the same thing uh, for the values. Let's say email list dot contains value. Let's pass the Mesam's email, mesam at makecode.org. Because it does exist in our map, we should see true. And true it is. You can check other options uh, yourself if you want. You can say email list dot. Once again, you can see that we have this clear option. It will clear all of the elements of your map. You have this is empty method. It will check that if your map is empty or not. The other option that you have in here is this values. You can see that this values method will return a collection. If you want to copy all of the values of your map, you can use these values and you can save it inside a collection. But I'm not going to do that in here, but to just show you, I'm going to say that there is an interface in Java called collection, this one in here, in which is the generic type of all of the collections available in Java. But more on that later on when we sort different items inside our array lists. Like array lists, you cannot have a primitive data type as the data type of your key or your values when you are using maps. For example, in here, I cannot say int. If you take a look at the warning, it says that type argument cannot be of primitive data type. Similarly for the values, let's say int. Once again, you can use the equivalent Java class for these primitive data types, but you cannot just use primitive data types. OK, let's roll back everything. Beside maps and array lists, you have other kind of collections in Java as well. I don't want to talk about them in here because I think that uh, for the Android course, these two are enough and you don't need to know about others. But if you are curious, you can always check this Oracle web page. 
you can see that we have sets, lists, and other kind of collections. But honestly, these are not going to be helpful for our Android course. Maps and array lists are just fine. As the data type of key values inside maps and also uh, values inside the array list, you can also have different classes. Let's quickly see that as well. In my source folder inside the package, I'm going to create a new class called student. Let's quickly see that. Inside this student class, I'm going to define two new fields. Let's say private string name and private integer ID. Let's have a constructor and some getters and setters. Now that I have created this class, I can pass it as the data type of my array list. Let's quickly create another array list down in here. I can say array list of different students this time. Let's name this array list student. Let's say is equal to new array list. Now you can put as many students as you want inside this array list. For example, let's say students.add. Let's say new student. Let's say Maysam with the ID of 15 maybe. So beside strings, other kind of customized data type is agreeable uh, with the collections in Java. Okay, just before I finish off this video, I'm going to talk about for each loops in here. If you remember, when we talked about loops in Java, I said that there is another kind of loops called for each loop. I said that we are going to talk about for each loops when we know about object-oriented programming and also collections in Java. So I think now it's a good time to talk about that. You can create a for each loop like this. You can say for, instead of saying int i is equal to zero, I'm going to pass the data type of the list that I'm going to iterate over. For example, in this case, I'm going to say a student. After that, I need a name. For example, I'm going to say s. And after the name, I need a column. After that, I need the list or array list that I'm going to iterate. For example, in this case, I'm going to say students. Let's review everything once again. In here, first of all, we have passed the data type of the object that we are going to look into. The name of that specific object is S. You can name it whatever you want. After the name, you should have a column. And after that, you need to pass the collection that you are going to look into. Inside this for loop, you can use this S in order to have some sort of operation on your object. For example, if I want to print the name of my students, I can say print s.getName. Right now, our array list has only one student. Let's quickly add another. Let's say students.add new student. Let's say Sarah with the ID of maybe 18. Let's run the application and see what would be the result. As you can see down in here, Maysam and Sarah has been printed. So this S in here is like I in a for loop, but instead of being the index of the item, it's the item itself. From time to time, for each loops can be useful, and this is how you can create them. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the video in here. In the next video, we are going to talk about some small concepts. For example, we will talk about this static keyboard that we have seen in the declaration of our main method. Beside that, if we had time, we will talk about inner classes, we will talk about interfaces and abstract classes. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about some small concepts that we need to know about. The first of those concepts is this static keyword that we have seen so far in the declaration of our main method. I'm going to talk about that in another class, so let's create another class in my package. Let's name this class test class. You have seen inside the main class that we can have this static keyboard for our methods. But beside that, we can also declare our variables as static as well. For example, in here I can say public, let's say static. After that, I can say string, let's say name. You can see that it's working fine as well. I'm not sure if you have noticed or not, but as soon as I declared this string as a static, the style of this name has changed to italic. If I remove that, you can see the difference. But what does it mean to have a static variable or a static method? Well, when you define your variables and methods as a static, those methods and variables belong to the object itself and not to the instances of that object. We will see what I'm talking about, but before that, uh, let's quickly have other variables in here. For example, I can say public int age, maybe another one, public 
let's say a string a skin color this variable doesn't mean anything i just want to have some variables let's also create a constructor in here notice that when i uh, use the intellij generator to create my constructor i do not see my static variable in this list once again that's because the static variables do not belong to the instances of the object it belongs to the object itself let's select these two and let's create getters and setters but as you can see we do have a getter and setter for this static variable okay now that we have this class if we want to create an instance of that class for example from inside our main class if we say test class let's name it test class is equal to new test class the constructor in here is waiting for an age and also a skin color let's say 25 right this way we can create our instance of the class but how do we assign a value to the name variable from inside our test class well you can use the setter method for example you can say test class dot set name this method and you can pass a name for example mesam but there is a warning in here this highlighted warning what does that mean is that you can set a value for this name variable even without instantiating your class for example in here i can say test class with capital t dot let's say name or alternatively because the setter method for this name uh, is static as well i can say set name let's use the first one i can say test class dot name is equal to for example mesa we can see that even without instantiating this object we can assign a value to this variable in order to make sure of that let's move this two line of code to after uh, assigning a value to the name variable i can also delete this set name method safely now if i want to have access to the name variable of this test class i can say something like this i can say name plus test class this time with loyalty dot let's say get name Let's run the application and let's see what would be the result. You can see that MaySam has been printed even though we have set the value of this name variable before instantiating our object. So whenever you use static variables, that variable will be the same in all instances of your class. For example, if I have another instance of this test class, for example, if I say test class, uh, second test class, is equal to new test class maybe another age and another skin color let's say 30 uh, black if i print the name variable of this second test class the result would be the same let's say second test class dot get name or for that matter we can say name let's run our application you can see that mesam has been printed beside variables methods can be static as well let's quickly define a static uh, method inside our test class let's say public static void let's name it print something and inside this method let's just print something this static method like a static variable belong to the object itself and not to the instances of uh, this object for example in here once again i can say uh, test class with capital t dot print something you can see that we do not need to uh, instantiate our object if we run our application you can see that something is printing okay now we know the static variables and methods belong to the object itself and not to the instances of that object but why would we want to use static variables and methods there are few reasons for that first of all you may want to have a constant variable in all instances of your class for example imagine that you are creating a class for simulating different employees of a company inside that class you may have some information about the employee for example the age the name email and everything but beside all of those you may have a field called company name you know that in all instances of your employee class the company name should be the same for that matter you may want to declare your company name field as a static also some say that using static variables and methods is very memory friendly because there can be only one instance of that variable or method in all of your application so no matter if you have a thousand employees in your application the company name field in all of those instances will occupy only some spaces as a string can so using static variables and methods is very memory friendly but there is a downside when you are working with this static keyboard let's quickly see that inside our test class as well let's quickly create another method in here let's say public void uh, let's name it print 
Notice that this print method is not static. And because this is not static, now we cannot have access to that method from inside this print something method. For example, in here, I cannot say print. You can see we have a red warning in here. It says that non-static method print cannot be referenced from a static context. Similar to non-static methods, you cannot have access to non-static fields inside a static method as well. For example, in here, if I try to print the age of this test class, you can see that we are getting a red warning in here. Once again, the warning says that non-static field cannot be referenced from a static context. So you cannot use non-static fields and methods inside a static method. Okay, I think that's enough talking about this static keyword. Let's quickly delete this class. Also, we need to delete all of these lines of code. Okay, now we know everything about this main method. First of all, its access modifier is public, it's a static method, its return type is void, its name is main, and also as the input of this method, we are receiving a string array called arguments. Because this main method is a static, we know that there can only be one instance of this main method in our entire application. We are not concerned about the why in here, but we know that in order to run Java applications, we need a main method which is a static with this specific syntax. Okay, that's enough. Let's move on. The next topic that I'm going to talk about in here is inner class. Let's quickly see that in another class called test class. Inside our classes, beside variables and methods, we can also have another class. And here is how we can define that class. We can say private. Let's say class. I'm going to name this class test inner class. And here we have this inner class. Like before, inside this inner class, we can have other methods and variables. For example, I can say private string name in here. I can have a constructor for this class as well. Let's quickly see that. You can see we can create a constructor, we can create all sorts of getters and setters, and we can treat this class as any other class in Java. But there are few differences between a class and an inner class. For example, if we have some fields in our parent class, let's define some. Let's say private int age and private string color. No matter what the access modifier of these fields are, we can have access to these inside our test inner class. But we need to do that inside another method. Let's say private void uh, print age. Inside this method, I can say print, let's say age plus age. You can see that it's working fine. Even though the access modifier of this age is private, we can have access to that from inside our inner class. The same is for different methods of your parent class. No matter what the access modifier of those methods are, you can have access to them from inside your inner class. There are some times that you may want to use inner classes. For example, when you use inner classes, your code might be much more easier for eyes to follow. The other reason for using inner classes is that you can have this private access modifier at the declaration of your class. If you remember, we cannot change this public access modifier when we create our parent class. For example, in here, I cannot say private. You can see an error in here, and if you hover over that, you can see that modifier private not allowed in here. Beside private access modifier, you can also have uh, a static classes. That is another benefit of using inner classes. You didn't have this option when you created your parent class. Let's quickly see that. If I say static in here, once again, modifier static not allowed in here. So with inner classes, you can have uh, private and static classes. In this course, we are not going to use inner classes that much. In fact, the first time that we are going to use it is when we know about async task. In most cases, we are going to define our async tasks as inner classes. We will talk about that later on in the course. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the video in here. I did want to talk about uh, interfaces and abstract classes in this video, but I think that's better to have that discussion in the next video. So see you in the next video. As I said at the end of the previous video, in this video we are going to talk about interfaces in Java. Interfaces are like a contract between two parts of your application. Let's see what I mean by that. You can create an interface like you have created a Java class. You can right click on your package by selecting new Java class. And down in here by selecting interface, you can have an interface. Let's name this interface car interface.
If you take a look at your package, you can see that we have created this interface. And if you take a closer look, you can see that the icon for this interface is somehow different from the icon of classes in Java. This is the general schematic of an interface in Java. Like classes, interfaces lives inside the package. They have this public access modifier. We can name our interfaces whatever we want. And also they have this interface keyword in their declaration. Inside interfaces, we can define our abstract methods. Let's quickly see an abstract method. I can say public, let's say void. After that, let's say print name. As the input of this method, let's just receive a name, let's say a string name. And that's it. You cannot have a body for your abstract methods. For example, in here, if I put a pair of curly braces, you can see that I'm getting a red warning. And the warning says that interface abstract methods cannot have body. So I can delete these two curly braces and I can finish my sentence in here. By using abstract methods, you are hiding the functionality of your methods. For example, in this case, we don't know what this print name method does. Instead, we are just defining some sort of contract. The contract in here is the signature of our method. We know that the name of this method is print name. We know that we are receiving a string called name. And also we know that the return type of this method is void. The signature of this method is a contract in which where we implement this interface, we are going to use this signature. Also, if you take a look at this public keyword, you can see that it's somehow grayed out. If you hover over that keyword, you can see that modifier public is redundant for interface methods. It means that it's not necessary in here. And the reason for that is because all of the abstract methods are public inside an interface. It means that you cannot have private or protected abstract methods. Inside your interface, you can have as many abstract methods as you want. For example, if I want to define another one in here, I can say void. Let's name this one start. And I'm not going to receive anything as the input of this method. Let's define another one. Let's name this one move. And also let's receive an integer called speed. I created the first method so that I can show you how you can create abstract methods and I'm going to delete that in here. So this car interface has two methods, start and move. But how can we use this interface? Let's quickly see that as well. Inside my package, I'm going to create a Java class called electric car. And inside this electric car, I'm going to implement that interface that I just created. In order to implement that interface, I'm going to say implements at the declaration of my class. And after that, I need to provide the name of my interface. In this case, it's car interface. But once I do that, you can see that I'm getting a red warning in here. And for this red warning, we need to implement the two methods that we have created inside our interface. In order to implement those two methods, we have multiple options. First of all, we can click on this red light bulb. By selecting implement methods, we can implement the necessary methods. Or alternatively, if you don't see this red light bulb, you can uh, click on the error and by pressing Alt plus Enter, you can see the same dialog. Or the other option is to come inside the declaration of your class and by pressing Ctrl plus I, you can see the list of necessary methods. In this case, we have a start and move methods. Also, if you press Ctrl plus O, you can see the list of all of the methods that you can overwrite. In here, you need to be a little bit careful because all of these methods are not necessary. The methods that are necessary are these two methods. If you take a closer look at the icon of these two methods, you can see that their icon is somehow not completed. These are the two methods that we need to implement or overwrite. Let's select them. And in here, we have a body for this start and move method. It means that we can define the functionality for these two methods in here. For example, in the start case, I'm just going to print something. Because it's an electrical car, I'm going to say electricity flow started. Let's also define a field for this class. I'm going to say private string name. We can also have a constructor by pressing Alt plus insert. Let's create that constructor and let's also create getters and setters. Down in here, let's also define some functionality for this move method. Once again, I'm going to print something. Let's say this dot get name plus moves at uh, some speed. 
Okay, now that we have created this class in which implements our interface, how can we instantiate our interface? For that, we can switch to our main class and inside this main class, we can say car interface. Let's name it car interface is equal to in here I have two options. First of all, I can say new car interface like we did for Java classes. But if I do that, you can see that we are overriding these two methods. Sometimes this might be our desired behavior, but in here uh, I'm not going to use this way. Instead, I'm going to say is equal to new electric car. This one. Let's also pass a name. Let's say Tesla. You can see that we are assigning a class to an interface. But how is it working? Well, because when we have created our class, we implemented this interface. Now Java compiler is happy with assigning a class to this interface. Now that we have instantiated this interface, we can use its methods. For example, I can say car interface dot, let's say start. And also let's say car interface dot move. We also need to pass a speed, let's pass 60. Let's run the application. You can see that electricity flow started and Tesla is moving at 60 miles per hour. You can see that even though inside our interface we didn't have any body, but we are printing some functionality when we call dot start method on our interface. If you want to make sure that this start method is happening inside your class, you can also print something else in here. For example, inside this start method, let's print the name of this class. I'm going to pass this. If you remember, I said that this refers to the current object. In this case, it's referring to this class. And right now, if I print this, it will uh, print the address of our class. Let's run the application. You can see the address of our electric car class. It means that this start method is happening inside our electric car class and not inside the interface. If you remember, when we have talked about collections, we have defined array lists in two ways. One of those ways was to define our array list as list. For example, we could have said list, which once again you can see that is an interface. For example, list of a string. Let's name it names is equal to new array list. Probably now you understand this syntax in here. It means that we have this array list class in which implements this list interface. If you want to make sure of that and see it for yourself, you can press down the control key on Windows. I believe it's command key on Mac. And by clicking on this array list, you can see the documentation for your array list class. Let's scroll a bit. Above in here, inside the declaration of our array list class, you can see that we are implementing this list. Don't worry about this E in here, it means that we are going to accept any kind of object. But as you can see, we are implementing list. Okay, let's move on from here. Now that we have our interface, we can also have another class in which implements this interface. Let's quickly create another class. Let's say new Java class. Let's name this one fossil fuel car. Once again in here I'm going to say implements, let's say car interface. We need to implement two methods. Let's press Ctrl I and let's select our two methods. Once again let's define some functionalities for these two methods. For example let's print something in here. Let's say explosion in cylinder cause the engine to start. Before I define some functionality for this move method, let's quickly add a field above in here. Like before, I'm going to say private string name. Let's create the constructor and also getters and setters. After that, inside the move method, I'm going to say this car is moving at some speed. Now that we have created this class, we can instantiate our interface inside our main class like this. Let's delete this line of code. In here I can say car interface once again. Let's name this one fossil car interface. Like before I can say new fossil fuel car. Let's pass Mercedes in here for example. Once again you can see that Java compiler is happy with this way of instantiating our interface because we have implemented this car interface inside both electric car class and also fossil fuel car class we can instantiate our car interface in both of these ways and after that i can say fossil car interface dot start and let's say fossil car interface dot move 
Let's also pass some speed in here and let's run our application. You can see that both of these methods have been called in here. I have a point by defining two classes and implement uh, the same interface in both of these classes. My point is that when you create an interface, that interface is a contract between different parts of your application. For example, in this case, I'm defining multiple kinds of cars. No matter what kind the car is, the contract says that this car should have a start and also a move method. So probably by now you can see the usage of interfaces. But there are a lot more to interfaces. For example, we can use something called callback interfaces. Callback interfaces are extremely useful for when you create event listeners like click listeners. And also they are useful for when you want to create some sort of connection between two different threads. We will talk about threads in the next video. Don't worry about that. We will see the use of interfaces when we want to create a communication between two different threads. Also, it's worth noticing that you can uh, implement multiple interfaces at the declaration of your class. For example, let's quickly create another interface in here. I'm going to name this one test interface. For this, let's just have a method in here. Let's say, sorry for private, the abstract methods cannot be private. Let's say void print name and let's receive a name. After I've created this interface inside, for example, my fossil fuel car, after implementing the first interface, I can add a comma. And after that, I can provide the name of my second interface. In this case, it's test interface. But once again, you can see that we are getting the error somewhere inside the declaration of our class. I can press Ctrl plus I and I can implement my method. So you can have multiple interfaces implemented at the declaration of your class. Okay, I think that's enough talking about interfaces. Later on in the course, we are going to use interfaces a lot and their usage will be much more clearer. So hang in there if something is vague. Okay, let's delete all of these extra classes and uh, extra interfaces. Let's also delete these lines of codes. Now let's talk about abstract methods. For that, I'm going to create a new class inside my package. Let's say new Java class. I'm going to name this one test abstract class. If you want to make your class abstract, you need to add another keyboard between the access modifier and the keyword class. Let's add abstract in here. You can see public abstract class. And immediately after I've added this abstract keyword, if you take a look at your package, you can see that the icon for this class has been changed. This means that this is an abstract class. Inside an abstract class like interfaces, you can have abstract methods. Let's quickly see them. For example, I can say public abstract, let's say void, and let's name this one print name. Let's receive a name, string name. Once again, like interfaces, when you create abstract methods, you cannot have a body. For example, if I put a pair of curly braces, once again, I can see the warning in here. Like before, I can finish my sentence with a semicolon. The use of abstract classes is a lot like interfaces, but there are a few slight differences. For example, let's see the first difference. In here, inside my package, I'm going to define a new class. Let's name this one test class. When we wanted to implement some interface, we could have said implements and after that the name of our interface, but when we want to use abstract classes, we can say extends. Let's say extends test abstract class. Right now we are getting the warning again. By pressing Ctrl plus I, we can see the necessary method. So the first difference is between this extends and implement keyword. The other difference is that when you want to use abstract classes, you cannot extend multiple abstract classes. For example, in here, I cannot uh, add a comma and add another abstract class. In another word, abstract classes does not support multiple inheritance. So that's the second difference between an interface and abstract class. The other difference is that inside your abstract class, you can also have non-abstract methods. For example, in here, I can say public, let's say void, let's name this method print. Let's receive something in here. For example, let's say a string text. And because this is not an abstract method, we can have a body for this method. We didn't have this option inside an interface. We can have public non-abstract methods inside an abstract class. 
Like every other class, we can also have fields and maybe a constructor as well. For example, let's say private string name. Let's create a constructor for this class. You can see that all is working well. So the other difference is that you can have fields, constructors and non-abstract fields. If you want to see the use of abstract classes, like before, we can switch to our main class. And in here, I can say test abstract class. Let's name it test abstract class is equal to new test class. The class that extends our test abstract class. After that, we can use the methods. For example, I can say test abstract class dot, let's say print name. In here, we need to provide a name. Let's say Mesa. But we didn't have any functionality inside our test class. Let's quickly uh, define some functionality in here. Also know that I've switched to this test class because we have created a constructor inside our test abstract class. We need to uh, create the constructor in here as well. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to delete all uh, three of these because I just wanted to show that these three options are available inside an abstract class. Let's print something inside our test class inside this print method. Let's just print the name. Let's run the application and let's see if we can see Mesam printed into our console. You can see Mesam has been printed. So once again, you can see that inside our test abstract class, we have this abstract method which does not have any body. Instead, we have uh, extended this class inside our test class and we have declared the functionality inside this test class. You can see that there are a lot of similarities between interfaces and abstract classes. Sometimes the decision for using an abstract class or an interface can be hard. For that, let me show you an Oracle web page in which may help you to decide better. You can see the address in here. Uh, I think if you check this web page, it might be helpful. They say that use abstract classes when your classes are related to each other. Or the other case is that when you think that the class that is going to uh, extend the abstract class may use some common methods or fields or also uh, it may require some access modifiers other than public such as private and protected. Or the other case is that when you want to declare some fields that are non-static and non-final. This option is also not available in interfaces. But they say that use interfaces when uh, your classes are not related to each other. Or in cases that you want to use multiple inheritance. We can see that when we use interfaces, we can implement multiple interfaces. Once again, I suggest you take a look at this web page. It might be useful. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to talk about concurrency and threading in Java. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about concurrency in Java. Concurrency means doing things simultaneously and at the same time. For example, imagine that you are working with your phone and you are reading a book. At the same time, you may want to listen to some music. Simultaneously, you may be downloading some files from internet. This is called concurrency or doing things at the same time in programming. In Java, the first option that we have in order to create a concurrent programming is to create a thread. A thread is a unit of execution in your device's central processing unit or CPU. Basically, different threads come together inside something called a process. All of these processes will be handled by your device's CPU. By default, when you run your Java application or for that matter your Android application, a thread called the main thread will be created. Also, some might call this main thread the UI thread or the user interface thread as well. Later on, if you want to do some background task, for example, downloading a file, you will create a worker thread inside your main thread. The first option in Java that you have in order to create a thread is like this. You can say thread. Let's name this thread is equal to new thread like defining any other Java class. Let's finish our sentence in here. The constructor of this thread requires an interface and that interface is the runnable interface. We can pass that like this. We can say new runnable. You can see that this runnable is an interface. When you pass this runnable interface, this run method will be created. Basically, this run method is the place that you put the code that you want to be handled inside a worker thread. For example, let's print something in here and let's see if we can have a complete application. For example, let's say hello from another thread. 
In order to start this thread, we need to come down after the declaration of our thread and say thread.start. Let's run our application and let's see if we can see any result. You can see that our message has been printed into the console. But how do we see the difference between the main thread and this worker thread? For that, I'm going to write a piece of uh, logic in here. For example, inside this run method, I'm going to create a for loop. Let's say for int i is equal to zero, i less than, let's say five, and i plus plus. Inside this for loop, I'm going to print the value of this i, and after that, I'm going to sleep the thread. We will see how we can sleep the current thread. First of all, let's say print, printing, let's say plus i, plus, let's say in a worker thread. In order to sleep your thread, you have multiple options. The first one, and I believe the easiest one, is to say something like this. You can say thread with capital T dot sleep. Inside the parentheses of this sleep method, you need to pass some numbers in milliseconds. For example, if I want to sleep my thread for one second, I need to pass 1000 milliseconds. This sleep method is going to cause our loop to wait one second for the next record. For example, in here we are going to print zero. After that, we are going to wait one second. And after that, we are going to print one. But right now, as you can see, we are getting a warning in here. And the warning says that unhandled exception, java.lang.interrupted exception. In the previous videos, briefly, we have talked about exceptions. We will talk about them in this video later on. But for now, you just need to know that whenever an exception occurs, your application would crash. So because of that, we need to do something for this uh, error in here. The easiest way to uh, overcome this error in here is to click on the error and press Alt plus insert. After that, select this surround with try catch. You can see that this code has been added and our thread.sleep method has been moved to this try block. Later on, we will talk about this, but for now, let's move on from this part. And let's write the same logic inside our main thread so that we can see that the code inside the worker thread and the main thread can be executed at the same time. So basically, I'm going to copy this for loop. Let's copy it from here and inside the main thread outside of this run method, let's paste it. But in here, I'm just going to uh, change this message to main thread. Let's run the application and let's see if this code is going to work. As you can see, we are printing the value of i two times uh, once in a worker thread and once in the main thread. It means that the code inside the worker thread and the code inside the main thread are happening at the same time. In this situation, we say that our application is asynchronous or it is concurrent. So once again, when you run your Java or Android application, one thread will be created by default in which we call that thread the main thread or the UI thread. After that, inside that main thread, you can create as many worker thread as you want. The simplest way to create a thread is to say thread thread is equal to new thread. And after that, we can pass a new runnable to the constructor of your thread in which we'll create this run method that will be executed in a background thread. But by this way of defining your thread, there are a lot of considerations that you need to be worried about. For example, you need to be worried about canceling your thread when the work is done. Also, there are all sorts of new concepts, for example, thread pools, deadlocks, and uh, interrupting your thread. I do not intend to talk about all of those concepts in here because in Android we have all sorts of options available for handling background tasks. In fact, later on in the course we have a complete section dedicated to handling background tasks in Android. We have options like async task, services, job scheduler, and work manager. We are going to talk about all of them, but more on that in future videos. Okay, now let's talk about this interrupted exception that is happening in here. Basically, whenever an exception occurs, your application will crash and your application will be closed by the operating system. There are all sorts of exceptions that can occur. For example, the ones that we have seen previously, where arithmetic exception, null pointer exception, and the one that we can see in here is interrupted exception. So in order to avoid crashes, you need to do something about the exception. Let's comment all of these and let's see what we can do about the exceptions. Let's create an application in which we'll create an arithmetic exception. In here, I'm going to define two new integers. For example, let's say int a is equal to two and int b is equal to zero. Let's print something in here. Let's say print 
a divided by b. If we run our application right now, we should see an arithmetic exception. You can see that down in here. The thing that we can do about this exception is that to catch it whenever it happens. And we can do that by using a try catch block. Let's quickly see that. For example, I can say try. Let's move this line of code to inside our try block. We can say try this. In case some exception happens, catch that exception. The kind of exception was arithmetic exception. So let's say arithmetic exception. Let's name this exception E. And inside the catch block, we can do something else with our code. For example, we can print something. In this case, let's say B was zero. Now, if we run our application, we wouldn't get an exception. Instead, we are printing this message. Sometimes this message might not be useful. And in fact, in most cases, this message will be useful for debugging purposes, but it's much better than a crash. The kind of exception that we are catching in here is arithmetic exception. If we do not know the kind of exception, we can pass the generic term exception. If we pass this exception, it's going to accept all of the exceptions. If we run our application once again, we should see the same result. And here is the same result. The other kind of exception that we have seen so far was a null pointer exception. That would occur when we do some operation on a null object reference. For example, if we had a string in here, let's say a string name is equal to null. If we do some operation on our name inside the try block, for example, if we say name dot equals, let's say mason, if we do that, we are going to get a null pointer exception because we have done this dot equals method on a null object. Inside the catch block, this time, instead of saying b was zero, let's say name was null. If we run the application, it's going to work fine because we are passing the generic term exception, but we can safely pass null pointer exception. Let's run the application. You can see that name was null. The other kind of exception that we just saw was this interrupted exception. It's going to happen whenever we interrupt the current thread. For example, imagine that inside a worker thread, you are downloading some file. At the same time, you may receive a phone call. If you don't catch the interrupted exception, you may get a crash. We have all sorts of exceptions. For example, we have IO exception, which stands for input output exception. We have class cast exception. We have all sorts of other exceptions in which we are going to talk about them whenever we face them. Also on our exception, we have a useful method for debugging purposes. And that method is called print stack trace. We can say E, the name of our exception, dot print stack trace. We will talk about this stack in future videos when we talk about activities and fragments in Android. But for now, just know that this line of code in here is going to print something into our console that might be useful when you are debugging your application. Let's run the application in here. You can see the stack trace of your exception in here. It says that the exception occurred in line 34, which is this line. And you are also seeing the name of your exception. This is not an actual exception. You are just seeing some information about your exception. This in here might be useful for when you are debugging your application. Okay, I think that's enough talking about concurrency and exceptions in Java. In the next video, we are going to talk about singleton pattern in Java. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about singleton pattern. Basically, we use singleton pattern when we want to make sure that we have only one instance of some class in our entire application. In some cases, we may want such a thing and here is how we can implement that pattern. For example, one case of using singleton pattern is when you are using a database in your application. Don't worry about the databases, we have a complete section dedicated to them, but in here we are just going to create a simple Java class named database. Let's quickly create that inside our source folder, inside our package, and we will see how we can implement that pattern. Let's name this class database. For this database class, I'm going to define a field, let's say private string name. Also, let's create a constructor and also getters and setters. Right now, because we have this public constructor, we can create as many instances as we want from this database class. But if you want to make sure that you have only one instance of this class in your entire application, you can create another field in here. For example, I'm going to say private 
static as the data type of this field i'm going to specify the class that we are in for example in this case i'm going to say database so let's say private static database make sure to import the one that comes from our package or dot make dot singleton pattern for the name of this field it's convention to name it instance and that's it now we can create a getter method for this field and here is how we can create that field we can say public because we are going to use this instance inside this field i'm going to say static the return type of this getter method is going to be the class itself so i'm going to say database let's name this method get instance as you can see uh, the suggestion in here and let's have a body for this method in here instead of just simply passing this instance i'm going to create an if statement i'm going to say if let's say null is equal to our instance if that's the case i'm going to create a new instance i'm going to say instance is equal to new database notice that we need a name for the constructor of this database so i'm going to receive that name via the input of this method in here let's say a string name and later on let's pass this name in here so if our instance is null we are going to create a new instance and after creating that we are going to return it we can say return instance but in the other case in case if our instance is not null in the else case i'm just going to simply return instance right now if we use this get instance method instead of this constructor we are sure that we have only one instance of our database class in our entire application for example if we go to the main class and if we try to instantiate our database we can have only one instance we can say database let's name it database is equal to database with capital d dot get instance of course we need a name in here let's pass a name for example let's say db music notice that because we have declared this get instance method as a static now we can use this database class with this capital d it means that we are not relying on the instance of this database class instead we are using the object itself but right now someone can declare the database class as we did for any other class for example in here someone can say database let's name this one test database is equal to new database because in our database class we have the constructor we can pass a name in here and if we do that we have another instance of this database class for example let's say db movies in order to restrict users from using the constructor i'm going to change the access modifier of this constructor inside my database class i'm going to change this public to private so that this constructor would be available only from inside this class and not from inside uh, any other class like this main class right now we have an error in here and the error says that the constructor is private so by changing the access modifier from public to private now we are restricting others from creating multiple instances of our database class but because our constructor inside our database is private we can use this constructor inside this get instance method as you can see in line 10 in here right now because of this static keyword and also because of this if statement that we have put in here we are sure that we have only one instance of our database class but there is also another point that we need to be worried about and that's when someone tries to create multiple instances of our database from multiple threads in some cases if someone tries to create multiple instances of our class uh, asynchronously they might be successful in doing such a thing in order to make our get instance method thread safe we have an option in here after this static keyword we can add another keyword in which we haven't seen so far we can say synchronized this synchronized keyword will make our get instance method thread safe it means that no more than one thread can call this get instance at the same time so this is the whole singleton pattern first of all you declare a static field of the kind of your class for example in this case database after that you create a get instance method in which is a static once again and also synchronized inside that get instance method you are checking that if the instance of your database is null or not if it is null it means that it's the first time that you are calling this get instance method so you need to create a new instance like we are doing in line 10 after that we are returning the instance but in the else case we are not going to create a new instance we are just going to return the existing instance 
Beside this get instance method in order to uh, restrict others from using the constructor, you need to uh, change the access modifier of your constructor to private so that it would be usable only inside your database class. We can also make this if statement shorter. For example, in here I can delete this whole else case and I can delete this return instance from line 11 in here and after the if statement I can return that instance. So by the time we reach to this line 13 in which we are returning the instance, we are sure that our instance is not null and we are returning either a new instance or the existing instance. Okay, I think that's enough talking about the singleton pattern. Later on in the course, you will see that this pattern might be useful from time to time. Before I finish off this video, I'm going to talk about one more method available in every class in Java. And that method is called toString. Right now, we don't have any toString method inside our database class, but if we switch back to the main class, and if we say print database.toString, you can see that we have such a method, and if we run our application, we should see some information about our database class. Let's quickly run it, and let's see if we can see any result. You can see that we are getting the address of our database class. If you want, you can change this. For example, inside your database class, you can override the toString method. Down in here, inside the scope of our class, we can press Ctrl plus O, and from here, we can select this toString method. Right now we are returning the super statement. If you want to change that, we can delete this whole statement and we can prepare a string in here. For example, we can say a string text is equal to, let's say database class. After that, let's add a line. And after that, let's print the name of our database. Let's say name plus this.name. After creating this text, we can return it. For example, we can say return text. Now that we have overrided this toString method, if we run our application, we should see some other results printed into our console. From time to time, this toString method can be useful as well. It's available in every Java class, and basically it will print some detail about that class. Okay, I think that's enough for this video, and for that matter, I think that's enough talking about Java. Our Java section is done, and hopefully we have learned a lot. In the next video, we are going to have a quick challenge in order to make sure that we have learned everything that we have talked so far. But before I finish off this video, I'm going to say that with Java, you can do a lot of things. For example, besides writing Android applications, you can use Java in order to create desktop applications for Windows, Linux, and macOS operating systems. And also, with the help of a Spring Framework, you can use Java in order to create enterprise web applications. There are much more to Java language. For example, you can use Java in order to create applications for quantum computers. You can also use it for data analysis purposes and literally everything else that you want. In this course, we have touched the surface of Java language, but if you want to know more, I'm currently recording a new course for Java language, and I'm sure that you will find that course helpful. Beside the Java course, I plan to record a complete course for a Spring Framework in order to create web applications. By the time you are watching this video, those courses may be released, so make sure to check them. Okay, I think that's enough. In the next video, as I said, we are going to have a quick challenge. See you in the next video. Here is our final challenge for the Java section. I want you to simulate your phone's contacts and messages applications. Here is how our application is going to work. First of all, we are going to greet the user with some message. After that, we are going to show three options to the user. One for managing the contacts, another one for handling the messages, and another one for quitting the application. In case if the user selects the first option, which is managing the contacts, we are going to show these options. One for showing all of the contacts, another one for adding a new contact, another one for searching for a specific contact, one more for deleting a contact, and the last one is to go back to the previous menu, which was these three options. But in case if the user selects the second option, which is handling messages, we are going to show these three options. The first one is to see a list of all of the messages, the other one is to send a new message, and one last one in order to go back to the previous menu, in which is our initial menu, which has three options. 
In case if the user selects this third option, we are going to quit the application. We haven't talked about databases and permanent data storage, but as a hint, if you want to store contacts and messages, you can use static variables. Okay, pause the video in here and go solve the challenge. After that, come back and let's see my solution for this application. Okay, let's quickly see how can we create this simple application. First of all, I have created my project and I have uh, created this package inside my source folder. Inside this package, I have created this main class in which contains this main method. Let's continue from here. First of all, I'm going to create a new Java class called message. Inside this message class, I'm going to have three fields. Let's say private string text. Another one, let's say private string recipient. This recipient in here is going to be the name of our contact. Also in here, I'm going to define an integer called ID. Let's say private int ID. This ID is not necessary for this application in here, but because in most cases when you are working with databases, you have a column called ID in order to identify every unique message. I want to be as close as I can to a real world application. I just wanted you to see this ID field inside a model in which is a message. Okay, now that we have these three fields, let's quickly create a constructor and let's accept all of these three fields. After that, let's create getters and setters. I'm not sure that we are going to need all of these getters and setters later on. If we didn't use them, uh, we will delete them. Also inside this message class, let's quickly create another method called getDetails. Basically, we are going to print the details of every message. So let's say public void. Let's name it getDetails. Let's say print. First of all, let's say contact name. And let's print the recipient. After that, let's print the text itself. Let's say message plus the text. We also need to add a plus in here. Sorry about that. And I think if we add a backslash n in here, it would be much better. After the text, let's also print the ID. Let's say backslash n ID plus our ID. That's it for our message class. Let's quickly create the contact class as well. New Java class. Let's name this one contact. Inside this contact class, I'm going to have four fields. Let's say private string name, private string number. You may think that this number should be an integer or maybe a long, but because different numbers can have different formats, for example, they can have some parentheses or maybe some hyphens. I'm saving this number as a string, but if you want, you can always use integers or long. After name and number, I'm going to save another field in here. Let's say private string email. And after all of these, I'm going to have another field in here. Let's say private array list of different messages. Let's name this one messages. So basically, I'm going to save different messages for every contact inside an array list. Okay, now that we have our four fields, let's quickly create our constructor. But in here, I'm going to create two constructors. Because at the time of creating a new contact, that contact does not have any messages. For that, I'm going to create another constructor in here, which will not accept an array list of different messages. This time, let's select the first three items. But because if I don't do anything about these messages, this array list will be null. Inside this constructor, I'm going to say this.messages is equal to new array list. So at the time of creating a new contact, I'm saving the messages array list as an empty array list. Okay, now that we have two constructors in here, let's quickly create getters and setters. And also after that, let's create a, a get details method. Let's say public void get details. 
we can also use two string methods but in here i'm just more comfortable with uh, this get details method let's print all of the information about each contact let's say name plus this dot name after that let's print the number and email okay that's it for our contact class let's switch to main class and let's write the logic for our application first of all in here i'm going to create an array list of different contacts but i'm not going to do that inside this main method because we are going to have multiple methods and we need to have access to our contacts array list in different methods for that i'm going to define my array list above in here in the fields of this main class I can say private static because the methods that I'm going to use later on are static methods I need to create this array list as a static so let's say private static array list of different contact let's name it contacts but this is not a good place to initialize our contacts array list because this is not the place that our code will be started we can initialize our contacts array list for example inside this main method but before i do that i'm going to also define a scanner in here because we are going to need the scanner in multiple methods so let's say private static scanner let's name it scanner after that inside the main method let's initialize our contacts array list let's say contacts is equal to new array list as you can see in here i'm going to greet the user with some message let's just print something after that i'm going to show these three different options to the user because i want to have a clean code i'm going to show these three options inside another method let's name that method show initial options but as you can see right now i'm getting a red warning and that's because i need to create this method down in here so let's say private static void show initial options let's print the options in here after that we need to get the user's input and for that we can use the scanner so let's initialize our scanner right now we have declared our scanner above in here but we never initialized it it's a good place to initialize our scanner in here we can say scanner is equal to new scanner let's pass system.in after that we can say int choice is equal to scanner dot next int let's create a switch upon this choice let's say switch on choice in case the choice is one we are going to manage the contacts once again let's do that in another method let's say manage contacts don't worry about this red warning we will create this method later on let's also add a break in here but in case uh, the choice is two, we are going to handle the messages. So let's say manage messages. In case the choice is three or for that matter, any other number, we are going to quit the application. So in here I can say default. In the default case, I'm just going to break out of the application. Let's minimize this project pane for now. And down in here, let's create our two methods first of all let's manage our contacts let's say private static void manage contacts once again in here i'm going to show a list of options so let's print those options once again we need to get the user's input for that we can use the scanner let's say int choice 
is equal to scanner.nextInt. Notice that we are not initializing our scanner in here and that's because we have done that inside this uh, show initial options method. So by this time we have an instance of our scanner. After that once again we need to create a switch on our choice. In case it's one we are going to show all of the contacts. Let's create that method. Show all contacts. And also we need a break. Let's also write the rest of the cases. In the default case, I'm going to go back to the previous menu. So I'm going to once again uh, run this show initial options method so that we can see all of these options once again. So in the default case, I'm going to say show initial options. After that, in here, we need a default as well. I'm saying default in here because I'm going to go back to the previous menu in case if the user enters any other number. Okay, let's create these methods one by one. First of all, let's show a list of all of the contacts. I'm going to do that down in here. Also, instead of writing the declaration of your method, you can use the help of your IDE. For that, you can click on the red arrow in here and by pressing Alt plus insert, the first option is to create this method. You can see that uh, we have created this method successfully. The void is fine for the return type. And down in here, I can create the logic for this method. In order to show a list of all of the contacts, I'm going to simply create a for each loop. Let's say for contact, let's name it C inside our contacts array list. Let's just say C dot get details, the method that we have created inside our contact class. After the for loop, once again, I'm going to show the initial options. For that, I'm going to say show initial options. We are going to quit the application when the user tells us. That's all we need to do inside this method. Let's just minimize it for now. And let's uh, create the second method, which is add new contact. Once again, we can use the help of our IDE. Inside this add new contact method, we are going to receive some user's input. But before that, let's print something. Let's say adding a new contact. After that, let's say please enter the contact's name. Once again, we are going to use our scanner. Let's say a string name is equal to a scanner dot next. After we get the contacts name, we are going to get the contacts number. So once again, let's print something in here. Let's say, please enter a contacts number. Let's say a string number is equal to a scanner dot next. Let's also get the contacts email. A string email is equal to a scanner dot next. After that, we need to make sure that the user enters something as the name, number and email of our contact. And don't just press enter and leave us with empty strings. For that, I'm going to create an if statement in here. Let's say if name.equals an empty string, let's say or if number.equals an empty string or if email is equal to an empty string. If each one of these is true, we are going to show some message to the user. We are going to ask to enter all of the required information. Let's say please enter all of the information. After printing this line of code, I'm going to recall this whole method. I'm going to start from the beginning of this method. For that, I'm going to say add new contact. I'm calling this method from inside the method. This is called a recursive call. You can see the icon at the left side in here. If you hover over that, you can see the recursive call. Calling a method from inside that method. 
So by this way of calling our method, we are starting once again from the beginning of this method. But in the else case, we are going to create our contact object. I'm going to say contact, let's name it contact, is equal to new contact. And after that, I'm going to pass name, number, and email. If you remember, inside our contact class, we had two constructors. And in here, we are using the second constructor. We didn't pass any messages array list to this constructor in here. After creating our contact object, we can say contact our array list dot add. Let's pass our contact. As simple as that, now we have added a new contact. After this if statement, once again, I'm going to show the initial options. So let's say show initial options. Because once again, we are not going to quit the application unless the user tells us so. Okay, we are done with our second method. Let's see what else do we have in here. Let's create this search for contact method. The void is fine for the return type. Inside this method, first of all, we are going to ask for the name of the contact. So let's print something. Let's say, please enter the contact name. Let's say a string name is equal to scanner.next. After that, we need to make sure that we have received a name. So let's say if name dot equals an empty string, we are going to print some message. We are going to uh, ask for the contact name once again. Let's say please enter the name. And after that, once again, we are going to use a recursive call. We are going to say search for contact once again. But in the else case, we are going to search for this contact inside our contact array list. For that, once again, I'm going to create a for each loop. Let's say for contact, let's name it C inside our contacts array list. Let's say if C.getName is equal to the name that we just received. If that's the case, let's print C.getDetails. Let's also define a boolean before this for loop. We will see why I'm defining this boolean. Let's say boolean, let's name it does exist. Let's initialize it to false. In this if statement where we have found the contact, first of all, I'm going to change the value of this does exist to true. Let's say does exist is equal to true. And after the for loop, I'm going to create an if statement. I'm going to say if does exist is not equal to true, then we are going to print something. I'm going to say there is no such contact. After all of these logics, we are going to show the list of options once again. So let's say show initial options. Okay, that's it for our search for contact method. Let's also create this delete contact method. Once again, in here, we are going to ask for the contact's name. So let's say, please enter the name. Like before, let's say a string name is equal to a scanner dot next. Next, we need to create our if statement. If name dot equals an empty string, we are going to ask for the name once again. And we are going to start from the beginning of this method. In the else case, we are going to look into our contacts array list. So let's say for contact C inside our contacts array list. Before I write the logic, let's also define a boolean above in here, like we did for the search for contacts method. Let's say boolean does exist. Let's initialize it to false. So in here, let's say if, I don't know why I said S in here, let's quickly uh, change this one to C. So let's say if C.getName is equal to the name that we have received. If that's the case, first of all, we are going to change the value of this does exist. Let's say does exist is equal to true. After that, we are going to remove this contact from our contacts array list. We can say contacts.remove. 
This remove method requires an object which I'm going to pass C, the object that we are currently looking in this iteration. After the for loop, I'm going to say if does exist is not equal to true, then we are going to say there is no such contact. And after all of these logics, we are going to show the list of all of the initial options. Okay, that's it for this method. Let's minimize this one. So far, we have created the logic for the first option in our initial options. We have created the whole logic for this manage contacts. But right now in the logic for this manage contacts option, we have one or two possible points for multiple bugs. We are going to fix those two and also we are going to write the rest of the logic for this application in the next video. See you in the next video. In the previous video, we have created the logic for this manage contacts option. But if you remember, I said that we have some issues right now with this manage contacts logic. And in this video, first of all, we are going to fix those issues. The first issue is inside this add new contact method. In here, we are adding the contact into our contacts array list. But before that, we need to make sure that we do not have a contact with this name saved on our device. For that, before adding this contact to my contacts array list, I'm going to uh, check that if I have uh, such a contact on my device. So first of all, let's create a boolean in here. Let's say boolean does exist. Let's initialize it to false. After that, I'm going to create a for each loop. Let's say for contact C inside my contacts array list. Let's say if C dot get name is equal to the name that we just received. Inside this if statement, I'm going to change the value of this does exist to true. So let's say does exist is equal to true. After the for loop, I'm going to check that if this does exist is equal to true or not. Let's say if does exist is equal to true, then we are going to print something. We are going to say uh, we have a contact with this name. After that, we are going to start from the beginning of this method. So I'm going to call uh, this add new contact method once again. But in the else case, I'm going to add the contact to my contacts array list. So I'm going to uh, cut this line of code from here and I'm going to paste them inside this else case. Also, after adding the contact to our contacts array list, I'm going to show some message to the user. So let's say name add it successfully. Okay, that's the fix that we needed inside our add new contact method. Let's also change the show all contacts method a little bit as well. So inside this for each loop, after printing the details of a contact, I'm going to print another line. And this line is going to be uh, just a separator that will indicate uh, the difference between different contacts. Nothing special in here. Okay, let's move on and let's create the method that we haven't created in here. This manage messages method. By pressing Alt plus insert, we can create that method. First of all, we are going to show a list of options. So let's print something. After that, we need to receive the user's input. I can say int choice is equal to a scanner dot next int. And let's create our switch statement on this choice. In case it's one, we are going to show a list of all of the messages. So let's say show all messages. We will create that method in a minute. But in here, let's add a break. And let's write the other cases. In case it's two, we are going to send a new message. So let's say send new message. And let's add a break. In the default case, I'm just going to show uh, the initial options. After that, in here, we need a break as well. Okay, let's create this show all messages method. In here, first of all, I'm going to save all of the messages from all of the contacts into an array list. So let's say array list of different messages. Let's name it all messages. 
is equal to new array list. After that, I'm going to create a for each loop for contact C inside my contacts array list. Let's say all messages dot add all. We haven't used this uh, add all method, but in here we are going to do that. I'm going to say C dot get messages. So by using this add all method, we are adding all of the messages of one contact to our all messages array list. After the for loop, I'm going to check that if the size of this all messages is zero or not. So let's say if all messages dot size is greater than zero i'm going to show the details of every message so for that i'm going to create another for each loop in here let's say for message let's name it m inside our all messages array list let's print m dot get details and after that let's also print some separator but in the else case i'm going to say that you do not have any message after everything after the if statement i'm going to show the initial options okay that's it for this show all messages method let's also create the other method which is uh, send a new message in here first of all i'm going to get the contact or recipient's name so let's ask the user that let's say who are you going to send the message after that we need to get the name of our contact so i can say a string name is equal to scanner.next after that we need to check that if this name is empty or not for that i can say if name.equals an empty string we are going to ask the user to enter a name so let's say please enter the name of the contact after that we are going to have a recursive call so in here i'm going to say send new message but in the else case I'm going to check that if we have such a contact in our contacts array list. For that, I'm going to define a boolean in here. Boolean does exist is equal to false. After that, I'm going to create a for each loop. Let's say for contact C inside our contacts array list. If C dot get name dot equals the name that we just received. Let's say does exist is equal to true after the for loop i'm going to check that if does exist is equal to true or not first of all let's write the else case in the else case i'm going to say there is no such contact but inside the if block uh, if we do have such a contact we are going to ask for the message itself so let's say what are you going to say let's say a string text is equal to scanner.next after that we need to make sure that this text is empty or not let's say if text equals an empty string if that's the case let's say please enter some message and after that we are going to start from the beginning of this method so let's say send new message which once again is a recursive call but in the else case we are going to create our message object and after that we are going to add it to the contact that exists in our contacts array list but if you remember inside our message class we had a field called id basically whenever you are receiving these messages from a database or maybe a web server this id is unique to every message in here i'm trying to be as close as i can uh, to a real world application so I'm going to make this ID unique. In order to have a unique ID for every message, I'm going to define a field above in here inside my main class. I'm talking about here. And after that, we will increment the number of this ID by one every time that we create a new message. For that, I'm going to say private static integer. Let's name this one ID and let's also initialize it to zero after that down in here when we create our message object inside this else case down in here i can say id plus plus so because this id is a static integer whenever we increment its value it's going to be unique for every message so right now we have the name of our recipient which we have received above in here 
and also we have the message body which is this text and also we have generated this id which is unique these are the three things that we need in order to create our message object i can say message let's name it new message is equal to new message we need the text after that we need the recipient which is name and after that we need the id next i need to find the proper contact to add this message to his or her array list of different messages for that i'm going to create a for loop let's say for contact c inside our contacts array list let's say if c dot get name is equal to uh, the name that we received if that's the case first of all we need to get the array list of different messages of this contact for that i can say array list of messages let's call this array list new messages is equal to c dot get messages after that we need to add this new message to this new messages array list so let's say new messages dot add new message sorry i have used this add all method i need to remove this all after that we are going to save the current contact that we are looking into because later on we are going to remove this contact from our contacts array list and we are going to update his or her array list of messages and after that we are going to add it once again to our contacts array list so for that i can say contact let's name it current contact is equal to c next we need to say current contact dot set messages and we need to pass our new messages array list after that it's time to remove the c from our contacts array list we can say contacts dot remove and we can pass the c object now that we have removed the previous contact we can add the new one by saying contacts dot add let's say current contact so this way we have added this new message to our specific contact and we have updated our contacts array list okay that's the entire logic that we need in order to add a new message just after everything after we are done with this method we need to show the initial options once again let's minimize this method and let's see what else do we have I think we have covered everything and we are ready to uh, test our application so let's run the application in here we are seeing the greeting message which is fine after that we are seeing the initial list of options if we select one we can see the options for managing different contacts right now we do not have any contact in our array list so if we select one you can see that we are not seeing anything it's better to print some message in here in case if we do not have any contact in our phone for example that says uh, you do not have any contact on your device but we will write that later on uh, for now let's just see the other options once again let's select manage contacts this time let's try to add a new contact you can see that the console is waiting for a name let's say mesam the console is waiting for a number let's add some number after that we need to provide some email let's say mesam at gmail.com and as you can see mesam added successfully if you want to make sure of that once again you can check uh, the list of all of your contacts by saying show all contacts and in here you can see the details of mesam let's also add another contact let's say sarah this time let's add a random number after that an email this time let's try searching for a new contact so in here if i say three you can see that the console is waiting for the name of our contact let's type brad in here you can see that we are seeing this uh, message there is no such contact in your phone once again let's try searching for a contact this time let's try sarah you can see that we are seeing the details about sarah let's also try removing one of the contacts let's say four in order to delete a contact let's say mesam 
in here we are not seeing any message indicating if that we have deleted uh, Maysam successfully or not but if we check the list of our contacts uh, we should see only Sarah and as you can see we have only Sarah in our contacts list let's also try this go back as well so let's say uh, manage contacts once again this time if I put any number beside 1 through 4 for example if I say 6 you can see that we are going back to the main menu also let's try adding a new contact with uh, empty values sorry about that I need to go back and select one let's say two in order to add a new contact uh, let's don't provide anything for the name you can see that the scanner is waiting for some input but even if the scanner moves to the next line we have write the logic in order to prevent adding an empty contact okay that's good let's add mason once again let's add some number and some email let's see what do we have inside the messages option in order to see a list of all of the messages let's press one you can see this message you don't have any message once again let's go to the messages option i've entered two in here and let's try sending a new message who are you going to send a message let's say sarah what are you going to say let's say hello it seems like we are getting a crash and the crash happened because of this exception concurrent modification exception okay let's take a deeper look into our code and uh, let's debug our application for the first time it seems like the exception occurred when we tried to add the new message also you can see the line 99 in here if you click on that you will be navigated to that line Yes, uh, we have this exception inside the add new message or send new message inside this for loop. I think the error in here is happening because first of all we are using this C to assign a new value to this current contact and immediately after that we are trying to remove this contact from our contacts array list. So this caused the concurrent modification exception if you want to get over that exception you can simplify this if statement for example in here i'm going to delete all these three lines of code so by this point we have uh, this new messages array list we have added our new message to this array list and after that in order to update the array list inside this contact i can say c dot set messages and i can pass my new messages array list so no need for removing and uh, adding a new contact into our array list concurrently. Let's run the application once again and let's see if we are seeing the exception once again. First of all, we need to add a contact. So let's say manage contact, add a new contact. Let's provide a name, a number. After that, some email and now we can send a new message let's say messages send a new message who are you going to send a message let's say Maysam. what are you going to say after this line of code we got the exception let's say hello and this time uh, it seems like we have added or we have sent a new message if you want to make sure of that you can uh, go to the messages option and you can show the list of all of your messages you can see that we have one message in which we have sent it to Mesa. Okay, that seems better. Once again, let's go to this messages option and let's try uh, going back to the main menu. So if I type three or any other number beside this one and two, we should go back to the main menu. For example, let's say four. And as you can see, we are seeing the initial options. For the last thing, let's try quitting our application. And as you can see, we have created the application successfully. Let's just uh, fix the few errors that we had uh, in the show all contacts method. If you remember, I said that we are going to uh, show some message in case if we don't have any contact in our array list. So for that, first of all, I'm going to check that if we do have any contact. For that, I'm going to say if contacts.size is greater than zero, First of all, let's write the else case. 
in the else case, I'm just going to print, you do not have any contact. But in the if block, we are going to do the same thing that uh, we were doing previously. Let's run the application one more time in order to see that uh, these changes were effective or not. So right now, we do not have any contact in our contacts array list. Also, you may be wondering why we are losing the contacts that we are keep adding into our application. That's because we are not using any permanent data storage like a database. We are using a static array list and that array list will be cleared when we close our application. For that reason, all of the contacts are being removed whenever we stop the application. So let's say manage contacts and let's say show all contacts. You can see the message in here. You do not have any contacts, but it's better to show the list of initial options once again after we print this line of code. So down in here, after this um, print statement, let's say show initial options. Okay, this was the last video of this section and this was my solution for this challenge. Your solution is probably different than me and that's okay because there are multiple ways of creating the same application. Hopefully you have practiced and learned everything that we have talked about in this section. In the next section of the course, we are going to switch back to Android Studio and we are going to talk about user interface and how we can design a beautiful layout for our application. See you in the next section. What's up everyone, I hope you are having fun. Before we start our talk about user interface, I just wanted to remind you that there is an extended version of this course that you can watch. By enrolling in the extended course, you will have lifetime access to more than 60 hours of videos. You can ask your questions directly from me and I will come back to you within hours. You will have access to all of the source codes that I write in the videos and also you can have access to all of the new videos that I upload. Just check out makecode.org for more details about the course and don't forget to use free code camp as the coupon code to get 20% discount. If you want to get serious in Android app development, taking the extended course is almost a necessity. Okay everyone, I just wanted to remind you that there is an extended version of this course that you can take. Without further ado, let's start our talk about user interface. Have fun learning! Hello everyone and welcome back. This is the user interface section of our course and we are going to talk about a lot of concepts and tools that we have related to user interface. We are going to talk about a lot of UI elements and their attributes. We are going to talk about different kind of event listeners, for example, click listeners on different UI elements. We will talk about how can we create applications that is compatible with different screen sizes and also different languages. Beside that, we will also talk about material design and all sorts of stuff in this section of the course. Without further ado, let's jump into our project and let's implement some UI elements. As you can see, I'm no longer using IntelliJ IDE and I've switched to Android Studio. We needed IntelliJ IDE for the Java section of the course, but in here we can uh, switch back to Android Studio. Just in case if you forget how to create a new project in Android Studio, I'm going to start from scratch. Let's say start a new Android Studio project. In here we needed to select a template. If you remember, I said that these templates are some applications written to some level. Later on in the course, specifically after we talked about activities, we will see that how can we create all of these from scratch. But for now, let's just select this empty activity. After that, in here, we needed to name our project. For example, for this application, I'm going to say UI Basics. I'm going to stay with this package name. I think it's fine. We needed a save location. Once again, the default is fine. And for the language, I'm going to say Java. For the minimum API level, as I said in previous videos, in the most videos for this course, I'm going to stay with API level 19. After selecting all of these, let's just uh, create our project by clicking on this finish button down in here. It seems like our project has been created successfully. Now that we know about Java, let's have another look at this class that we have created in here. But before that, let's minimize this run pane. As you can see, this is a Java class in our package. 
you can see that it's a class called main activity this class is extending the app compat activity whatever that is inside this class we have this onCreate method which is overrided you can guess it probably because of this app compat activity and also above in here we have some imports right now we are importing this app compat activity and also this bundle don't worry about these we will talk about them later on in the course but for now you can see the general syntax of a simple java class in here as well if you remember i said that when you create an activity a java class and also a xml file will be created the java part is responsible for the behavior of your application for example in your layout file you may receive the user's input in the java file you may decide to what to do with the user's input hopefully now that we know about java we can understand all of these much better this onCreate method is a part of something called the activity life cycle we will talk about that in future videos but for now just know that this onCreate method is somehow like the main method inside a simple java application this is the start point of every activity and right now because our application has only one activity this is the start point of our entire application so this line 13 in here would be the start point of our code you can see this super statement in here once again it means that do whatever you are doing inside the parent class in this case the parent class is this app compat activity for the time being we are not concerned about that but as you can see we are passing this save instance state which is a bundle to this super statement later on we will talk about that also it's important to know that inside activities you have some inner methods we didn't have this option in java for example you can see this set content view method you don't see the declaration of this method anywhere inside this class but you can see that by using it you are not getting any red warning similar to this set content view we have a lot of other inner methods inside an activity we will talk about them later on in the course okay let's move on from this part and let's start working on our user interface i just wanted to have another look at our application and specifically this java file now that we know about java okay let's close this java file and let's start talking about this activity main.xml file if you remember in the first videos of this course i said that xml is a markup language once again if you are a web developer you know the concept of markup languages those are just helpful for defining some elements that are going to be shown to the user before everything let's quickly locate this file in our project right now we are inside the android view and if you want to find this activity main.xml file you can come to this resources folder down in here inside the layout folder you can see the file and if you switch to project view you can go to your application folder inside the app folder inside the source folder you have this main folder and in here you have the resources folder once again inside the layout file you have this activity main.xml file okay let's switch back to android view and let's minimize this project pane for now if you remember from the previous videos of this course i said that uh, whenever you want to define a layout file you have two options first of all you can use this design view for example by uh, dragging some items into your design view you can have uh, different elements and later on you can define some attributes for your elements this is one way but the other way is to switch to text view and manually type everything that you need in my opinion when you are an android developer most of the times you are going to work with uh, the text view so in here we are going to start from this text view first of all if you are not seeing this uh, preview in here you can always enable it and disable it from this uh, preview option in here if you have a low memory ram my suggestion is to uh, disable this preview because it's going to render the layout file in real time and that's going to load a lot of pressures on your uh, device's memory ram and also cpu for that if you have low memory ram uh, disable this preview it will speed everything up right now inside this simple layout file we have this text view you can see that when i click on this text view 
this text view inside our XML file has been highlighted. It means that these are the same. I'm going to delete this text view for now. Let's select all of it and let's press delete. The next thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to change this constraint layout. In future videos, we will talk about what a constraint layout is. But for now, for a starter, I think it's better to start with relative layout. Let's select that. Also, if you have noticed, you can see that uh, when we have changed the opening tag in here to relative layout, the closing tag has been changed to relative layout as well. Inside these opening and closing tags, I can have different uh, UI elements. For example, if I want to define a text view, I can open an anchor bracket and by typing text view in capital T, we have a list of options. Let's select the first one, text view. Immediately after pressing enter, we are getting some attributes. So for every UI elements, you need at least two attributes, a width and also a height. The values for these two attributes can be some numbers, but alternatively, you can see that we have other options in here as well. We will talk about this mesh part and wrap content in a minute, but for now, let's just select wrap content. Basically, it's going to wrap the content of this text view. For the height, let's also select wrap content. If you want, you can finish creating your text view by adding a slash in here. And that's it. You can have a text view, but if you want to have uh, more attributes, you have a lot of options. For example, before this slash, I'm going to say, let's say text. You can see that we are getting a suggestion and read column text. Let's select that. And in here, I can pass a text. For example, let's say hello world. As soon as I type this, you can see the text in the preview as well. So text is one of the attributes of this text view. Let's talk about the other attributes one by one. For example, right now this text is at the corner of my screen. I don't like this. I'm going to change the position of this text view to the middle of this line. For that, I have multiple options. First of all, I can add some margin in which we'll add a space between this text view and the edge of the screen. For example, I can say margin and I can pass 50, for example, 50 dp. dp is the unit when you are working with your layout files. You can see that we have some margin, but we can be more specific. For example, we can say margin top, margin left, margin right, and also margin bottom. For example, I can say margin left, let's say 100 dp this time. Margins are extremely useful, but in here they are not going to help us. Because this is not accurate, uh, we want our text view to be exactly in the center of our line. For that, instead of using a margin, I have a better option. I can say uh, center horizontal in order to center my text view horizontally. As you can see, I can pass true or false in here. Let's pass true. And this time, uh, the text view has been centered horizontally. If you want, you can also center it vertically by saying uh, center vertical and passing a value of true. You can see that it has been centered both uh, horizontally and vertically. Beside these two, you also have another option. For example, in this case, I'm going to delete both of these attributes. Instead, I'm going to say center in parent, this one down in here. Let's pass true as the value of this attribute. This center in parent is going to center our element inside its parent element. An XML file is like a tree. We have these child elements and above them we have the parent elements. For example, in this case, the parent element is a relative layout. If we want, we can have another relative layout in here or maybe some other UI elements. And inside that element, we can have this text view. We can do this kind of inheritance as many times as we want. So in this case, the text view is our child element and this relative layout is our parent element. And when we use this center in parent uh, attribute, it's going to center our text view uh, in its parent element. Okay, let's move on from this part. If you want, you can also increase the size of your text. For that, you can say text size, this attribute in here and you can pass a number. For example, you can say 20 SP. When you are working with the size of your fonts, uh, the unit is SP. 
you can see that it's larger now also if you want you can have some styles on this text as well for that we can say text style this attribute you can see three styles bold italic and normal for example let's pass bold if you want your attribute to be both bold and italic you can add a pipeline in here and after that you can say italic this time you can see both of these attributes in the same element if you want you can also change the color of your text for that we can say text color and we can pass a color but that color should be defined inside another XML file called uh, color. Right now we have three colors, this color accent, color primary, and color primary dark. Basically these are the names of some colors. Let's select the first one. And as you can see, the color has been changed successfully. But where does this uh, color.xml file locates in our project? Well, if you want to take a look at that, uh, you can open the project pane inside the resources folder inside the values folder we have this colors.xml you can see that we have some colors in here uh, with the exact name that we just saw don't worry about this uh, we are going to talk about different kind of xml files in future videos but for now i just wanted you to see this xml file so instead of passing a color from inside the uh, color.xml file you can also pass the hexadecimal value of that color for that, you can search the internet for something like HTML color picker. Let's search that. Uh, for example, let's select a green color in here. Uh, this one maybe. And in here, you can see the hexadecimal value. Let's copy that. And instead of passing a color from inside our color.xml file, I'm going to paste the value of that color. You can see that the color of the text view has been changed to the color that we just selected. If you remember from the previous videos of this course, we have seen that uh, when we wanted to have access to all of these UI elements inside our Java file, we needed an ID. Let's add an ID attribute for this text view as well. Let's say ID. The convention is to say add plus ID slash. Let's select that and let's define some ID. Let's say txt welcome. The ID attribute should be unique inside every XML file. It means that two different elements inside the same XML file cannot have the same ID. Later on, we will use this ID in our Java file in order to have access to this text view. There are much more attributes to text views, but I think if we continue, we are going to get bored. For that, I'm going to move on from this text view and I'm going to define a button after this text view. For that, once again, I can open an anchor bracket and in here I can say button with this capital B. Let's select the first option. Once again, we have these two mandatory uh, attributes. And in here, let's talk about the difference between this wrap content and match parent. Right now, if I select match parent, let's also select match parent for this height. You can see that this button is uh, covering all of the screen and that's because we have set the width and height to match parent. If you want, you can change this height, for example, to wrap content. And here you can see the difference. The width is matching the parent, but the height is uh, wrapping the button's content. Let's also change the width to wrap content. Beside wrap content and match parent, you can always uh, pass the values manually. For example, I can say 150 dp. You can see that the width has been changed. But this is highly discouraged because our application is going to be installed on devices with uh, different screen sizes. Sometimes if we put some numbers for this, if we pass the values manually, we may not know the exact position of every element. And also sometimes our elements might not fit in the screen in some devices. So for that matter, I'm going to change this one to wrap content in here. Also, now that I have talked about different screen sizes, I'm going to say that in here inside this preview, you have this option called devices for preview. If you click on that, you can see a drop down. And from here, you can select different screen sizes. For example, let's select this one. And you can check uh, the looks of your application in different screen sizes. For example, let's check a tablet. 
you can see that it's somehow different. Don't worry about this. Uh, later on in the course, we are going to cover how we can uh, have a consistent look for our application in different screen sizes. I just wanted to mention this option above in here. Like for the text view, we have a text option for the button as well. Let's say text and let's say say hello. Similarly, we have the option to add some margins, but I'm not going to do that right now. Instead, I'm going to move this button to below this text view. For that, we have uh, an attribute called below, this one in here, layout below, and we need to pass the ID of the other element. For example, in this case, we need to pass the ID of this text view. I can say add plus ID slash, and I can say txt welcome. You can see that the button has been moved to below this text view. But this is not entirely what we want. Uh, we also need to center it horizontally. For that, once again, we can say center horizontal and we can pass through. Let's also add a margin top. Let's say margin top. And let's pass, for example, 15 dp. That's much better. For both of this text view and button, you have another attribute called background. Let's also see that. We can say background and for example we can pass a color let's pass the first color you can see that the background color of this button has been changed somehow you have the same option for the text view if you want you can apply that i think this is an ugly color so i'm going to change that let's see the other colors let's select this primary dark nope this is not my color Okay, this is better. You can always add the hexadecimal value of the color that you want in here as well. For different UI elements, we also have another attribute called onClick. We have seen the use of this onClick when we have created our first Android application. You can guess it, we are going to set an event listener for this button and we are going to say what happens when we click on this button. So let's say onClick and let's pass the name of some method. For example, I'm going to say on uh, hello btn clicked. Right now you can see that we are getting this red warning and that's because we need to create this method inside our Java file. Let's finish creating our button by using this slash and let's create this method inside our main activity.java file. So let's open that file. In order to open some files, I can always uh, switch to this project pane. Or alternatively, I can press the shift key two times. You can see that when I do that, I have a, a search menu. For example, in here, I can search for main activity. And if I press enter on the first option, we can open our main activity.java file. This is just a, a helpful shortcut that we can use from time to time. Okay, we need to create the onClick method inside the scope of our class and outside of the scope of this onCreate method. If you remember the signature of that method, it was something like this. We needed to set the access modifier to public. The return type uh, was void. The name of the method is going to be exactly the name that we have passed in our XML file. Let's say on hello btn clicked. For the inputs of this method, if you remember, we had a view object with capital V. This view object is not important right now. We just need to know that uh, we need to receive it as the input of this method. Let's pass view as the name of this input. And in here we can have the logic to handle the click listener on our button. Also, if you have noticed when I added this view, a new import has been added above in here. Let's also minimize this import for now. This is one way of creating event listeners for buttons and also for that matter for different UI elements. We have other options in which may be more useful from time to time. We will take a look at them in a minute, but in here let's quickly uh, write some logic. For example, in here I'm going to change the text of my text view. For that, first of all, I need to have access to my text view. I can say text view. If you take a look at your imports, you will see that uh, this text view from the widget package has been added to our class. If you remember, I said that equivalent to every UI element, you have a class in Java. 
Okay, let's name this text view txt welcome and let's initialize it. We can initialize it like this. We can say find view by ID like this set content view method. This find view by ID is also another inner method inside every activity. Right now, this find view by ID method is waiting for some integer and the integer is going to be the ID of our element. And here is how we can pass our ID. For example, we can say r.id. Once again, if you remember, I said that this r in here stands for resources. It's a special class in Java and it will give us the access to all of the static contents in our project. So in here I can say r.id. Let's pass the ID of our text here, which was txt welcome, I believe. Now that we have access to this txt welcome, we can do some operation on that. For example, I can say txt welcome dot set text. We have seen this method previously and inside this method I can pass a text. Let's say hello again. Let's run the application and let's see if we can change the text of this text view. I'm going to run the application on Pixel 3 API level 29. You can select whichever device that you want. Okay, right now we can see the layout that we have created so far, which is honestly ugly, but don't worry about that. We are going to work on, on our designing power. If I click on this button, you can expect what would happen. We are going to change the text from uh, hello world to hello again. Okay, there was nothing special uh, in this video. I just wanted you to have another look at what we have done in the first section of this course which was to create your first Android application. I just wanted you to have a better understanding on uh, what you have done in that video. Also, we have learned about some other attributes in here as well. Okay, in the next video, we are going to continue our talk on different UI elements. For example, we will talk about edit texts. And also, we will talk about different ways that we can implement uh, an on-click listener for our button. Okay, see you in the next video. In the previous video, we have seen one way of creating an on-click listener for our button. There are two more ways and in here we are going to see them. For example, in our layout file, let's quickly create a button. But before that, I'm going to change this constraint layout to a relative layout. Let's delete this text and let's create a button. Let's say wrap content and wrap content for the width and height. Let's give it a text. For example, let's say, say hello once again. Let's say centering parent and let's pass through. We have seen these in the previous video, so I'm not going to discuss them. Also, we are going to need an ID. Let's say btn hello. You can pass whatever you want. So in the previous video, when we wanted to create an onclick listener, we would have add this onclick attribute. In here, we needed to pass the name of the equivalent method inside our Java file. But in this case, I'm going to use another approach and for that, I'm going to delete this attribute. Okay, let's switch back to our Java file and let's define this button. Inside my onCreate method, I'm going to say button. Let's name it btn hello is equal to find view by ID. Let's say r.id dot btn hello for setting an onclick listener for your button you can use the equivalent method you can say btn hello dot set onclick listener you can see that we have this method inside the parentheses we need to pass an interface in this case it can be new view dot onclick listener if you take a closer look you can see that this is an interface Okay, now that I have passed this new interface in here, this onClick method has been overrided. And inside this onClick method, I can uh, write my code. For example, if I want to print something into my console, I can say print. Uh, let's just say hello. Let's run the application and let's see if we can see any result. I have opened this run panel in here and if I click on this say hello button, you can see that hello is being printed in here. So this way, by using uh, this set onClickListener method on our button, we can define the onClickListener.
Inside the parentheses of this method, we have passed this new view.onClickListener method, but there is also another way. Let's quickly see that. So instead of passing a new interface in here, I'm going to implement uh, this exact interface in the declaration of my class. If you remember from the Java session, we can implement interfaces like this. We can say implement, let's say on click listener. There are two options in here. The first one is coming from android.view.view package and the next one is from another one. We need the first one. When we implement interfaces, we also need to implement the methods. We can do that by pressing Ctrl plus I. We need to implement this onClick method. As the input of this onClick method, we are getting a view object. And now we can use this view in order to create different cases. For example, we can say switch on view or v in this case, it's his name. Let's say dot get id. We are going to create our switch depending on the ID of this view object. And after that, I can say case, in case it's r.id.btn hello, the exact ID that we have passed in here. In case this is the ID, let's write some code. For example, I'm going to copy this line of code from here. Let's also add a break and also a default case. Now that I have implemented this method at the declaration of my class and also I've implemented this onClick method, I can remove this uh, btn hello dot set onclick listener method and let's write it once again. Let's say btn hello dot set onclick listener. This time instead of saying new view dot onclick listener, I can say this. If you remember from the Java session, this refers to the current object. Right now we are inside this class which implements this interface. So this method down in here is happy with accepting this as the input. So how is the flow of things in here? First of all, we are setting the onclick listener and we are passing the class itself as the interface. Whenever the user clicks on this button, this onclick method will be triggered. A view will be passed to this method. In this case, it's a button. Later on, we will talk about that, why a view and a button are equivalent. We are getting the ID of this view and we are creating a switch statement. In case the ID of this view is r.id.btn hello, the ID of our button, we are printing this hello in here. If we had other buttons or for that matter, other views, we can create different cases for them in here as well. Let's run the application once again and let's see if we can see the same result. Once again, if I click on this say hello button, we can see that hello has been printed into our run console. Also, I don't like to come down in here inside this run in order to test my application. Instead, I'm going to show something to the user in our application. For that, instead of using this system.out.print line, I'm going to use another option called toast messages. Let's search for toast messages and let's see what those are like. So basically a toast message is something like this. This is not a permanent message and it will be disappear after a period of time. Let's quickly see that how can we define this in our code. So in here I'm going to delete this line of code. Instead I'm going to say toast. You can see that I have two options in here. The first one is a Java class, but the second one is a template. Basically, templates are provided by the IDE that we are using. For example, in here, if I select this template, you can see that this whole line of code has been created. So we are using this toast class in which has this static method. Inside this static method, we are passing a context, whatever that is. We will talk about context later on in the course, but for now. So we are using this toast class in which has this static method called make text. We have three inputs for this make text method. The first is a context. Uh, don't worry about the context yet. We will talk about that later on in the course, but for now, just know that every activity in Android is a context. And because right now we are inside an activity, we can pass this as our context. The next input is a text. Basically, this is going to be the text that we are going to show. For example, let's say, hello button clicked. 
after that we have this uh, constant in here which is toast.length short basically this is just a, a constant for determining how long do we want our toast message for example if you want to see the other time periods uh, you can say dot we have length long and length short let's select uh, length short and after this make text method we have this dot show method which you can guess is going to show our toast message so before this we have created our toast message and after that uh, with the help of this show method we are uh, showing it to the user in here we have used the template but if you don't want to use the template you can always create your own toast message you can say toast this time let's select the first one let's say make text for the context let's pass this we need the text in here let's say second text and after that we need a constant let's say toast dot length long dot show basically these two lines of code are the same uh, we just can create them with the help of the ide okay this time let's run the application and let's see what would be the result so this time if we click on this say hello button you can see that some toast message is uh, showing down in our screen and after that it will be disappeared i think toast messages is much better for our testing purposes it's much better than this run pane down in here okay let's close the application in here and let's talk about this view that we are receiving in here in a logical way instead of this view we need to receive a button because we are uh, creating our switch statement based on the id of our button but there is a point in here if you press down the control key and if you click on this button class once again if you press down the control key and if you uh, click on the class that this button is extending in this case this text view you can see that this text view class is extending the view class it means that after uh, two times of inheritance, our button is somehow a view. We just extended the view class two times. So at the end, a button is a view. If you remember from the Java session, when we have talked about inheritance, for example, when we extended the animal class and we created our dog class, we said that a dog is an animal. In this case, a button is also a view. For that matter, every UI element is a view, like text views, edit text, and also other UI elements that uh, we will talk about later on in the course. So this in here proves that we can create an onclick listener for our text view and other UI elements as well. So this onclick method is not limited to our button. It's also worth mentioning that when you create your onclick listener this way by implementing the interface in your class declaration, you just need to create one onclick method for all of your UI elements. For example, if I had another method down in here, I could have passed uh, the ID of that button to another case. And inside that case, I could have uh, write my logic. So I can have as many methods and uh, for that matter, as many onclick listeners for my view elements. Also, this onclick listener is one of the available event listeners. We have others as well. If you want, you can take a look at them by saying btn hello dot set. Let's say set listener. And you can see a lot of these options. We have on click listener. We have on drag listener. You can guess the meaning of each one of these. We have set on hover listener in case if we hover over our button. We also have another useful one uh, on long click listener. It means that if we long press on a button, let's quickly see this one. This time, instead of implementing the on long click listener in my uh, class declaration, I'm going to use the easier way by saying new view dot on long click listener. This one. You can see that in here we have a boolean as the return type of this on long click method. This boolean is just a callback indicating if uh, we have long pressed our button. If you want your uh, code inside this method to work fine, you need to pass through. Let's write some logic in here. For example, I'm going to say toast. Once again, we can see this context in here, but the format is somehow different. Because right now we are inside an interface, we are inside this online click listener interface. 
If we pass this, this will refer to the current object, which in this case is an interface. But interfaces are not context and uh, we need to pass our activity. For that matter, we can say main activity dot this. Don't worry about this main activity dot this if you didn't get that. I will talk about that later on in the course when we have talked about activities. But for now, just uh, let's pass this as our context and let's create a text. Let's also change the time period in here to length long. I think I need to delete this case from here as well. Okay, let's run the application. So like before, if I click on this button, and you can see that we are seeing this message, hello button clicked, which is a simple unclick listener for our button. But if I press my button and hold the key, you can see that we are seeing this long press message. So this time, instead of this onClick, we have uh, executed this set on long click listener method. You can also check the other event listeners for your view items. Later on in the course, we will check uh, a few more of them. But in general, you can say btn hello dot set listener. And you can use each one of these that you want. OK, let's move on from the event listeners. And let's define another UI element in our layout file. Before this button, I'm going to define uh, an edit text. Let's say edit text. For the width, let's say match parent this time. And for the height, let's say wrap content. You can see that it's something like this. If you click on that, this is our edit text. Let's also add a text in here. Uh, let's say name. And name has been added. That seems to be better. Let's also center our edit text. I'm going to say uh, center in parent and I'm going to pass through. But right now we have a conflict between this edit text and our button. For that, I'm going to move this button to below this edit text. But before that, I need to give an ID to this edit text. Let's say ID. Let's just name it edit text name. Let's finish creating this edit text. And down in here, inside our button element, I can say below or to be specific layout below and I can pass the ID of my edit text. Before that, I need this add plus ID slash, let's say edit text name. So this way we have moved this button to below our edit text. I think it's better to have some margins, let's say margin top and let's pass 20 dp. That seems better. Okay, let's switch back to our edit text. I don't like the text inside my edit text because if I run the application and if I try to type something in here, first of all, I need to delete this text. For that, instead of this text attribute, I'm going to use another attribute called hint. I think we have hint uh, at the first videos of this course. Let's just pass name. This time it's much better. So whenever I click on this edit text and uh, if I try to type something, this name hint will be disappeared. Also, if we want to decrease the width of our edit text, we can uh, pass a number in here. For example, we can say 250 dp, which is better in this case. But if you remember, I said that it's never a good idea to pass your width and height manually because in different screen sizes, you cannot predict the size of your different elements. For that, once again, I'm going to change this font to match parent, I believe it was. And after that, down in here, I'm going to add two margins. Let's say margin left to 50 dp, for example. I think it's better to change it to 100. And also, let's add a margin right of 100. Adding different margins is one way, but we also have another way. Let's quickly see that as well. So I'm going to delete both of these margins. Instead, uh, at the declaration of my relative layout inside the opening tag, as you can see, this is our uh, closing tag and uh, this is our opening tag. Inside the opening tag, I can define an attribute called padding. Once again, like margins, uh, we have multiple paddings. We have padding bottom, padding left, right, top. Let's just use padding in here and let's pass 100 dp. So as you can see, the size of our edit text has been changed. The padding and the margin are a lot like each other, just there is one difference. When you are adding a margin, for example, in the previous case uh, for our edit text, the margin would be added uh, from the end of our element, for example, from here to the end of our screen. 
But when you are adding a padding, that padding will add some space from inside your element. For example, in this case, the element is this relative layout itself, and we have added the padding from inside the relative layout. So once again, margin adds the space from the outside of the element, but the padding will add the space from the inside of the element. You can use both of them depending on your need. Let's see what other attributes do we have for our edit text. Like a text view, we can change the color for this edit text as well. For example, I can say text color and let's pass uh, this color that we have in our color resources. Right now, we do not have any text inside our edit text, but as soon as we type something, the color will be changed to this color that we can see in here. We can also style the text by saying uh, text style this one. We can say italic, bold, normal, or if we want to use uh, two styles at the same time, we can add a pipeline. There is another attribute that we didn't have in text views, and that's called lines. For example, there are times that you may need a bigger input from the user. You can specify the number of lines in here. For example, if I say uh, four, for example, now our edit text is going to accept four lines of inputs. In this case, I'm not going to use these lines, so I'm just going to delete that. The default number for different lines is one. With edit text, you can also define the kind of input that you are going to receive. For that, you can say input type, this one, and you can pass one of these. For example, if it's a date that I'm going to receive, I can pass a date or maybe this date time. If I'm going to receive a number password, I can pass this number password. If it's just a simple text, I can pass this text. We have other options, for example, for different emails and all sorts of options that you can see in here. For example, if I select this text password in here, and if I add some text instead of this hint, let's say text, you can see that when I type the text, it will change it to these dots. Probably you have seen this on your phone when you are trying to log into some application or some website. This will add some level of security. Also, when you define it to email, this text email address, when the user clicks on your edit text, the keyword will be prepared to uh, type the email address. I'm not going to define any specific type of input, so I'm going to delete this one in here as well. And let's also change this one to hint. Okay, I think that's enough about edit text. We have all sorts of different options in which you can check them uh, from here. As you can see, there are a thousand of these attributes. Okay, below this button, let's also define a text view. I'm going to say text view, wrap content and wrap content. Let's give it an ID. Let's say uh, txt hello. After that, maybe some placeholder text. Let's just say hello. Let's also move it to below this button. I'm going to say layout below. Also, it's worth noticing that if you are not using a relative layout, for example, if you are using a constraint layout, you do not have this layout below option. This is one of the features of this relative layout. We will talk about that in uh, future videos. Okay, in here, let's pass the ID of our button. Let's say BTN hello. Also, let's move it to center horizontal. And let's add some margins. Margin top of maybe 30 dp. Let's increase the size of this text by saying text size and by passing, I believe 20 would be fine. I'm almost done with this layout file. Let's just go uh, top in here into this code and let's select this reformat code in order to rearrange our code so that if I publish the code, you would have the same code that I'm writing in here. Okay, let's switch to the main activity and let's define all these three items. Let's say edit text. Let's name it edttxt. I believe it was name is equal to find view by id r dot id dot edit text name. Let's also define our text view. Let's name it txt name is equal to find view by id r dot id dot txt name or txt hello was it? I think it's better to change the name to txt hello. 
But right now there is a problem with our code. We are instantiating our UI elements inside this onCreate method, which once again is the starting point of our application. But we are going to need these two UI elements inside this onClick method because we are going to uh, change the value of this text view whenever the user clicks on our button. And if I try to have access to this txt hello, for example, from inside this method, if I type txt hello, you can see that I'm getting a red warning. You can see that the ID cannot resolve this symbol. It means that inside this method, we do not have access to this text view. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this in the Java section, but the problem in here is occurring because of the scope in Java. So right now the scope of this text view is inside this onCreate method. And outside of that, we cannot use that. If we want to have access to this text view uh, inside both of these methods, we can say something like this. We can declare this text view in the declaration of our class as different fields. For example, above in here, I can say private, let's say text view, this one, and let's name it txt hello. But right now in here, if I try to instantiate my uh, text view, for example, if I say find view by id and I pass my id, because this part in here is not a part of this activity lifecycle, we are not going to instantiate our text view at all. We need to instantiate our element inside this onCreate method, which is once again the starting point of our application. So this way we are separating the declaration and instantiating of our UI element. I can put a semicolon down in here, and this time instead of defining the whole text view, I can use this field. I can say txt hello, this one is equal to find view by id r.id.txt hello. Now that I have declared this txt hello as a field, I can use it in both of these methods. For example, in here, I can say txt hello.setText. Inside this setText method, I'm going to need the text of this edit text. For that, I'm going to define this edit text as a, a field as well. So let's say private edit text. Let's name it edit txt name. And then in here, let's remove this edit text. Now I can pass this edit text, for example, to this set text method. Uh, let's say hello plus the edit text dot get text. If you remember from the first videos of this course, I said that we need a two string method as well. We have seen this two string method in different Java classes. It's just going to generate some text. In this case, if we delete this two string and if we just pass this edit text name dot get text, if you press down the control key and if you hover over this get text method, you can see that the return type of this get text method is an editable. We do not know what that is yet, but we just know that this is not a string and in here we are going to need a string. For that, we need another level of conversion. We need to convert the editable to a string. So we can use this to string method. Okay, I think after a lot of talking, our application is ready. Let's just run the application and let's see if we can see the behavior that we wanted. Let's type something in here. Let's say Mason. And let's press this button. Hello Mason. Our application is working fine and hopefully we understand each piece of the code that we have wrote so far. Few minutes earlier, I said that different UI elements extend the view class. We have seen that for this button. Let's also check the case for this edit text and text view. You can press down the control key and you can click on this edit text class. You can see that it's extending the text view. If you click on this text view once again by pressing down the control key, you can see that it's extending the view class. The same is for the text view itself. If we press down the control key and if we uh, click on the text view, we can see that it's extending the view class. Now that we know both of these are extending the view class, we can create an onclick listener for each one of them. And later on inside this onclick method, if we want, we can create another case for each one of them. For example, down in here, uh, for the edit text, I can say edit text name dot set onclick listener. 
you can see that we have this option in here. And because we are implementing the unclick listener interface inside our class declaration, I can pass this in here. Later on, inside the unclick method, I can create another case. For example, let's say case r.id. Uh, let's say edit text name. If that's the case, let's toast some message. Let's say attempting to type something. Before I run my application, I'm going to delete this toast because I'm not going to have a conflict between different toasts. So this time, if I click on the BTN hello, the text is going to be changed to hello plus the text inside our edit text. And if we click on the edit text itself, we are going to see this toast message. By clicking on the edit text, you can see the toast message down in here. That seems to be perfect. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to talk about some other UI elements like checkboxes, radio buttons, and radio groups, and also progress bar. Just before I finish off this video, I'm going to say that I will upload the source code at my website at mako.org slash codes. So feel free to check that if you need. Okay, see you in the next video. The first UI element that we are going to talk about in this video is checkbox. Let's quickly see that in our layout file. Before everything, I'm going to delete this text view and also I'm going to change the constraint layout to relative layout. Down in here, we can create our checkbox like this. We can say checkbox for the width and height, let's say wrap content. You can see that this little checkbox has been added in here. If you want, we can add a text to this checkbox as well. Let's say text. I'm going to enter the name of a movie. So let's say Harry Potter. We can have an ID as well. Let's say ID. Let's name it checkbox Harry. So basically a checkbox is a box that we can check or uncheck. For example, in here we have an attribute called checked. We can pass true or false for this. For example, if we say true, you can see the checkbox will be checked. Let's quickly add two more checkboxes. Basically, I'm going to copy and paste this one two more times. But this time, first of all, I'm going to change the text to, let's say, the matrix. And also, let's uh, change the ID as well. Also, I'm going to add another attribute. I'm going to move this new checkbox to the right of uh, my previous checkbox. For that, we have an attribute called to write of, layout to write of. Let's pass the ID of our first checkbox. Let's say checkbox Harry. Let's also add a margin left. We can say margin left. And let's pass 15 dp, for example. Let's copy and paste this one once again. Let's change the text to, let's say, Joker. Let's also change the ID. Let's say checkbox Joker. And also let's move it to the right of checkbox matrix. So this way, as you can see, we can have multiple checkboxes. You can check and uncheck them by default by setting an attribute of checked. Let's change the value for the Joker to, let's say, false. If we want to center this checkbox horizontally, we can add a margin for the first one. For example, we can say margin or margin left, and we can pass 25, for example. But as you can see, this is not accurate. Instead, what we can do is that we can create another relative layout and move all of these three checkboxes into that relative layout. Let's quickly see how we can do that. So inside my first relative layout, I'm going to create another relative layout. Let's say relative layout. For the width and height, let's say wrap content. Let's also give it an ID. Let's say ID. I'm going to name this one movies relative layout. Now, if I want, I can center this relative layout. I can say center horizontal. Let's pass through. Beside that, let's add a margin top. Let's say margin top of 20 dp. In other UI elements, normally in here, we could have finished uh, creating our element by adding a slash in here. 
But in this case, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to finish creating my first tag, my opening tag. For that, I can add a left anchor bracket. And as you can see, this closing tag has been created automatically. Now I can put my three checkboxes inside these two tags, the opening tag and the closing tag. Let's move all of them to inside those two tags. If you noticed, you can see that these three checkboxes are now centered horizontally and also they have a margin top of 20 dp. That's because their parent layout, which is this relative layout, has these two attributes. So inside a XML file, you can have relative layout nested inside another relative layout. Okay, now let's see what can we do with these checkboxes inside our Java code. For that, I'm going to open my main activity.java file. If you are wondering, I'm pressing double shift in order to see this search menu. First of all, in here, let's define our checkboxes. Once again, I'm going to define them as fields. Let's say private checkbox. For the first one, let's say checkbox Harry. In here, I have two options. First of all, I can create my checkboxes line after line. For example, I can say private checkbox. And for the second one, we can name it checkbox matrix. Or alternatively, because the kind of these objects are the same, I can add a comma in here and I can define my second checkbox. For example, I can say checkbox matrix. Let's also define the checkbox joker. And later on inside our onCreate method, let's instantiate them. Let's say checkbox Harry is equal to find view by id r.id.checkbox Harry. Similarly for the next two. If you want, you can have a click listener for each one of these checkboxes. For example, I can say checkbox Harry dot set unchecked changed listener. This is the listener that I need. Let's pass new unchecked changed listener. Once again, you can see that this is an interface. The exact name is uh, compound button dot unchecked changed listener. Inside this interface, we have this unchecked changed method in which we receive two elements. The compound button itself, which is our checkbox in this case, and also this is checked boolean. So in here, I can create an if statement. I can say if is checked. Let's show a toast message. Let's say you have watched Harry Potter. But in the else case, let's show another toast message. This time I'm going to say you need to watch Harry Potter. Before I write the logic for the next two checkboxes, let's run our application and let's see what would be the result. Right now, Harry Potter is checked, but we are not seeing any toast message, and that's because the onClick listener in here is going to react when we click on this checkbox. For example, if I uncheck this uh, checkbox, you can see that you need to watch Harry Potter. Let's also check it. You have watched Harry Potter. But what if we want to see the toast message when we run the application without any clicking on our checkbox? For that, we have an option in here before setting this on click listener. We can check that if our checkbox is checked or not. For example, for that, I can create an if statement. I can say if checkbox Harry dot is checked. As you can see, this method is going to return a Boolean. And as its name applies, it's going to check that if our checkbox is checked or not. So if it's checked, I'm going to show the toast message. Let's copy it from here. But in the else case, I'm going to show another toast message. Once again, we can copy it from down in here. Let's run the application. As you can see, when I run the application without any clicking, I saw the toast message. So from time to time, this is check method is going to be useful. I'm not going to define an unclick listener for the next two checkboxes because I'm sure that you got my point. Also, like in the previous video, instead of passing this new compound button dot unchecked changed listener, you can implement this listener at the declaration of your class, for example, in here. And after that, you need to override this unchecked changed method. After that, you can pass this instead of this uh, new listener in here into your set unchecked changed listener method. But once again, I'm not going to go through that. 
Instead, let's switch back to our activity main.xml file and let's talk about another UI element. But before that, I'm going to minimize this relative layout. The next UI element that I'm going to talk about is radio button. Let's say radio button, this one down in here. For the width and height, let's say wrap content. You can see that this is this uh, circular button. Let's move it to below our relative layout. I can say below or layout below. I think it was named movies relative layout. Let's also add two margins. Margin left of, uh, let's say 25 dp and also margin top of maybe 20 dp. Like checkboxes, we can also have text. Let's say text. For the text, I'm just going to say married. This is going to determine the marital status of the user. So that's what this text is about. Let's also give it an ID. Let's say radio button married. Like checkboxes, if you want to check this uh, married radio button, you can say checked and you can pass through. If you want to have multiple radio buttons, you can say something like this. You can uh, copy and paste this radio button, but there is going to be some problem with our code. Before that, let's change the text and ID of this radio button. For example, in here, let's say single. And after that, let's change the ID to RB single. Let's also move this one to right of our radio button married. Let's say to right of radio button married. So the purpose of radio buttons in programming is that among multiple radio buttons, you can only select one. This is the difference between radio button and checkbox. When you have checkboxes, you can uh, check multiple checkboxes. But when you have radio buttons, you can only have one radio button checked. But as you can see, our program is not functioning right in here. And that's because we need to group these radio buttons. And we can do that by creating another item in here called radio group. Before that, I'm going to delete these two radio buttons. Let's say radio group, this one. Once again, for the width and height, I'm going to say wrap content. Let's move it below our movies relative layout. Layout below ID, movies rel layout. A margin top maybe of 20 dp and also let's center it horizontally center horizontal to true once again because i'm going to put some radio buttons inside this radio group i'm not going to finish creating this radio group instead i'm going to finish creating this opening tag by adding a left anchor bracket like a relative layout you can see that now we have an opening tag and also a closing tag Inside this radio group, I can have my radio buttons. Let's say radio button, wrap content and wrap content. Let's give it an ID. Let's say radio button married, a text maybe. And also let's change its default value to checked. Let's say checked true. Now we can have multiple radio buttons. Let's copy and paste this one. So as you can see, I never moved this radio button to below our first radio button, but it moved automatically. If we change the ID to, for example, RV single, you can see that even though both of these radio buttons are checked, but only one of them uh, is showing the checked value. So when you are using radio buttons, only one of them uh, can have a checked value. For that, I'm going to delete this checked attribute from the second radio button. And also I'm going to change the text to single. Let's also add another one. For the ID, let's say radio button in rel. And let's change the text to in a relationship. Let's also delete this checked attribute. Right now, our radio buttons are vertical. If you want, you can have uh, horizontal radio buttons as well. For that, inside your radio group, you can have an attribute called orientation in which you can pass horizontal or vertical. If I pass horizontal, you can see that now we have our radio buttons horizontally ordered. I think it's better to have some margins between these radio buttons. So let's quickly add some margins. Let's say margin left of maybe 15 dp i guess and let's add another one down in here 
Okay, now let's see how we can use these radio buttons and radio group inside our Java file. For that, I do not need to define my radio groups. Instead, I just need to uh, instantiate my radio group. Let's say radio group. Let's name it radio group marital status. But I believe I need to give an ID to this radio group. And I think I didn't do that. Yes, in here I can say ID. Let's say radio group marital status. In our onCreate method, let's also minimize this if statement and also this onClick listener. And after the checkboxes, let's instantiate our radio group. We can say radio group marital status, find view by ID or dot ID dot radio group marital status. We can have an onClick listener for this radio group by saying radio group dot set unchecked change listener. So this method is going to be called whenever we change uh, the radio button selected. And inside the parentheses, you can guess I can pass new unchecked changed listener. Radio group dot unchecked changed listener, which is an interface and it will create this unchecked change method. One of the inputs of this method is this checked ID in which we can use that. For example, we can create a switch statement on this checked ID and we can create our cases. We can say in case it's r.id. Let's say radio button married. So basically this checked ID is the ID of our radio button, whichever is selected. So in case if the user selects this radio button married, I'm going to show a toast message. Let's just say married. But in case it's r.id. Let's say radio button single. Let's show another toast message. Let's also add another case for RB in rel. As usual, let's also create our default case and let's add a break. Let's run our application and let's see if we can see any result. Right now, this married is selected. If we select the single, you can see that uh, the married one has been unchecked and also we have saw the toast message. Let's select another one. You can see the toast message, which is perfect. Right now, we have an onclick listener for our different radio buttons inside this radio group. And depending on that button, we are doing something. For example, in this case, we are showing a toast message. But if you want to do something without clicking on these buttons, we can do something like this in our code. So before this set unchecked change listener, I can say radio group marital status dot get checked radio button ID. As you can guess, this will return the ID of the checked radio button. And I can save that inside an integer. For example, I can say int checked button. After that, I can create a similar switch statement based on the checked button. So let's say switch on the checked button and let's create our cases. I'm going to copy and paste the cases from here. Let's run the application and let's see if we can see any result. As you can see, we are not clicking on any of these radio buttons, but we just saw the married toast. That seems to be perfect. In some cases, we might need to check for the checked radio button before clicking on them. I'm going to talk about another UI element in this video and that's called a progress bar. Let's quickly see that as well. Before that, I'm going to minimize this radio group. After that, down in here, let's say progress bar, wrap content and wrap content. Let's give it an ID. Let's say progress bar. Let's also center it. Let's say center in parent and let's pass through. Let's run the application and let's see what uh, our application is going to look like with this progress bar. As you can see, an infinite progress bar is constantly circulating. This might be useful, for example, when we are uh, downloading something from the Internet. In order to make our progress bar visible or invisible, we have an option. For example, in our XML file, if we want it to be not visible, we can uh, say visibility and we can pass gone. 
Also, we have this visibility attribute for almost all of the other UI elements. If we want, we can change it to gone, but by default, it's visible. Let's change it back to gone. Later on in our Java code, we will change this visibility to visible. And whenever we are done with it, we are going to change it to gone. Let's see how can we do that in our Java code. Before everything, let's minimize all of the extra methods and codes. And let's instantiate our progress bar. Above in here, I'm going to say private progress bar. Let's name it progress bar. And down in here, inside the onCreate method, let's say progress bar is equal to find view by id or that id dot progress bar. I do not have any button in here in order to change the visibility of this progress bar. Instead, I'm going to change its visibility whenever the user clicks on the radio button single. For that, inside the radio group marital status listener, inside the switch case, in case if it's uh, RB single, instead of showing the toast message or after the toast message, I'm going to say progress bar dot set visibility and I can say visible. Instead, whenever the user clicks on this radio button in rel, I'm going to change the visibility of my progress bar to gone. Let's copy this line of code and after the toast message, let's paste that and uh, let's just change this constant to gone view.gone. Let's run our application. Right now we cannot see any progress bar because in our XML file we have added the visibility attribute and we have set the gone value. In case if we click on this single, you can see that we are seeing the progress bar. In case if I click on this in a relationship, you can guess the visibility will be changed to gone. There is also another form of progress bar. Let's quickly see that as well. So in my activity main.xml file, I can define a style for my progress bar. Before that, I'm going to change the visibility once again to visible in order to see the progress bar in our preview. And after that, let's say style. If I type horizontal, you can see this style in here, widget.appcompat.progressbar.horizontal. Let's change the width to match parent so that we can see it better. And also in here, I have another option. I can say progress and I can pass an integer. For example, I can say 30. You can see that the progress of this progress bar has been changed to 30. This type of progress bar is extremely useful when you want to show the progress of something. For example, downloading a file. Sometimes you may want to show that how much of the file has been downloaded. You can also set a maximum uh, for your progress. For example, you can say max and you can pass 100. Let's also add some margin left and right. Margin left of 20 dp, margin right of 20 dp. Okay, now let's switch back to our Java file and let's see what we can do with this progress bar. Before everything, I'm going to delete these two lines of code because I'm not going to make my progress bar visible or invisible. Let's also minimize this switch statement and this whole listener for our radio group. After instantiating our progress bar, I'm going to create a thread. If you remember from the Java session, this is the simplest way that we can create a thread. Let's say thread thread is equal to new thread. We needed to pass a runnable, let's say new runnable. Inside this run method, I'm going to create a for loop. Let's say for int i is equal to zero, i less than 10, and i plus plus. For every time of looping, I'm going to increment the progress of this progress bar by 10. So let's say progress bar dot increment progress by as you can guess, we need to pass an integer in here. For example, let's pass 10. After that, let's freeze this thread for half a second. If you remember from the Java session, we have used this way. We set thread.sleep. But this way, there is a probability that we create interrupted exceptions. For example, you can see that we have an error in here and the error says that unhandled exception. 
There is also another way in Android. I'm going to use that in here. I can say system clock dot sleep. So this way we don't need to create the try catch block. This wasn't available in Java. This system clock is uh, coming from android.os. You can check that by take a look at this import. This one in here, android.os.systemclock is the one that we just imported. After creating our thread, we just need to start it. We can do that after the definition of our thread. We can say thread.start. So in here, we have created this worker thread in which inside that we are creating a for loop. And for each time of looping, we are incrementing the progress of our progress bar by 10. Also, after each time of looping, we are slipping the worker thread for half a second. Let's quickly switch back to our layout file and let's delete this progress attribute. It was just for demonstration. So if I remove this one, you can see that uh, the progress will change to zero. Let's run the application and let's see if we can see the progress of our progress bar. As you can see, we are changing the value of this progress bar for every half a second. If you want, you can also get the progress of your progress bar at any moment that you want. For example, in here you can say progress bar dot get progress. As you can see, this get progress is returning an integer, which is the current progress of your progress bar. Sometimes you may need that and here is how you can get that. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Once again, like previous videos, I'm going to upload the source code at my website at makeout.org slash codes. Feel free to check that if you need. And also in the next video, finally, we are going to talk about the differences between a relative layout, a constraint layout, and also a linear layout. I think it's going to help you a lot with understanding uh, the layout files better. Okay, see you in the next video. In this video, we will talk about different layouts in Android. Specifically, we will talk about relative layout, we will talk about linear layout, and also constraint layout. Let's start by talking about the relative layout. Like before, I'm going to switch to text view in my layout file. Let's also minimize this project plane, and let's change this constraint layout to relative layout. I'm also going to enable this preview so that we can see what we are doing. First of all, let's delete this text view and let's start from the beginning. So inside a relative layout, all of our UI elements are somehow related to each other. It means that the place of every UI element is relative to another layout or maybe its parent. Let's quickly create a text view and let's see the relativity in action. Like before, I'm going to say wrap content for the width and height. Let's also specify a text. Let's just say hello world. As you can see right now, the text view is placed at the left corner of my screen. If I want, I can change that. For example, you have seen in the previous videos that I can uh, center this text view vertically or horizontally. For that, I can say center horizontal. Let's pass through. You can see that it's being centered and this is the relativity that i was talking about when we set this layout center horizontal attribute to true we are defining a relativity between this text view and its parent let's also center it vertically or instead of these two attributes i can simply say center in parent let's also give an id to this text view let's say txt hello now if i define another ui element i can place that related to this uh, text view let's quickly create a button in here let's say wrap content and wrap content for the width and height let's define a text like before let's say say hello also let's define an id Now, if I want to move this button to below this text view, I can simply say layout below. And let's pass the ID of our text view, txt hello. I can center this button as well. For example, I can say center horizontally. And let's pass through. We can also have a margin. For example, we can say margin top, layout margin top, and we can pass some number. For example, 15 dp. 
inside a relative layout you can also have another relative layout let's quickly see that for example in here i'm going to define a relative layout and inside that relative layout i'm going to put three text views after that i'm going to move this text view this hello world to below that relative layout so i can say relative layout for the width and height let's say wrap content you can say match parent like other ui elements we can define an id for our relative layout for example i can say first relative layout so up until this point when we wanted to create our ui elements after setting the attributes we could have used this backslash in order to finish creating our ui elements but in this case because we are going to put some other elements inside this relative layout we need to create an opening tag and uh, instead of using the backslash i'm going to use the left anchor bracket by doing that we also create this uh, ending tag and inside this opening and ending tag now we can put our ui elements for example we can pass our text views let's say text view wrap content and wrap content i'm going to fast forward everything for these three text views Like before, we can place our three text views uh, inside this relative layout correctly. For example, we can move them to right of each other. So for this uh, second text view, I can say to right of, let's say txt name. Let's also add a margin left of 10 dp. Similarly, for this uh, third text view. Let's say to write of our uh, txt last name and margin left of maybe uh, 10 dp once again. Once again, this whole relative layout is placed at the left corner of our screen. If we want, we can use the center vertical or center horizontal attributes for this whole relative layout as well. So inside the opening tag of this relative layout, I can say center horizontal and let's pass through. Let's also add some margin top, let's say margin top, and let's pass 100 dp. You can see that when I use these attributes on a relative layout level, all of the UI elements inside that relative layout respond to those attributes. For example, in here we have centered them horizontally and also we have added the margin. Now that we have this relative layout, we can minimize that so that we can see everything better. And after that, we can uh, move this hello text to below this relative layout. But before that, I need to delete this centering parent attribute. Once again, you can see that it moves to the corner of our screen. And because we have set the layout below for this button, it moves as well. So in here, I can say layout below and I can pass the ID of my relative layout. It was first relative layout. Let's also center it horizontally and let's uh, pass some margin center horizontal true margin top let's say 10 dp so my point in here was that inside a relative layout or for that matter inside any other kind of layout you can have other relative layouts as well some of these attributes for example this layout below are specific to relative layout and if you're inside some other kind of layout for example a linear layout and also constraint layout you cannot use this layout below during the course, we will see that which of these attributes are specific to relative layout. Before we move to the next kind of layouts, let's also switch to this design view. At the left pane in here, you can see this component tree. As the name of this component tree applies, this in here is showing us the hierarchy of different elements in our UI. So for example, in here we have this parent relative layout. Inside that we have this uh, first relative layout and also txt hello and btn hello. Inside our first relative layout we have three text views. Sometimes when you have a messy UI you may use this component tree in order to keep track of different UI elements. Okay let's switch back to our text view and let's start talking about uh, linear layout. Before that I'm going to delete all of these. And let's change this relative layout to a linear layout. Inside a linear layout, all of the UI elements will be placed line after line. Let's quickly see that. 
I'm going to define a text view once again, wrap content and wrap content. Let's pass a text. Let's say hello world once again. Let's also give it an ID. Let's say txt hello. So the first thing that is different inside a linear layout is that you do not have the center in parent, center horizontally or center vertically attributes when you use linear layout. For example, in here, I cannot say center in parent. You can see that it's not available. If you want to center your UI elements, you can have, for example, a relative layout inside this linear layout. Let's move on from this part and let's add another UI element. Let's say button, wrap content and wrap content. For the text, let's say, say hello. And let's give it an ID. Let's say btn hello. You can see that even though I didn't use any attribute to move this button to the right of our text view, it automatically placed to the right of our text view. And that's because we are using a linear layout. Inside a linear layout, all of our UI elements will be placed one after another. If you want, you can change the orientation of this linear layout so that the UI elements will be placed one after another vertically. Let's quickly do that. So in the definition of my linear layout, I'm going to pass an attribute in here, let's say orientation, and let's pass vertical. You can see that they have been placed vertically. There is also another attribute that I'm going to talk about in linear layout. Let's quickly delete this button and let's define another text view. For the text, let's say name, and for the ID, let's say uh, txt name. Like before you have the margins, for example, you can say margin top and we can pass any number that we want. But there is also another attribute. In here, before I talk about that attribute, I'm going to give some background color for these two text views so that we can see the difference better. So I can say background and I can pass a color. For example, this color accent that we have in our color resource. Let's also set a color for the first text view let's say background and let's pass color primary this time so the attribute that i'm going to talk about is weight let's quickly see that we can see this layout weight in here and we can pass any number that we want for example i can say 20. let's also pass a weight to this uh, second text view and we will talk about it let's say weight and let's pass 80 for example you can probably guess the usage of this weight attribute right now. It will give our attribute some weight according to the numbers that we have used. For example, in this case, the entire weight of our layout is 20 plus 80, which is 100. And it will give the first text view 20% of the weight of the whole layout. It doesn't matter what number you put in here. For example, in here, if I say 2 and for the second one, if I say 8, it will uh, work the same. Also, you can see this space in here. That's because we have this margin top. If we remove that, you can see that the whole layout will be divided accordingly. So this weight was another attribute that I was going to talk about. If I change this orientation to horizontal, you can see that uh, it's working the same. There is not much to this linear layout. I just wanted to show you that there is one linear layout with uh, some specific attributes, for example, this orientation and this weight. And in this course, we are not going to use linear layout that much. It's uh, for simple layouts, but you can uh, use it if you want. Before I remove all of this, I'm going to say that inside a linear layout, you can also have other layouts, for example, a relative layout or a constraint layout. Okay, let's remove all of these and let's talk about constraint layout. Before that, I'm going to remove this orientation because it was specific to linear layout. Okay, let's say constraint layout. We have two options in here, widget.constraint and widget.constraint layout. This is the one that we are going to need. For this constraint layout, I'm going to switch to design view because I think uh, it's much better to work with the design view. First of all, I'm going to enable the blueprint so that we can see the difference. If there is any, you can click on this blue stack in here and you can select this design plus blueprint. We will talk about the difference between this design mode and this blueprint in a minute. Okay, for working with the constraint layout, you can drag your UI elements like before. You can drag, uh, for example, a text view. 
and as soon as I did that you can see that uh, we have four circles at the four edges of our UI element uh, let's zoom in a little bit you can see that the four circles are at the four edges of our UI element let's zoom out a bit I just wanted to show you the four circles also the shortcuts that I'm using in here is Control plus plus in order to zoom in and Control plus minus in order to zoom out also at any time you, know, you can use Control plus zero in order to have a fit screen it's also worth mentioning that if you have a keyboard that has some numbers and uh, keys for the calculator the plus minus and zero from the uh, calculator keys are not going to be helpful in here so the shortcuts are going to be only useful for when you are using the upper numbers and also the upper plus and minus the most basic thing in a constraint layout is to constrain your UI elements right now you can see that we have a red error in here similarly we have the same error in our component tree it says that we need to constraint your UI element in order to constrain your UI elements you can uh, drag one of these circles to for example the edge of your screen so right now we have added one constraint if we switch back to our text view you can see that uh, we have this constraint in here I'm talking about these two line of code in here okay let's go back to the design view we can add another constraint for example for the right constraint of our uh, UI element we can add a constraint to the right edge of our screen but still this constraint layout is not happy it says that not vertically constrained it means that we need to at least add another constraint in here and now the error is gone and uh, it has been changed to some warning if you want to center your UI element and into the center of your parent you can add another constraint for example from the bottom of this text view to the bottom of the screen if you want to remove one of these constraints you can just click on the circle and you can press the uh, delete key you can see that the constraint will be deleted let's press ctrl plus z in order to redo that if you take a look at this attributes pane in here you can see that you have a slider for this uh, text view for different constraints right now the number says 50 but if you want you can change that for example if you move it a little bit you can see that the text view responds accordingly it will move according to this slider similar to that we have this horizontal slider in which you can guess we can uh, move our UI element so constraining your UI element to the edges of a screen is one way you can also add constraints to other UI elements for example if I have a button in here let's quickly add that and let's delete the constraints of this text view all of them let's move it uh, so that we can see everything better this time if we want we can constrain this button to for example the bottom of this text view you can see that it moves accordingly you can also see that when I click on one of these uh, circles I can see all of the available targets for example I can constrain it to the right of my text view sometimes it might not work uh, and you may want to add that one more time so this way we have constrained our button to the bottom of this text view and also to the right of this text view if we want to make it center we can add another constraint to the left of this text view and both of these UI elements are now uh, somehow centered let's also add a margin so that we can see everything better so by clicking on one of your UI elements you can see that in the attributes pane we can add a margin for example from top let's add 32 if you take a look at this component tree in here you can see that uh, we have no error about this button but we have an error about this text view it means that we have all of the necessary constraints about this button but we need to add some constraints about this text view for example we need to constrain it uh, vertically or maybe horizontally as well like before we can add the constraints to the both edges of our screen you can also see that when I add the constraint this button moves as well it means that no matter where this text view is we want our button to be uh, constrained to this text view let's add another one let's also add a margin top for this text view as well I think 32 is not enough so let's say 100 
Let's also add another text view and let's see other kind of constraints. So constraining uh, your text views, uh, for example, from top of this text view to the top of this text view and from bottom of this text view to the bottom of this text view is one way of having uh, two text views at the same line horizontally. There is also another way. I'm going to press Ctrl Z two times so that uh, we undo the constraints. We can right click on uh, one of our UI elements and we can select this show baseline. Now you can see this baseline. Instead of adding the two constraints from top and bottom, we can select this baseline and we can constrain it to the baseline of this text view. This time, once again, they are at the same uh, line horizontally. Let's zoom in a little bit. In order to uh, navigate through all of your layout, you can press down the space key and you can drag your mouse. Like uh, if you work with Photoshop, you have the same ability. You can see that both of these text views are at the same line uh, horizontally by adding some constraint to the baseline. Once again, the baseline is not available by default. You can right click and uh, you can select this show baseline. Let's zoom out. So we have seen that we can uh, constrain our UI element to uh, both edges of our screen. But what if we want to, for example, have another line? For example, if we want to uh, move this uh, text view or constrain this text view to some other space beside these two edges. For that, we can right click on our layout. Down in here inside these helpers, we have these uh, guidelines. Add vertical guideline and add horizontal guideline. You can guess each one of these will create a line. For example, let's add a vertical guideline. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit so that we can see better. You can see that this line has been added to our layout. We can move it. For example, uh, we can move it to the right of our screen. As soon as I did that, you can see that we have some margin from the left side of our screen. You can see this triangle in here. If I click on that, it will uh, change the margin from left to the right of our screen. Sometimes this might be useful as well. Right now, the constraint of this text view is the edge of our screen. Let's quickly delete the left constraint of this text view. And if we want, we can add this constraint to this guideline. For example, we can add it in here. Sometimes, once again, it might not work. You can see the difference, the text view now constrained to this guideline instead of the edge of our screen. If you want, you can constrain this text view to this guideline as well. But before that, uh, we need to delete this baseline constraint. Let's quickly delete that. Sorry, I deleted the whole text view. And let's constrain it to this guideline and also to the edge of our screen. If you want, you can also have multiple guidelines. We will add another one in a second. So for example, I can once again right click on the layout by going to these helpers. I can add another vertical guideline. You can see that this guideline has been added and I can use it like I've used this first guideline. We also have a vertical guideline in our helpers. We can add this horizontal guideline. You can guess it will add a horizontal guideline. Once again, we have this triangle in here. If we click on that, it will change the margins from top to bottom. Let's also constrain this text view to uh, our guideline. Sometimes when you are working with different uh, UI elements in a constraint layout, adding some constraint might be difficult. For example, in here, we don't have much space. For that, we can select both of the items that we want to add constraint. For example, this text view and this guideline. You can select multiple UI elements by pressing down the control key. After you have selected uh, both of them, you can right click. You can go to this constraint in here. We want to constrain our uh, text view too, which is the ID of this text view to our guideline. So I'm going to say uh, top two, let's say bottom of our guideline tree. This way we can add a constraint. Sometimes where there is not much space to work with, you can use the uh, right click menu by selecting this constraint. You can add the required constraints. But for that, once again, you need to select the both of uh, items that you want. For example, this text view and this guideline. Or if you want to add the constraint from this text view to this button, for example, you can select this text view and this button. 
Right now we have set the left constraint of this text view to this guideline. We can also move this guideline. For example, we can uh, move it accordingly to right and left. You can see that once I move this guideline, the UI elements move as well. But depending on your system, this uh, operation in here might be a slow because as you can see, uh, we are tracking uh, the live response of our UI elements. If you want, you can disable this live rendering. You can uh, go to this eye in here and you can uncheck this live rendering. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now, if I move this guideline, you can see that the UI elements themselves do not move, but uh, we can see the outline of every UI element. So in some cases, when you uh, do not have uh, all of the required resources, for example, some large amount of memory RAM, you can disable this live rendering. But in here, you can see the difference between this blueprint and also this design view. You can see that when I move this guideline, the UI elements inside the blueprint view are moving accordingly. And that's because the blueprint view do not render our UI elements at all. It's just some blueprint of all of our UI elements. Later on, when we add some image view to our layout, we will see the difference much better. Okay, let's move on from this part. Sometimes when you are creating your layout files, you may want to have some sample data. Or as we might call it in programming, you may want to have some placeholders. For example, right now the placeholder for this text view is this text view. If we want, we can change that. We can right click on our element. We can go to this set sample data and we can select some text. We can see that we have these cities, for example. It will change the text of our text view to Shanghai, for example. Let's see others. For example, another popular choice is this date in here. You can see different formats. We can select that and we can have some sample data about the date. The other one is lorem ipsum. If you search on the internet for sample text, you probably get this uh, lorem ipsum text. Let's select that and we can have some sample text. And according to that, we can have this text on our layout. We also have the lorem text. Let's quickly see that. So instead of lorem random, we can select this lorem, which is basically this lorem text. Before we finish off this video, let's also see uh, the sample data for this image view as well. I know that we didn't talk about image view so far in the course, but we will talk about that in the next video. We can drag some image view to our layout. And first thing, we need to set some sample data for our image view. For example, we can select from the avatars. Right now, this is the avatar that by default we have selected for our image view. If you want, you can change that by right clicking and set some sample data. We can select another avatar or we can select one of these, for example, this background. Let's select another avatar, for example, this one. Like before, you can constrain this image view, for example, to the both edges of your uh, text view. Let's quickly do that. If you take a look at the attributes pane in here, you can see that for the layout width, we have uh, set the width to wrap content. We can change that. For example, we can say match constraint. When we do that, the width of our image view will change according to its parent constraint, which is this text view in this case. But there is also another difference when we uh, change this layout width to match constraint. When we do that, if you take a closer look in here inside this constraint widget, you can see that we have this uh, line in here. Let's click on that. And once I do that, you can see that this ratio in here has been added. It's useful for when you want to uh, show some images from the internet, when you don't know the size or the ratio of your image. Right now, the ratio is uh, 1 to 1. If you want, you can change that. For example, you can say 1 to 2. You can see that now the ratio has been changed. Or let's say 2 to 1. The ratio of our image view responds accordingly. Also, you have the same option from above in here, layout constraint ID, which uh, you can change this 2 to 1 to once again 1 to 1. Also, now that you have used this image view, you can see the difference between this blueprint and this uh, design view. You can see that in the blueprint view, we are not rendering the image view. 
and in the blueprint view we are not rendering our layout. It's very useful for when you are working with constraint layout, especially if you do not have the required resources, for example, if you do not have large amount of RAM. You can always go up to this uh, blue stack icon and you can select this blueprint so that you have uh, only the blueprint. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, first of all, we are going to work with this image view element. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about images in Android and I believe it will be a short video. Uh, as always, let's switch uh, back to our layout file and let's change this constraint layout to a relative layout. You can keep working with constraint layout, I'm just more comfortable with this relative layout. First of all, I'm going to delete this text view and let's create our image view. This time, instead of wrap content or match variant for the width and height, I'm going to uh, put some number. For example, I'm going to say 150 dp. Right now, you cannot see any image in your layout file in this preview because we do not have any placeholder. But you can see the outline of your image. If you want to have some placeholder, you can say something like this. You can say source, this src, and you can address some image from your project. By default, you have some images in your project. For example, in your drivable folder, you have this IC launcher background. Let's select that, for example. And as soon as I select that, you can see that we can see this uh, green image in our preview. Later on, we will talk about this drawable folder and other folders that are related to images in Android projects. So this is going to be a placeholder. And if you want, we can later on uh, change this image in our Java file. Let's also give an ID to our image view. Let's say ID. Let's name it my image. Let's also move it to the center of our parent. Let's say center in parent and true. So when we have addressed this image, we have used this at drawable. It means that this image, this IC launcher background lives in our drawable folder. If you take a look at your project pane in the resources folder, we have seen the layout folder in which we have this activity main.xml file. But beside that, we have this drawable folder. Inside this drawable folder, we have some XML files as well. So if you take a look at this IC launcher background, you can see that we have this XML file, which at the end, its result is this image, or to be specific, is this drawable. Inside this XML file, we have some elements like vector, path, and everything. Don't worry about them yet. We will talk about them later on in the course, but at the end, the result of this XML file is this drawable in here. If you want, you can add other drawables in your drawable folder as well. For example, if you right click on your drawable folder by selecting new vector asset or image asset, depending on your need, you can add new drawables. Let's select this new image asset. In here, first of all, we can select the type of our image. Right now, uh, it's launcher icons. If you want, you can change that. For example, you can say action bar and tab icons. So basically this way you can add some icons to your project. First of all, you need to name your icon. This is going to be the name that later on you will pass to your images. For example, your image view, you can see that we have passed this IC launcher background. That name is coming from here. IC stands for icon. It's the convention to name your icons with uh, this IC. So let's say IC alarm, for example. In Android Studio, you have some uh, icons. For example, if you click on this icon in here, this Android icon in here, you can see the clip art. You can see that there are all sorts of icons and uh, you can use whichever you want. Uh, also notice that these icons are uh, available under this Apache license. So make sure to check that before you use them in your project. Uh, because I've named this icon IC alarm, I'm going to select one of these alarms. For example, this one. Let's select OK. And in here, uh, you probably can see the icon. It's somehow white. If you want, you can change the color by opening this drop down and select a custom color. For example, let's pass a black. Now you can see the alarm better. 
Also notice that there are multiple sizes of this icon and that's because in different screen sizes the Android system is going to select one of these sizes. For example, if it's a large screen size with a large pixel rate, it will uh, select one of these larger images. Similar to that, if your application is going to run on a smaller screen size device, the Android system will select one of these smaller icons. Okay, let's select next from here. Once again, you can see that in your resources folder, inside the drivable folder, multiple images, multiple drivable files with multiple qualities will be added. And you can also see the output file. This is going to be the XML file when you create your drivable file. Basically, this at the end is going to create that alarm icon. Let's click finish in here. And if you take a look at your drivable folder now, you can see that we have this IC alarm which once again uh, is presented with five different qualities. Now in our activity main.xml file, instead of passing this IC launcher background, we can pass IC alarm. So this way by adding some drivable into your drivable folder, you can add some images to your project. Similarly, you can add some images into your mipmap folder as well. Right now we have some images in here. For example, we have this IC launcher. And also we have this IC launcher round, which at the end will create a rounded icon. If you want to add some extra images into your project from, for example, let's say your computer, you can add them into this mipmap folder. For example, I have prepared this PNG file. I can copy that. Let's say copy. And in my mipmap folder, I can paste that. Let's select the directory. And also let's name our file. It's also very important to know that when you are importing some images into a project, uh, the name of your uh, mipmap file, the name of your PNG or JPEG file shouldn't have any spaces. And also for that matter, they shouldn't have any upper cases. So the name in here, I think is fine. Let's press OK. And as you can see, this mako.png has been added to my mipmap folder. Now that I have this image into my project, I can address that from inside the activity main.xml file. For example, in here, instead of saying IC alarm, I can say make code. But because we have added that um, file into our mipmap folder, we are getting a red warning because we are saying add driver. For that, I'm going to delete all of this and I'm going to say add mipmap and I can address make code. We can see that the logo has been added into our project successfully. So far, we have added these images and drivers in our project in this Android view. Let's also check the project view and let's see if we can locate different images in the project view as well. So you can guess that it's in our app folder, inside the sources folder, inside the main folder, inside resources folder. You can see all these drivers and mipmap folders. Once again, each one of these is going to respond to the quality of the screen of the user's device. So for example, if you want to locate this mako.png because it was a high quality image, I believe it will be inside this mipmap xxhdpi. As you can see, it's in here. But if you want to have an application that responds to each one of the screen sizes and screen qualities correctly, you need to create images for each one of these qualities and add them into your project. Right now, if you take a look at, for example, this MDPI, you can see that inside this folder, we do not have any makeup.png. It's not going to cause any problem in order to show the images in different screen sizes. As long as there is some image with the name makeo.png, it's going to show something to the user, but it may cause some bad user experience. Okay, let's switch back to our Android view. And let's talk about how you can change the icon of your application. But before that, let's quickly run the application and let's see what is the current uh, icon for our application. Right now, you can see that the name of this application is images. And if you take a look at the list of your applications on your device, you can see that the logo of these images is this rounded Android icon. This is the icon that we have seen inside our mipmap folder. So if you take a look at your mipmap folder, down in here, we have this IC launcher round. 
which is this icon, which at the end will be somehow rounded. And if you want to change that, you can go to your manifest folder. You can see that we have this Android manifest.xml file. If you click on that, you can see some general information about your application. Later on, we will talk about this manifest file and also other XML files in your project. But for now, you can see that inside this application tags, we have two attributes, this icon and also this round icon. Both of them are addressing the IC launcher icon for now. If you want, you can change that. For example, in the devices that you are not going to show a round icon, you can change this. Let's quickly change this one and let's address our make code. Similarly for the round icon. I'm going to pass make code. Let's run the application and let's see if we have changed the icon successfully. If you take a look at the list of your applications once again, you can see that the icon for this images application has been changed. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to uh, start working on the list view and also a spinner. So in the next video, we are going to show how can we have a list of different items. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about how we can show a list of different items in our application. For example, a list of different cities or a list of different students. For that, first of all, I'm going to start talking about list view. List view is one of the options that we can use in order to show a list of different options. For that, first of all, I'm going to close this uh, Java file for now and inside my XML file. First of all, I'm going to delete this text view and after that, I'm going to change this constraint layout to a relative layout. If you want, you can work with a constraint layout, but I'm more comfortable with relative layout. After that, down in here, I'm going to say list view. For the width and height, this time I'm going to say match parent. And as soon as I do that, you can see that in here in our preview, we can see a list of different items on our screen. These are just some sample data indicating that we are going to use a list view. I'm also going to add a margin top, let's say margin top, and let's say 100 dp. Let's also give an ID. But before that, if you take a closer look in here, I'm not sure that if you can see this scroll bar at the left pane in here, but it indicates that uh, we can scroll our list view in case if all of our items do not fit on the screen. So if we have a large amount of items, we can scroll over our list view. Okay, let's give an ID to our list view. Let's say ID. I'm going to name it cities list view or cities list. And I think that's enough for now. Let's quickly switch back to our Java file and uh, let's initialize this list view. Like before above in here, I'm going to say private list view. Let's name it list view or let's name it cities list. Down in here inside the onCreate method, I'm going to say cities list is equal to find view by ID or dot ID. Also, if you have noticed, I'm using a shortcut for this find view by ID method. Instead of typing all of the method, I'm using FB shortcut. If you press enter or tab, you will get the whole method. We will talk about these available shortcuts in IntelliJ and Android Studio later on in the course. Okay, let's pass the address of our list view. Let's say r.id.citieslist. After that, we need to create the data that we want to show in our list view. For example, in here, I'm going to create an array list of different strings. And later on, I'm going to pass it to this cities list view. For that, I'm going to say array list this one in here, of different strings, let's name it cities, is equal to new array list. And after that, I'm going to add some cities to this array list. Let's say cities.add, and let's add some items. In here, I'm adding all of these cities to my cities array list manually. But in most cases, the list of your objects will be coming from the web server or maybe your database. Because we didn't talk about those stuff yet, uh, we are going to hard coding them and we are going to pass them manually to our array list. 
Okay, after providing your data, you need to pass this data to your list view. But before that, you need to create an adapter. The purpose of the adapter is to fetch the data to your list view. Let's quickly see how we can create our adapter. There are multiple kind of adapters, but the one that I'm going to use in here is this array adapter. This is the simplest one and we are going to work with that in here. Let's say array adapter of type string. Let's name it cities adapter. Let's say is equal to new array adapter. Inside the parentheses of this array adapter, we need three things. First of all, we need a context, which I'm going to pass this. Later on in the course, we will talk about context, but in here, because we are inside an activity, I'm talking about this main activity and activities are context. So this one in here is going to work fine. So by passing this, we are passing our main activity as the context. Don't worry about that yet. We will talk about context later on in the course. After that, we need to pass a layout file for every item in our list view. So for example, if we are going to show the name of a city, we need a layout for that city in our uh, list view. We can create our customized layout, but in here I'm going to use one of the built-in layouts. For that, I'm going to say android.r.layout. Let's say simple list item one. So basically, this is a built-in layout file in which we can use in order to show different cities in our list view. After passing the context and also the layout file for every item, we also need to pass the data. In this case, we need to pass the cities array list. So let's say cities in here. And now we have our adapter for our list view. Once again, the purpose of this adapter is to fetch the data, in this case, this cities array list to our list view. After creating your adapter, you can say cities list dot set adapter, and you can pass your adapter. Let's say cities adapter. Before running the application, let's quickly review what we are doing in here. First of all, we have created our list view inside our layout file. After that, we have initialized it inside this onCreate method in here. After that, we have prepared our data. In this case, we have created this simple array list of different strings called cities. After that, we have created an adapter in order to fetch this cities array list to our list view. And after creating the adapter, we have passed it to our list view. Let's quickly run our application and let's see if we can see these items in our list view. As you can see, we have created this list view and also populated the data that we have passed in our array list. Also, if we had more data that wouldn't fit on the screen, the list view would be scrollable. This layout in here for every item is this simple list item that we have passed in here. If you want to take a look at that, you can press down the control key. In Mac, it should be command key. And by clicking on the simple list item one, you can check the layout file. You can see that it's a simple text view with some attributes. Nothing special in here. You can also make your items clickable. Right now, if you click on one item, nothing happens. But you can set a listener for each one of these items. Let's quickly see that. So after passing the adapter in here, I can say cities list dot set on item click listener this one. And I can pass my interface. I can say new on item click listener. Notice that it's adapter view dot on item click listener. It's different from on click listener. When we pass this interface, we have this on item click method in which uh, has some inputs. The one that we are interested in is this uh, position in here. Basically, this is going to be the position of our item in our list view. Let's quickly see how we can use that. For example, in here, I'm going to show a toast message after clicking on each one of the items. Once again, when we create our toast message, first of all, we need to pass a context because we are inside this on item click method, which exists in another interface. We cannot simply pass this. We need to pass main activity dot this in order to reference to our context. After passing the context, we can pass our text. For the text in here, I'm going to say uh, cities dot get. And for the index in here, I can pass this position. 
So this way we are going to get the city name that we have clicked on. We are using this position as the index in order to get the appropriate city name from our cities array list. Also, if you have noticed when I use this cities inside this on item click method, this final keyword has been added to the declaration of our array list. As a reminder from the Java session, when you add a final keyword at the declaration of a variable or an object, that variable or the instance of that object would be constant. It means that you cannot change that instance. But although we cannot change the instance of these cities after declaring it as final, we can use all of the methods inside that object. For example, we can use this dot add method. Because we are using this cities array list inside this on item click method, which exists in another interface, the cities array list needs to be constant and uh, this final keyword has been added automatically. And if I remove it right now from here, you can see that we are getting this error down in here and it says that your variable should be constant. So let's add the final keyword once again. Also, let's add another text in here. Let's say plus selected. Okay, let's run the application once again and let's see if we have set the on item click listener successfully. So now if we click on one of the items inside our list view, for example, this New York, you can see the toast message in here, New York selected, Berlin, Berlin selected. Okay, it seems like our on item click listener is working fine. Once again, this on item click listener is different from the on click listener. If you set the on click listener on your list view, it's not going to work according to every item in your list view. Okay, I think that's enough talking about list view. You can work around list view if you want, but I do not suggest that because in Android we have uh, modern solutions for populating a list of different options. For example, we have recycler view, which has a lot of flexibilities. If you take a look at your layout file inside the design view, you can find the list view somewhere inside this legacy. You can see that in here and uh, it's inside this legacy because these days almost no one uses list view. I just wanted to show how can you create a list view. The reason that you may want to avoid using list view is that uh, list view does not have uh, much flexibility. For example, you cannot customize the layout of every item in your list view. You can create a customized layout for every item, but uh, in recycler view, you have much more flexibilities. And also the other issue is about performance. If you have a large amount of data that you want to show in a list, for example, if you have a thousand items, in those cases, you will see the performance issue when you are working with list view. Recycler view has done a much better job uh, when it comes to performance. We will talk about recycler view in one or two videos from now, but uh, let's move on from this part. The other layout file that I'm going to talk about is called a spinner. Let's quickly see that. I'm going to define my spinner above this list view. So in here, let's say a spinner for the width and height. This time, let's say wrap content. Let's center it horizontally and also let's add some margin top. Center horizontal true margin top. Let's say 50 dp. Right now, you cannot see your spinner inside this preview very well, and that's because you do not have any data inside your spinner yet. Basically, this spinner is going to create a drop down menu. For example, if you click on this, you will see a list of different options. We will see that in action in a minute, but for now, let's just pass an ID for our spinner. Let's say students list or students spinner, it's a better name. Also, let's move our list view to below this spinner. Layout below and let's pass the ID of our spinner. Let's initialize our spinner in our Java file. Like before, I'm going to come above in here and say private spinner. Let's name it student spinner. And down in here inside the onCreate method, I can initialize that. Let's say a student spinner is equal to find view by id r dot id dot let's say a student spinner. Once again, like the list view, first of all, we need to create the list of items, the data that we want to show in our spinner. For that, I'm going to create another array list in here. So let's say array list of different strings. 
let's call it students is equal to new array list after that let's pass some data to this students array list Similar to when we have worked with list views, after providing our data, we also need to create an adapter. Once again, the purpose of this adapter is going to be fetching the data into our spinner. We can create our adapter like we have did for the list view. So in here I can say array adapter of different strings. Let's name it students adapter. Is equal to new array adapter. Like before, inside this parenthesis, we need three items. First of all, we need the context. After that, we need the layout file for every item in our spinner. Once again, you can create your customized layout file if you want, but in here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use a built-in one. So let's say android.r.layout. The layout file that I'm going to use this time is this uh, simple spinner drop-down item. When we created the adapter for list view, we have used this simple list item one, but in here we are going to use this simple spinner drop down item. After that, once again, we need our data, which I'm going to pass my students array list. After creating your adapter, you can say students spinner dot set adapter, and you can pass your students adapter. Let's run our application and let's see what an spinner looks like. You can see the spinner above in here, it's going to generate a drop down menu. If I click on this triangle in here, you can see the name of the students that I have passed into my array list. Once again, these items can be also clickable. For example, if I uh, click on one of these, we can uh, take some action. Let's quickly see that how can we create an unclick listener for each one of these items. So after setting the adapter down in here, I'm going to say student spinner dot set on item selected listener. This is different from the listener that we have used for the list view. For the list view, we have used set on item click listener, but it's not going to work in here. Instead, we are going to use this set on item selected listener. Let's pass our interface. Let's say new on item select listener adapter view dot on item selected listener. And this interface is going to generate two methods on item selected and on nothing selected. The names are descriptive. Uh, on nothing selected means that if you do not select anything inside your spinner, we are not going to work with this method and we are not going to write any logic in here. Instead, inside this on item selected, we are going to show a toast message. Once again, you can see that we have this position in here in which we can use it in order to, for example, get the name of that student. First of all, like before, we need the context because we are inside another interface. We are going to pass main activity dot this. After that, for the text, I'm going to say students dot get. And as the index, I'm going to pass position. Let's say plus selected. Let's run the application and let's see if everything is going to work. So in here you can see that even though I never clicked on any item, I see the toast message. And that's because we have used this set on item selected listener. Once again, this is different from the on item click listener. I don't know why, but we cannot use on item click listener for the spinner. If you try to use that, you will get an exception. Instead, the other option that you have is this set on item selected listener. Let's see if we can show the toast message if we select another item, for example, Sarah. You can see the toast message down in here. This is one way of showing data inside your spinner. It's useful for when you do not know uh, what data you are going to show. For example, if you are going to retrieve the data from a web server or a database. To be precise, in case your data is dynamic. But in case you know the data uh, previously, in case your data is static, you can use another way. Let's quickly see that. So before that, I'm going to open this project pane. Inside my app folder, inside this resources folder, we have this values folder in here, in which inside that we have this strings.xml file. 
we can create a string array inside this XML file and later on we can pass it uh, into our spinner. Basically this strings file is going to be the place that we put all of the static strings. For example, right now you can see that we have this app name string in which we have used it inside our manifest file. Let's quickly see that. Inside this android manifest.xml file, we have this label attribute. If we click on the label, you can see that it's addressing the string file. And this is the name of our string from strings.xml file. We know for sure that the name of our application is not going to change. For example, it's not dependent on some string from our database or the web server. So we have passed it in here. In the next video, we will talk about the usages of this uh, strings.xml file and also for that matter, other XML files in our application. But for now, let's create a string array statically in here and let's pass it to our spinner. So inside this strings.xml file, you can create two different kinds of items. You can create a string or alternatively, you can create a string array. The way to do that is like this. You can say a string array. You need to name your array. For example, in here, I'm going to say students. After that, inside this opening and closing tag, I can create different items. Let's say item. And inside these item tags, I can uh, provide the value. For example, I can say Mason. You can copy and paste this item as many times that you want. Once again, don't worry if you don't understand this strings.xml file, we will talk about it in the next video. Now that we have created this string array, we can pass it to our spinner item inside our activity main.xml file. When we have created our spinner, we have an attribute called entries. Uh, this attribute in here. You can see that we have this at array students. This is the address of our string array in our strings.xml file. Let's pass that. And as soon as I pass that, you can see that we have some sample data in our spinner. So now that I have passed the data to our spinner statically, I don't need to pass them in my Java file dynamically. For that, I can comment all of these lines of code. For example, from here to top in here. But right now we are getting an error inside this on item selected method. And that's because we no longer have this students array. If you want to show the name of the student when you select some item, uh, instead of using the students array list, you can use another way. Let's delete this line of code and let's create a new toast message. For the text, this time I'm going to say student spinner dot, let's say get selected item. You can see that this method is going to return an object. Let's say get selected item. After that, we can say dot to string. This to string is just another level of conversion in order to convert the object that has been returned to a string. After that, let's say plus selected. Once again, before running the application, let's review what we have done. First of all, we have uh, created this string array. After that, we have passed it to our spinner statically. And after that, inside our Java file, we have created this set on item selected listener. Inside the on item selected method, we have created this toast message and we are getting the value of every item by using a student's spinner dot get selected item method. Let's run the application and let's see if we have the same behavior. You can see that we have some data in our spinner. If I select Brad, for example, you can see the toast message Brad selected. It seems like our spinner is working fine. So far, we have talked about different layout files. For example, this activity main.xml, which is a layout file. In the next video, we are going to talk about other kind of XML files. For example, this strings.xml or this android manifest.xml. Also, we have other kind of XML files. In the next video, we are going to talk about them. Okay, see you in the next video. So far, we have talked about different layout files in our application placed inside this resources folder, inside the layout folder. 
For example, we have talked about this activity main.xml file in which we have defined the looks of our layout file for our main activity. But in Android there are a lot of other XML files. For example, at the end of the previous video we have take a look at the strings.xml file. Let's close this and uh, let's talk a bit about that uh, strings.xml file. As I said, it's placed inside this resources folder, inside the values folder. You can see this strings.xml file. If you remember, I said that this is the place that you will put all of the static strings of your application. Let's quickly see what I mean by that. So for example, inside my layout file, if I define a text view, uh, we have a text view in here. Let's give it an ID. Let's say txt hello. Let's go to our Java file and let's initialize this text view. Let's say private text view. Let's name it txt hello. And down in here inside the uncreate, let's uh, quickly initialize this text view. Let's see what would happen if we uh, set the text of this txt hello manually. For example, in here, if we say txt hello.set text, and if we pass hello, you can see that we are getting some highlights in here. And the highlight says that uh, this string cannot be translated. Use Android resources instead. If you want, you can have some more information about this warning. As the suggestion says, uh, you can press Ctrl plus F1. And you can see a whole dialogue about this warning. Basically, this in here means that uh, this text is going to be the same in all of the languages. For example, if you have an application that uh, has some users around the world, this text is going to be the same in all of the devices regardless of the user's language. As the warning says, you can define this text inside your strings.xml file. Let's quickly see how we can use this strings.xml file in order to localize our application. So in here, I'm going to define another string. The way to do that is to open a tag and say a string. After that, we need to name our string. For example, in here, I'm going to simply say hello. And for the value of this string, I'm going to say hello. Now I can pass this string uh, to my text view inside my Java file. Instead of hard coding this text, I can say get a string. This get a string method, like this find view by ID, is an inner method inside every activity. We can use that because we are extending this app compat activity. So inside this parenthesis, we can address our uh, a string file. For example, I can say r dot string dot let's say hello. Right now, the result is going to be exactly as before. For example, we are just going to show hello to the user. But the option that we have in here is to create another strings.xml file inside our values folder. For example, in here, uh, I can right click on my values folder. I can say new value resource file. I need to name this new XML file exactly strings. Let's say strings. The name is important in here. It should be exactly the same. And in here you have a few options. We will talk about few of them in here. But the one that we are interested in here is this locale. Let's select that and let's add it to these uh, chosen qualifiers. So basically this locale is going to be useful for when you want to expose your application to different languages. For example, if you know that you have some users from Germany, you can translate your application this way for those users as well. Uh, let's quickly see that if we can see German in here. You can see that we have this DE German, DE stands for Deutsch. In the right hand side, we can select a specific region. We know that there are multiple countries that spoke German. Let's select Germany and let's press OK. If you take a look at your uh, values folder, you can see that now you have this strings folder in which inside that you have two strings.xml file. The names are exactly the same, but the second one is for the German language users. Right now, this strings.xml file for German users is empty. If you want, you can define some strings in here. 
For example, I'm going to define my hello text in here as well. Let's say a string. Let's name it hello. It's very important that this name would be exactly the same name that you have passed inside the other strings.xml file. If you remember in here we have this uh, string called hello. We are going to name it in here uh, hello as well. Now let's pass some value for this string. For example, the German translation of hello is hello, I believe. So inside this strings.xml file for the German users, we have a string called hello, but the value in here is different from the one that we had inside the default strings.xml. Now that we have created two strings.xml file, because inside our main activity, we are using this get string method and we are addressing our hello. If some uh, German language user uses our application, the value of this text view would be different in different languages. Let's quickly run our application and let's see the difference. Right now, the language of this device is English and because of that, we are seeing this hello text. But if we change the language of this device to, let's say, German, we should see hello. Let's close this application and let's quickly change the language of this device and let's see if we can see the difference. So we can go to the settings. Down in here inside the systems, I believe, or system, language and input. Let's go to languages and let's add another language. Let's search for German or its equivalent Deutsch. We need to select a region. Let's select Deutschland. And also we need to make this Deutsch uh, as the default language of this phone. So let's uh, move this to the, above this English. And now you can see that the language of this phone has uh, changed to Deutsch. If we run our application once again, we should see the difference. This time you can see that we are seeing hello instead of hello. Without changing a line of code, we now have an application that looks different in different languages. So this strings.xml file is extremely useful for localization purposes. If you want, you can add another uh, string file. For example, once again on our values folder, we can right click, we can say new value resource file. Once again, we can name it strings. And once again, we can select this local. And if you want, you can select another language and you can do the same process. After creating your application, if you want to translate your application for another language, you can pass this strings.xml file to maybe a translator and ask him or her to uh, change some of the values for your string files. As simple as that, you can localize your application for different languages. You can see that we also have an error in here. This error is not important. Basically, it says that you do not have an equivalent string uh, for this app name. You can also change the app name in different languages as well, but we are not going to do that in this application. Okay, let's close all of these and let's uh, talk about another kind of XML file in Android applications. The other XML file that I'm going to talk about is this colors.xml file. Once again, it's placed inside this values folder. Let's take a look at that. You can see that right now we have three colors in here. Like a strings, this is going to be the place that we pass all of our static colors. If we want, we can define another color in here. For that, we can uh, come between this resources tag and we can say color. We can name our color, for example, let's say blue. And for the value, we need to pass a hexadecimal value. We can get that value by searching for HTML color picker. Let's quickly do that. For example, in here, uh, if we want a blue color, a lighter blue maybe, we can copy the hexadecimal value from here and we can paste it in our project. You can see that uh, at the left pane in here, we have this blue color. Now that we have this blue color, we can use it in different places of our application. For example, inside our activity main.xml file, when we have defined this text view, we can change its color. 
we can say color or to be precise text color and we can address our color for example i can say add color slash blue this add color is referencing our uh, colors.xml file this one in here you can see that the color of our text has been changed to this light blue instead of searching for different colors on the internet you can also define them another way for example you can copy this uh, color accent color let's copy that let's paste it in here and uh, let's define a white color but for the value of this white color i can click on this square and i can select a white color for example let's select this white and as you can see now we have a white color without searching the internet we can get the hexadecimal values for different colors okay there is not much more to this colors.xml file i just wanted to show you how you can define new colors let's talk about the other xml file in android applications which is this styles.xml but before that let's close these two and let's open this styles.xml once again it lives inside our values folder so basically this styles.xml file uh, is the place that we define the theme of our application right now we have one style in here later on we will see that where we have used this the name of this style is app theme but if we want we can uh, overwrite this for example uh, we can change the value of some of these colors if we want or we can uh, change other attributes you can also define multiple styles for example let's copy this whole style and let's paste it down in here uh, we need to name our style differently for example let's say uh, customized app team and let's override the previous style for example we have this parent attribute in here which you can guess it's implementing all of the features of this exact theme in here if you want first of all you can change this parent for example let's uh, take a look at the other ones let's say light dot we have this no action bar in which we are going to use uh, in future videos we have these dialogues i'm not going to change the parent in here instead if you want you can uh, change some of the values of this color so in different parts of our application we may use this color primary for uh, different texts the value of this color primary is uh, right now uh, this value in here at color slash color primary if you want you can change that for example you can say blue the color that we just created you can see that now the color primary in these two styles is different for the first one is this dark green and for the second one is this light blue now that you have defined this customized app theme style you can pass it to let's say different activities in your application it means that different activities in your application different pages in your application can have different styles for example one of them may have uh, some toolbar some of them may not have that toolbar if you use another parent later on we will see that how we can do that also we will talk about activities later on in the course don't worry about uh, activities if you don't understand them yet so this styles.xml file is the place that you define different styles for your application we will be coming back to this styles.xml file later on in the course specifically when we talk about material design but for now let's move on from this part i believe you grasp the general idea the other xml file that i'm going to talk about is this manifest file this android manifest.xml file i believe this is the most important xml file uh, in every android application basically this is where you define uh, the general attributes the general features of your application you can see that we have this manifest tag inside that we have this application tag we have seen this icon and round icon previously basically these are uh, helpful for when you want to define different icons for your application we also have this label which is basically the name of your application that is going to be shown to the user you also have a general theme for your application which as you can see is addressing the style the app theme style if you want you can pass your customized app theme it will override all of the activities in your application but in here i'm not going to do that 
right now inside the application tag you have one activity which is basically our main activity so basically every activity needs to be declared inside the manifest file inside this application tag as well this activity in here has been added uh, automatically because when we have created our application we have selected the empty activity template but if we don't select that template and uh, one of the things that we need to do is to come inside this manifest file and declare our activity inside this activity tag you have this intent filter tag don't worry about that yet we will talk about that later on in the course i believe in the broadcast receiver section of the course but probably you can guess the usage of this intent filter from this launcher and main it means that this main activity is the launcher activity when we run our application don't worry about all of these yet these are just some basic properties some basic features of our application so beside activities you need to define three other elements in the manifest file as well so in every android application we have four main components activities content providers broadcast receivers and services we will talk about all of them later on in the course but uh, these are the four main component of every android application all of them needs to be declared inside the manifest file so as you can see this manifest file is very important it contains all of the important features of your application we will be coming back to this manifest file a lot during the course so don't worry if you don't understand all of these new stuff that we are seeing in here okay the next xml file that i'm going to talk about is menus let's quickly see them as well so in your project pane inside the resources folder you can create another directory for different menus by default you do not have that directory like we did have for different values and layout files we need to create that directory we can right click on our resource folder we can say new directory it's very important to name this directory menu and after that you can see that we have this menu folder in here you can right click on that and you can say new menu resource file this way you can create a menu.xml file for example let's name this menu file main menu let's create this file and let's see what does it look like let's switch to text view in here you can see that we have this menu tag basically menus are useful for when you want to create some sort of menu in your application and the way to do that is to come inside this menu tag and create different items i can say item you can define multiple attributes for your item but the one that is mandatory and you have to uh, create that is this title you can say android column title and you can pass a title for your menu for example we can say uh, settings in here you can see that some menu has been created in here later on we will pass this menu to for example our main activity to have some sort of menu in our main activity the other attributes that i have in here is an id for example i can say settings menu we also can have an icon for our menu item but i believe we do not have any icon in our project yet before passing an icon let's quickly create some icons in our drivable folder we have seen how we can create different icons we can right click on our drivable folder by saying new image asset we can create icons in the icon type i'm going to say uh, action bar and tab icons for example inside this clip art uh, let's search for settings icon you can see that we have one icon in here let's add that let's change the name to ic settings and let's change the color to black let's add another icon in our drivable folder new image asset like before let's name this one i see lr let's search for lr the color is fine let's just create this icon 
Now that we have these two icons, we can pass them in our menu file. For example, in this item, I can say icon. Let's pass our settings icon, IC settings. Right now, we cannot see the icon of this setting in here. But if you want to see that, you can define another attribute that's called uh, show as action. So we have some values for this show as action attribute. Uh, if we say always, it means that we always want our menu items in the toolbar. You can see that we have other options. For example, we have this if room. It means that place them in the toolbar if there is room for this menu item. We have also this never. It means that always show the menu items like this and never show them in the toolbar. Let's change the value for now to always and let's create another item in here. So I can say item like before the title is mandatory and also we are getting a warning for the previous items title. Once again, it says that you need to define the title in your strings.xml file. Like before, this is for the localization purposes and the best practice is to create this settings title in your strings.xml file. In your real world applications, make sure to do that. But in here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to cope with this warning. So let's pass a title in here. I'm going to say alarm. Let's give it an ID. Let's say alarm menu. After that, let's give it an icon. Uh, let's say I see alarm. Let's set the show as action attribute for this one uh, to if row. You can create as many items as you want, but I think for this simple menu item, these two would be fine. Okay, now that we have created this menu file, let's see how we can pass this to, for example, our main activity. Let's close this file. Once again, it was placed inside our resources folder inside the menu directory that we just created. In order to show this menu in your main activity, you need to open the main activity.java file and you need to overwrite another method in here. So because we are extending the app compat activity inside this main activity, we have some methods that we can overwrite. One of these methods is this onCreate method. If you come outside of this onCreate method and uh, press Ctrl plus O, you can see the list of all of the available methods. You can see that there are a lot of them. The one that we need in here is called onCreate options menu. If you type on create options menu, you can see this uh, method in here. Let's select that. And in here we have this method. First of all, I'm going to delete this statement from here. This return super dot on create options menu. And I'm going to create or inflate my menu. For that, I can say menu inflator. This class in here. Let's name it inflator is equal to get menu inflator. This get menu inflator is like this uh, find view by ID method. It's an inner class in every activity. So basically with the help of this inflator, we are going to inflate or uh, create our menu. After accessing to our inflator, we can say inflator dot inflate. For this inflate method, first of all, we need to address the menu file that we just created. For that, we can say r dot menu dot main menu the menu that we just created the second argument is the menu that is being passed to this method let's pass that you can see that the return type of this method is a boolean this boolean is indicating that if we have successfully inflated our menu by this point we have inflated our menu and after that we can return true this is all of the logic that we need in order to inflate or create our menu in our main activity. Let's run the application and let's see if we can see our menu in our application. You can see that in our activity, we have these two items, this settings icon and this uh, alarm icon. We can also set an onclick listener for each one of these menu items. Let's quickly see how we can do that. So we need to uh, overwrite another method outside of this onCreate options menu method. If we press Ctrl plus O and if we search for on options item selected, this method in here, if we select that, 
we can override that this time i'm going to keep this uh, super statement we will talk why i'm going to keep that as you can see as the input of this method we are getting a menu item this is the item that user is going to click on and we can use it uh, for example to create a switch statement let's create our switch statement so our switch statement is going to work on the item dot get item id if you remember in our menu file for different menu items we have set different ids let's quickly see that in our main menu.xml file we have set id for each one of these items and in here we are going to act upon uh, those ids let's create our switch statement let's say in case it's r.id.settings menu we are going to show a toast message let's say toast for the text let's say settings clicked or settings selected after showing the toast message in here instead of adding a break for this switch statement for this specific case we can return something once again you can see that the return type of this method is a boolean as well this boolean indicates that if we have acted according to this item successfully or not in here after showing the toast message we are going to return true so let's say return true and let's create other cases for example in case it's r.id.alarm menu once again we are going to show another toast message let's say alarm selected in here i'm showing a toast message but in a real world application you may want to navigate the user to some other part of your application but more on that later on when we know about different activities and fragment okay after showing the toast message let's return true once again and also let's create the default case in the default case i'm going to return this super statement because i'm not interested in other items beside these two so do whatever you are doing inside the parent class so basically i can uh, cut this uh, super statement from here and i can return it in the default case before we run our application let's review what we are doing in here as the input of this on options item selected method we are uh, getting a menu item we can use this item id in order to create a switch statement in case the id is the id of our settings menu item we are showing this toast message settings selected in case it's alarm menu item id we are showing another toast message but in the default case in case if it's uh, another item beside these two we are passing the job to the parent class let's run the application and let's see if we have set the listener successfully so for example if we click on this settings icon you can see that settings selected if we click on this alarm we can see alarm selected it seems like we have done a good job inside this on options item selected method Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to continue our talk about other kind of XML files available in Android. See you in the next video. Let's continue our talk about different XML files in Android. In previous videos, we take a look at different XML files, for example, drawable files, layout files, some files inside our mipmap folder we have seen uh, strings and colors and styles beside this we take a look at menus and also our manifest file let's see what else do we have in here right now our main activity has only one layout file this activity main.xml but if you want you can create more layout files for this activity for example right now uh, this layout is for the portrait mode if you want you can create another layout file for the let's say landscape mode if you don't know what the portrait and landscape modes are let me quickly show that so right now this is called the portrait mode if we change the rotation of our device uh, this is going to be the landscape i think i need to activate the rotation of this device let's go to the notification center and from here i believe this is the option this auto rotate we need to activate that and now if we rotate our device you can see that now we have a different look for our application sometimes this might work but if you have a complex layout file 
that you want to show it differently in different rotations, you need to create two separate files for uh, each one of these rotations mode, one for the portrait mode and one for the landscape mode. Let's quickly see that how we can create another layout file for this main activity. So inside my layout folder, on the layout folder, I can right click by uh, selecting new layout resource file. I can create a layout file or alternatively uh, inside this activity main.xml file from here. If you click on this icon, you can see that uh, we have this portrait selected right now. If you want, you can create a landscape variation uh, for the layout of your main activity. But before I do that, I'm going to add another text and also I'm going to add some constraints to this layout file. So I'm going to move this uh, new text view to below my hello world text. Let's quickly add some constraints. As I mentioned before, if uh, your items are too close to each other, you can always select both elements and you can uh, use the right click menu by going to constraint and add constraint from here. Okay, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to add some margin salt. Let's say 100. So for this simple application, this is going to be the look of my application in the portrait view. The two text views are placed after each other vertically, but in the landscape mode, I'm going to put the two texts uh, beside each other. Let's quickly create a variation for our uh, landscape mode by selecting this uh, create landscape variation. You can see that inside our layout file, now we have two files inside the activity main folder. We have this activity main.xml, which is for the portrait mode, and the other one, uh, which is for the landscape mode. And now if you want, we can change this landscape. For example, I'm going to change the constraint of this text view. Let's delete all of the previous constraints. I'm also going to delete the constraint of this text view, the left constraint. Let's place this one in here and let's add some constraint. Also, another point in here that you may find useful is that if you want to center your elements, for example, horizontally, you can select the two items, for example, these two, by right clicking on the item and by going to this center and selecting horizontally, you can center your items horizontally. So once again, this is the view for the landscape mode, the layout for the landscape mode. And this is going to be the layout for the portrait mode. Now, if I run my application, I should see the difference. You can see that in the landscape mode, the two texts are beside each other. But if we change the rotation to portrait mode, the two texts are vertically after each other. So this way, by coming to this uh, icon in here and selecting create landscape variation, you can create another layout file for your main activity. But this is not the only option. You can also create a night version in case if you want to activate a night theme for your application. I'm not going to do that. Let's quickly see how we can create that. So in here, I can go to this create other. And from here, I have all sorts of options. For example, if you want to create a night mode for our activity, we can select this night mode. We can pass it to this uh, qualifiers. And for the night mode, let's say night. Let's create this one. And let's take a look at our project pane. Now inside this activity main folder, you can see that we have three activity main.xml files. The middle one is for the night view. If you want, you can change that. For example, you can change some colors, but I'm not going to do that in here. I'm just going to ignore this layout file for the night view. Let's see what other layouts we can create for our activity. So once again, I can uh, go to this icon in here by saying create other. You can see that we have all sorts of options. For example, in here we have this version in which we can create different layout files for different versions of the Android on the user's device. Let's add this to these chosen qualifiers. And in here we can uh, put a number. For example, if we want our application to look different in API level 21, we can uh, put 21 in here and we can create the layout file. Let's take a look at our layout folder inside the activity main folder. Now we have this activity main.xml, which is specific for the version 21 of the API. This way you can also create other layout files and you can change them if you want. Before I finish off this video, I'm going to talk about another kind of XML files in Android. Let's right click on our layout file and let's select new layout resource file and let's see what an include is. So for the file name of this XML file, I'm going to say trademark. And also I'm going to change the root element to, let's say, relative layout. Let's select OK. 
and let's switch to text view. Inside this text view, you can see that we have this relative layout. So basically, you use include whenever you want to reuse some layout file. For example, now I have created this trademark.xml file in which I'm going to put an image view and a text view inside that. After creating this layout file, I can reuse this trademark.xml in order to show this trademark in multiple activities of my application. So the use of include tag is to reuse your layout files. First of all, let's design this trademark.xml. In here, I'm going to say text view, or before that, let's define an image view. Let's say 15 dp for the width and height. Let's give it an ID. And for the placeholder, I'm not going to import any image into my project. Instead, I'm going to use this IC launcher background, which exists in our drivable folder. Let's also define a text view in here. Wrap content and wrap content. For the text, I'm going to say developed by Mesa. After that, let's move this text view to the right of our image view. Let's say to right of logo. Let's add some margin left maybe 10 dp let's style this text a little bit let's say italic and bold let's also change the size of this text view right now the width and height of this relative layout this whole parent is match parent in here i'm going to change that i'm going to change both of these to wrap content we will see why uh, when we use this layout file and also I'm going to add another attribute for both of these elements. Let's center them vertically. Center vertical for both of them, let's say true. It will place them uh, at the center vertically. So this is our simple layout file. In here we are showing a text view and uh, also an image view. If we want to show this layout file in multiple places in our application, we can use the include tag. Include tag is very useful for when you have a complex layout file and you don't want to write the exact same file twice. Let's switch to our uh, activity main.xml file and let's see how we can use that trademark. So down in here after the text view, I'm going to say include and I can add a layout attribute and I need to pass the address of my layout file. In this case, it's at layout slash trademark. As simple as that, we can include another XML file inside this layout file. If we want, we can also constrain this layout file. You can see that I can select this whole layout file. But right now, if I try to constrain my layout file, you can see that it won't work. You can see that it will be placed once again at the top of my screen. And that's because uh, we need to overwrite the width and height of this uh, layout file. The way to do that is uh, to come inside this include tag. And in here for my whole layout file, I need to uh, define my layout width and height once again. So for example, for the layout width, I'm going to say wrap content. For the height as well, I'm going to say wrap content. This way you can see that now we can constrain our layout file. We just need to override the width and height of our layout file. Let's also add two more constraints. I can use this trademark.xml file as many times as I want in different parts of my application. That can be useful sometimes. Also, where you are using include tag, you may want another tag. Let's quickly see that. So instead of this relative layout, sometimes you may see merge. This tag in here. So basically what this merge is doing is that it's avoiding redundancy. Let's talk about what I mean by that. So right now, these two elements have no idea about their parents. They do not know where they are going to be used inside a relative layout, a linear layout, or a constraint layout. For that reason, because they don't know about their parent, you can see that our layout does not uh, look very beautiful in here. But if you know for sure that where you are going to use uh, this layout file, for example, if you are going to use this layout file inside a linear layout, you do not need to uh, write the linear layout once again. You can use this merge tag in order to avoid redundancy. At the time of rendering your layout file, this merge tag will be ignored and these two elements will be placed inside the parent that they are going to be used. Sometimes when you know for sure that where you are going to use in your layout file using this merge tag can improve the performance when rendering your layout file. But in here, I'm just going to change this to a relative layout. 
Okay, I think that's enough talking about different XML files in Android. We have others as well. We will take a look at them later on in the course. But for now, I think it's enough. In the next video, we are going to talk about the material design library. See you in the next video. In creating Android applications, designing is an important aspect and creating a beautiful layout will impact the number of downloads for your application on the Play Store and also it will impact the user's feedback. But sometimes designing can be challenging, especially if you are like me if you are more interested in the code side of the application. But luckily we have material design as a guideline for our designing. Despite being a guideline, material design also introduces some new components that we can use in our application. Let's check the material design website and let's see how we can use that in our projects. The website for material design is material.io. If you go to this develop tab in here, you can see that beside Android applications, you can also use material design for iOS app development. You can use it for web development and also you can use it with hybrid development with Flutter. Let's go to the Android page. As I said, material design consists of two things. First of all, it's a guideline for designing your applications. Also, beside being a guideline, you have some components that you can use in your application. We will take a look at those components in a minute, but before that, if you take a look at this theming in here, for example, if you want to check the guidelines for typography theming, you can click on this link. And after that, if you take a look at this material design guideline for typography, you will see some guidelines. Basically, these guidelines are helpful for when you want to design and create a beautiful application. And basically, these are some to-dos and not to-dos uh, in order to follow when you are designing different applications. So make sure to check this web page and their guidelines. In here, we are not going to talk about guidelines. Instead, we are going to take a look at the components. If you go to this components link, you will see that we have a lot of components. We are familiar with some of these components, for example, we have seen different buttons and checkboxes, but some of them are new. Don't worry about that, later on we will see a lot of these in the course, but let's take a look at a few components that we already know. For example, let's check these buttons. Down in here, in this image, you can see that we have four different kind of material buttons. These are somehow different from the buttons that we have used already in our applications. Basically, the main difference is uh, in the styling of different buttons. Similar to button, we have all sorts of other components. For example, we have checkboxes. For some of these components, we have also some documentations and guidelines uh, for designing them. For example, if you want to check the guidelines for designing a checkbox, you can click on that link. And in here, you can see some guidelines. So make sure to check that if you need. But let's see how we can use these components in our applications. Before that, I'm just going to say that uh, in this video, we are not going to work with all of these components. During the course, we will be coming back to this web page and a lot of these components. But for now, first of all, we are going to start with material buttons. We will also take a look at the floating action button, this one in here. We will also take a look at the material card and uh, things like snack bars. Later on in the course, we will take a look at the top app bars, bottom app bars, and also things like tab layouts and uh, a lot more. Okay, instead of talking, let's implement these material buttons in our application. In order to use material design components in your application, you need to add a dependency in your application. We haven't used any extra dependencies in our applications yet, but let's see how we can do that. If you remember, I said that Gradle will combine all of the layout files, all of the Java files, all of the static resources in our application. And beside all of those, Gradle will also use the third-party libraries that we use in our application. One of those libraries that we are going to use in here, and later on Gradle is going to handle combining it in our application, is this material design. So we need to add this material design library in our project with the help of Gradle. In order to add the material design library, you can go to this develop tab. After that, you can select this Android. And inside this documentation, you can go to this getting started. And from there, you can find the dependency that you need. 
In this page, you can see a step-by-step -step guide uh, for adding the library, the material design library into your project. Make sure to read this page if you need, but basically what they are saying is that first of all, make sure that you are using Google repositories in your project. Let's see where that is in Android Studio. In Android Studio, inside this Gradle script, inside this build.gradle, this uh, project module, you need to add the Google repository. Google repositories has been added by default into our project inside this all projects. But if you don't see this Google in here, make sure to add that. The next step after adding the Google repository is to add the material design dependency. You can copy this dependency from here and you can add it uh, to your project. Let's copy that. This time we need to go to this build.gradle module app, this one in here. But before that, let's close this one and let's also minimize all these extra panes. We need to add that dependency inside these dependencies in here. For example, you can add that dependency before all the other dependencies. Let's paste that in here, but we also need to change this line because right now we have this version tag in here and this is not the version. It's better to always check the internet for the latest version of material design. You can also use the help of Android Studio. Right now I'm getting a highlight. If I hover over this highlight, you can see that the latest version available is 1.1.0. So instead of this version, I'm going to say 1.1.0. After adding this dependency, you need to click on this sync now. And after that, Gradle will download some files to the specific uh, material design library files from the internet and it will add the library to your project. So let's click on this sync now. Before that, make sure that you have an internet connection. It was somehow fast and now we can use material design components in our project. Also inside these dependencies, you can see that uh, by default, we have other dependencies as well. For example, we have this constraint layout. We have these dependencies for testing. And also we have this app compat dependencies, which uh, help backward compatibility, but more on them later on. Okay, now that we have added this material dependency, let's see how we can use them. But before using them, I'm going to uh, add a button in my layout file. Let's quickly see that. Let's also enable this preview. And before everything, let's delete this text view. So in here, I'm going to say button, let's say wrap content and wrap content, and let's define a text. Let's say, say hello. Let's also change this constraint layout to a relative layout. And let's center our button. You can see that we are seeing the previous style for our button. Now let's implement material theme and let's see how that changes the style of our button. So for that, I'm going to open my project pane. If you remember inside the resources folder, inside the values folder, we have this styles.xml. Let's open that. Right now we have this app theme style in which its parent is this theme that we are seeing in here. If we want to implement material theme, we can change this parent. Let's quickly do that. And the theme in here is going to be theme.material components. We also have another theme called theme.materialcomponents.light, this one in here. We will take a look at that in a minute, but in here, I'm not going to customize this theme.materialcomponents. So for that, I'm going to delete all these three items. I'm going to use all of the values from inside this material components theme. So let's delete them. We just changed the parent theme of this app theme. But right now, if we switch to our activity main.xml file, you can see that we are getting this dark theme. Somehow we also changed the style of our button. This is good for a night theme, but in here I'm going to change the parent theme to a light theme so that we can see better. So let's select this light in here. And if we switch back to our activity main.xml file, you can see that we are seeing this beautiful light theme. Our button is now styled. We have some round corners. The font is somehow different and also the spacing between the letters is different. We didn't change anything for our button element, but because we are uh, using the material theme as the parent theme of our application, all of these styles have been applied automatically. We can also customize this button. For example, we can change the background color of this button. But before that, let's quickly add a color to our color resources. Inside colors.xml, I'm going to add a new color. Let's copy this one. Let's paste it and let's change the name to, let's say, orange. For the value, I'm going to select this orange color. 
Now in our activity main.xml file, if we want to change the background color of this button to the orange, we can say background tint, this one in here, and we can address our orange color. We can also change the text color of this button, but I don't think that's necessary. I just wanted to show you that you can customize your buttons. Let's delete this color. As you saw on the material design website, we have some styles for our button. Let's see other styles as well. For example, in here I can say a style. Let's search for material button. You can see that we have this on elevated button style. Let's quickly see that. This is basically this style that we are currently using. It's the default case. Let's remove that and let's see others. We have this button style. We have this outline button. If you take a look at that, you can see that the style of your button is changed to some outline button. Sometimes this might be useful. We also have a text button. Let's quickly see that. And this is the one material components dot button dot text button. It will change our button to a text button. Sometimes you may want to use this. I'm going to stay with the default case. So I'm going to uh, delete this whole style attribute. So you can see that using material design is very easy. Basically, we just added the material dependency into our project inside this uh, build.gradle module app. After that, inside the styles, we change the parent to this theme.material components theme. And after that, we can use all of the elements uh, from inside the material design library. If you add another element into your layout file, for example, a checkbox, by default, uh, the checkbox from the material design library will be used. Okay, let's move on from this part and let's talk about some of the components that we don't have in our applications if we don't use the material design library. The first of those components that I'm going to talk about in here is called floating action button. Let's delete this button and let's see that floating action button. So in here I can say floating action button. We can see that we have two options. Uh, we have this floating action button and we have this extended floating action button. Let's use the first one. For the width and height I'm going to say wrap content. And as soon as I do that, you can see that we have this beautiful button in here. This floating action button is going to be floating on our uh, layout file, even if, for example, we scroll the page. If you want, you can change the location of this button. For example, you can move it to down below in here. For that, I can use two attributes that we haven't seen so far. For example, I can say align parent button and I can set it to true. You can see that as soon as I do that, its location will be changed to the bottom of our screen. We can also use another attribute called align parent end in order to move it to the right of our screen. Let's say true. And now you can see the difference. Let's also add some margins. Let's say margin. In here we have two options. We can add this margin right or alternatively we can use this margin end. If I use this margin right in here, I will get a warning. Let's quickly use that and let's see the warning. For example, in here I'm going to say 20 dp. You can see the highlight in here. If you take a look at this, it says that it's better to use margin end. The reason for this is because some of the languages start from right. So for example, if the language of your user is Arabic, in that case, this floating action button will be placed at the left of the screen. And if you add a margin right, it's going to put the floating action button to outside of the screen. For that reason, it's better to use a margin end. So let's say margin end and let's pass 20 dp. You can see that we are getting the same result in here. We also need to add a margin button. Let's say margin button and let's pass 20 dp. You can also add an icon for your floating action button as well. Let's quickly add an icon into our driver folder and let's add it uh, for our floating action button. Let's say new image asset on our driver folder and let's select action bar and tab icons and let's select uh, a plus sign in here. Let's search for add and let's add this one. For the name, let's say IC add and also let's change the color. I'm not sure that if this is a white color, for that I'm going to use this custom color and I'm going to use white. Right now the selector is on white, so let's say choose and let's create our icon. And now you can add the icon for your floating action button. But for some reason I cannot use the source attribute, which is the attribute to pass an icon for your floating action button. 
I think because I've added this dependency in my project, I need to restart my Android Studio. Or the other option is to rebuild my project. Or the better option is to go to this file and invalidate your cache and restart Android Studio. Let's select that. Let's say invalidate and restart. Now that I have invalidated my cache, I can use the source attribute. So inside this floating action button tag, I can say source this one android source and i can pass my ic add icon you can see that as soon as i do that this icon will be added uh, to my floating action button if you want you can also change the color of this floating action button for example let's change it to the orange color that we have defined a few minutes ago for that i can say background tint this one in here and i can pass color orange you can see that the color will be changed to orange also uh, you can see that we have some sort of border for this floating action button if you want you can also change that the way to do that is like this you can say app column background tint and this way you can pass your new color for example if you want to pass a white color first of all you can create that color inside your color resources and after that pass that or alternatively you can pass the hexadecimal value of that color directly in here for example i know that uh, hashtag fff is for the white color so if i pass that you can see that we have a white color in here and also you can see that the border of this floating action button is now white so this android column background tint is for the background color of your floating action button but this app column background tint is for the border of your floating action button you can also define another color in here let's quickly see that you can say ripple color this one in here app column ripple color and pass a color for example once again i'm going to pass white this ripple color is the color of the floating action button when you click on it let's run this application and let's see that you can see that we have this beautiful floating action button at the bottom of our screen and if we click on that you can see some color and that white color is this ripple color beside that you may also have noticed that the color of this top app bar has changed as well this is because we are using material component theme in our application later on we will see that we have a beautiful toolbar when we work with material design we will implement that toolbar in our applications later on but for now let's talk more about this uh, floating action button you can also set an on-click listener for this button if you want as well but for that we need to have access to this uh, floating action button inside our main activity.java file so for example like before i can say private floating action button this one that comes from material.floating action button package let's name it fab after that we need to instantiate it inside our onCreate method let's say fab is equal to find view by id but before that we need to give an id to our floating action button i don't think we did that in here let's say id let's just name it fab let's say r.id.fab after that you can say fab dot set on click listener this one in here and we can pass our listener for example let's show a toast message let's say fab clicked let's run the application and let's see if we see the toast message you can see that we are seeing the toast message it seems to be perfect there are also other ways of using these floating action buttons for example one way is to use a combination of floating action button and app bar navigation in that case we will see that uh, we can implement a beautiful style and a beautiful design for our application but more on that later on when we talk about bottom app bar navigations okay i think that's enough for this video in the next video we will talk about two more components in material design library we will talk about snack bars and also card views see you in the next video in this video we are going to talk about two more material components the first of those components is a snack bar before we start implementing a snack bar let's see what does it look like so if you go to material.io in this component in this listing here you will see a snack bar let's see that this is what a snack bar looks like it's a lot like a toast message but the style is a little bit different and also inside the snack bar you can have a button that will do some action 
Beside that, you can make your snack bars to be indefinite. It means that they won't be dismissed until the user clicks on this action. Also, you can style your snack bar as well. For example, you can change the color of this text and also the color of this action button. As we will see later on in the course, snack bars are extremely useful when you are developing Android applications. In order to use snack bars, first of all, you need to add the material design library into your project. So let's go to this develop tab in this Android section. Let's go to the documentation, getting started. And let's copy the dependency. In our project inside the Gradle scripts, build.gradle, let's quickly add that dependency. For the version, if you hover over this, you will see the latest version, which is 1.1.0. After adding the material dependency, first of all, in my layout file, I'm going to do some changes. I'm going to add a button and also beside that I'm going to give an ID to my parent layout. But first of all you may have noticed some changes in the looks of Android Studio compared to the previous video. That's because I have updated my Android Studio and we have slight differences. Don't worry about that, we will talk about these differences in the next video. For this video let's just implement our snack bar. The first difference inside this new Android Studio is that you no longer can see the text and design mode in here. And if you want to go to your text, you can go uh, to this split view in here. Once again, we will talk about these differences. Let's give an ID to our constraint layout. Let's say ID. I'm going to name it parent. Later on in this video, we will see that why I'm giving an ID to this constraint layout. Let's also go back to our design view and let's add a button. Before that, let's delete this text view. Let's quickly constraint it. And also let's change its text. I'm going to change it to show a snack bar. Let's also quickly change the theme of my application so that we can see the material button. In our project, like we saw in the previous video, in our values folder, inside the styles folder, I'm just going to change the parent theme in here. I'm going to change it to this theme.materialcomponents.light. If you switch back to your layout file, now you can see that we are using the material buttons. In my Java file, first of all, I'm going to initialize this parent, this constraint layout, and also this button. Let's quickly do that. Let's say private constraint layout. Let's name it parent. And also private button. Let's name it btn show snack bar. Down in here inside the onCreate method, let's initialize this to parent is equal to find view by id r.id.parent. btn show snack bar is equal to find view by id r.id. I believe its id was button. After that, let's set an unclick listener for this button. Let's say btn show snack bar dot set unclick listener. New unclick listener. I'm going to hand the job to another method. So let's say show snack bar. Let's quickly create this method down in here. Private void show snack bar. We don't need any input. And here is how you can show a snack bar. You can say snack bar dot make without instantiating a new snack bar you can use this static make method in order to create your snack bar this make method needs three inputs first of all we need to pass the parent layout the layout that we are going to show our snack bar inside that in this case our parent layout is a constraint layout and as you saw i have initialized that uh, constraint layout in here that's the reason i gave an id to my uh, constraint layout now in here I can say parent. After that I need the text that I want to show in my snack bar. For example, I'm going to say this is a snack bar. The third parameter in here is a constant that will indicate the time that you want to show your snack bar. And you can pass that constant like this. You can say snack bar dot. You have three constants in here. This length long, length short, and also length indefinite. 
The long and short are descriptive, but if you pass length indefinite, you will show your snack bar indefinitely and it won't be dismissed until the user clicks on that action button. Let's select this one for now, length indefinite. After this make method, you can call dot show method in order to show your snack bar. This is going to be a really simple snack bar and we don't have any action yet. Let's see if it's going to work. If we click on this button, we should see our snack bar. And here it is. It's a really basic snack bar and we don't have any action. Besides that, we haven't changed the style of our text. Also, because we have passed this length indefinite, there is no way to dismiss this snack bar. Let's quickly change this constant to length short and let's see the difference. Now, if we show our snack bar, you can see that uh, it will be dismissed after a few moments. Okay, now let's see how we can add an action to our snack bar. But first of all, I'm going to change this constant to length indefinite once again. And before the show method, I'm going to call another method. That method is called dot set action. First of all, we need a text in here. This is going to be the text of our action. For example, if you want, you can say retry in here. After that, you need an unclick listener. Let's say new unclick listener. This is going to be an interface and inside the onClick method we can do whatever we want when the user clicks on this retry text. For example, in this case I'm just going to show a toast message. Let's say retry clicked. Let's see if we can see the action. As you can see in here, now we have this retry option. Remember that the length is still indefinite, but if we click on this retry, the snack bar will be dismissed and also we will see a toast message. Let's also see that how we can change the color of these two texts, this retry and also the color of the message of our snack bar. For that, once again, before the show method in here, I'm going to call another method. Let's say dot set action text color in order to change the color of our action text. In here, you can pass your colors in two different ways. First of all, you can address the color from your color resources. If you remember in your project inside the resources folder, inside the values folder, you had this colors.xml file in which you have few colors inside that. You can address one of these colors inside your set action text color like this. You can say get color and after that r.color. For example, color primary. Beside that, if you have noticed, we have some colors that are coming from the material design libraries. You can see that we have these colors as well. But for example, right now, if I use this uh, color primary in here, you can see that we are getting this warning. And this warning says that you can use this method in API level 23 and higher. There is also another way to get our color without seeing this error. Let's quickly see that. Let's say get resources this one dot let's say get color inside this method you can address your color you can say r dot color dot for example color accent let's also see the other way instead of using the resources in my project i can use a java class so for example instead of this whole method in here i can say color with capital c which is coming from android dot graphics dot let's say red this way we can get the red color with the help of this color class. So if you don't have this red color in your resources, you can also use this class. Okay, now let's see how we can change the color of the message of our snack bar. For that, I can say dot set text color, this method. Once again, in order to pass a color, you have two options. In this case, I'm going to say color dot, for example, yellow. Let's run the application and let's see if we have successfully changed the color or not. Let's show our snack bar. You can see that the color of the message is yellow and also the color of our action button is red. Okay, I think that's enough talking about the snack bar. Later on, we will use snack bars a lot in the course. The next material component that I'm going to talk about is material card view. Let's quickly see what does it look like in material.io. Once again, inside this components tab, inside these cards, you can see your card views. Let's scroll down a little bit. This is what card view looks like. You can use it to, for example, show different items in your application. You can mix UI elements in form of a card. 
Beside that, you can also have some actions for your card view. Also, you can have some corner radius. And also, you can have some shadow or elevation to be precise beside your card view. In this video, we are not going to implement the actions. We will do that later on in the course, but for now, let's just implement a simple card view in our application. We have added the material design dependencies in our project so we can add the card view without any problem. But before that, let's close this style and colors. In my layout file in here, I'm going to add my card view below this button. Let's switch to a split view and let's add that. Down in here, I'm going to define my card view. Let's say material card view, this one. Beside the material card view, you also have a native card view, but the style is a little bit different. If you don't want to use the material card view, you can always go to developer.android.com and get the dependency from the Android X libraries for card view. But in here, let's implement this material card view. I'm going to enter my widths and height manually. For the widths, I'm going to say 100 dp. I think that's fine. And for the height, let's say 200 dp. It has an odd shape. I think it's better to change the width to 150 dp. Let's give it an ID. I'm going to say card view. After that, inside this card view, let's enter some elements. But before that, let's quickly constraint our card view. Inside this card view, first of all, I'm going to define a relative layout. For the width and height, let's say match parent. Their parent is this card view, so we are going to fit the whole card view. And inside this relative layout, I'm going to put my elements. For example, I'm going to put a text view, wrap content and wrap content. Let's also center it horizontally. For its text, let's just say hello. Let's also change the style of this code. Let's say text style and let's pass bold. Beside that, let's increase the size. Let's say 18 SP. After that, below this text view, I'm going to define an image view. You can see that in a card view, you can have multiple UI elements. For the width of this image, I'm going to say 140 dp. And for the height, let's say match parent. I'm going to move this image view to below this text view. So let's say layout below. But before that, I need to give an ID to this text view. Let's say ID txt hello. Let's also add a margin top and let's center this image view. Margin top, let's say 10 dp. Center horizontal true. Let's also give it a placeholder. Let's say source. I'm going to pass this IC launcher. Okay, I think that's enough for understanding the card view. Beside that, in the card view element, you have other attributes as well. For example, if you want to make the corners of your card view radius, you have this option, corner radius, card corner radius. You can say 5 dp, for example. Right now, you may not see the difference, but if we run our application, we will see the corner radius. You can also change the corner radius if you think that 5 dp is not enough. The other option that we have in here is this card elevation, in which we'll give some 3D shape to our card view, some shadow behind our card view. Once again, I'm going to say 5 dp. You can also define this card view like any other UI elements in your Java file. Let's quickly do that. Private card view. In here, you can see that we have two options. We have this card view, which is coming from Android X card view. And also we have this material card view, which is coming from the material design libraries. In here, we are going to use this material card view, but once again, the difference is only in the style. Let's name it card view. And down in here, inside the uncreate method, let's initialize it. Let's quickly set an unclick listener for this card view. Card view that set unclick listener. Beside that, you can see that we have a lot of options in here. We will talk about them later on in the course. Set unclick listener. Let's say new unclick listener. Let's just show a toast message. Let's run the application and let's see what does our card view look like. 
Our card view looks like something like this, which is not that good, but we can do much better with the card views. We will do that later on in the course, specifically when we talk about recycler view. The combination of recycler view and card view for its items will create a really beautiful layout file. We will see that, I believe, in the next video. But in here you can see that we have this corner radius and also we have this elevation, which is this 3D shape for our card view. Beside that, later on in the course, we will see how we can create an expandable card view. That means that we will have some button in here, for example, an arrow, in which by clicking on that, we will expand our card view. And we will see some more information and maybe actions for our item in our card view. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In this video, I just wanted to show you how you can uh, create a snack bar and also implement this card view. In the next video, we are going to start talking about Recycler view. In previous videos, we have seen list view for showing different items, but Recycler view is a much more better option to show a list of different items. In the next two or three videos, we are going to see how we can use Recycler views. See you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about Recycler View, which, as I said before, is another option for showing a list of different items in our application. But before that, as you can see, I've updated my Android Studio, and uh, in here we have some changes. Before talking about Recycler View, I'm going to show some of these changes in the newest version of Android Studio. I strongly suggest that you always keep your Android Studio updated. You can uh, do that by going to this Help menu. Down in here, you can check for different updates. And if there is any update available, you can see a list of different options. This in here is Firebase services. We are not going to use that. I'm going to cancel this update. You can see that I've also have some updates for my emulator and Haxam installer. I will update them after this video, but for now, let's just say remind me later. Also, if you remember from the installation videos, I've said that always check the updates from a stable channel. If you are not sure about your channel, you can always go to settings by going to this file tab in here, by going to settings. In here, if you check for updates, you can see that my updates are being checked uh, from inside a stable channel. We have others as well. These other channels are for preview purposes and it's basically for professional developers to check new features in Android and report some bugs if there is any to the Android team. But for you, for the starter, it's probably best to check your updates from a stable channel. The first thing that is different in this newest version of Android Studio is uh, the way you go to full screen. You can go to full screen by going to this view menu and by going to appearance. From here, you can go to uh, full screen. In previous versions, this option was somewhere down in here. Let's go to full screen mode. The other change that you can probably see in here is this component tree. The style in here is a little bit different. There are not much changes in here, just the style. But there is a very important change above in here. You can see that down in here, we no longer have that design and text view mode. Instead, above in here, we have three options. Right now, we are inside the design view. We can also select this one to go to the text view. And in between these two, we have this splitter mode. As you can see, it acts like uh, if you have enabled preview inside your text view, but there is a difference. Before that, let's quickly minimize this project pane. From here, from inside this splitter view, you can also enable attributes. For example, if I select this button, I can see the text view of this button, I can see the design view of this button, and also I can see all of the attributes in here as well. This is going to be helpful, especially if you are using multiple monitors. For now, I'm just going to minimize this attribute pane. You can also change the size of this preview. Beside attributes, you can also enable this palette from here, in which you can see all of different layout elements, and you can drag them directly into your design view. Once again, this is going to be helpful if you are using multiple monitors. The other thing that you can see in here is this resource manager. We had this resource manager in Android Studio 3.5, but there has been some improvements in this newest version. 
Basically inside this resource manager, you can see all of the static resources inside your project. Previously, if you wanted to see different drawable items inside your project, you could have go to this project pane in here and inside the resource folder, you could have checked your drivables. Now with this resource manager, you can have access to those drivables more easily. Also beside that, you can see different colors, you can see different layouts, map maps, the strings, and also if you click on these three dots in here, you can see all sorts of uh, resources in your project. Also, if you want, you can use these resources directly from here. For example, right now in our layout file, we have this image view, which its source is this IC launcher background, which exists in our drivable folder. If we want to change this to this IC launcher map map file, we can simply drag this IC launcher and we can paste it in here. You can see that the source of our image view has now changed. Similarly, we can do the same thing for strings. For example, right now in our string resources, we have this app name string. We can drag that, for example, instead of this hello. We can see that the text has been changed. Let's undo the changes. So from time to time, this resource manager can be useful. The other thing that has uh, changed in this newest version of Android Studio is the font of my code. I actually don't like this font and I'm going to change it to the previous font that we had in our Android Studio. For that, I can go to this file inside these settings. You can search for fonts. And in here, you can change the font. For example, I think I'm going to select this one. Let's press OK. And yes, it is the previous font that we had uh, when we worked with different layout files. Also, beside Android Studio, I've updated my Gradle tool as well. If you want to check that, you can go to your project menu. You can go to this Gradle script. We have changed two things about the Gradle. First of all, if you take a look at this Gradle.wrapper properties, you can see that we have the latest version of Gradle in here. And also beside that, if you go to this uh, build.gradle project module, you can see that we are using the latest Gradle tools version. So beside Android Studio, I've updated my Gradle as well. Probably you wouldn't see any difference when you update your Gradle. In most cases, it's going to fix some bugs and also it may improve some performance. Once again, my suggestion is to keep everything updated and when you are working with Android Studio. Okay, let's move on from this part and let's talk about Recycler View in Android Studio. For that, I'm going to close this project and I'm going to create a new project. Let's say start a new Android Studio project. Now that we have in here, Android Studio has a new update in these templates as well. For example, inside this TV, you can see that we have other options for different operating systems or for different devices. Some new templates has been added, but we are not going to work with them. Like before, we are going to use this empty activity. Let's name this project Recycler View or let's say Recycler View example. It's interesting that in here we have this new option in here. It says use legacy android.support.libraries. So basically before Android X, we had to use uh, support libraries for having backward compatibilities in older devices. As you saw in the previous videos, the use of Android X was mandatory, but now in here we have this new option. I don't think we are going to use this legacy support libraries in our course, but uh, it seems like we now have this option. Okay, let's create our project. And let's see how we can use Recycler View. For that, uh, we have two options. First of all, we can go to our activity main.xml file. As you can see, we have this Recycler View option in here, but before uh, using it, we need to download its dependency into our project. We can click on this download option in here and it will be automatically added to our Gradle file. Or if you don't want to add it from here, you can always search for Recycler View dependencies and add it manually into your Gradle file. Before I add this Recycler View, let's quickly open our Gradle script, build.gradle module app. Down in here in these dependencies, you can see that we don't have any Recycler View. Let's download this Recycler View by clicking on this. You can see a warning in here. Would you like to add this now? Let's say OK. It seems like we have added Recycler View successfully. Let's check our build.gradle file. 
and then in here you can see the recycler view but as you can see the highlight in here this is not the latest version uh, for that reason it's always better to check the internet for the latest recycler view dependencies the highlight in here says that you have a uh, version 1.1.0 available so let's change this one to 1.1.0 and let's sync our project okay now that we have added this recycler view dependency we can add it to our uh, layout file I'm going to switch to text view from above in here and I'm going to uh, minimize this resource manager. First of all, I'm going to change this constraint layout to a relative layout. After that, like before, I'm going to delete this text view and let's add a recycler view. So you can say recycler view, this option down in here. For the width and height, let's say match parent, I'm going to match the whole relative layout. Let's also give it an ID. Let's say contacts recycler view. As you can guess, uh, I'm going to show a list of different contacts in my recycler view. After that, we can finish creating our recycler view. And if you enable your preview from inside this split view, you can see that we have these options inside this recycler view. I'm also going to add some padding to this parent relative layout. So in here, inside the starting tag, let's say padding and let's say 10 dp. That seems better. After that, we need to initialize our recycler view in our Java file. So inside this uh, main activity.java file, first of all, I'm going to say private recycler view. This one that comes from Android X recycler view widget. Let's name it contacts recycler view. And down in here, inside the onCreate method, let's initialize it. Contact recycler view is equal to find view by ID r dot id dot contact recycler view. When we have worked with list view, right after this point, right after initializing our list view, we could have created an array adapter, and after that, we could have passed our array adapter to our list view. But when we are using recycler view, we need to create our own adapter. Creating your own recycler view adapter is probably the most complex code that you have uh, written so far, but uh, we are going to go through each step together. Before creating our adapter, we also need a layout file. If you remember when we have used list view for every item in our uh, list view, we have passed a built-in layout. In recycler view, we need to create that layout as well. So inside my project, inside the resources folder, inside the layout folder, I'm going to create a new layout resource file. I'm going to name this one contacts list item. I'm also going to change this root element to a relative layout. Okay, let's create our layout file and let's switch to our text view. If you remember from previous videos, I said that when you are working with recycler view, you have all sorts of flexibilities in designing your items layout files. We will take a look at more complex layout files, but in here, I'm just going to add a simple text view. Let's switch to the split view so that we can see the preview. Okay, let's say text view, wrap content and wrap content. For the text, let's say, contact name later on in our recycler view we are going to change this text view beside that let's also give an id to this text view let's say txt name i'm also going to change the height of this relative layout to wrap content because we don't want to occupy the whole screen for just one item in our recycler view for that, let's change this font to wrap content. Let's also add some inters in here so that we can see it better. And also let's add some padding. Let's say padding and let's pass 10 dp. Sorry for that. Let's also give an ID to this relative layout. We will see how it can be useful. Let's just name it parent. So this in here is going to be the layout file for every item in our recycler view. Now that we have created this contacts list item.xml file, we can create our recycler view adapter. For that, we need to create a Java class in our project. 
So inside our package, I'm going to say new Java class. Let's name this class contacts recycler view adapter. Let's create our class and let's see what do we have in here. So first of all, before everything, I'm going to create an inner class inside this class. We will see what this inner class is. This inner class needs to be public. Let's say public class. I'm going to name it view holder because it's the convention. This view holder class needs to extend recycler view dot view holder. This class in here. But as you can see, we are getting an error in here and that's because we need to create our constructor. Let's quickly do that by pressing Alt plus insert. This inner view holder class is going to hold the view for every item in our recycler view. For example, in this case, it's going to generate a new contact list item in which later on we will see how we can use this layout file and also all of the elements inside that. So basically this inner class is responsible uh, for generating our view objects. If you want to have access to elements inside your view object, you can uh, add them as the fields of this inner class. For example, in here I can say private text view. If you remember, we had a text view in our list item. Uh, the ID was txt name. Let's name it txt name. And down in here inside the constructor, let's say txt name is equal to find view by ID. But because we are not inside an activity, we cannot use this find view by ID method like this. Instead, what we can do is that we can use this view object that has been passed to this constructor. For example, I can say item view dot find view by ID. You can see that we have this method in here. So the only difference is that inside an activity, you can simply say find view by ID. But in here, because we are not inside an activity, we can use this view. We can say item view dot find view by ID. After that, we can address our text view. I can say r.id. Let's say txt name. If you have other elements inside your layout file, you can add them like this one by one. We will see that later on in a few minutes. But for now, we are done with this inner view holder class. Let's minimize this. And now we can uh, extend the recycler view adapter at the declaration of our adapter class. The way to do that is like this. We can say extends recycler view dot adapter. We can see that we have this option. Also take a look at this VH in here. It stands for view holder. If you import this adapter inside the diamonds, we need to pass view holder. There are also multiple view holders. Make sure to import the one that is inside this class, this project name. You also have one in Android X.recycler view, so make sure to don't confuse them. If you remember when we have used array adapter for list views uh, as the data type of our adapter, we have passed a string. This view holder class is exactly like that. And we are saying that the data type of our adapter at the end is this view holder class, the class that we created inside uh, our adapter. Okay, now that we have extended recycler view adapter, we need to create some methods or to be specific, we need to implement some methods. For that, I can press Ctrl plus I. And as you can see, we have three mandatory methods on create view holder, on bind view holder, and this get item count method. Let's implement all three of them. We are also going to need a constructor for this adapter class. Let's quickly create that by pressing Alt plus insert. By going to constructor, we can create our constructor. Before explaining these three methods in here, I'm going to create a model in my project. As I said previously in this video, I'm going to show some contacts inside my recycler view and I'm going to create a model for those contacts. So inside my project, I'm going to create a new Java class. Let's name it contact. For this contact, I'm going to define some features. First of all, let's say private string name. After that, let's say private string email. After that, I'm going to define a new string, let's say private string image URL. We will see how this one is going to be useful. Basically, we are going to show some images from the internet by using their URLs. After that, we need to create our constructor. Once again, by pressing Alt plus insert, we can do that. 
let's also create some getters and setters i'm not sure that i'm going to use all of them later on if we didn't use them i will delete them let's also create a two string method this might be useful as well okay now we have our contact model let's close this class so once again inside my recycler view i'm going to show a list of different contacts because of that i need to pass the list of different contacts to this adapter class for that before everything above in here i'm going to create an array list or to be specific a private array list of different contacts let's say private array list of contacts let's name it contacts is equal to new array list it's very important to initialize your array list if you don't initialize it you will definitely get a null pointer exception also because we have set this contacts array list as private we also need to create a setter method so that later on for example from inside our main activity we can uh, set the initial data for our contacts for that down in here after the get item count method i'm going to press alt plus insert and by going to this setter menu we can create a setter for our contacts array list later on from inside our main activity we will pass our data via using this set contacts method but there is a very important point in here imagine that you are getting your data for example the list of your contacts from a web server from internet the list of different contacts that are coming from the internet uh, may change during the time so the list of different contacts inside your uh, recycler view should be changed as well if you want uh, at any time you can reuse this set contacts method in order to uh, change the data inside your adapter but in order to refresh the data inside your recycler view you need to uh, use another method inside this set contacts method that method is called notify data set changed this one in here so basically the data set for our adapter in this case is our contacts array list after changing the list of different contacts at any time we are going to notify the adapter that the data set has been changed this way we can refresh our recycler view with the new data that we have received or passed to this adapter class okay let's move on from this part and let's start working on these three different methods the simplest of these methods is this uh, get item count you can guess its purpose it's just going to return the count of uh, different items in your adapter in this case we know that the data in our adapter is a list of contacts so we can simply return the list of our contacts we can say contacts.size that's all we need to do inside this get item count for some reason recycler view needs the number of items inside your adapter and in here we can simply return that okay i think that's enough for this video in the next video at the beginning we will start working on these two methods after that we will see that how we can have uh, more complex layouts in recycler view and after that we will see how we can use that image url in order to show different uh, contact images in our application okay see you in the next video okay let's continue our talk about creating a recycler view adapter but before that let's quickly have a review of what we have done so far so first of all we have added the recycler view dependency in our gradle scripts if you take a look at build.gradle module app inside these dependencies you can see that we have added recycler view after that we have added this recycler view in our um, activity main.xml file inside this relative layout we have this recycler view after that inside our main activity.java file we have initialized our recycler view after that it was the time to create the layout file for every item in our recycler view we have done that by creating a new layout file called uh, contacts list item in our layout folder if you want to take another look it's a simple relative layout which contains only one text view later on we will change this after creating the layout file for every item uh, it was time to create our adapter class we have done that by adding a new java class in our package the name of that class was contacts recycler view adapter inside this class first of all we have created this inner class 
we have named it view holder because it's the convention after that we have extended the recycler view dot view holder we needed a constructor so we have created this constructor in here as i said in the previous video this view holder class is responsible for holding the view items for every item in our recycler view we can also instantiate all of our UI elements from inside our contacts list item.xml file inside this view holder class if we want. After creating this view holder class, this inner class in here, we have extended the recycler view.adapter class in which as its data type we have passed our uh, inner view holder class. When we extended this recycler view.adapter, we needed to implement three mandatory methods. This on create view holder, on bind view holder, and get item count methods. We are going to talk about these methods in this video, but before that, uh, we also created a model for our contacts. We have added that in our package. This contact has a name, an email, and also an image URL. Later on in this video, we will see that how we are going to show an image based on its image URL. After creating our model inside our adapter class, we have created an array list of different contacts in which we have named that uh, contacts. It was also important to initialize this array list. I said that we are going to get a null pointer exception if we don't initialize our array list. Also later on when we create an instance of this adapter class, we are going to need a constructor. So for that we have created this empty constructor. I believe later on we will change this. Also, in order to pass the data into this adapter class, in this case, an array list of contacts, we have used this uh, set contacts method in which we are going to call it from inside our main activity. After passing the data to this adapter, we have uh, notified the adapter that the data set has changed so that we can refresh the list of items in our recycler view. Also, in the previous video, we have talked about this get item count method. Once again, it's going to return the number of items in our adapter. In this case, we have returned our contacts array list dot size. Okay, now it's time to work on these two methods. But before everything, let's close all of the extra classes and files. And let's start working on this on create view holder method. As you can see, the return type of this method is a view holder. It means that this method is the place to generate our view holder the place to instantiate our view holder class that we have created down in here. In order to create our view holder class, first of all, we need to create a view object. We can do that by saying view, this one in here. Let's name it view is equal to, if we were inside an activity, we could have said get layout inflator, but because we are inside a class beside our activity, we can't use that. Instead, we can say something like this. We can say, layout inflator with capital L dot from this method in here. You can see that this from method is waiting for our context. You can also guess by the style of this from method that this is a static method. In here we don't have any context uh, but we can use this view group in order to get the context. Let's get the context from this view group and I will talk about it. You can see that the name of this view group is parent, so I can say parent.getContext. As you can see in here, we are creating a view object, and we are using this layout inflator to generate that view object. The job of this layout inflator is that to inflate a layout. For some reason, this layout inflator needs a context, so we can say dot .from, and inside that method, we can pass our context. The way to inflate our layout with the help of this layout inflator is that uh, to use dot inflate method. So in here, after this from method, we can say dot inflate. And after passing some arguments, we can generate our view object. In here, we need to pass three arguments. First of all, we need to pass the address of our layout file for every item in our recycler view. I mean that contacts list item dot XML file that we just created. So for that, I can say r.layout dot, let's say, contact list item. After that, we need to pass our view group. In this case, its name is parent. Once again, I will talk about it. And also after that, we need to pass a Boolean. I will talk about that after I talked about view group. Let's pass false in this case. And now we have our view object. 
Okay, let's talk about these two arguments in here, this view group and also this boolean. Basically, the view group is the parent of all of the layout files. For example, it's the parent of relative layout, linear layout, and also constraint layout. This view group can be used to group different views inside it. If you want to make sure of that, uh, for example, you can go to your main activity just for testing purposes. If we say private relative layout, let's name it relative layout. From the previous videos, we know that if you want to check some documentation in Android, we can press down the control key. And by selecting uh, the class name, we can have access to the relative layout documentation and also declaration. In here, you can see that this relative layout is extending view group. So once again, view group is the parent of all of our layout files. But why we are passing this view group as one of the arguments inside our uh, adapter class? Before talk about that, let's quickly delete this line of code. We have created this just to read the documentation and declaration. So in here, inside this inflate method, we are passing this view group. Basically, this tells that where do you want to attach your view object. For example, when we create an instance of our adapter object from inside our main activity, because in our main activity layout file, we have defined a relative layout. This view group is going to be a relative layout. And this view object in here, our layout file for every item, is going to be attached to that relative layout inside our main activity. That's also the reason why this view group uh, has the name of parent in here. But what is this boolean in here? You can see that the name of this boolean is attached to root. And also I'm passing false in here. I just said that I want to attach my view object to its parent. I'm passing false in here because if we pass true, it will be a redundant job. We already passed uh, our view group as the parent of our view object. And if we pass true, it's going to be redundant. We have this boolean because we can also pass null in here. For example, if you are not sure about our parent and about where our view is going to be attached, instead of our parent view group, we can simply pass null. You can see that the name of this argument has changed to root. So if you pass null, you are not going to be sure about the place that this view is going to be attached to. But of course, this is an option that you have. Once again, I'm going to pass parent. And for the boolean, I'm going to pass false. So at the end of this line of code, with the help of this layout inflator dot inflate method, we have our view object. Now it's the time to create our view holder object and after that return it. If you take a look at the constructor of this class that you have created, you can see that uh, this constructor in here is accepting a view. Now that we have our view object, we can create an instance of this view holder class. So above in here, before the return statement, I can say view holder, the one that exists in our adapter class, not the one inside the Android X.recycler view. Let's say view holder, let's name it holder, is equal to new view holder, and let's pass our view. After that, let's return our holder. So once again, the purpose of this method in here, this onCreate view holder, is to create an instance of our view holder class for every item in our recycler view. Later on, this holder will be passed to this onBind view holder method, as you can see in here, and we can use it in order to change the properties of our UI elements. Let's see how we can do that. So inside this onbind view holder method, which I believe is the most important method inside every recycler view adapter, we are going to use the properties of our view holder class. For example, uh, right now inside our layout file, we have only one text view. So if I want to change the value of my text view, I can say something like this. I can say holder dot txt name dot set text and we can pass our text. You can see that in here we are able to use holder.txt name. If you remember inside our view holder class, we had such a field, but also this field was private. If you remember from the Java session, I said that whenever you use inner classes from inside the parent class, you can have access to all of the private fields and methods of your inner class. In this case, 
Inside this adapter class, we can use uh, this holder.txt name, even though it's private. Okay, but what do we pass uh, inside this set text method? As you can see, beside this holder, we also are getting some integer called position. It's exactly like the position that we had inside list view adapters. This is going to be the position of the item in our recycler view. Once again, we can use this position in order to get the data, for example, from our contacts array list. For example, inside this set text method, I can say contacts dot, let's say, get. And in here as the index, I can pass position. Also, during the time I've seen that the name of this integer was different. Sometimes it was named I, sometimes it was position. And also, I think I've seen others. But basically, this integer is just the position of every item in your recycler view dataset. Okay, after getting the corresponding contact, we can use uh, .get name, for example, in order to set the name of our contact to this text view. This is going to be the simplest recycler view that you can create. You can have all sorts of UI elements inside your uh, list item layout file, and after that, inside this unbind view holder method. You can also set different unclick listeners for each one of UI elements, but more on that in few minutes. So by this time, our adapter class is ready. We have done a great job and uh, we have created our recycler view adapter class. Now that we have created our recycler view adapter, it's time to switch back to our main activity and pass some data to this adapter class. So inside this onCreate method, we have instantiated our recycler view. After that, we need to uh, create an array list of different contacts. For example, let's say array list of different contacts. Let's name it contacts is equal to new array list. Once again, I'm uh, passing the data manually in here because we don't know anything about databases and web servers yet. In a real world application, these data are probably coming from a database or a web server. Let's quickly add some data to our contacts array list. As you can see, I've added some contacts into my array list. For every contact, I've uh, selected a name, also an email. And beside that, I have uh, get these image URLs from the internet. There is just one point in here, and that's regarding these image URLs. Sometimes when you are copying the address of some image from the internet, that address may not have an extension, for example, uh, like this .jpg or .png. Those images are not going to be useful in here, so make sure to select the images that have the extension of .jpg or .png. Just because uh, some students asked me before how to get the address of these images, let me quickly show you one example. For example, in uh, Google Images, you can search for different images, and by right-clicking on the image, you can uh, copy the image address. For example, in another tab, you can uh, paste the address. If it's ending with uh, .jpg or .png, you are good to go. Okay, after creating your contacts, uh, it's time to create your recycler view adapter. For that, I'm going to say contact recycler view adapter. Let's name it adapter is equal to new contacts recycler view adapter. We didn't need anything for the constructor, so we are good to go. After that, we can use the setter method uh, inside our adapter. We can say adapter uh, dot set contacts and we can pass our array list. After creating our adapter instance and uh, setting the data, we can set this adapter to our recycler view. So down in here, I can say contacts recycler view dot set adapter and I can pass my adapter. In a list view, that would be the end of everything and we could have test our application. But in recycler view, there is also one more step. We also need to set a layout manager for our recycler view as well. Let's quickly set that and we will talk about it. Let's say contacts recycler view dot set layout manager. In here, we have few options. First of all, we can pass a linear layout manager and we can pass that like this. We can say new linear layout manager in which for its constructor, we need a context. This time, because we are inside an activity, we can safely pass this as the context. By setting the layout manager of our recycler view to a linear layout manager, 
we are saying that display the items in our recycler view in a linear fashion. The other option that we have is grid layout manager. We will take a look at that. Uh, but in here, this linear layout manager is by default vertical. If you want to change that, for example, if you want to have a horizontal view, uh, you can do that. We will do that in a minute after running our application. So by this point, our application is ready to test. We have created our recycler view. We have instantiated down in here. We also have created this uh, dummy list of contacts. After that, we have instantiated our adapter class. We have set the data inside this adapter class. After that, we have set the adapter to our recycler view. We also have uh, set a layout manager for our recycler view. Let's test the application and let's see uh, what does a recycler view look like. As you can see, the list of different contacts name are being shown inside a recycler view in my activity. If I had more contacts, I could have uh, scrolled my recycler view and I could have uh, access to all of them. Right now, they all can fit on the screen, so this is not a scroll view. Let's quickly change this linear layout to a horizontal linear layout and see the difference. So in order to have a horizontal linear layout, after this uh, context, you can say linear layout manager dot horizontal, this one in here. This is a constant in which you can use in order to have a linear layout manager. Beside that, you also have a Boolean in here. Let's pass that. I'm going to pass false. As you can see, the name of this Boolean is reverse layout. If you want to reverse the order of items inside your uh, recycler view, you can pass true in here. But I don't see any reason for doing that, uh, so I'm going to pass false. Let's run the application once again and let's see uh, what a horizontal linear layout looks like. You can see that this time right now we are seeing only one contact on the screen. And that's because when we created the layout for every item in our recycler view, we have passed match parent as the width of the item. But if you want to see other items, you can uh, scroll the window horizontally. You can see that we are seeing other contacts. So this is what this horizontal linear layout looks like. Okay, let's quickly see the other layout manager that I talked about and let's move on from this one. The name of the other layout manager was grid layout manager. So I'm going to delete all of these. And inside this set layout manager method, I'm going to say new grid layout manager. For the inputs of this constructor, we need two arguments. First of all, we need the context. After that, we need the number of columns. For example, I can pass two in here. This two in here is going to divide our screen horizontally in two different parts or to be a specific two different columns and it's going to show different contacts in uh, those two columns. But before I run my application, I'm going to change one thing in the application in the contacts list item.xml file. I'm going to change the match parent attribute of my uh, relative layout to let's say wrap content. You can see that for this width, we have set it to match parent. I'm going to change that to wrap content. Okay, now let's run the application. You can see that the screen has been divided into two different columns horizontally, and we can see the uh, contacts name in two different columns. So sometimes you may want to use this uh, grid layout manager. Okay, now let's see how we can set an unclick listener for each one of these items in our recycle view. Right now, uh, if we click on each one of these items, they are not going to do anything. But if you want to set an unclick listener, we need to do that inside our contacts recycle view adapter. Let's quickly open that class. It was in our Java folder inside our project folder. Contacts recycle view adapter. If you remember, I said that this unbind view holder method is the most important method uh, in your adapter class. And inside this method, you can set an unclick listener for every UI element that you want. Also, if you remember inside this contacts list item, I've defined an ID for this whole relative layout. If you want, you can uh, set the unclick listener on this text view, but I think it's better to define the unclick listener on the whole relative layout. Because as you can see, we have this padding of 10 dp and uh, some places in our relative layout are not going to be clickable if we set the unclick listener on the text view. 
but because I'm going to define the unclick listener on this relative layout inside my adapter class when I've created this view holder class. After creating the text view, I need to reference the relative layout as well. So I can say private relative layout. Let's name it parent. We also need to instantiate it inside the constructor. Down in here, I can say parent is equal to item view dot find view by id once again let's say r dot id dot parent after defining this relative layout now you can have access to that inside this unbind view holder method so for example in here i can say holder dot parent which is the name of this relative layout dot let's say set on click listener you can see that we have this option Let's pass our interface, new unclick listener. And in here, I'm just going to show some toast message. Let's say toast. If you remember when we have used this make text method on our toast, we needed a context. But in here, we do not have access to any kind of context. Once again, we will talk about context later on when we talk about activities in Android. But inside this adapter class right now, we don't have any context. So we have to pass it inside the constructor. For example, I'm going to define the context as the member variable above in here. Let's say private context. Let's name it context. And after that, I'm going to receive that via this constructor. Let's say context. Let's name it context. Inside the constructor, I can say this.context is equal to context. But now that I have changed this constructor, if I switch back to main activity, I should see some red warning. When we have instantiated our adapter class, we need to pass uh, our context. Once again, because this time we are inside this activity, I can simply pass this. So this way inside our adapter, now we have a context. And when we create our toast message, we can pass that as the context. For the text, I'm going to show the name of the contact so I can say contacts, the array list that we had, let's say dot get. Once again, I'm going to use this position as the index. Let's say dot get name. Also, if you have noticed, uh, as soon as I've used this position inside this onclick method, because we are inside uh, an interface, this final keyword has been added to the declaration of this integer. Let's also add another text in here. Let's say select it. Let's quickly run the application and let's see if we have correctly uh, set the onclick listener on our relative layout. Let's click on the first one. Margot Robbie selected. Social Ronan, Social Ronan selected. It seems like our onclick listener is working fine. Okay, I think that's a good point to stop the video in here. I did want to talk about that image URL and how to show that in our recycler view but it seems like this video is getting a little bit long. So I'm going to talk about that in the next video. Beside that, we will also talk about using a combination of recycler view and card view. The combination of these two will generate a really beautiful look for our recycler view. Okay, see you in the next video. In the previous video, we have created a functional recycler view. By functional, I mean we have created a skeleton of our recycler view. But right now it's very simple. If you take a look at your contacts list item.xml file, you can see that every item in your recycler view is just a simple text view. In this video, we are going to work around this and uh, we are going to see how much flexibility we have when we are working with recycler views. The first thing that I'm going to do in here is that to use a card view instead of this simple text view and its parent, which is a relative layout. We are going to show our contacts in a card view. For that, first of all, we need to add the card view dependencies into our project. In previous videos, when we wanted to use card view in our project, we have added the material design library. And from there, we have used the material card view. Instead of using the material design library, this time I'm going to use the native Android card view. Let's see where we can find that uh, card view dependencies. So if you search for card view dependencies, you will end up with a link like this.
Make sure to put Android X in your search because if you search for Android, you may get uh, some link like this. Let's quickly take a look at that. In here, inside these dependencies, you can see that uh, you are using com.android.support library. We are not using support libraries in our project right now. If you remember when we have uh, created our project, we have added the Android X artifacts. If you want to make sure of that, you can always check your Gradle file. Let's quickly do that. So in my project pane, inside this Gradle script, in this build.gradle module app, in these dependencies, you can see that we are always using Android X. If for some reason you are using the support libraries, you can implement this support libraries version. But because we are using Android X, this dependency is not going to be helpful for us. So make sure to include this Android X in your search. And the first link from the official Android developers website is probably our needed link. Down in here, you can see the dependencies. You can see that this time we are going to add the dependency from Android X packages. Let's copy this line of code and let's add it into our project. So once again, inside this build.gradle module app file, inside these dependencies, we are going to add our dependency. Let's quickly do that in here and let's sync our project. Now that I've added card view dependencies into my project, I can use it in my layout files. For example, inside this contacts list item.xml file, instead of this relative layout, I'm going to use card view. You can see that it's coming from Android X packages. If you remember in card views, we had two attributes that can be helpful in here. The first one is card elevation, this one in here which will give some 3D shape to our card. For example, if I say 5 dp, we will get an elevation of 5 dp. The next one is card corner radius. This one in here, which once again, I'm going to say 5 dp. I will change these numbers if it was necessary. And also inside this card view, instead of this text view, I'm going to use a relative layout. The reason for the relative layout is that because I'm going to include multiple UI elements and I'm going to use some of the attributes like layout below center horizontal and uh, attributes like that and those attributes are available inside a relative layout. So for that first of all in here I'm going to create a relative layout for the width and height let's say match parent and I think that's enough for our relative layout Inside that, first of all, I'm going to move this text view. First of all, let's center this text view horizontally. Let's say center horizontal and let's pass through. Beside that, let's change the style of this text. Let's say text style. And let's change it to bold. After that, I'm going to create another text view and I'm going to show the contacts email. Let's add that after this text view. Let's change the contact name to contact email. And let's change the ID to txt email. Let's also move this to below our contact name. Layout below, let's say txt name. Let's also change the style in here. Let's say italic. I think it's better to add some margin top, margin top, let's say uh, 7 dp. Also, I'm going to delete this center horizontal attribute. Okay, after these two texts, I'm going to show the contacts image. For that, I'm going to create an image view. Let's say image view. For the width and height of this image view, because I want to have a consistent image view, I'm going to put the numbers manually because my images are coming from the internet and I don't know anything about their size. For example, in here, I'm going to say 150 dp. I think that would be fine. For the height as well, once again, 150 dp. Let's also give an ID to this image view. Let's just say image. I'm going to move this to below my contacts email. Let's say layout below and let's pass TX the email. Let's add a margin top. I think 10 dp would be fine. 
I'm also going to center this image view horizontally. So let's say center horizontal and let's pass through. Let's also add a placeholder. I'm going to say source and let's address one of our images in our package. I think this uh, IC launcher background would be fine. Okay, I think that's enough for our card view. I don't think we need anything else. Let's just uh, have a quick look of what our card view looks like. I think I need to increase this corner radius. For example, let's say 10 in here. That should be better. Beside that, let's increase this card elevation. You can play around with these numbers until you are satisfied. I'm almost done with this contact list item file. Uh, I'm just going to reformat my code so that when I publish this code, you and I have the same base code. For that, I'm going to go to this code tab in here. And down in here, I'm going to select this reformat code. You can see that the code has been rearranged. Okay, now that I have changed this layout file, we need to also apply the changes inside our recycler view adapter file as well. So down in here, when we have created our view holder class, we need to address all of the new elements in our uh, contacts list item.xml file. First of all, we have deleted this relative layout and we have replaced that with a card view. So in here, instead of using a relative layout, I'm going to say card view. And let's also add our email text. I'm going to add it in the same line with this txt name. Let's say txt email. And let's initialize it down in here inside this constructor. So let's say txt email is equal to item view dot find view by id r dot id dot txt email. We also need to add some codes inside this unbind view holder method. For example, we are going to show the contacts email. We need to do that in here. Let's say holder dot txt email dot set text. Let's pass our contacts dot get, which for the index I'm going to pass position. Let's say dot get email. Before showing the image view, I'm going to run the application and I'm going to see that if everything is working fine. So let's run the application. You can instantly see that uh, with these few changes, how much we have improved our layout. But right now this layout needs some modification. For example, we need to add some margin between these card views and also we need to add a margin top for this txt name. Let's quickly apply them. So if I switch back to my contact list item.xml file for this parent card view, I'm going to add a margin, let's say margin top. Or instead of margin top, I'm just going to say margin. I think 10 dp would be fine. Beside that, let's also add a margin for this text view. Let's say margin top and let's pass 7 dp. Let's also add a margin start for this uh, email. So in here for this txt email, I'm going to say margin start. This one in here and I'm going to say 5 dp. Let's run the application once again. You can see that it's much better now. You can also see the two attributes that we have added for our card views much better in here. First of all, we have added this corner radius. You can see that in here and also this 3D shape with a shadow behind our card view is for that card elevation attribute. Beside that, the reason that we are seeing two columns in here is because of that grid layout manager that we have passed to our recycler view. If you want to have only one column, you can change that. For example, inside our main activity, down in here, instead of a grid layout manager, we can pass a linear layout manager. So in here, let's say new linear layout manager, and let's pass our context. Before I run this application, I'm going to make sure that I've centered my recycler view. Let's switch to our main activity layout file, and let's center our recycler view. Let's say center horizontal and let's pass through. Also, I'm going to change the width attribute in here to wrap content. Let's run the application once again. Right now, you can see that we have only three contacts in our screen, but we can scroll our recycler view. Let's quickly do that. You can see that if our item do not fit on the screen, our recycler view is scrollable. Beside that, let's also check the unclick listener. Let's click on this card view and you can see that social run unselected. It seems to be perfect. 
Okay, now let's work on this image view. Let's see how we can show our images. For that, we have multiple options. The easiest one is to use an external library called Glide. Let's add that into our project and we will talk about it. So if you search for Glide dependency, the first link from this GitHub page is the link to that external library. Let's see what does it look like. Down in here, you should see the dependencies. First of all, we need to add these two into our repositories. Let's see if we have them in our Gradle file. Let's open our project pane in the Gradle scripts inside this build.gradle project one. In these repositories, we need to add the Maven repositories. Let's quickly add them. I'm going to copy this one in here. And I'm going to add it inside these repositories for all projects. Beside that, we need to add these two dependencies into our project. Inside this build.gradle design module app, we need to add the dependencies. Let's sync our project. And while it's syncing, let's also talk about this Glide. So Glide is an image loader library in which has developed by Google, so you can safely use it in your projects. Glide has a lot of functionalities in which one of them is to load images from the internet. Later on in the course, we will see other functionalities as well, but uh, if you want to know more about Glide, they have a documentation in here. Let's click on this view Glide's documentation. You can read this page if you want, but we will talk about Glide more later on in the course. Okay, let's switch back to our project. And it seems like we have added the Glide library successfully. Let's close these two Gradle files. Also, let's close this activitymain.xml file. And let's go to our contacts recyclerviewadapter.java file. So inside this unbind view holder method, I'm going to show the images of different contacts. For that, I'm going to use the glide inside this method. Let's see how we can use glide. In order to show images with glide library, you can say something like this. You can say glide with capital G. After that, you need to pass your context. You can do that by saying dot with. For the context in here, I'm going to pass my context. As a reminder, we have get the context via the constructor of this class in the previous video. I'm talking about this one in here. Now that we have our context, we can use it uh, with this with method. After that, I'm going to say that this image is going to be a bitmap. So let's say dot as bitmap. After that, we need to pass the source of our image. In this case, we are going to pass the image URL for our contact image. Let's say dot load. And let's pass our contacts image URL. For that, I'm going to say contacts.get. Once again, I'm going to use the position as the index. Let's say dot get image URL. After that, we need to pass the image view that we want to show our image inside that. I'm going to say dot into and I'm going to address my image view, which I can say holder dot image. But for that, first of all, we need to add this image inside this view holder class. We never did that. So inside this view holder class, first of all, I'm going to say private image view. Let's call it image. And let's also instantiate it inside the constructor. Let's say image is equal to item view dot find view by ID or dot ID dot image. This is the simplest way of using Glide. First of all, we need to pass our context. After that, we need to say that it's going to be a bitmap file. After that, we need to pass the source of our image with this dot load method. And after that, we need to specify the image view that we are going to show our image inside that. This is going to work fine, but before I run my application, I need to do one more thing. We are going to load different images from the internet. For that, we need to add a permission into our manifest file for accessing the internet. So far, we haven't talked about requesting a permission. Let's quickly see how we can do that. So in our project pane, inside the app folder, inside this manifest folder, if we open this Android manifest.xml file, we can add our permission in here above the application tag. In here, I can open a tag and the tag is going to be user's permission, this one in here. And we need to specify the kind of permission. Let's search for internet permission. 
you can see this android.permission.internet. Let's close our tag. There are much more concepts regarding these permissions. We will talk about them later on in the course. For some permissions, you need to create a UI, a logic, in order to ask the user to grant that permission to your application. But this internet permission is a safe permission. And if you add it to your manifest file, the Android system is going to grant it automatically. That's all we need to do in order to request for an internet permission. Later on, we will talk more about permissions. Let's just run our application and let's see if we can successfully show different images. You can see that we are seeing different images in here. But there was a problem when I ran this application after adding the permission for the first time. The first time I wasn't able to see the images and that's because we have changed our manifest file. Whenever you change your manifest file, you need to uninstall the application and install it once again. So if you are not seeing different images, make sure to uninstall the application and install it once again. After that, you should see different images. Uh, let's also check the others. You can see that the images are loading from the internet after a few seconds. You can see that our recycler view, our card views, and also the glide library is working perfect. The combination of these three will create a really beautiful layout for when we want to show a list of different items. And probably by now you can uh, see the flexibility and all of the functionalities of recycler view. You can see that we can modify our layout files, our list item layout files, however we want. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Just to see our recycler view better, I'm going to change the linear layout manager once again to a grid layout manager. And after that, we will finish our uh, video. So let's change it back to grid layout manager and let's run our application once again. You can see that our recycler view seems perfect. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, we are going to see how we can use different fonts for our text views. For example, an external font uh, that we don't have in Android Studio. Okay, see you in the next video. In this video, we are going to talk about different fonts, how we can apply different fonts to our text view, whether that font exists in our project or whether we are going to add it externally. I believe this will be a short video. First of all, let's see how we can add an external font into our project. Before that, I'm going to go to this layout file and give an ID to this text view. Let's just name it txt hello. In order to add an external font in your resources folder, you need to create a new directory. You can right click on your resource folder. By selecting new Android resource directory, you can create that directory. We have done this when we have created a menu resource file. In here, you just need to define the type of your resource. You can search for font in here. And that's all you need to do. Now you can see that you have this font folder and you can copy your external fonts into this folder. For example, I have prepared this font, uh, but before adding this font into my project, I need to do some modifications. For example, I need to change the name of this font. In order to add this font into your project, you need to follow some rules. For example, you need to change all of the upper cases into lower cases, and also you shouldn't use hyphens. Instead of that, you can use underlines. So in here, I'm going to change the name a little bit. Let's change this upper A to lower A. After you have uh, changed the name, you can simply copy your font. And inside your font folder, you can paste it. The name is fine. Let's just press OK. Now in your font folder, you have this Amsterdam.ttf. If your font has some preview, you can uh, see that by double clicking on your font. Okay, now that we have added this font, let's see how we can use it on our text view. Let's switch to our text view mode. And on this text view, we have one attribute called font family. This one in here, and now we can address our font, which is at font slash Amsterdam. Let's switch to split view and let's see if we can see our font in the preview. You can see that right now the font hasn't been rendered, but I believe this will be changed when we run our application. Let's run the application and let's see if we can successfully change the font of our text view. 
you can see that this beautiful font has been applied on our text view. Besides using your own fonts in your project, you can also use some fonts called Google Fonts. Let's quickly see how we can use them. So for that, I'm going to switch to Design View and uh, search for Font Family Attribute in here. But before that, I need to uh, click on this text view. Let's search for Font Family. You can see that we have this attribute and uh, beside our font, which is right now at Font Amsterdam, we have this drop-down icon. If we click on that, you can see that in Android, we have some fonts that we can use. But beside all of these, uh, we have this more fonts option. And when we click on that, you can see that we have a list of a lot of more fonts. Also, you can see the source in here. It says uh, Google Fonts. These Google Fonts are free and you can safely use them in your applications. You just need to add a license in your application somewhere. Okay, let's see what do we have in these uh, Google Fonts. For example, we have this calligraphy or something like that, that we can use. In here, you can see that we have two options, create downloadable font and add font to your project. The first option means that you don't want to add the font to your project and you want to use the online font every time that a user uses your application. If you are creating an offline application, this option in here might not be that useful. Instead of that, I'm going to use the second option, which will add the font to my project, but it will increase the size of the final APK file. Also down in here, you can see this preview. For some fonts, you have more than one preview, and you can select between them. But for this font, we have only this regular. Also down in here, you can see the license that you need to show somewhere in your application. For this simple application, I'm not going to do that because this is not going to be a commercial application. Okay, let's add this font into our project by pressing OK. You can see that this calligraphy font has been added into my font folder. I believe this will have a preview, so if I click on that, you can see a preview of your font. Now, if I run my application, I should see this font instead of this Amsterdam font. You can see that the font has been applied successfully. For some fonts, you may have different styles. For example, regular or normal, italic, bold, and bold italic. Let's quickly see a font that has those styles, and let's see how we can apply those styles on our text views. So once again, I'm going to uh, click on this drop-down menu. And once again, I'm going to click on these more fonts. The font that I'm going to use in here is called Lobster 2. If you click on that, you can see that in this preview pane, you have four options. I'm going to add them one by one into my project. For the first one, I'm going to name it Lobster 2 underline regular. And also I'm going to add it to my project. I'm not going to make a downloadable font. Let's press OK. And let's do the same for the other three styles. You can see that now we have four different Lobster 2 fonts. If we want to apply them on our text views, we can do the same as we did for the other fonts, which we had only one font. For example, inside our text view, for this font family in here, we can uh, pass the font manually by specifying the name of our font, or we can pass this styling job to the Android. For example, we can uh, add a text style in here, and we can specify the style, which can be italic, bold, or normal. Right now, if I select text style as bold, and uh, if I change this lobster to bold italic to just lobster to regular, Let's quickly do that. If I run my application, I'm going to get a bold style for this specific font. Let's quickly run that. You can see that we have this bold font, but this in here is not accurate because we have added the style manually. This actually in here is using our Lobster to regular font. And if we want to use specifically this uh, Lobster to bold font, we can create a font family for that. Let's quickly see how we can create a font family. 
so in my font resource folder i can uh, right click and by pressing new font resource file we can create a new font family for the file name i'm going to put the font name which in this case is lobster2 let's create that inside this font family i'm going to define four fonts we need three attributes in here first of all uh, we are going to need the font itself for the first one i'm going to pass the lobster to regular font after that i'm going to pass a style for this font let's say font style you can see that in here we have two styles italic and normal in here i'm going to pass normal but if uh, you want to pass a bold style you need to pass that as a font weight let's quickly see that we can see that we have this font weight attribute in which we can pass a number basically for normal fonts this uh, weight should be 400 i will show a link for where you can find the exact font weight that you need but for now let's just pass 400 and let's finish creating our font after that i'm going to create three more font elements and i'm going to pass uh, the other three fonts let's say font once again we need to address our font this time let's say lobster to italic for the style i'm going to say italic this time and once again because this is not a bold font we are going to pass 400 as the font weight let's quickly add two more fonts for the bold styles you can see that for the normal bold font i've passed normal as the font style but for the italic one i've passed italic the only difference between a bold and a regular size font is in this weight for the regular we have passed 400 but for the bold ones we have passed 700 before we go further let's quickly see where we can find the proper font weight so if you search for font weight android developer you can see this font weight from the developer.android.com let's quickly see that and in here inside this uh, companion properties you can see different weights for different fonts for example we have passed 400 for the regular fonts which is the correct number for the bold ones we also passed 700 i believe in android you won't see much difference if you pass for example 500 when the fonts are being rendered the only difference is between this 400 and 700 so if you want you can check this web page okay let's switch back to android studio now that we have created this font family we can pass it in our activity main.xml file but before that you can see that we have a lot of warnings in here if we hover over one of them it says that these attributes are only usable in api level 26 and higher so if your application is running on api level lower than that uh, this font family won't be applied i've seen that some people use app namespace instead of this android for example you can say app in here of course you need to add the namespace uh, by pressing alt plus enter you can see that this new namespace has been added i'm not going to talk about namespace in here but basically it's like importing in xml file in other programming languages you also have namespaces basically it will define that uh, where this app attribute is coming from so some people uh, are using this app namespace they say that if you use this app namespace instead of android the font family will be applied in lower api levels as well but honestly i didn't see that difference so i'm going to change this one back to android and in my activity main.xml file i'm going to pass the font family so in here instead of passing uh, lobster to regular i'm going to pass lobster to this xml file that we just created and now this way we are passing the styling job to the android system so even though we are using this lobster too because we have set the style to bold in here at the end our font is going to be rendered to this lobster to bold let's run our application and let's see if we can see a bold font you can see that we are seeing the bold font once again the difference in here is that this time we are using exactly this uh, lobster to bold but when we have passed lobster to regular and we have set the style to bold only the android studio increased the size 
Sometimes there might be some differences between different font styles when uh, the designer created the font. So this way of creating a font family is much more accurate. Okay, just before finishing this video, I'm going to show you how you can apply different fonts in Java file. For example, inside this uh, layout file in the design view, I'm going to add a button. And by clicking on this button, I'm going to change the font of this text view. Let's change the ID of this button first of all to let's say btn change font. And also let's add some constraints. And let's change the text. I'm just going to say change. In our main activity, first of all, let's initialize these two items. After that, let's set an unclick listener for our button. Let's say that set unclick listener, new unclick listener. Before this unclick listener, I'm going to create a typeface and after that, I'm going to change the typeface of this text view inside this unclick method. So above in here, let's say typeface. You can see that it's coming from android.graphics package. Let's name it typeface is equal to. In here, we are going to get a reference to our font in our resources folder. If I try get resources in here, let's quickly see that get resources dot get font and if I pass my font address for example if I say r dot font dot let's say Amsterdam you can see that we are getting a red warning in here and the warning says that this method is only available in API level 26 and higher you can overcome this problem by using resource compat instead of this get resources method let's quickly see that so in here I can say resource compat dot get font first of all we need a context which i'm going to pass this after that we need to address our font let's say r dot font dot amsterdam so instead of get resources you can use this resource compat which is a good option for backward compatibility after you have defined your typeface inside the onclick method you can say txt hello dot set typeface and you can pass your typeface as simple as that, you can uh, change the font of your text view. Let's run the application and let's see if everything is working fine. Right now the font is Lobster 2. If we click on this button, you can see that the font is changing to Amsterdam. It seems to be perfect. Okay, I think that's enough for this video and also for that matter for this section of the course. There are a lot more concepts and tools that you have uh, when you are designing your layout files, for example. You have navigation drawers, you have bottom navigation views, you have animations that you can apply in your application. But I'm not going to talk about them in this section of the course because there are a lot more concepts that we don't know anything about them yet. Later on in the course we will see a lot more tools uh, for designing our layout files. Okay, in the next video we are going to have a quick challenge for this section of the course so that we make sure we have learned everything that we have talked so far. See you in the next video. As I said at the end of the previous video, in this video we are going to have a quick challenge. The purpose of this challenge is to make sure that we have learned everything that we have talked so far. And here is our challenge. I want you to create this simple layout file. You can think of this uh, layout file as a simple registration form in which we are receiving the user's name, email, password, gender and also country. Beside that we have this image view in here plus this button which normally in a normal application this button should navigate us to the user's gallery or maybe the camera in order to take a photo but because we don't know anything about that yet uh, this button and this image view are just for showing purposes. These are not going to do anything just if you want you can show a toast message after clicking on this pick image button. Beside that we have this license agreement text which down below that you can see this checkbox. If everything works fine when we click on the register we are going to show a snack bar indicating that the user has registered successfully. But if for example the user leaves one of these edit texts empty you are going to show a warning. Beside that we are going to make sure that the user agrees to our license agreement.
Okay, this is our challenge. As you can see, this is a simple layout file. I'm sure that you can do it by yourself. But as you can see, we are going to practice a lot of things that we have learned in this section of the course. We are going to work with a lot of uh, UI elements. Besides that, as you can see, we are implementing material theming. Also, we are going to show snack bars. And beside that, we are going to see how we can initialize and work with our UI elements in the Java file. Feel free to use any kind of layout file that you want in order to design this simple layout file. In here, I have used a constraint layout. But if you want, you can use linear layout or relative layout. Okay, pause the video in here and go solve the challenge. Whenever you are done, come back to see my solution as well. Okay, I hope you solved the challenge. Let's quickly see my solution as well. I'm going to start by creating a new project. For the name of this project, I'm going to say UI challenge. I'm going to save with uh, API level 19. In this simple application, it shouldn't matter. Okay, let's start working on our layout file. But before that, I'm going to close all of my extra files and panes. As I said, I'm going to work with constraint layout, but uh, if you want, you can work with linear layout or relative layout. Before everything, let's remove this text view and let's drag all of our items. First of all, we need an image view for the image profile. For the sample data, I'm going to select one of the avatars. We also need a button. Beside that, we are going to need a material design components. We will add that in a minute. But before that, let's quickly drag all of our UI elements. We need four edit texts in here. The first two are going to be plain text and the next ones are going to be password. The first two are for the name and email. Let's quickly add two passwords in here. The difference between this password and this plain text edit text is that when you type something inside the password edit text, it won't show the text itself, but you will see some dots. Also beside that, we need a text view for our uh, gender text. After that, we need a radio group. Let's quickly add that. Inside this radio group, we need four radio buttons. Also, I'm not sure that if you have seen this way of uh, dragging radio buttons in your radio group in the design view. Previously, we have seen how to add uh, radio buttons inside a radio group in the text view, but here is how you can do that uh, in the design view. Basically, you can use this component tree. For example, I can drag my radio buttons to inside this radio group. Let's add two more. Let's also quickly change the orientation of this radio group. Let's search for the orientation in the attributes. This one in here, I'm going to change it to horizontal. Beside that, we need a text view for the countries. And also we need a spinner in here for selecting one of the countries. Let's search for a spinner. Let's quickly change the width of this spinner to wrap content instead of uh, match parent. This is not match parent in here. Uh, it's just some uh, DPs. We are going to change that to wrap content. Also, I think it's better to put it above in here beside our country's text. And after everything, if you remember, we had a button. Let's quickly add that. This is going to be our button register. Beside that, we need a text view in here for our license agreement. And also we needed a checkbox. Let's search for checkbox. And let's change the checked value of this checkbox to true. Let's search for checked. Uh, or you can see that down in here. Also, uh, I'm going to change the checked value of this radio button to checked as well. Also, let's quickly change the ID of our UI elements so that we can use them in our Java file. I'm going to fast forward the process of giving them an ID. Basically, you can select your UI element and you can change the attribute from this uh, top right pane in here. Just to have a quick review, let's quickly see the ID of each one of them because later on we are going to use them in our Java file. This one is image profile. This one is BTN pick image. Edit text name, edit text email, edit text password, edit text pass repeat, txt gender. This one in here is RG gender for our radio group. The three radio buttons are named RB male, RB female, and RB other. This text view is called txt country. The spinner is called a spinner country, and this button is BTN register. This text view in here is called txt agreement, and this checkbox is called agreement check. We are also going to need four more text views. If you remember, I said that when we click on this register button, 
we are going to make sure that we have received some input from the user and if for some reason the user uh, don't enter anything on our edit text we are going to show some warning and we are going to use text views for those warnings so let's quickly add four more text views i'm going to add the warning for each one of edit text above the edit text let's quickly give some id to these for example for the first one i'm going to say txt var name you can guess the rest of them this one is txt warn email this one txt warn pass and the last one is txt warn pass repeat okay now that we have the id for uh, all of these ui elements let's quickly change their initial values for example for this text view i'm not going to change anything but for this edit text i'm going to delete the text and i'm going to add a hint let's search for the hint let's just say name sometimes like this you can see some options which can be annoying by pressing the escape key on your keyboard you can get rid of that uh, suggestion let's do the same thing for these three remaining edit texts for this text view i'm going to change its value to let's say gender for the radio buttons let's change the first one to male the next one to female and the other one i'm going to name other this text view in here let's change it to countries or country let's change this button's text to uh, pick image and this one to register also this checkbox to i agree beside that we need to change the value of this text view but uh, we are going to do that later on when we created our constraints i'm not going to do anything about this yet also i'm going to change the color of these four warning text views let's quickly do that let's search for color and let's change it to some red color i think this one would be fine now let's start constraining our uh, ui elements for example for this image view i'm going to constrain it to the left of my screen and also to the top of my screen but of course i need some margin i will add that in a minute beside that the right of this image view to the left of my button and also the right of this button to the right of my screen beside that i'm going to constrain this button to the bottom of my image view similar thing uh, for the top of my image view also let's add some margin uh, for this image view for example margin top let's say 32 i believe is fine and let's move it to left but as you can see when i move this image view to left and uh, this button do not move i'm going to delete this right constraint and i'm going to drag it uh, from the left of this button to the right of my image view now let's constrain this image view to the right of our screen and now we can move it it seems better now for these text views first of all i'm going to add a horizontal guideline so let's right click on our layout and let's go to these helpers and let's add horizontal guideline let's move this guideline to somewhere about here i think it's fine beside that we need a vertical guideline let's quickly add that helpers add vertical guideline and let's move it a little bit now let's constrain our edit texts for example uh, this one to our guideline i'm going to constrain this text view to this guideline as well also i'm going to add a constraint from the top of this edit text to the bottom of this text view but as you can see these uh, are too close to each other what you can do is that by pressing down the control key you can select both of them and by right clicking you can use this right click menu you can go to this constraint let's say edit text name uh, let's say top to the bottom of our txt warning name you can see that now we have a constraint beside that i'm going to add a constraint from the top of this text view to our horizontal guideline so once again let's select both of them and let's right click constraint txt warning name top to bottom of our guideline i think i'm going to remove the margin in here you can see that we have an 18 margin let's decrease that to zero i believe is fine let's do the same thing for the rest of edit text and text views for these three remaining text views i'm going to add a margin top to the top edit text but i'm also going to add a margin let's right click constraint txt warning email top to the bottom of our edit text name let's see what is the margin in here 
15 I think I'm going to save it 16 okay let's do the same thing for the remaining uh, two edit text and text views you can see that everything looks better now also if for any reason your computer is slow you can always go to this eye icon in here and you can disable this live rendering or alternatively you can work with the blueprint view which you can show from this blueprint option in here let's quickly see that you can work with this one as well but like before i'm going to stay with the design view okay let's add a constraint for this gender text first of all i'm going to constrain it to the top of this edit text constraint txt gender top to let's say bottom of our edit text let's also add a margin I think a margin uh, 24 would be fine. It seems too much. Let's say 16. Let's also add a margin to the left of our screen. Let's add a margin in here as well. For the radio group, I'm going to uh, select the radio group from this component tree. For the left constraint, I'm going to add it to this guideline. Also, I'm going to add a, a constraint from the top of this radio group to the bottom of this gender text view. Once again, I'm going to use the right click menu, let's say constraint. It seems like I didn't select the radio group. You can always use this uh, component tree if you want. Let's select both of them. Let's right click constraint. Let's say radio group gender, top to bottom of our TXT gender. That seems to be better. Let's also add a margin. I think 16 would be fine. For the country text, I'm going to do the same thing. For the left margin, let's say 16. Let's constrain it to our radio group. Constraint txt country top to the bottom of our radio group. For the margin, let's say 16 once again. For the spinner, I'm going to constrain it to the right of my country text view and also its bottom and top to the bottom and top of this country text view as well. But of course, we need a margin left. Let's quickly add that. For this register button, I'm going to constrain it to the three edges of my screen. But I need a margin button. Let's add 32 for example. I think that's fine. For this text view, I'm going to add another guideline in here. Let's quickly add that. Helpers add a vertical guideline. I'm going to move this guideline. Let's move it to somewhere about here. And let's constrain our text view to this one in here. For the top, I'm going to constrain it to the vertical guideline. Let's also constrain this checkbox. I'm also going to constrain the top of this checkbox to the bottom of our text view. Let's add another guideline in here. This one is going to be a horizontal guideline. And let's move it down below this edit text. Now I'm going to add a constraint from the bottom of this checkbox to, the, uh, to this horizontal guideline. It seems like we don't have a proper constraint in here. For that, I'm going to delete this top constraint. You can delete the constraint by uh, selecting the constraint and pressing down the delete key. Let's also add a constraint from uh, the bottom of this text view uh, to the bottom horizontal guideline. Also, I'm going to move it a little bit above. That seems better now. Let's also change the text of this text view and also let's uh, change the visibility of this for warning text to uh, gone. First of all, let's add the text for this text view. But you can see that as soon as uh, I type the text view in here, the text of our text view somehow uh, occupies other layout files and also it doesn't fit on the screen. If you want to fix that, you can click on this two arrow in here and you can change the constraint to a match constraint but we also need a margin let's quickly add 8 in here also for the right okay that seems better also i think it's better to move this checkbox to above a little bit let's click on that and let's move it above okay that seems better let's quickly change the visibility of these four warning text views as well let's search for visibility and let's change it to gone similarly for the next three text views but now that i've done that you can see that uh, we have two uh, small margins we can increase that for example let's say 18 here similarly for the next two edit text sorry for the repetition okay that's about the size of our layout file we also need to add some entry for our spinner let's quickly add them in our uh, strings values 
in our resources in values folder inside the strings i'm going to add an array string let's say array let's name it countries and let's add our items now in our activity main.xml file uh, we can pass this as the entries of our spinner let's search for entries and let's address our countries array okay that seems better beside that for this image view we also need a source let's search for source in here for some reason we can't see source in here let's switch to text view or this split view and let's add it in here let's say source and let's pass this mipmap file that we have in our project before testing the application let's quickly add the material design team for that i'm going to go to material.io let's go to this develop tab we have seen all of this before in this android in the documentation getting started down in here you can see the dependency let's quickly add that in our project gradle script build.gradle module app down in here inside the dependencies let's add that we also need to add a version in here which as you can see in the warning the latest version is 1.1.0 let's sync our project and let's go to our styles and change the theme of our application i'm going to delete this theme in here and i'm going to use theme.materialcomponents.light this one we have used this previously in previous videos let's switch back to our activity main file you can see that the style of our buttons has changed let's quickly test everything i'm going to run the application on pixel 3 api 29 it seems like we have done a relatively good job we just need to increase the size of this image view for that i'm going to change the width and uh, height of this image view i'm going to add them manually let's say 130 dp i think that would be fine let's run the application once again if you want you can also decrease the size of this text view as well yes that seems to be better your design might be different than mine uh, it's okay it's probably better than me i'm not a designer but we just wanted to practice everything that we have learned okay i think that's enough for this video in the next video we are going to switch to our java file and we are going to work on the logic of our application see you in the next video In the previous video we have created this layout file which isn't that bad. In this video we are going to work on the java file and the logic for this application. So for that let's switch to our main activity.java file and let's close our layout file. First of all in here I'm going to initialize all of my UI elements. Before that let's quickly add a log. I believe it will be useful. Let's say private edit text. We had four edit texts i'm going to fast forward the process of defining and initializing these ui elements you can see that it's very boring i'm also going to define a constraint layout element in here let's say private constraint layout i'm going to name it parent i believe later on we will use this constraint layout to show a snack bar i also need to give an id to my constraint layout so for that let's switch to our activity main.xml file in our split view in the parent constraint layout i'm going to give it an id let's say id i'm going to say parent okay now let's initialize all of uh, these ui elements i'm going to do that inside another method let's name that method init views first of all let's create that method down in here private void init views first of all let's add a log let's say it started Let's minimize this project pane and let's initialize. Once again, I'm going to uh, fast forward the process of initializing these UI elements. I think I have a typo in here when I have set uh, an ID for this VTN register. Let's quickly fix that in our layout file. If I click on this register button, in here you can see my typo. Sorry for that. I also need to change it in here okay now that we have initialized all of our views i'm going to uh, set an unclick listener first of all for my btn peak image i'm talking about this one in here so after this method i'm going to say btn peak image dot set unclick listener new unclick listener let's just show a toast message we haven't seen how to pick an image for example from a gallery 
or for that matter uh, to take a picture using the device's camera for that uh, we are just going to show this toast message after that let's define an onclick listener for our btn finish or btn register i believe i named it set onclick listener new onclick listener i'm going to do the job inside another method let's say init register let's create that method down in here let's say private void init register once again let's add a log let's say start in here first of all i'm going to check that if the user has entered all of the data for that i'm going to say if i'm going to create another method i will create that in a minute but let's say if validate data if that's the case we are going to continue let's quickly create this method down in here and let's see what we are going to do inside this method private the return type is going to be a boolean let's say private boolean validate data once again let's add a log let's say if edit text uh, name dot get text dot to a string if it's equal to an empty string first of all we are going to show the warning text so let's say txt warning txt warning name dot set visibility let's pass visible i believe you have seen this previously in the course after that we are going to return false it means that uh, we didn't validate the data so we shouldn't continue our code in this method uh, inside this if statement let's create three more if statements uh, for the other three edit texts if edit text email dot get text dot to string is equal to an empty string txt warning email dot set visibility once again visible also we need to return false in here as well also in each one of these cases before returning false we are going to change the text of our txt warning because if you remember uh, in the layout file we didn't change the text of that warning text view so i can say txt warning name for example dot set text let's just say uh, enter your name similarly for the other three cases and after all of these uh, if statements after all of these cases if we reach to this point we are going to return true it means that the user has entered all of the data so inside this validate data method we are validating that the user filled all of the blanks after that inside this init register method inside this if statement we are going to check that if the user agrees to our license agreement so let's say if agreement check dot is checked this option in here if that's the case we are going to continue but in the else case we are just going to show a toast message let's say you need to agree to the license agreement but if the user reaches to this point uh, where the user enters all of the data and also agree to the license agreement we are going to show a snack bar let's do that in another method let's say show a snack bar let's create that method down in here private void show a snack bar once again add a log and down in here inside this method first of all we need to change the visibility of all of our warning texts because those warnings are no longer valid so let's say txt warning name dot set visibility let's say gone this time let's do the same thing for the other uh, three remaining warning texts after that we need to show our snack bar if you remember we can do something like this we can say snack bar dot make first of all we need to pass our constraint layout which is our parent in this case after that we need the text in here right now i'm going to show a dummy text for example i'm going to say user registered but later on i will change this text for example i will show the details of the newly registered user for now let's say user registered after that we need a constant for the length of our snack bar i'm going to say snack bar dot length indefinite let's also define an action button for our snack bar i'm going to say dot set action for the text i'm just going to say dismiss let's also create an onclick listener let's say new onclick listener for the time being i'm not going to do inside this onclick method later on uh, we will clear our edit texts let's finish creating our snack bar but before that we just need to show it let's say dot show let's run the application and let's see if we have write everything correctly 
First of all, let's click on this pick image button. We should see a toast message. You can see that yet to be talked about. Let's enter some data and let's register a new user. Let's say Mesa. Let's add an email. Let's enter a password. Let's retype our password. We also need to check that if these two are the same. Uh, I forgot to do that. I will do that after the testing of this phase of the application. Before registering the user, I'm going to uncheck this uh, license agreement checkbox. Let's say register. You can see that you need to agree the, to the license agreement. Let's check it once again and let's register. This time we should see the snack bar. User registered. It seems like our application is working fine. If we press dismiss, uh, the snack bar will be dismissed. Also, let's delete this email in here. And let's see if we get the warning text if we click on this register button. We can see that enter your email. We are successfully validating our data. If we enter an email in here, for example, maysam at gmail.com. And if we click on the register button, we should see that the email warning text disappears. Okay, now I'm going to change the application. First of all, I'm going to check that these two are the same. After that, I'm also going to empty all of these four edit texts uh, when I click on this dismiss button so that we can add a new user. Also, I'm going to change the text of this snack bar to the details of our newly registered user. Let's quickly do that. First of all, inside this uh, validate data method, I'm going to add another if case. Let's say if edit text password, this one dot get text dot to string. If that's equal to our edit text password repeat dot get text dot to string. If that's the case, or let's change our logic. Let's say if that's not the case. First of all, we are going to change the visibility of this txt warning password repeat. And after that, we are going to return false. Let's say txt warning password repeat dot set visibility. Let's say visible. After that, I'm going to change the text. I'm going to say txt warning repeat dot set text. Let's say uh, password doesn't match. And after that, I'm going to return false. Okay, now that we have validated this data successfully, Let's go to this onClick method and in here, let's clear our edit texts. I'm going to say edit text email or edit text name dot set text. Let's just pass an empty string. Similarly for the other three edit texts. Next thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to change the text of this snack bar. First of all, I'm going to create that text above in here inside this show snack bar method. Before everything, I'm going to get the user's data. For example, let's say the string name is equal to edit text name dot get text dot to string. Similarly for the email, I'm going to say a string email is equal to edit text email dot get text dot to string. I'm also going to get the user's gender and also country. Let's say a string country is equal to countries spinner dot get selected item dot to string. For getting the user's gender, I'm going to create a switch statement. Before that, I'm going to create a string. Let's say string gender is equal to an empty string. After that, let's create a switch statement on our radio group or radio group gender dot get checked radio button ID. Let's say in case it's r.id.radiobuttonmail we are going to change the value of this uh, gender string let's say gender is equal to mail sorry about that let's also add a break in here another case r.id.female let's say gender is equal to female this default case should never happen, but just for security purposes, if something goes wrong, I'm assigning unknown to the gender string. So after this switch statement, we have all of the data about our user. Now we can create the text that we want to show inside this snack bar. Let's say a string a snack text is equal to, and let's create our text. First of all, I'm going to say name plus the name that we created or we got from the edit text name. After that, I'm going to add a backslash n in order to go to the next line. Let's say email plus the email. Once again, a backslash n. Let's also show the gender and country. Let's say gender plus the gender. 
once again backslash n and also let's show the country now that we have created this text we can show it in our snack bar so this time instead of this text i'm going to say snack text let's run the application once again and let's see if we have uh, fixed our application successfully let's test the different cases first of all let's check that if we see the warning if we enter different passwords in these two edit texts in the password field i'm going to enter one two three four five six but in the re-enter password edit text i'm going to say one two three four five if we click on this register button we should see the uh, warning text password doesn't match okay let's add six in here now they do match let's change the country to for example uh, switzerland and also let's change the gender in here to female and let's see if we can register a new user in here you can see that we are seeing the snack text that we have created but we are not seeing all of it we are seeing only the first two line if you want to change the maximum line attribute of your snack bar you can do that first of all you need to get the instance of your snack bar after that you need to get the text view of your snack bar and after that you can change the max line attribute on your text view this way you can override the maximum line attribute of the text view of your snack bar but that seems like a lot of work and we are not going to do that in here we will do that later on in the course uh, in other places when we use a snack bar but in here if you want to make sure that you have created your snack text successfully you can simply log it for example in here i'm going to add a log let's say log d let's say a snack bar text and let's pass our snack text but before i run my application and test this i'm going to click on this dismiss button if you remember uh, we write the logic so that we clear all of our edit texts let's click that and you can see we are now ready to register a new user let's run the application once again and let's test this snack text for that i'm going to open the logcat let's enter some data in here and let's click on this register you can see the snack text in here name mesam email mesam at gmail.com gender mail country norway it seems like we have created our text successfully okay i think that's enough for this video i hope that you have solved the challenge in the next section of the course we are going to create the first of four of our applications now we know about java now we know about user interface and in the next section of the course we are going to combine these two and we are going to create our first real world application beside practicing everything that we have learned so far we are also going to learn a lot of new stuff as well so stay tuned for the next section of the course and as always see you in the next video what's up everyone i hope you are having fun before we start creating our sample application i would like to remind you that there is an extended version of this course that you can watch by enrolling in the extended course you will have lifetime access to more than 60 hours of videos you can ask your questions directly from me and i will come back to you within hours you will have access to all of the source codes that i write in the videos and also you can have access to all of the new videos that i upload just check out makecode.org for more details about the course and don't forget to use free code camp as the coupon code to get 20% discount. If you want to get serious in Android app development, taking the extended course is almost a necessity. Okay everyone, I just wanted to remind you that there is an extended version of this course that you can take. Without further ado, let's start creating our sample application. Have fun learning! hello everyone and welcome back in this section of the course we are going to create the first application of the four real world application that i promised it's important to say that in creating this application beside practicing everything that we have talked so far we are also going to learn a lot of new stuff you will see them in action when we create the application okay now let's talk about the application itself we are going to create an application that will help the user to manage his or her library. In this application, we are going to show a list of different books to the user, and the user can see the details of that book. Later on, if the user wants, he or she can add that book to different lists. For example, a list that indicates that the user has already read this book, or maybe a wish list, or also a favorite list. We will see all of them later on in the course. In the process of creating this application, we are going to practice all of our knowledge about user interface and Java. 
and beside that we are going to learn about a lot of new concepts. After watching this section of the course, you can change the application that we create together and you can even publish it in the Play Store. So I highly suggest that uh, you watch this section of the course and don't uh, skip it. Okay, without more talking, let's create our project and let's start writing our application. I'm going to start with empty activity as before. Let's change the name of this application to my library. For the other fields in here, I'm not going to change anything. For the package name, once again, I'm going to put my website name uh, in backward org.makeo.project name which is my library the save location is fine language is java and we are going to save with api level 19 for the minimum sdk we are also not using the support library so i'm not going to check this option in here let's create our project and let's start working on our layout file before everything, I'm going to add the material design library dependencies into my project because we are going to need them. For that, let's go to material.io. Let's go to this develop tab. Let's select Android from here. Documentation, getting started. Let's copy this line of code. We have done this previously, so I'm not going to explain it in here. In our Gradle scripts, build.gradle module app, in the dependencies, let's add that. And also the latest version is 1.1.0, so let's change this one. And let's sync our project. It seems like we have added the material components successfully. First of all, let's change the style of our application. In values, styles.xml. Instead of this uh, app compat theme, I'm going to use theme.materialcomponents.light. Let's close this and let's switch to our activity main.xml file. Our application is going to have multiple pages. Later on, we will see how we can create multiple pages or to be specific, multiple activities. But for now, this is going to be the first page or the first activity of our application. And let's quickly design that. First of all, I'm going to have a text view for the name of this application. After that, I'm going to add a few buttons. One for the list of all books. I'm going to show the list of all of books by clicking on this button. I'm going to add five more buttons and I will talk about them. Let's also add an image view above in here for our logo. For now, I'm going to stay with one of our avatars. And also I'm going to add a text view in here for licensing. Let's give some IDs to our elements. For this one, I'm going to name it IMG logo because it's going to be our logo. For the text view, I'm going to say TXT name, but I'm not sure that we need an ID for this one. This button in here is going to show a list of all of our books. So let's say BTN all books. Also, let's change its text to show all books or see all books. Beside that, I don't like that this text is in all caps. If you want, you can change that. You need to search for all caps, this text all caps, and you can change its value. Let's change it to false. Now you can see that this text is much more better. For the second button, I'm going to change its ID to BTN currently reading because this button is going to show the list of the books that the user is currently reading. Let's say BTN currently reading. And let's change the text to currently reading books as well. Like before, let's change the text all caps value to false as well. For the third button, I'm going to change its ID to BTN already read because this button is going to show the list of books that the user already read. So let's say BTN already read. Let's change the text to already read books. Once again, let's change the text all caps attribute to false. For the fourth button, I'm going to change its ID to btn12 readbook. Let's say btn12 read. 
because this button is going to show the list of different books that the user uh, wants to list. Basically, this is the wish list. Let's also change the text. Let's say your wish list. Let's change the all caps attribute. That seems better. The fifth button, I'm going to change its ID to BTN favorite box. Let's say BTN favorite. And for its text, I'm going to say, see your favorites. Once again, let's change the all caps attribute. And for the last button, I'm going to change its ID to BTN about. By clicking on this uh, about button, we are going to show a dialog in which we'll show some information about this application. Let's say btn about and let's change its text to about. For this button, I'm not going to change its all caps attribute because I think it's better this way. Let's also give an ID to this text view as well. Let's say txt license. I'm going to change its text to developed by mesam at meko.org. I'm also going to change the style of this book to italic. Let's search for uh, text style. Let's change this font to italic. Also, let's change the text of the first text view to the name of our application. I'm just going to put uh, my library in here. Later on, we will change the font of this text view as well. Okay, let's add our constraints. Also, you can see that I'm using the constraint layout in here, but feel free to use the relative layout or linear layout. I'm more comfortable with constraint layout, so I'm using constraint layout. Let's add our constraints. I'm going to add a margin top of maybe 70 dp for this image view. But before that, I'm going to move my text view because right now I cannot see that. Okay, now let's add the margin top. I think 50 dp would be better. Now let's constrain our text view to the bottom of our image view and also to the both side of our screen. We also need a margin top. I think once again 50 dp would be fine. It seems too much. Let's say uh, 40 dp. Let's constrain all of these buttons. For this one, I'm going to constrain it to the bottom of my text view and also to both sides of my screen. I need a margin top, let's say 30 dp. After that, let's constrain the second one. I'm going to fast forward the process in here. Sometimes like this, if uh, the items are too close to each other, as before, we can select both of the items. And by right clicking, we can use this right click menu. Let's say BTN currently reading, top two, bottom uh, BTN all box. Let's add a margin in here by selecting our button. Margin top, I think 16 would be fine. It seems too much. Let's say 10 dp. Also for the second one. For this last text view in here, first of all, I'm going to constrain it to the bottom of my screen. And also beside that, I'm going to constrain it to the both edges of my screen so that it would be centered. Also, let's add a margin bottom of maybe uh, 16 dp. That seems better. For this image view, I'm not going to use a sample data. Instead, I'm going to show the actual image. I have prepared an image in here on my desktop. Let's use that. I'm going to copy this image. Let's add it into our MipMap folder. Resources, MipMap, right click and paste. I think the name is fine. And let's switch to our split view. For this image view, if you click on that, 
First of all, let's delete this last attribute, this tools source compat. And instead of that, let's use source. Let's address the image that we just uh, added into our project. It seems too large. Uh, we need to pass the width and height manually. Let's say 150 dp. I think that's fine. And also 150 dp for the height. That seems a little bit better. For this my library, if you remember, we had an attribute called uh, font family. Let's search for that in the design view. Font family. If we click on this arrow, more fonts. Let's search for a good font. Once again, these are the Google fonts and you can use them in your uh, projects free of charge. I think this lemon font is good. Let's add font to our project and let's press OK. You can see that the font has changed. Let's also increase the size a little bit. Let's search for text size and instead of 14 SP, let's say 18 SP. That seems better. The next thing that I'm going to change in this layout file is the width of all of these buttons. I want my buttons to have the same width. Right now you can see that these have an ugly shape. If we click on one of our buttons, uh, let's switch to a split view. Once again, let's click on that. For the width, if we say 200 dp, I think that would be fine, yes. For all of our buttons, for the width, I'm going to say 200 dp. You can see that it's much better now. Okay, this is going to be the layout for the first page of our application. Let's quickly initialize the necessary items in our Java file. By pressing double shift, you can search for mainactivity.java file. And in here, let's initialize our UI elements. Let's also initialize these buttons down below inside this uh, onCreate method. I'm going to do that inside another method, let's say initViews. And let's create that method by pressing Alt plus Enter. Once again, I'm going to fast forward the process of initializing these buttons. By clicking on each one of these buttons, beside this BTN about, I'm going to navigate the user to another activity. Up until this point, our applications had only one activity, which was named main activity. But if we want, we can create another activity in our application as well. We are going to talk about activities and fragments in the next video, but creating an activity is really simple. There are a lot more concepts regarding activities, we will talk about them later on, but in here, if you want to create an activity, you can do something like this. In your project, inside Java folder, inside your project folder, you can right click on that by saying new activity. In here you can see that you have few options. The names of some of these activities may be familiar from that gallery view from where we created our project. But basically in here we need this empty activity. You can also uh, select this gallery in which you will get the same dialog uh, when you created your application. Let's select empty activity once again. In here we can name our activities. The convention in here is that to use the keyword activity in naming and also you cannot use spaces and also other strange characters. For the name of this activity in here, I'm going to name it uh, All Books Activity because this is going to be the activity that we are going to navigate the user when the user clicks on that See All Books button. So let's say All Books Activity. You can also see a checkbox in here. It says that if you want to generate a layout file for your activities. It is possible to create an activity with only the Java file and not the XML file. We will talk about that in the next section of the course, but in here we do need a layout file, so I'm going to leave this one uh, checked in here. You can see that when I changed the name of my activity, also the layout name changed as well. 
In the layout name, you cannot use uppercases letter. And as you can see, all the letters change to lowercases. Beside that, you cannot uh, have uh, spaces. You have another option in here uh, to indicate that if this activity is going to be a launcher activity. Basically, in every application, one of the activities can be launcher. Right now, the launcher activity in our application is this main activity. It means that when we launch our application, uh, this main activity is going to be shown. And for that, I'm not going to check this option in here. Also, if you don't check this option in here, if you change your mind, uh, you can change it in your manifest file later. But more on that later on in the course. The package name is fine. We are going to create this activity in our package. And for the language of this activity, once again, I'm going to use Java. Let's finish creating our activity. And let's see what happened in our project. So first of all, a new Java class has been added into our package. You can see that we have this allbox activity.java file. Beside that, in our resources folder, in the layout folder, we have this activity allbox.xml. Both of these has been created by the Android Studio. Beside that, if you take a look at your manifest file, this android manifest.xml, you can see that in here we have a new line. We have a new activity tag in our application tag. It means that now our application has two activities. If you want to create your activities yourself without the help of Android Studio, that is possible. Uh, basically, you can create a Java file. After that, you can create a new layout file. And beside all of these, you need to add this tag into your application tag inside the manifest file. Also, you need to link the Java file and the layout file in your onCreate method. We will uh, take a look at that in a minute. But instead of all of this, we have used the help of uh, Android Studio. Okay, let's close this manifest file and let's switch to activityallbox.xml file. You can see that in here we have another layout in which we can design for this activity. In this video, I'm not going to design the layout for this activity. Instead, I'm just going to change its background color. If we switch to a split view in here, once again, you can see that we have a constraint layout. And inside the opening tag of this constraint layout, I'm going to say background and I'm going to pass a color. For example, I think I'm going to pass this uh, color accent. I'm doing this because I'm just going to uh, indicate that we have uh, navigated the user from the main activity to this all box activity. Okay, now let's see how we can navigate the user. Let's close both of these files, this uh, all box activity.xml file and also this all box activity.java file. I said that we are going to navigate the user to the other activity by clicking on this btn all box activity. So we need to create an on click listener in here. Let's say btn allbox.set onclick listener. Let's pass new onclick listener. And inside this onclick method is the place to write the logic to navigate the user. In here, I'm going to use an object that I have never used so far. And that object is called intent. You can see that it's coming from android.content package. Let's import that. Let's name it intent is equal to new intent. It's a simple Java class that we have defined it like any other Java class. The constructor of this intent uh, needs two things. First of all, we need to pass a context in here because we are inside this main activity and hopefully by now we know that activities are context. We need to pass main activity dot this. Let's pass that main activity dot this. After that, we need to pass the destination activity where you want to navigate the user to. For example, I can say all books activity dot class. So this way we are saying that this intent is going to navigate us from the main activity to all books activity. After that, when we created our intent, we can call an inner method in here called start activity. You can see that this start activity needs an intent and we can pass our intent safely. This start activity is an inner method like this find view by ID, which exists inside every activity. Now, if we run our application, we should see that when we click on this button, the user will be navigated to all box activity. Let's quickly test that. 
right now you can see that we have few issues with our layout first of all we cannot see this license text view for that we need to decrease the margins from here and also beside that uh, this currently reading box text does not fit in our button we will increase the width of all of our buttons as well but for now if we click on this see all books button you can see that we are navigating to the other activity Beside that, if we press this back button, uh, once again, we will be navigated to our main activity. It seems to be working perfect. Let's quickly fix the issues with our layout and let's finish off this video. In our activity main.xml file, first of all, let's decrease the margins. For example, this margin top, I'm going to change it to 30 dp. Beside that, margin top of this my library text. Let's decrease that to 30 dp. That seems better. For all of my buttons, instead of 200 dp, I'm going to say 230 dp. For example, for the first one, let's say 230 dp. Let's run the application once again and let's see if we have fixed the issues successfully. The layout seems better. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Just before I finish off, I'm going to say that you can check the source code for this application at makeodeorg slash codes. So feel free to check that if you need. I upload the source code uh, at the end of every video. Also, would be very happy to see your feedback. Okay, in the next video, first of all, we are going to create a model for our books. Beside that, we will create a recycler view and recycler view adapter to show a list of different books uh, inside the second activity. See you in the next video.